The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 8, Side 1. In the year 1060, the Seljuk Turks extended their conquests to Armenia. That harassed country has felt the claws of rival imperialisms through many centuries, because its mountains hindered its unity of defense, while its valleys provided tempting roads between Mesopotamia and the Black Sea. Greece and Persia fought for those roads as highways of trade and war. Xenophon's Ten Thousand traversed them. Rome and Persia fought for them. Byzantium and Persia, Byzantium and Islam, Russia and Britain. Through all vicissitudes of external pressure or domination, Armenia maintained a practical independence, a vigorous commercial and agricultural economy, a cultural autonomy that produced its own creed, literature, and art. It was the first nation to adopt Christianity as its state religion in 303. It took the Monophysite side in the debate about the nature of Christ, refusing to admit that he had shared the infirmities of human flesh. In 491, the Armenian bishops parted from Greek and Roman Christianity and formed an autonomous Armenian church under its own Catholicos. Armenian literature used the Greek language until the early 5th century, when Bishop Mesrob invented a national alphabet and translated the Bible into the Armenian tongue. Since that time, Armenia has had an abundant literature, chiefly in religion and history. From 642 to 1046, the country was nominally subject to the caliphs, but it remained virtually sovereign and zealously Christian. In the 9th century, the Bagratuni family established a dynasty under the title of Prince of Princes, built a capital at Ani, and gave the country several generations of progress and relative peace. Ashok III, from 952 to 977, was much loved by his people. He founded many churches, hospitals, convents, and almshouses, and, we are told, never sat down to meals without allowing poor men to join him. Under his son Gagik I, from 990 to 1020, how peculiar our names must seem to the Armenians, prosperity reached its height. Schools were numerous, towns were enriched by trade and adorned by art, and Kars rivaled Ani as a center of literature, theology, and philosophy. Ani had impressive palaces and a famous cathedral, circa 980, subtly compounded of Persian and Byzantine styles. Here were piers and column clusters, pointed as well as round arches, and other features that later entered into Gothic art. When, in 989, the cupola of St. Sophia in Constantinople was destroyed by an earthquake, the Byzantine emperor assigned the hazardous task of restoring it to Terdat, the architect of the Ani Cathedral. Chapter 11. The Islamic Scene, 628 to 1058. 1. The Economy. Civilization is a union of soil and soul, the resources of the earth transformed by the desire and discipline of men. Behind the facade and under the burden of courts and palaces, temples and schools, letters and luxuries and arts, stands the basic man, the hunter bringing game from the woods, the woodman felling the forest, the herdsman pasturing and breeding his flock, the peasant clearing, plowing, sowing, cultivating, reaping, tending the orchard, the vine, the hive, and the brood, the woman absorbed in the hundred crafts and cares of a functioning home, the miner digging in the earth, the builder shaping homes and vehicles and ships, the artisan fashioning products and tools, the peddler, shopkeeper, and merchant uniting and dividing maker and user, the investor fertilizing industry with his savings, the executive harnessing muscle, materials, and minds for the creation of services and goods. These are the patient yet restless leviathan on whose swaying back civilization precariously rides. All these were busy in Islam. Men raised cattle, horses, camels, goats, elephants, and dogs stole the honey of bees and the milk of camels, goats, and cows, and grew a hundred varieties of grains, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and flowers. The orange tree was brought from India to Arabia at some time before the 10th century. The Arabs introduced it to Syria, Asia Minor, Palestine, Egypt, and Spain, from which countries it pervaded southern Europe. The cultivation of sugar cane and the refining of sugar were likewise spread by the Arabs from India through the Near East and were brought by crusaders to their European states. Cotton was first cultivated in Europe by the Arabs. These achievements on lands largely arid were made possible by organized irrigation. Here the caliphs made an exception to their principle of leaving the economy to free enterprise. 
the government directed and financed the maintenance of the greater canals. The Euphrates was channeled into Mesopotamia, the Tigris into Persia, and a great canal connected the twin rivers at Baghdad. The early Abbasid caliphs encouraged the draining of marshes and the rehabilitation of ruined villages and deserted farms. In the 10th century, under the Samanid princes, the region between Bokhara and Samarkand was considered one of the four earthly paradises, the others being southern Persia, southern Iraq, and the region around Damascus. Gold, silver, iron, lead, mercury, antimony, sulfur, asbestos, marble, and precious stones were mined or quarried from the earth. Divers fished for pearls in the Persian Gulf. Some use was made of naphtha and bitumen. An entry in Harun's archives gives the price of naphtha and reeds used in burning the corpse of Jafar. Industry was in the handicraft stage, practiced in homes and artisans' shops, and organized in guilds. We find few factories and no clear advance in technology except the development of the windmill. Masudi, writing in the 10th century, speaks of seeing these in Persia and the Near East. There is no sign of them in Europe before the 12th century. Possibly they were another gift of the Moslem East to its crusading foes. There was much mechanical ingenuity. The water clock sent by Harun al-Rashid to Charlemagne was made of leather and damascened brass. It told the time by metal cavaliers, who at each hour opened the door, let fall the proper number of balls on a symbol, and then, retiring, closed the door. Production was slow, but the worker could express himself in integral work and made almost every industry an art. Persian, Syrian, and Egyptian textiles were famous for the patient perfection of their technique. Mosul for its cotton muslin, Damascus for its damask linen, Aden for its wool. Damascus was noted also for its swords of highly tempered steel, Sidon and Tyre for glass of unexcelled thinness and clarity, Baghdad for its glass and pottery, Rai for pottery, needles, combs, Raqqa for olive oil and soap, Fars for perfume and rugs. Under Muslim rule, Western Asia attained a pitch of industry and commercial prosperity unmatched by Western Europe before the 16th century. Land transport was chiefly by camels, horses, mules, and men. But the horse was too prized to be chiefly a beast of burden. Do not call him my horse, said an Arab. Call him my son. He runs more swiftly than the tempest, quicker than a glance. He is so light of foot that he could dance on the breast of your mistress, and she would take no hurt. So the camel, ship of the desert, bore most of the freight of Arab trade, and caravans of 4,700 camels swayed across the Moslem world. Great roads radiating from Baghdad led through Rai, Nashipur, Merv, Bokhara, and Samarkand to Kashgar and the Chinese frontier, through Basra to Shiraz, through Kufa to Medina, Mecca, and Aden, through Mosul or Damascus to the Syrian coast. Caravanserais, or inns, hospices, and cisterns, helped the traveler and his beasts. Much inland traffic was borne on rivers and canals. Harun al-Rashid planned a Suez Canal, but Yahya, for unknown reasons, probably financial, discouraged the idea. The Tigris at Baghdad, 750 feet wide, was spanned by three bridges built upon boats. Over these arteries a busy commerce passed. It was an economic advantage to Western Asia that one government united a region formerly divided among four states. Customs dues and other trade barriers were removed, and the flow of commodities was further eased by unity of language and faith. The Arabs did not share the European aristocrats' scorn of the merchant. Soon they joined Christians, Jews, and Persians in the business of getting goods from producer to consumer with the least possible profit to either. Cities and towns swelled and hummed with transport, barter, and sale. Peddlers cried their wares to latticed windows. Shops dangled their stock and resounded with haggling. Fairs, markets, and bazaars gathered merchandise, merchants, buyers, and poets. Caravans bound China and India to Persia, Syria, and Egypt. And forts like Baghdad, Basra, Aden, Cairo, and Alexandria sent Arab merchantmen out to sea. Muslim commerce dominated the Mediterranean till the Crusades, plying between Syria and Egypt at one end, Tunis, Sicily, Morocco, and Spain at the other, and touching Greece, Italy, and Gaul. It captured control of the Red Sea from Ethiopia. It reached over the Caspian into Mongolia and up the Volga from Astrakhan to Novgorod, Finland, Scandinavia, and Germany, where it left thousands of Muslim coins. 
It answered the Chinese junks that visited Basra by sending Arab dhows out from the Persian Gulf to India and Ceylon through the Straits and up the Chinese coast to Kanfu, or Canton. A colony of Muslim and Jewish merchants was well established there in the 8th century. This vitalizing commercial activity reached its peak in the 10th century when Western Europe was at Nader. And when it subsided, it left its mark upon many European languages in such words as tariff, traffic, magazine, caravan, and bazaar. The state left industry and commerce free, and it aided it with a relatively stable currency. The early caliphs used Byzantine and Persian money, but in 695, Abd al-Malik struck an Arab coinage of gold dinars and silver dirhems. Ibn Haqqal, circa 975, describes a kind of promissory note for 42,000 dinars addressed to a merchant in Morocco. From the Arabic word sak, S-A-K-K, for this form of credit, is derived our word check. Investors shared in financing commercial voyages or caravans. And though interest was forbidden, ways were found, as in Europe, of evading the prohibition and repaying capital for its use and risk. Monopolies were illegal but prospered. Within a century after Omar's death, the Arab upper classes had amassed great wealth and lived on luxurious estates manned by hundreds of slaves. Yahya the Barmakid offered seven million dirhams, or $560,000, for a pearl box made of precious stones and was refused. The caliph Muqtafi, if we may believe Muslim figures, left at his death 20 million dinars, or $94,500,000, in jewelry and perfumes. When Harun al-Rashid married his son al-Mamun to Buran, her grandmother emptied a shower of pearls upon the groom. And her father scattered among the guests balls of musk, each of which contained a writ entitling the possessor to a slave, a horse, an estate, or some other gift. After Muqtadir confiscated 16 million dinars of Ibn al jassas's fortune, that famous jeweler remained a wealthy man. Many overseas traders were worth 4 million dinars. Hundreds of merchants had homes costing from 10,000 to 30,000 dinars, or $142,500. At the bottom of the economic structure were the slaves. They were probably more numerous in Islam in proportion to population than in Christendom, where serfdom was replacing slavery. The caliph Muqtadir, we are told, had 11,000 eunuchs in his household. Musa took 300,000 captives in Africa, 30,000 virgins in Spain, and sold them into slavery. Kutaiba captured 100,000 in Sogdiana. The figures are oriental and must be discounted. The Quran recognized the capture of non-Muslims in war and the birth of children to slave parents as the sole legitimate sources of slavery. No Muslim, just as in Christendom, no Christian was to be enslaved. Nevertheless, a brisk trade developed in slaves captured in raids. Negroes from East and Central Africa, Turks or Chinese from Turkestan, whites from Russia, Italy, and Spain. The Muslim had full rights of life and death over his slaves. Usually, however, he handled them with a genial humanity that made their lot no worse, perhaps better as more secure, than that of a factory worker in 19th century Europe. Slaves did most of the menial work on the farms, most of the unskilled manual work in the towns. They acted as servants in the household and as concubines or eunuchs in the harem. Most dancers, singers, and actors were slaves. The offspring of a female slave by her master, or of a free woman by her slave, was free from birth. Slaves were allowed to marry, and their children, if talented, might receive an education. It is astonishing how many sons of slaves rose to high place in the intellectual and political world of Islam. How many, like Mahmud and the early Mamluks, became kings. Exploitation in Asiatic Islam never reached the merciless of pagan, Christian, or Muslim Egypt, where the peasant toiled every hour, earned enough to pay for a hut, a loincloth, and food this side of starvation. There was and is much begging in Islam, and much imposture in begging. But the poor Asiatic had a protective skill in working slowly. Few men could rival him in manifold adaptation to idleness, alms were frequent, and at the worst a homeless man could sleep in the finest edifice in town, the mosque. Even so, the eternal class war simmered sullenly through the years, and broke out now and then, in 778, 796, 808, and 838, in violent revolt. Usually, since state and church were one, rebellion took a religious garb. Some sects, like the Quramiya and the Muhayyida, adopted the communistic ideas of the Persian rebel Mazdak. One group called itself Surk Alam, 
the red flag. About 772, Hashim al-Mukana, the veiled prophet of Khorasan, announced that he was God incarnate and had come to restore the communism of Mazdak. He gathered various sects about him, defeated many armies, ruled northern Persia for fourteen years, and was finally, in 786, captured and killed. In 838, Babi al-Qurani renewed the effort, gathered around him a band known as Muhammira, that is, Reds, seized Azerbaijan, held it for twenty-two years, defeated a succession of armies, and, Tabari would have us believe, killed 255,500 soldiers and captives before he was overcome. The Caliph Mutasim ordered Babik's own executioner to cut off Babik's limbs one by one. The trunk was impaled before the royal palace, and the head was sent on exhibition around the cities of Khorasan as a reminder that all men are born unfree and unequal. The most famous of these servile wars of the East was organized by Ali, an Arab who claimed descent from the Prophet's son-in-law. Near Basra, many Negro slaves were employed in digging saltpeter. Ali represented to them how badly they were treated, urged them to follow him in revolt, and promised them freedom, wealth, and slaves. They agreed, seized food and supplies, defeated the troops sent against them, and built themselves independent villages with palaces for their leaders, prisons for their captives, and mosques for their prayers. This in 869. The employers offered Ali five dinars, or $23.75 per head, if he would persuade the rebels to return to work. He refused. The surrounding country tried to starve them into submission, but when their supplies ran out, they attacked the town of Obola, freed and absorbed its slaves, sacked it, and put it to flames. This in 870. Much encouraged, Ali led his men against other towns, took many of them, captured control of southern Iran and Iraq to the gates of Baghdad. Commerce halted, and the capital began to starve. In 871, the Negro general Mohalabi, with a large army of rebels, seized Basra. If we may credit the historians, 300,000 persons were massacred, and thousands of white women and children, including the Hashemite aristocracy, became the concubines or slaves of the Negro troops. For ten years the rebellion continued. Great armies were sent to suppress it. Amnesty and rewards were offered to deserters. Many of his men left Ali and joined the government's forces. The remnant was surrounded, besieged, and bombarded with molten lead and Greek fire, flaming torches of naphtha. Finally, a government army under the vizier Moafak made its way into the rebel city, overcame resistance, killed Ali, and brought his head to the victor. Moafak and his officers knelt and thanked Allah for his mercies. This in 883. The rebellion had lasted fourteen years and had threatened the whole economic and political structure of eastern Islam. Ibn Tulun, governor of Egypt, took advantage of the situation to make the richest of the caliph's provinces an independent state. 2. The Faith Next to bread and woman, in the hierarchy of desire, comes eternal salvation. When the stomach is satisfied and lust is spent, man spares a little time for God. Despite polygamy, the Moslem found considerable time for Allah and based his morals, his laws, and his government upon his religion. Theoretically, the Moslem faith was the simplest of all creeds. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. The simplicity of the formula is only apparent, for its second clause involves the acceptance of the Quran and all its teachings. Consequently, the Orthodox Moslem also believed in heaven and hell, angels and demons, the resurrection of body and soul, the divine predestination of all events, the last judgment, the four duties of Moslem practice, prayer, alms, fasting and pilgrimage, and the divine inspiration of various prophets who led up to Muhammad. For every nation, said the Quran, there is a messenger and a prophet. Some Moslems reckon such messengers at 224,000, but apparently only Abraham, Moses, and Jesus were considered by Muhammad as having spoken the word of God. Hence, the Moslem was required to accept the Old Testament and the Gospels as inspired scriptures. Where these contradicted the Quran, it was because their divine text had been willfully or unwittingly corrupted by men. In any case, the Quran superseded all previous revelations, and Muhammad excelled all the other messengers of God. Moslems proclaimed his mere humanity, but revered him almost as intensely as Christians worshipped Christ. If I had been alive in his time, said a typical Moslem, I would not have allowed the apostle of God to put his blessed foot upon the earth, but would have borne him upon my shoulders wherever he wished to go. 
Making their faith still more complex, good Muslims accepted and obeyed, besides the Quran, the traditions preserved by their learned men of their prophets' customs and conversation. Time brought forward questions of creed, ritual, morals, and law to which the holy book gave no clear answer. Sometimes the words of the Quran were obscure and needed elucidation. It was useful to know what, on such points, the Prophet or his companions had done or said. Certain Muslims devoted themselves to gathering such traditions. During the first century of their era, they refrained from writing them down. They formed schools of hadith, or traditions, in diverse cities, and gave public discourses reciting them. It was not unusual for Muslims to travel from Spain to Persia to hear a hadith from one who claimed to have it in direct succession from Muhammad. In this way, a body of oral teaching grew up alongside the Quran, as the Mishnah and Gemara grew up beside the Old Testament. And as Yehuda Hanasi gathered the oral law of the Jews into written form in 189, so in 870, al-Bukhari, after researches which led him from Egypt to Turkestan, critically examined 600,000 Mohammedan traditions and published 7,275 of them in his Sahih, Correct Book, each chosen tradition was traced through a long chain, or isnad, of named transmitters to one of the companions or to the Prophet himself. Many of the traditions put a new color upon the Muslim creed. Muhammad had not claimed the power of miracles, but hundreds of pretty traditions told of his wonder-working, how he fed a multitude from food hardly adequate for one man, exorcised demons, drew rain from heaven by one prayer and stopped it by another, how he touched the udders of dry goats and they gave milk, how the sick were healed by contact with his clothes or his shorn hair. Christian influences seem to have molded many of the traditions. Love toward one's enemies was inculcated, though Mohammed had sterner views. The Lord's Prayer was adopted from the Gospels. The parables of the sower, the wedding guests, and the laborers in the vineyard were put into Mohammed's mouth. All in all, he was transformed into an excellent Christian, despite his nine wives. Muslim critics complained that much of the hadith had been concocted as Umayyad, Abbasid, or other propaganda. Ibn Abi al executed at Kufa in 772, confessed to have fabricated 4,000 traditions. A few skeptics laughed at the hadith collections and composed indecent stories in solemn hadith form. Nevertheless, the acceptance of the hadith in one or the other of the approved collections as binding in faith and morals became a distinguishing mark of Orthodox Muslims who therefore received the name of Sunni, or traditionalists. One tradition represented the angel Gabriel as asking Muhammad, What is Islam? And Muhammad replied, Islam is to believe in Allah and his prophet, to recite the prescribed prayers, to give alms, to observe the fast of Ramadan, and to make the pilgrimage to Mecca. Prayer, almsgiving, fasting, and pilgrimage constituted the four duties of Muslim religion. These, with belief in Allah and Muhammad, are the five pillars of Islam. Prayer had to be preceded by purification, and as prayer was required of the Muslim five times a day, cleanliness came literally next to godliness. Muhammad, like Moses, used religion as a means to hygiene as well as to morality, on the general principle that the rational can secure popular acceptance only in the form of the mystical. He warned that the prayer of an unclean person would not be heard by God. He even thought of making the brushing of the teeth a prerequisite to prayer. But finally he compromised on the washing of the face, the hands, and the feet. A man who had had sexual relations, a woman who had menstruated or given birth since the last purification, must bathe before prayer. At dawn, shortly after midday, in late afternoon, at sunset, and at bedtime, the muezzin mounted a minaret to sound the adan, or call to prayer. Allahu Akbar, God is most great. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the Apostle of Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the Apostle of Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the Apostle of Allah. Come to prayer, come to prayer, come to prayer. Come to success, come to success, come to success. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. There is no God but Allah. It is a powerful appeal, a noble summons to rise with the sun, 
a welcome interruption in the hot work of the day, a solemn message of divine majesty in the stillness of the night. Grateful even to alien ears is this strange, shrill chant of many muezzins from divers mosques, calling the earthbound soul to a moment's communion with the mysterious source of life and mind. On those five occasions, all Moslems everywhere must leave off whatever else they may be doing, must cleanse themselves, turn toward Mecca and the Kaaba, and recite the same brief prayers in the same successive postures, in an impressive simultaneity moving with the sun across the earth. Those who had the time and will would go to the mosque to say their prayers. Usually the mosque was open all day. Any Moslem, Orthodox, or heretic might enter to make his ablutions, to rest or to pray. There, too, in the cloistered shade, teachers taught their pupils, judges tried cases, caliphs announced their policies or decrees. People gathered to chat, hear the news, even to negotiate business. The mosque, like the synagogue and the church, was the center of daily life, the home and hearth of the community. Half an hour before Friday noon, the muezzin chanted from the minarets the salutation or salam, a blessing on Allah, Muhammad, his family, and the great companions and called the congregation to the mosque. The worshippers were expected to have bathed and put on clean clothes, and to have perfumed themselves, or they might perform minor ablutions in the tank or fountain that stood in the courtyard of the mosque. The women usually stayed at home when the men went to the mosque, and vice versa. It was feared that the presence of women, even veiled, would distract the excitable male. The worshippers removed their shoes at the door of the mosque proper, and entered in slippers or stocking feet. There, or in the court, if they were numerous, they stood shoulder to shoulder in one or more rows, facing the mirab or prayer niche in the wall, which indicated the qibla, or direction of Mecca. An imam or prayer leader read a passage from the Koran and preached a short sermon. Each worshipper recited several prayers, and in the prescribed postures of bowing, kneeling, and prostration. Mosque meant a place of prostration in prayer. Then the imam recited a complex series of salutations, benedictions, and orisons, in which the congregation silently joined. There were no hymns, processions, or sacraments, no collections or pew rents. Religion, being one with the state, was financed from public funds. The imam was not a priest but a layman, who continued to earn his living by a secular occupation, and was appointed by the mosque warden for a specified period and a small salary to lead the congregation in prayer. There was no priesthood in Islam. After the Friday prayers, the Moslems were free, if they wished, to engage in work as on any other day. Meanwhile, however, they had known a cleansing hour of elevation above economic and social strife, and had unconsciously cemented their community by common ritual. The second duty of Moslem practice was the giving of alms. Mohammed was almost as critical of the rich as Jesus had been. Some have thought that he began as a social reformer, revolted by the contrast between the luxury of the merchant nobles and the poverty of the masses. And apparently his early followers were mostly of humble origin. One of his first activities in Medina was to establish an annual tax of two and a half percent on the movable wealth of all citizens for the relief of the poor. Regular officials collected and distributed this revenue. Part of the proceeds was used to build mosques and defray the expenses of government and war but war in return brought booty that swelled the gifts to the poor. Prayer, said Omar II, carries us halfway to God. Fasting brings us to the door of his palace. Almsgiving lets us in. The traditions abound in stories of generous Moslems. Hassan, for example, was said to have three times in his life divided his substance with the poor and twice given away all that he had. The third duty was fasting. In general, the Moslem was commanded to avoid wine, carrion, blood, and the flesh of swine or dogs. But Muhammad was more lenient than Moses. Forbidden foods might be eaten in cases of necessity. Of a tasty cheese containing some prohibited meat, he only asked with his sly humor, mention the name of Allah over it. He frowned on asceticism and condemned monasticism. Mohammedans were to enjoy the pleasures of life with a good conscience, but in moderation. Nevertheless, Islam, like most religions, required certain fasts, partly as a discipline of the will, partly, we may presume, as hygiene. A few months after settling in Medina, he saw the Jews keeping their annual feast of Yom Kippur. He adopted it for his followers, hoping to win the Jews to Islam. When this hope faded, he transferred the fast to the month of Ramadan. For twenty-nine days the Moslem was to abstain, during the daylight hours, from eating, drinking, smoking, or contact with the other sex, 
Exceptions were made for the sick, the weary traveler, the very young or old, and women with child or giving suck. When first decreed, the month of fasting fell in winter, when daylight came late and ended soon. But as the lunar calendar of the Moslems made the year shorter than the four seasons, Ramadan every thirty-three years fell in midsummer, when the days are long and the eastern heat makes thirst a torture. Yet the good Moslem bore the fast. Each night, however, the fast was broken, and the Moslem might eat, drink, smoke, and make love till the dawn. Stores and shops remained open all those nights, inviting the populace to feasting and merriment. The poor worked as usual during the month of fast. The well-to-do could ease their way through it by sleeping during the day. Very pious persons spent the last ten nights of Ramadan in the mosque. On one of those nights it was believed Allah began to reveal the Koran to Muhammad. That night was accounted better than a thousand months. And simple devotees, uncertain which of the ten was the night of the divine decree, kept all ten with dire solemnity. On the first day after Ramadan, the Moslems celebrated the festival of Id al-Fitr, or breaking of the fast. They bathed, put on new clothes, saluted one another with an embrace, gave alms and presents, and visited the graves of their dead. Pilgrimage to Mecca was the fourth duty of Moslem faith. Pilgrimage to holy places was traditional in the East. The Jew lived in hopes of one day seeing Zion, and pious pagan Arabs long before Muhammad had trekked to the Kaaba. Muhammad accepted the old custom because he knew that ritual is less easily changed than belief, and perhaps because he himself hankered after the black stone. By yielding to the old rite, he opened a wide door to the acceptance of Islam by all Arabia. The Kaaba, purified of its idols, became for all Moslems the house of God. And upon every Mohammedan the obligation was laid, with considerate exceptions for the ailing and the poor, to make the Mecca pilgrimage as often as he can, which was soon interpreted as meaning once in a lifetime. As Islam spread to distant lands, only a minority of Moslems performed the pilgrimage. Even in Mecca there are Moslems who have never made a ritual visit to the Kaaba. Doughty has described, beyond all rivalry, the panorama of the pilgrimage caravan moving with fantastic patience across the desert, caught between the hot fury of the sun and the swirling fire of the sands. Some seven thousand believers, less or more, on foot or horse or donkey or mule or lordly palanquin, but most tossed along between the humps of camels, bowing at each long stalking pace, making fifty prostrations in every minute, whether we would or no, toward Mecca, covering thirty miles in a weary day, sometimes fifty to reach an oasis, many pilgrims sickening and left behind, some dying and abandoned to lurking hyenas or a slower death. At Medina the pilgrims halted to view the tombs of Muhammad, Abu Bekr, and Omar I, in the Mosque of the Prophet. Near those sepulchres, says a popular tradition, a space is reserved for Jesus, the son of Miriam. Sighting Mecca, the caravan pitched its camp outside the walls, for the whole city was haram, sacred. The pilgrims bathed, dressed in seamless robes of white, and rode or walked in a line many miles long over dusty roads to seek living quarters in the town. During their stay in Mecca, they were required to abstain from all disputes from sexual relations, and from any sinful act. In the months specially ordained for pilgrimage, the holy city became a babbling concourse of tribes and races, suddenly doffing nationality and rank in the unanimity of ritual and prayer. Into the great enclosure called the Mosque of Mecca, these thousands hurried in tense anticipation of a supreme experience. They hardly noted the elegant minarets of the wall or the arcades and colonnades of the cloistered interior, but all stopped in awe at the well of Zemzem, whose water, said tradition, had slaked the thirst of Ishmael. Every pilgrim drank of it, however bitter its taste, however urgent its effects. Some bottled it to take it home, to sip its saving sanctity daily and in the hour of death. At last the worshippers, all eyes and no breath, came, near the center of the enclosure, to the Kaaba itself. A miniature temple illuminated within by silver hanging lamps its outer wall half draped with a curtain of rich and delicate cloth, and in a corner of it the ineffable black stone. Seven times the pilgrims walked around the Kaaba and kissed or touched or bowed to the stone. Such circumambulation of a sacred object, a fire, a tree, a maypole, an altar of the temple at Jerusalem, was an old religious ritual. Many pilgrims, exhausted and yet sleepless with devotion, passed the night in the enclosure, squatting on their rugs, conversing and praying, and contemplating in wonder and ecstasy the goal of their pilgrimage. On the second day the pilgrims, 
to commemorate Hager's frantic search for water for her son, ran seven times between the hills, Safa and Marwa, that lay outside the city. On the seventh day, those who wished to make the major pilgrimage streamed out to Mount Ararat, six hours' journey distant, and heard a three-hour sermon. Returning halfway, they spent a night in prayer at the oratory of Mustalifa. On the eighth day, they rushed to the valley of Mina and threw seven stones at three marks, or pillars, for so they believed Abraham had cast stones at Satan when the devil interrupted his preparations for slaying his son. On the tenth day, they sacrificed a sheep, a camel, and some other horned animal, ate the meat, and distributed alms. This ceremony, commemorating similar sacrifices by Mohammed, was the central rite of the pilgrimage. And this festival of sacrifice was celebrated with like offerings to Allah by Muslims all over the world on the tenth day of the pilgrimage period. The pilgrims now shaved their heads, pared their nails, and buried the cuttings. This completed the major pilgrimage. But usually the worshipper paid another visit to the Kaaba before he returned to the caravan camp. There he resumed his profane condition and clothing, and began with proud and comforted spirit the long march back home. This famous pilgrimage served many purposes. Like that of the Jews to Jerusalem, of the Christians to Jerusalem or Rome, it intensified the worshipper's faith and bound him by a collective emotional experience to his creed and to his fellow believers. In the pilgrimage, a fusing piety brought together poor Bedouins from the desert, rich merchants from the towns, Berbers, African Negroes, Syrians, Persians, Turks, Tatars, Muslim Indians, Chinese, all wearing the same simple garb, reciting the same prayers in the same Arabic tongue, hence perhaps the moderation of racial distinctions in Islam. The circling of the Kaaba seems superstitious to the non-Muslim, but the Muslim smiles at similar customs in other faiths, is disturbed by the Christian rite of eating the god, and can understand it only as an external symbol of spiritual communion and sustenance. All religions are superstitions to other faiths. And all religions, however noble in origin, soon carry an accretion of superstitions, rising naturally out of minds harassed and stupefied by the fatigue of the body and the terror of the soul in the struggle for continuance. Most Muslims believed in magic and rarely doubted the ability of sorcerers to divine the future, to reveal hidden treasures, compel affection, afflict an enemy, cure disease, or ward off the evil eye. Many believed in magic metamorphoses of men into animals or plants, or in miraculous transits through space. This is almost the framework of the Arabian Nights. Spirits were everywhere, performing every manner of trick and enchantment upon mortals, and begetting unwanted children upon careless women. Most Muslims, like half the Christian world, wore amulets as protection against evil influences, considered some days lucky, other days unlucky, and believed that dreams might reveal the future, and that God sometimes spoke to man in dreams. Everyone in Islam, as in Christendom, accepted astrology. The skies were charted not only to fix the orientation of mosques and the calendar of religious feasts, but to select a celestially propitious moment for any important enterprise, and to determine the genetheology of each individual, that is, his character and fate, as set by the position of the stars at his birth. Seeming to the outer world so indiscriminately one in ritual and belief, Islam was early divided into sects as numerous and furious as in Christendom. There were the martial, puritanic, democratic Karajites, Mujiites, who held that no Muslim would be everlastingly damned, Jabrites, who denied free will and upheld absolute predestination, Qadarites, who defended the freedom of the will, and many others. We pay our respects to their sincerity and omniscience and pass on. But the Shiites belong inescapably to history. They overthrew the Umayyads, captured Persian, Egyptian, and Indian Islam, and deeply affected literature and philosophy. The Shia, that is, group or sect, had its origin in two murders, the assassination of Ali and the slaughter of Hussein and his family. A large minority of Muslims argued that since Muhammad was the chosen apostle of Allah, it must have been Allah's intent that the Prophet's descendants, inheriting some measure of his divine spirit and purpose, should inherit his leadership in Islam. All caliphs except Ali seemed to them usurpers. They rejoiced when Ali became caliph, mourned when he was murdered, and were profoundly shocked by Hussein's death. Ali and Hussein became saints in Shia worship. Their shrines were held second in holiness only to the Kaaba and the Prophet's tomb. Perhaps influenced by Persian, Jewish, and Christian ideas of a messiah, and the Buddhist conception of bodhisattvas, 
repeatedly incarnated saints, the Shiites considered the descendants of Ali to be imams or exemplars, that is, infallible incarnations of divine wisdom. The eighth imam was Riza, whose tomb at Mashhad in northeastern Persia is accounted the glory of the Shia world. In 873, the twelfth imam, Muhammad ibn Hassan, disappeared in the twelfth year of his age. In Shia belief he did not die, but bides his time to reappear and lead the Shia Muslims to universal supremacy and bliss. As in most religions, the various sects of Islam felt toward one another an animosity more intense than that with which they viewed the infidels in their midst. To these Dimi, Christians, Zoroastrians, Sabaeans, Jews, the Umayyad Caliphate offered a degree of toleration hardly equaled in contemporary Christian lands. They were allowed the free practice of their faiths and the retention of their churches, on condition that they wear a distinctive honey-colored dress and pay a poll tax of from one to four dinars, or $4.75 to $19 per year, according to their income. This tax fell only upon non-Muslims capable of military service. It was not levied upon monks, women, adolescents, slaves, the old, crippled, blind, or very poor. In return, the dimi were excused or excluded from military service, were exempt from the 2.5% tax for community charity, and received the protection of the government. Their testimony was not admitted in Muslim courts, but they were allowed self-government under their own leaders, judges, and laws. The degree of toleration varied with dynasties. The successors were spasmodically severe, the Umayyads generally lenient, the Abbasids alternately lenient and severe. Omar I ejected all Jews and Christians from Arabia as Islam's holy land, and a questionable tradition ascribes to him a covenant of Omar restraining their rights in general. But this edict, if it ever existed, was in practice ignored, and Omar himself continued in Egypt the allowances formerly made to the Christian churches by the Byzantine government. The Jews of the Near East had welcomed the Arabs as liberators. They suffered now divers' disabilities and occasional persecutions. But they stood on equal terms with Christians, were free once more to live and worship in Jerusalem, and prospered under Islam in Asia, Egypt, and Spain as never under Christian rule. Outside of Arabia, the Christians of Western Asia usually practiced their religion unhindered. Syria remained predominantly Christian until the third Muslim century. In the reign of Mamun, from 813 to 833, we hear of 11,000 Christian churches in Islam, as well as hundreds of synagogues and fire temples. Christian festivals were freely and openly celebrated. Christian pilgrims came in safety to visit Christian shrines in Palestine. The Crusaders found large numbers of Christians in the Near East in the 12th century, and Christian communities have survived there to this day. Christian heretics persecuted by the patriarchs of Constantinople, Jerusalem, Alexandria, or Antioch were now free and safe under a Muslim rule that found their disputes quite unintelligible. In the ninth century, the Muslim government of Antioch appointed a special guard to keep Christian sects from massacring one another at church. Monasteries and nunneries flourished under the skeptical Umayyads. The Arabs admired the work of the monks in agriculture and reclamation, acclaimed the wines of monastic vintage, and enjoyed in traveling the shade and hospitality of Christian cloisters. For a time, relations between the two religions were so genial that Christians wearing crosses on their breasts conversed in mosques with Muslim friends. The Mohammedan administrative bureaucracy had hundreds of Christian employees. Christians rose so frequently to high offices to provoke Muslim complaints. Sergius, father of St. John of Damascus, was chief finance minister to Abdel Malik, and John himself, last of the Greek fathers of the church, headed the council that governed Damascus. The Christians of the East in general regarded Islamic rule as a lesser evil than that of the Byzantine government and church. Despite or because of this policy of tolerance in early Islam, the new faith won over to itself in time most of the Christians, nearly all the Zoroastrians and pagans, and many of the Jews of Asia, Egypt, and North Africa. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 9, Side 1. In 768, to provide his son, al-Mahdi, with independent quarters, al-Mansur built a palace and a mosque on the eastern or Persian side of the river. Around these buildings a suburb grew, Lusafa, connected with the round city by two bridges resting on boats. 
As most of the caliphs after Harun made their dwelling in this suburb, it soon outstripped the city of Mansur in size and wealth. After Harun, Baghdad means Rusafa. From the royal centers on either side of the Tigris, narrow crooked streets designed to elude the sun led out their chasms of noisy shops to the residential districts of the well-to-do. Each craft had its street, or mart, perfumers, basket weavers, wire pullers, in the literal sense, money changers, silk weavers, booksellers. Over the shops and beyond them were the homes of the people. Almost all dwellings but those of the rich were of unbaked brick, made for a lifetime, but not for much longer. We have no reliable statistics of the population. Probably it reached 800,000. Some authorities estimated at 2 million. In any case, it was in the 10th century the largest city in the world, with the possible exception of Constantinople. There was a crowded Christian quarter with churches, monasteries, and schools. Nestorians, Monophysites, and Orthodox Christians had there their separate conventicles. Harun rebuilt and enlarged an early mosque of Al-Mansur, and Al-Mutadid rebuilt and enlarged this mosque of Harun. Doubtless several hundred additional mosques served the hopes of the people. While the poor solaced life with heaven, the rich sought heaven on earth. In or near Baghdad they raised a thousand splendid mansions, villas, palaces, simple without, but within nothing but azure and gold. We may imagine this domestic splendor from an incredible passage in Abul Fadah, which assures us that the royal palace at Baghdad had on its floors 22,000 carpets, and on its walls 38,000 tapestries, 12,500 of silk. The residences of the caliph and his family, the vizier and the governmental heads, occupied a square mile of the eastern city. Jafar, the Barmakid, inaugurated an aristocratic migration by building in southeastern Baghdad a mansion whose splendor contributed to his death. He tried to evade Harun's jealousy by presenting the palace to Mamun. Harun accepted it for his son, but Jafar continued to live and frolic in the Casa Jafari till his fall. When the palaces of Al-Mansur and Harun began to crumble, new palaces replaced them. Al-Mutadid spent 400,000 dinars, or $1.9 million, on his Palace of the Pleiades in 892. We may judge its extent from the 9,000 horses, camels, and mules that were housed in its stables. Al-Muqtafi built next to this his Palace of the Crown in 902, which, with its gardens, covered nine square miles. Al-Muqtadir raised in his turn the Hall of the Tree, so named because in its garden pond stood a tree of silver and gold. On the silver leaves and twigs perched silver birds, whose beaks piped mechanical lays. The Buwayid sultans outspent them all by lavishing thirteen million dirhams upon the Muizia palace. When Greek ambassadors were received by al-Muqtadir in 917, they were impressed by the twenty-three palaces of the caliph and his government, the porticos of marble columns, the number, size, and beauty of the rugs and tapestries that almost covered floors and walls, the thousand grooms in shining uniforms, the gold and silver saddles and brocaded saddle cloths of the emperor's horses, the variety of tame or wild animals in the spacious parks, and the royal barges, themselves palaces, that rode on the Tigris, waiting the caliph's whim. Amid these splendors the upper classes lived a life of luxury, sport, worry, and intrigue. They went to the Maidan or plaza to watch horse races or polo games, drank precious forbidden wine, and ate foods brought from the greatest possible distances at the greatest possible price, robed themselves and their ladies in gorgeous and colorful raiment of silk and gold brocade, perfumed their clothing, hair, and beards, breathed the aroma of burning ambergris or frankincense, and wore jewelry on their heads, ears, necks, wrists, and feminine ankles. The clinking of thine anklets, sang a poet to alas, has bereft me of reason. Usually women were excluded from the social gatherings of the men. Poets, musicians, and wits took their place, and doubtless sang or spoke of love, and willowy slave girls danced till the men were their slaves. Politer groups listened to poetic readings or recitations of the Koran. Some formed philosophical clubs, like the Brethren of Purity. About 790 we hear of a club of ten members, an Orthodox Sunni, a Shiite, a Karijite, a Manichaean, an erotic poet, a materialist, a Christian, a Jew, a Sabean, and a Zoroastrian. Their meetings, we are told, were marked by mutual tolerance, good humor, and courteous argument. 
In general, Muslim society was one of excellent manners. From Cyrus to Li Hung Chang, the East has surpassed the West in courtesy. It was an ennobling aspect of this Baghdad life that all the permitted arts and sciences found there a discriminating patronage, that schools and colleges were numerous, and the air resounded with poetry. Of the life of the common people we are told little. We may only assume that they helped to uphold this edifice of grandeur with their services and their toil. While the rich played with literature and art, science and philosophy, the simpler folk listened to street singers or strummed their own lutes and sang their own songs. Now and then a wedding procession redeemed the din and odor of the streets, and on festive holy days people visited one another, exchanged presents with careful calculation, and ate with keener relish than those who feasted from plates of gold. Even the poor man gloried in the majesty of the caliph and the splendor of the mosque. He shared some dirhams of the dinars that were taxed into Baghdad. He carried himself with the pride and dignity of a capital, and in his secret heart he numbered himself among the rulers of the world. Chapter 12 Thought and Art in Eastern Islam, 632 to 1058. 1. Scholarship. If we may believe the traditions, Muhammad, unlike most religious reformers, admired and urged the pursuit of knowledge. He who leaves his home in search of knowledge walks in the path of God, and the ink of the scholar is holier than the blood of the martyr. But these traditions have the ring of pedagogic narcissism. In any case, the contact of the Arabs with Greek culture in Syria awoke in them an eager emulation, and soon the scholar as well as the poet was honored in Islam. Education began as soon as the child could speak. It was at once taught to say, I testify that there is no God but Allah, and I testify that Muhammad is his prophet. At the age of six, some slave children, some girls, and nearly all boys except the rich, who had private tutors, entered an elementary school, usually in a mosque, sometimes near a public fountain in the open air. Tuition was normally free, or so low as to be within general reach. The teacher received from the parents some two cents per pupil per week. The remaining cost was borne by philanthropists. The curriculum was simple. The necessary prayers of Muslim worship, enough reading to decipher the Quran, and for the rest, the Quran itself as theology, history, ethics, and law. Writing and arithmetic were left to higher education, perhaps because writing in the Orient was an art that required specific training. Besides, said the Moslem, scribes would be available for those who insisted on writing. Each day a part of the Quran was memorized and recited aloud. The goal set before every pupil was to learn the entire book by heart. He who succeeded was called Hafiz, holder, and was publicly celebrated. He who also learned writing, archery, and swimming was called Al-Kamil, the perfect one. The method was memory, the discipline was the rod. The usual punishment was a beating with a palm stick on the soles of the feet. Said Harun to the tutor of his son Amin, Be not strict to the extent of stifling his faculties, nor lenient to the point of accustoming him to idleness. Straighten him as much as thou canst through kindness and gentleness, but, but fail not to resort to force and severity should he not respond. Elementary education aimed to form character, secondary education to transmit knowledge. Squatting against a mosque pillar or wall, scholars offered instruction in Quranic interpretation, hadith, theology, and law. At an unknown date, many of these informal secondary schools were brought under governmental regulation and subsidy as madrasas or colleges. To the basic theological curriculum, they added grammar, philology, rhetoric, literature, logic, mathematics, and astronomy. Grammar was emphasized, for Arabic was considered the most nearly perfect of all languages, and its correct use was the chief mark of a gentleman. Tuition in these colleges was free, and in some cases government or philanthropy paid both the salaries of the professors and the expenses of the students. The teacher counted for more than the text, except in the case of the Quran. Boys studied men rather than books, and students would travel from one end of the Muslim world to another to meet the mind of a famous teacher. Every scholar who desired a high standing at home had to hear the master scholars of Mecca, Baghdad, Damascus, and Cairo. This international of letters was made easier by the fact that throughout Islam, through whatever diversity of peoples, the language of learning and literature was Arabic. Latin had no wider realm. When a visitor entered a Muslim city, he took it for granted that he could hear a scholarly lecture at the principal mosque at almost any hour of the day. 
In many cases, the wandering scholar received not only free instruction at the madrasa, but for a time, free lodging and food. No degrees were given. What the student sought was a certificate of approval from the individual teacher. The final accolade was the acquirement of adab, the manners and tastes, the verbal wit and grace, the lightly carried knowledge of a gentleman. When the Moslems captured Samarkand in 712, they learned from the Chinese the technique of beating flax and other fibrous plants into a pulp and drying the pulp in thin sheets. Introduced to the Near East as a substitute for parchment and leather at a time when papyrus was not yet forgotten, the product received the name papyrus, paper. The first paper manufacturing plant in Islam was opened at Baghdad in 794 by Al-Fadl, son of Harun's vizier. The craft was brought by the Arabs to Sicily and Spain, and thence passed into Italy and France. We find paper in use in China as early as A.D. 105, in Mecca in 707, in Egypt in 800, in Spain in 950, in Constantinople in 1100, in Sicily in 1102, in Italy in 1154, in Germany in 1228, in England in 1309. The invention facilitated the making of books wherever it went. Yakubi tells us that by his time, in 891, Baghdad had over a hundred booksellers. Their shops were also centers of copying, calligraphy, and literary gatherings. Many students made a living by copying manuscripts and selling the copies to book dealers. In the 10th century, we hear of autograph hunters and of book collectors who paid great sums for rare manuscripts. Authors received nothing from the sale of their books. They depended on some less speculative mode of subsistence or upon the patronage of princes or rich men. Literature was written and art was designed in Islam to meet the taste of an aristocracy of money or of blood. Most mosques had libraries and some cities had public libraries of considerable content and generous accessibility. About 950, Mosul had a library established by private philanthropy where students were supplied with paper as well as books. Ten large catalogues were required to list the volumes in the public library at Rai. Basra's library gave stipends to scholars working in it. The geographer Yakut spent three years in the libraries of Merv and Khwarizm, gathering data for his geographical dictionary. When Baghdad was destroyed by the Mongols, it had 36 public libraries. Private libraries were numberless. It was a fashion among the rich to have an ample collection of books. A physician refused the invitation of the Sultan of Bokhara to come and live at his court on the ground that he would need 400 camels to transport his library. Al-Waqidi, dying, left 600 boxes of books, each box so heavy that two men were needed to carry it. Princes like Saib ibn Abbas in the 10th century might own as many books as could then be found in all the libraries of Europe combined. Nowhere else in those 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries of our era was there so great a passion for books, unless it was in the China of Ming Huang. Islam reached then the summit of its cultural life. In a thousand mosques from Cordova to Samarkand, scholars were as numerous as pillars and made the cloisters tremble with their eloquence. The roads of the realm were disturbed by innumerable geographers, historians, and theologians seeking knowledge and wisdom. The courts of a hundred princes resounded with poetry and philosophical debate, and no man dared be a millionaire without supporting literature or art. The old cultures of the conquered were eagerly absorbed by the quick-witted Arabs, and the conquerors showed such tolerance that of the poets, scientists, and philosophers who now made Arabic the most learned and literary tongue in the world, only a small minority were of Arab blood. The scholars of Islam in this period strengthened the foundations of a distinguished literature by their labors in grammar, which gave the Arabic tongue logic and standards, by their dictionaries, which gathered the word wealth of that language into precision and order, by their anthologies, encyclopedias, and epitomes, which preserved much that was otherwise lost, and by their work in textual, literary, and historical criticism. We gratefully omit their names and salute their achievement. Those whom we remember best among the scholars are the historians, for to them we owe our knowledge of a civilization that without them would be as unknown to us as Pharaonic Egypt before Champollion. Mohammed ibn Ishaq, who died in 767, wrote a classic Life of Mohammed. As revised and enlarged by Ibn Hisham in 763, it is, barring the Quran, the oldest significant Arabic prose work that has reached us. 
Curious and tireless scholars composed biographical dictionaries of saints or philosophers or viziers or jurists or physicians or calligraphers or mandarins or lovers or scholars. Ibn Qutaybah, from 828 to 889, was one of many Muslims who attempted to write a history of the world, and unlike most historians, he had the courage to set his own religion in that modest perspective which every nation or faith must bear in time's immensity. Muhammad al-Nadim produced in 987 an Index of the Sciences, a bibliography of all books in Arabic, original or translated, on any branch of knowledge, with a biographical and critical notice of each author, including a list of his virtues and vices. We may estimate the wealth of Muslim literature in his time by noting that not one in a thousand of the volumes that he named is known to exist today. The Livy of Islam was Abu Jafar Muhammad al-Tabari, who lived from 838 to 923. Like so many Muslim writers, he was a Persian, born in Tabaristan, south of the Caspian Sea. After several years spent as a poor wandering scholar in Arabia, Syria, and Egypt, he settled down as a jurist in Baghdad. For forty years he devoted himself to composing an enormous universal chronicle, Annals of the Apostles and Kings. From the Creation to 913. What survives fills fifteen large volumes. We are told that the original was ten times as long. Like Bosuet, Al-Tabari saw the hand of God in every event and filled his early chapters with pious nonsense. God created men to test them. God dropped upon the earth a house built of rubies for Adam's dwelling, but when Adam sinned, God drew it up again. Al-Tabari followed the Bible in giving the history of the Jews, accepted the virgin birth of Christ, Mary conceived Jesus because Gabriel blew into her sleeve, and ended part one with Jesus' ascension into heaven. Part two is a far more creditable performance and gives a sober, occasionally vivid history of Sasanian Persia. The method is chronological, describing events year by year and usually traditional, tracing the narratives through one or more chains of hadith to an eyewitness or contemporary of the incident. The method has the virtue of stating sources carefully, but as Al-Tabari makes no attempt to coordinate the diverse traditions into a sustained and united narrative, his history remains a mountain of industry rather than a work of art. Al-Masudi, Al-Tabari's greatest successor, ranked him as Al-Masudi's greatest predecessor. Abu al-Hassan Ali al-Masudi, an Arab of Baghdad, traveled through Syria, Palestine, Arabia, Zanzibar, Persia, Central Asia, India, and Ceylon. He claims to have even reached the China Sea. He gathered his gleanings into a thirty-volume encyclopedia, which proved too long even for the spacious scholars of Islam. He published a compendium, also gigantic. Finally, in 947, perhaps realizing that his readers had less time to read than he had to write, he reduced his work to the form in which it survives and gave it the fancy title, Meadows of Gold and Mines of Precious Stones. Al-Masudi surveyed omnivorously the geography, biology, history, customs, religion, science, philosophy, and literature of all lands from China to France. He was the Pliny as well as the Herodotus of the Muslim world. He did not compress his material to aridity, but wrote at times with a genial leisureliness that did not shun now and then an amusing tale. He was a bit skeptical in religion, but never forced his doubts upon his audience. In the last year of his life he summarized his views on science, history, and philosophy in a book of information, in which he suggested an evolution from mineral to plant, from plant to animal, and from animal to man. Perhaps these views embroiled him with the conservatives of Baghdad. He was forced, he says, to leave the city where I was born and grew up. He moved to Cairo, but mourned the separation. It is the character of our time, he wrote, to separate and disperse all. God makes a nation prosper through love of the hearth. It is a sign of moral uprightness to be attached to the place of one's birth. It is a mark of noble lineage to dislike separation from the ancestral hearth and home. He died at Cairo in 956 after ten years of exile. At their best, these historians excel in the scope of their enterprise and their interests. They properly combine geography and history, and nothing human is alien to them. And they are far superior to the contemporary historians in Christendom. Even so, they lose themselves too long in politics and war and wordy rhetoric. They seldom seek the economic, social, and psychological causes of events. We miss in their vast volumes a sense of orderly synthesis, and find merely a congeries of uncoordinated parts, nations, episodes, and personalities. 
They rarely rise to a conscientious scrutiny of sources and rely too piously upon chains of tradition in which every link is a possible error or deceit. In consequence, their narratives sometimes degenerate into childish tales of portent, miracle, and myth. As many Christian historians, always excepting Gibbon, can write medieval histories in which all Islamic civilization is a brief appendage to the Crusades, so many Muslim historians reduced world history before Islam to a halting preparation for Muhammad. But how can a Western mind ever judge an Oriental justly? The beauty of the Arab language fades in translation like a flower cut from its roots, and the topics that fill the pages of Muslim historians, fascinating to their countrymen, seem aridly remote from the natural interests of Occidental readers, who have not realized how economic interdependence of peoples ominously demands a mutual study and understanding of East and West. 2. Science In those lusty centuries of Islamic life, the Muslims labored for such an understanding. The caliphs realized the backwardness of the Arabs in science and philosophy, and the wealth of Greek culture surviving in Syria. The Umayyads wisely left unhindered the Christian, Sabaean, or Persian colleges at Alexandria, Beirut, Antioch, Haran, Nisibis, and Jundishapur. And in those schools the classics of Greek science and philosophy were preserved, often in Syriac translations. Muslims learning Syriac or Greek were intrigued by these treatises, and soon translations were made into Arabic by Nestorian Christians or Jews. Umayyad and Abbasid princes stimulated this fruitful borrowing. Al-Mansur, Al-Mamun, and Al-Mutawakil dispatched messengers to Constantinople and other Hellenistic cities, sometimes to their traditional enemies the Greek emperors, asking for Greek books, especially in medicine or mathematics. In this way, Euclid's elements came to Islam. In 830, Al-Mamun established at Baghdad, at a cost of 200,000 dinars, or $950,000, a house of wisdom as a scientific academy, an observatory, and a public library. Here he installed a corps of translators and paid them from the public treasury. To the work of this institution, thought Ibn Khaldun, Islam owed that vibrant awakening which in causes, the extension of commerce and the rediscovery of Greece, and results, the flowering of science, literature, and art, resembled the Italian Renaissance. From 750 to 900, this fertilizing process of translation continued, from Syriac, Greek, Pahlavi, and Sanskrit. At the head of the translators in the House of Wisdom was an Nestorian physician, Hunayn ibn Ishaq, that is, John, son of Isaac, who lived from 809 to 873. By his own account, he translated a hundred treatises of Galen and Galenic school into Syriac and thirty-nine into Arabic. Through his renderings, some important works of Galen escaped destruction. Further, Hunayn translated Aristotle's Categories, Physics, and Magna Moralia, Plato's Republic, Timaeus and Laws, Hippocrates's Aphorisms, Dioscorides's Materia Medica, Ptolemy's Quadripartitum, and the Old Testament from the Septuagint Greek. Al-Mamun endangered the treasury by paying Hunayn in gold the weight of the books he had translated. Al-Mutawakil made him court physician, but jailed him for a year when Hunayn, though threatened with death, refused to concoct a poison for an enemy. His son, Ishaq ibn Hunayn, helped him with his translations, and himself rendered into Arabic the metaphysics on the soul and on the generation and corruption of animals of Aristotle, and the commentaries of Alexander of Aphrodisias, a work fated to wield great influence on Muslim philosophy. By 850, most of the classic Greek texts in mathematics, astronomy, and medicine had been translated. It was through its Arabic version that Ptolemy's Almagest received its name. And only Arabic versions preserved books 5 through 7 of the Conics of Apollonius of Perga, the Mechanics of Hero of Alexandria, and the Pneumatics of Philo of Byzantium. Strange to say, the Mohammedans, so addicted to poetry and history, ignored Greek poetry, drama, and historiography. Here, Islam accepted the lead of Persia instead of Greece. It was the misfortune of Islam and humanity that Plato, and even Aristotle, came into Moslem ken chiefly in Neoplatonic form. Plato, in Porphyry's interpretation, and Aristotle discolored by an apocryphal theology of Aristotle, written by a Neoplatonist of the 5th or 6th century, and translated into Arabic as a genuine product of the Stagirite. The works of Plato and Aristotle were almost completely translated, though with many inaccuracies, 
But as the Muslim scholars sought to reconcile Greek philosophy with the Quran, they took more readily to Neoplatonist interpretations of them than to the original books themselves. The real Aristotle reached Islam only in his logic and his science. The continuity of science and philosophy from Egypt, India, and Babylonia, through Greece and Byzantium, to Eastern and Spanish Islam, and thence to Northern Europe and America, is one of the brightest threads in the skein of history. Greek science, though long since enfeebled by obscurantism, misgovernment, and poverty, was still alive in Syria when the Moslems came. At the very time of the conquest, Severus Sobokt, abbot of Kennesri on the upper Euphrates, was writing Greek treatises on astronomy and was making the first known mention of Hindu numerals outside of India, this in 662. The Arabic inheritance of science was overwhelmingly Greek, but Hindu influences ranked next. In 773, at Al-Mansur's behest, translations were made of the Siddhantas, Indian astronomical treatises dating as far back as 425 B.C. These versions may have been the vehicle through which the Arabic numerals and the zero were brought from India into Islam. In 813, Al-Khwarizmi used the Hindu numerals in his astronomical tables. About 825, he issued a treatise known in its Latin form as Algorithmi de Numero Indorum, Al-Khwarizmi on the numerals of the Indians. In time, algorithm or algorithm came to mean any arithmetical system based on the decimal notation. In 976, Muhammad ibn Ahmad, in his Keys of the Sciences, remarked that if, in a calculation, no number appears in the place of tens, a little circle should be used to keep the rows. This circle the Muslims called sefer, empty, whence our cipher. Latin scholars transformed sefer into zephyrum, which the Italians shortened into zero. Algebra, which we find in the Greek Diophantes in the third century, owes its name to the Arabs, who extensively developed this detective science. The great figure here, perhaps the greatest in medieval mathematics, was Muhammad ibn Musa, who lived from 780 to 850, called Al-Khwarizmi, from his birthplace Khwarizm, now Kiva, east of the Caspian Sea. Al-Khwarizmi contributed effectively to five sciences. He wrote on the Hindu numerals, compiled astronomical tables which, as revised in Moslem Spain, were for centuries standard among astronomers from Cordova to Chang'an, formulated the oldest trigonometrical tables known, collaborated with 69 other scholars in drawing up for Al-Mamun a geographical encyclopedia, and in his calculation of integration and equation gave analytical and geometrical solutions of quadratic equations. This work, now lost in its Arabic form, was translated by Gerard of Cremona in the 12th century, was used as a principal text in European universities until the 16th century, and introduced to the West the word algebra, from al-jabr, restitution or completion. Tabit ibn Qura, who lived from 826 to 901, besides making important translations, achieved fame in astronomy and medicine, and became the greatest of Muslim geometers. Abu Abdullah al-Batani, 850-929, the Sabaean of Raqqa known to Europe as al batanius advanced trigonometry far beyond its beginnings in Hipparchus and Ptolemy by substituting triangular for Ptolemy's quadrilateral solutions and the sine for Hipparchus's chord. He formulated the trigonometrical ratios essentially as we use them today. The Caliph al-Mamun engaged a staff of astronomers to make observations and records, to test the findings of Ptolemy and to study the spots on the sun. Taking for granted the sphericity of the earth, they measured a terrestrial degree by simultaneously taking the position of the sun from both Palmyra and the plain of Sinjar. Their measurement gave fifty-six and two-thirds miles, half a mile more than our present calculation and from their results they estimated the Earth's circumference to approximate 20,000 miles. These astronomers proceeded on completely scientific principles. They accepted nothing as true which was not confirmed by experience or experiment. One of them, Abul Fargani of Transoxiana, wrote, circa 860, an astronomical text which remained an authority in Europe and Western Asia for 700 years. Even more renowned was Albatani. His astronomical observations, continued for forty-one years, were remarkable for their range and accuracy. He determined many astronomical coefficients with remarkable approximation to modern calculations. 
the precession of the equinoxes at 54.5 seconds a year, and the inclination of the ecliptic at 23 degrees 55 minutes. Working under the patronage of the early Buwayid rulers of Baghdad, Abu Wafa, in the disputed opinion of Sadiyo, discovered the third lunar variation 600 years before Tycho Brahe. Costly instruments were built for the Moslem astronomers, not only astrolabes and armillary spheres known to the Greeks, but quadrants with a radius of 30 feet and sextants with a radius of 80. The astrolabe, much improved by the Moslems, reached Europe in the 10th century and was widely used by mariners till the 17th. The Arabs designed and constructed it with aesthetic passion, making it at once an instrument of science and a work of art. Even more important than the charting of the skies was the mapping of the earth, for Islam lived by tillage and trade. Suleiman al-Tajir, that is, the merchant, about 840 carried his wares to the Far East. An anonymous author in 851 wrote a narrative of Suleiman's journey. This oldest Arabic account of China antedated Marco Polo's travels by 425 years. In the same century, Ibn Qurdat Bey wrote a description of India, Ceylon, the East Indies, and China, apparently from direct observation. And Ibn Haqqal described India and Africa. Ahmad al-Yakubi of Armenia and Khorasan wrote in 891 a book of the countries, giving a reliable account of Islamic provinces and cities and of many foreign states. Muhammad al muqaddasi visited all the lands of Islam except Spain, suffered countless vicissitudes, and in 985 wrote his description of the Muslim Empire, the greatest work of Arab geography before al-Biruni's India. Abu al-Raihan Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Biruni, who lived from 973 to 1048, shows the Muslim scholar at his best. Philosopher, historian, traveler, geographer, linguist, mathematician, astronomer, poet, and physicist, and doing major and original work in all these fields. He was at least the Leibniz, almost the Leonardo of Islam. Born like Al-Khwarizmi, near the modern Kiva, he signalized again the leadership of the Trans-Caspian region in this culminating century of medieval science. The princes of Khwarezm and Tabaristan, recognizing his talents, gave him a place at their courts. Hearing of the bevy of poets and philosophers at Khwarezm, Mahmud of Ghazni asked its prince to send him al-Biruni, Ibn Sina, and other savants. The prince felt obliged to comply in 1018, and al-Biruni went to live in honor and studious peace with the bellicose ravisher of India. Perhaps it was in Mahmud's train that al-Biruni entered India. In any case, he stayed there several years and learned the language and the antiquities of the country. Returning to Mahmud's court, he became a favorite of that incalculable despot. A visitor from northern Asia offended the king by describing a region which he claimed to have seen, where for many months the sun never set. Mahmud was about to imprison the man for jesting with royalty, when al-Biruni explained the phenomenon to the satisfaction of the king and the great relief of the visitor. Mahmud's son Masud, himself an amateur scientist, showered gifts and money upon al-Biruni, who often returned them to the treasury as much exceeding his needs. His first major work, circa 1000, was a highly technical treatise, Vestiges of the Past, or Atar ul Bakia, on the calendars and religious festivals of the Persians, Syrians, Greeks, Jews, Christians, Sabaeans, Zoroastrians, and Arabs. It is an unusually impartial study, utterly devoid of religious animosities. As a Moslem, al-Biruni inclined to the Shia sect, with an unobtrusive tendency to agnosticism. He retained, however, a degree of Persian patriotism and condemned the Arabs for destroying the high civilization of the Sasanian regime. Otherwise, his attitude was that of the objective scholar, assiduous in research, critical in the scrutiny of traditions and texts, including the Gospels, precise and conscientious in statement, frequently admitting his ignorance and promising to pursue his inquiries till the truth should emerge. In the preface to the Vestiges, he wrote like Francis Bacon, We must clear our minds from all causes that blind people to the truth, old custom, party spirit, personal rivalry or passion, the desire for influence. While his host was devastating India, al-Biruni spent many years studying its peoples, languages, faiths, cultures, and castes, 
In 1030, he published his masterpiece, History of India, Tariq al-Hind. At the outset, he sharply distinguished between hearsay and eyewitness reports and classified the varieties of liars who have written history. He spent little space on the political history of India, but gave 42 chapters to Hindu astronomy and 11 to Hindu religion. He was charmed by the Bhagavad Gita. He saw the similarity between the mysticism of the Vedanta, the Sufis, the Neo-Pythagoreans, and the Neoplatonists. He compared excerpts from Indian thinkers with like passages from Greek philosophers and expressed his preference for the Greeks. India, he wrote, has produced no Socrates. No logical method has there expelled fantasy from science. Nevertheless, he translated several Sanskrit works of science into Arabic, and as if to pay a debt, rendered into Sanskrit Euclid's Elements and Ptolemy's Almagest. His interest extended to nearly all the sciences. He gave the best medieval account of the Hindu numerals. He wrote treatises on the astrolabe, the planisphere, the armillary sphere. He formulated astronomical tables for Sultan Masood. He took it for granted that the earth is round, noted the attraction of all things toward the center of the earth, and remarked that astronomic data can be explained as well by supposing that the earth turns daily on its axis and annually around the sun as by the reverse hypothesis. He speculated on the possibility that the Indus Valley had once been the bottom of a sea. He composed an extensive lapidary, describing a great number of stones and metals from the natural, commercial, and medical points of view. He determined the specific gravity of eighteen precious stones and laid down the principle that the specific gravity of an object corresponds to the volume of water it displaces. He found a method of calculating, without laborious additions, the result of the repeated doubling of a number, as in the Hindu story of the chessboard squares and the grains of sand. He contributed to geometry the solution of theorems that thereafter bore his name. He composed an encyclopedia of astronomy, a treatise on geography, and an epitome of astronomy, astrology, and mathematics. He explained the workings of natural springs and artesian wells by the hydrostatic principle of communicating vessels. He wrote histories of Mahmud's reign, of Sabuktijin, and of Khwarizm. Oriental historians call him the Sheikh, as if to mean the master of those who know. His multifarious production in the same generation with Ibn Sina, Ibn al-Haytam, and Firdausi marks the turn of the 10th century into the 11th as the zenith of Islamic culture and the climax of medieval thought. Chemistry as a science was almost created by the Moslems, for in this field where the Greeks, so far as we know, were confined to industrial experience and vague hypothesis, the Saracens introduced precise observation, controlled experiment, and careful records. They invented and named the alembic, from alambic, chemically analyzed innumerable substances, composed lapidaries, distinguished alkalis and acids, investigated their affinities, studied and manufactured hundreds of drugs. Alcohol is an Arabic word, but not an Arabian product. It is first mentioned in an Italian work of the ninth or 10th century. To the Muslims, alcohol was a powder for painting the eyebrows. Alchemy, which the Muslims inherited from Egypt, contributed to chemistry by a thousand incidental discoveries and by its method, which was the most scientific of all medieval operations. Practically all Muslim scientists believed that all metals were ultimately of the same species and could therefore be transmuted into one another. The aim of the alchemists was to change base metals like iron, copper, lead, or tin into silver or gold. The philosopher's stone was a substance, ever sought, never found, which when properly treated would affect this transmutation. Blood, hair, excrement, and other materials were treated with various reagents, were subjected to calcination, sublimation, sunlight, and fire, to see if they contained this magic elixir, or essence. He who should possess this elixir would be able at will to prolong his life. The most famous of the alchemists was Jabir ibn Hayyan, who lived from 702 to 765, known to Europe as Gebir. Son of a Kufa druggist, he practiced as a physician, but spent most of his time with Alembic and Crucible. The hundred or more works attributed to him were produced by unknown authors, chiefly in the 10th century. 
Many of these anonymous works were translated into Latin and strongly stimulated the development of European chemistry. After the 10th century, the science of chemistry, like other sciences, gave ground to occultism and did not lift its head again for almost 300 years. The remains of Muslim biology in this period are scant. Abu Hanifa al-Dinawari, from 815 to 895, wrote a book of plants based on Dioscorides, but adding many plants to pharmacology. Mohammedan botanists knew how to produce new fruits by grafting. They combined the rose bush and the almond tree to generate rare and lovely flowers. Otman Amr al-Jahiz, who died in 869, propounded a theory of evolution like al-Masudi's. Life had climbed from mineral to plant, from plant to animal, from animal to man. The mystic poet Jalal Uddin accepted the theory and merely added that if this has been achieved in the past, then in the next stage men will become angels and finally God. 3. Medicine Meanwhile, men loved life while maligning it and spent great sums to stave off death. The Arabs had entered Syria with only primitive medical knowledge and equipment. As wealth came, physicians of better caliber were developed in Syria and Persia or were brought in from Greece and India. Forbidden by their religion to practice vivisection or the dissection of human cadavers, Muslim anatomy had to content itself with Galen and the study of wounded men. Arabic medicine was weakest in surgery, strongest in medicaments and therapy. To the ancient pharmacopoeia, the Saracens added ambergris, camphor, cassia, cloves, mercury, senna, myrrh. And they introduced new pharmaceutical preparations, syrups, juleps, rose water, etc. One of the main features of Italian trade with the Near East was the importation of Arabic drugs. The Arabs introduced the first apothecary shops and dispensaries, founded the first medieval school of pharmacy, and wrote great treatises on pharmacology. Muslim physicians were enthusiastic advocates of the bath, especially in fevers and in the form of the steam bath. Their directions for the treatment of smallpox and measles could scarcely be bettered today. Anesthesia by inhalation was practiced in some surgical operations. Hashish and other drugs were used to induce deep sleep. We know of 34 hospitals established in Islam in this period, apparently on the model of the Persian Academy and Hospital at Jundishapur. In Baghdad, the earliest known to us was set up under Harun al-Rashid, and five others were opened there in the 10th century. In 918, we hear of a director of hospitals in Baghdad. The most famous hospital in Islam was the Bimaristan, founded in Damascus in 706. In 978, it had a staff of 24 physicians. Medical instruction was given chiefly at the hospitals. No man could legally practice medicine without passing an examination and receiving a state diploma. Druggists, barbers, and orthopedists were likewise subject to state regulation and inspection. The physician vizier Ali ibn Isa organized a staff of doctors to go from place to place to tend the sick, this in 931. Certain physicians made daily visits to jails. There was an especially humane treatment of the insane. But public sanitation was in most places poorly developed, and in four centuries, forty epidemics ravaged one or another country of the Muslim East. In 931, there were 860 licensed physicians in Baghdad. Fees rose with proximity to the court. Jibril ibn Baktisha, physician to Harun, al-Mamun, and the Barmakids, amassed a fortune of 88,800,000 dirhams, or over $7 million. We are told that he received 100,000 dirhams for bleeding the caliph twice a year and a like sum for giving him a semi-annual purgative. He successfully treated hysterical paralysis in a slave girl by pretending to disrobe her in public. From Jibril onward, there is a succession of famous physicians in Eastern Islam. Yuhana ibn Musawai, from 777 to 857, who studied anatomy by dissecting apes. Hunayn ibn Ishaq, the translator, author of Ten Treatises on the Eye, the oldest systematic textbook of ophthalmology, and Ali ibn Isa, greatest of Muslim oculists, whose manual for oculists was used as a text in Europe till the 18th century. The outstanding figure in this humane dynasty of healers was Abu Bakr Muhammad al-Razi, who lived from 844 to 926, famous in Europe as Razis. 
This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 1 by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 9, Side 2. The outstanding figure in this humane dynasty of healers was Abu Bekr Muhammad al-Razi, who lived from 844 to 926, famous in Europe as Razis. Like most of the leading scientists and poets of his time, he was a Persian writing in Arabic. Born at Rai, near Tehran, he studied chemistry, alchemy, and medicine at Baghdad and wrote some 131 books, half of them on medicine, most of them lost. His Kitab al-Hawi, or comprehensive book, covered in 20 volumes every branch of medicine. Translated into Latin as Liber Continens, it was probably the most highly respected and frequently used medical textbook in the white world for several centuries. It was one of the nine books that composed the whole library of the medical faculty at the University of Paris in 1395. His treatise on smallpox and measles was a masterpiece of direct observation and clinical analysis. It was the first accurate study of infectious diseases, the first effort to distinguish the two ailments. We may judge its influence and repute by the forty English editions printed between 1498 and 1866. The most famous of al-Razi's works was a ten-volume survey of medicine, the Kitab al-Mansuri, the book for al-Mansur, dedicated to a prince of Khorasan. Gerard of Cremona translated it into Latin. The ninth volume of this translation, the Nonus al-Mansoris, was a popular text in Europe till the 16th century. Al-Razi introduced new remedies like mercurial ointment and the use of animal gut in sutures. He checked the enthusiasm for urinalysis in an age when physicians were prone to diagnose any disease by examining the urine, sometimes without seeing the patient. Some of his shorter works showed a genial side. One was on the fact that even skillful physicians cannot cure all diseases. Another was entitled, Why Ignorant Physicians, Laymen, and Women Have More Success Than Learned Medical Men. Al-Razi was by common consent the greatest of Muslim physicians and the greatest clinician of the Middle Ages. He died in poverty at the age of 82. In the School of Medicine at the University of Paris hang two portraits of Muslim physicians, Razis and Avicenna. Islam knew its greatest philosopher and its most famous physician as Abu Ali al Hussein ibn Sina, who lived from 980 to 1037. His autobiography, one of the few in Arabic literature, shows us how mobile might be in medieval days the life of a scholar or sage. Son of a money changer of Bokhara, Avicenna was educated by private tutors, who gave a Sufi mystic turn to an otherwise scientific mind. At the age of ten, says Ibn Khan, with customary oriental hyperbole, he was a perfect master of the Koran and general literature, and had obtained a certain degree of information in theology, arithmetic, and algebra. He studied medicine without a teacher, and while still young began to give gratis treatment. At seventeen he brought back to health the ailing ruler of Bukhara, Nu ibn Mansur, became an official of the court, and spent eager hours in the sultan's voluminous library. The break-up of the Samanid power towards the end of the 10th century led Avicenna to take service under al-Mamun, prince of Khwarizm. When Mahmud of Ghazni sent for Avicenna, al-Biruni, and other intellectual lights of al-Mamun's court, Avicenna refused to go. With a fellow scholar, Masihi, he escaped into the desert. There in a dust storm, Masihi died, but Avicenna, after many hardships, reached Gurgan and took service at the court of Kabus. Mahmud circulated throughout Persia a picture of Avicenna and offered a reward for his capture, but Kabus protected him. When Kabus was murdered, Avicenna was called to treat the emir of Hamadan. He succeeded so well that he was made vizier. But the army did not like his rule. It seized him, pillaged his home, and proposed his death. He escaped, hid himself in the rooms of a druggist, and began in his confinement to write the books that were to make his fame. As he was planning a secret departure from Hamadan, he was arrested by the emir's son and spent several months in jail, where he continued his writing. He again escaped, disguised himself as a Sufi mystic, and after adventures too numerous for our space, found refuge and honors at the court of Allah ad the Buwayyid emir of Isfahan. 
A circle of scientists and philosophers gathered about him and held learned conferences over which the emir liked to preside. Some stories suggest that the philosopher enjoyed the pleasures of love as well as of scholarship. On the other hand, we get reports of him as absorbed day and night in study, teaching, and public affairs. And Ibn Khalikan quotes from him some unhackneyed counsel. Take one meal a day. Preserve the seminal fluid with care. It is the water of life to be poured into the womb. Worn out too soon, he died at fifty-seven on a journey to Hamadan, where to this day pious veneration guards his grave. Amid these vicissitudes he found time, in office or in jail, in Persian or in Arabic, to write a hundred books, covering nearly every field of science and philosophy. For good measure he composed excellent poems, of which fifteen survive. One of them slipped into the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Another, The Descent of the Soul, into the body from a higher sphere, is still memorized by young students in the Moslem East. He translated Euclid, made astronomical observations, and devised an instrument like our vernier. He made original studies of motion, force, vacuum, light, heat, and specific gravity. His treatise on minerals was a main source of European geology until the thirteenth century. His remarks on the formation of mountains is a model of clarity. Mountains may be due to two different causes. Either they result from upheavals of the earth's crust, such as might occur in violent earthquake, or they are the effect of water, which, cutting for itself a new route, has denuded the valleys. The strata are of different kinds, some soft, some hard. The winds and waters disintegrate the first kind, but leave the other intact. It would require a long period of time for all such changes to be accomplished, but that water has been the main cause of these effects is proved by the existence of fossil remains of aquatic animals on many mountains. Two gigantic productions contain Avicenna's teaching, the Kitab al-Shifa, or Book of Healing, pertaining to healing of the soul, an eighteen-volume encyclopedia of mathematics, physics, metaphysics, theology, economics, politics, and music, and the Kanun Filtib, or Canon of Medicine, a gigantic survey of physiology, hygiene, therapy, and pharmacology, with sundry excursions into philosophy. The Kanun is well organized and has moments of eloquence, but its scholastic passion for classification and distinction becomes the one disease for which the author has no prescription. He begins with a discouraging admonition. Every follower of my teachings who wishes to use them profitably should memorize most of this work, which contains a million words. He conceives medicine as the art of removing an impediment to the normal functioning of nature. He deals first with the major diseases, their symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment. He has chapters on general and individual prophylaxis and hygiene, and on therapy through enemas, bleeding, cautery, baths, and massage. He recommends deep breathing, even occasional shouting, to develop the lungs, chest, and uvula. Book two summarizes Greek and Arabic knowledge of medicinal plants. Book three, on special pathology, contains excellent discussions of pleurisy, epiema, intestinal disorders, sexual diseases, perversions, and nervous ailments, including love. Book four discusses fevers, surgery, and cosmetics, the care of the hair and the skin. Book five, Materia Medica, gives detailed directions for concocting 760 drugs. The Kanun, translated into Latin in the 12th century, dethroned Al-Razi and even Galen as the chief text in European medical schools. It held its place as required reading in the universities of Montpellier and Louvain till the middle of the 17th century. Avicenna was the greatest writer on medicine, Al-Razi the greatest physician, Al-Biruni the greatest geographer, Al-Haytam the greatest optician, Jabir probably the greatest chemist of the Middle Ages. These five names, so little known in present-day Christendom, are one measure of our provincialism in viewing medieval history. Arabic, like all medieval science, was often sullied with occultism, except in optics it excelled rather in the synthesis of accumulated results than in original findings or systematic research. At the same time, however haltingly, it developed in alchemy that experimental method which is the greatest pride and tool of the modern mind. When Roger Bacon proclaimed that method to Europe five hundred years after Jabir, he owed his illumination to the Moors of Spain, whose light had come from the Moslem East. 4. Philosophy In philosophy, as in science, Islam borrowed from Christian Syria the legacy of pagan Greece, 
and returned it through Moslem Spain to Christian Europe. Many influences, of course, ran together to produce the intellectual rebellion of the Mutazilites and the philosophies of Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Avicenna, and Averroes. Hindu speculations came in through Ghazni and Persia. Zoroastrian and Jewish eschatology played some minor role, and Christian heretics had stirred the air of the Near East with debate on the attributes of God, the nature of Christ and the Logos, predestination and free will, revelation and reason. But the yeast that caused the ferment of thought in Moslem Asia, as in Renaissance Italy, was the rediscovery of Greece. Here, through however imperfect translations of apocryphal texts, a new world appeared, one in which men had reasoned fearlessly about everything, unchecked by sacred scriptures, and had conceived a cosmos not of divine whimsy and incalculable miracle, but of majestic and omnipresent law. Greek logic, fully conveyed through Aristotle's organon, came like an intoxication to Moslems now gifted with leisure to think. Here were the terms and implements they needed for thought. Now, for three centuries, Islam played the new game of logic, drunk like the Athenian youth of Plato's time with the dear delight of philosophy. Soon the whole edifice of Mohammedan dogma began to tremble and crack, as Greek orthodoxy had melted under the sophists' eloquence, as Christian orthodoxy would wince and wilt under the blows of the encyclopedists and the whips of Voltaire's wit. What might be called the Moslem Enlightenment had its proximate origin in a strange dispute. Was the Koran eternal or created? Philo's doctrine of the Logos is the timeless wisdom of God, the four Gospels' identification of Christ with the Logos, the divine word or reason, that was in the beginning was God, and without which was not anything made that was made, the Gnostic and Neoplatonic personification of divine wisdom as the agent of creation, the Jewish belief in the eternity of the Torah, all conspired to beget in orthodox Islam a correlative view that the Koran had always existed in the mind of Allah, and that only its revelation to Muhammad was an event in time. The first expression of philosophy in Islam, circa 757, was the growth of a school of Mutazilites, that is, seceders, who denied the eternity of the Koran. They protested their respect for Islam's holy book, but they argued that where it or the Hadith contradicted reason, the Koran or the traditions must be interpreted allegorically, and they gave the name Kalam, or logic, to this effort to reconcile reason and faith. It seemed to them absurd to take literally those Quranic passages that ascribed hands and feet, anger and hatred to Allah. Such poetic anthropomorphism, however adapted to the moral and political ends of Muhammad at the time, could hardly be accepted by the educated intellect. The human mind could never know what was the real nature or attributes of God. It could only agree with faith in affirming a spiritual power as the foundation of all reality. Furthermore, to the Mutazilites it seemed fatal to human morality and enterprise to believe, as orthodoxy did, in the complete predestination of all events by God, and the arbitrary election from all eternity of the saved and the damned. In a hundred variations of these themes, Mutazilite doctrines spread rapidly under the rule of al-Mansur, Harun al-Rashid, and al-Mamun, at first in the privacy of scholars and infidels, then in the soirees of the caliphs, finally in the lecture circles of colleges and mosques, the new rationalism won a voice, even here and there, ascendancy. Al-Mamun was fascinated by this fledgling flight of reason, defended it, and ended by proclaiming the Mutazilite views as the official faith of the realm. Mingling old habits of Oriental monarchy with the latest ideas of Hellenizing Moslems, Al-Mamun in 832 issued a decree requiring all Moslems to admit that, that the Quran had been created in time. A later decree ruled that no one could be a witness in law or a judge unless he declared his acceptance of the new dogma. Further decrees extended this obligatory acceptance to the doctrines of free will and the impossibility of the soul ever seeing God with a physical eye. At last, refusal to take these tests and oaths was made a capital crime. Al-Mamun died in 833, but his successors, Al-Mutasim and Al-Watik, continued his campaign. The theologian Ibn Hanbal denounced this inquisition. Summoned to take the tests, he answered all questions by quoting the Quran in favor of the orthodox view. 
He was scourged to unconsciousness and cast into jail, but his sufferings made him in the eyes of the people a martyr and a saint, and prepared for the reaction that overwhelmed Moslem philosophy. Meanwhile, that philosophy had produced its first major figure. Abu Yusuf Yaqub ibn Ishaq al-Kindi was born in Kufa about 803, son of the governor of the city. He studied there and at Baghdad, and won a high reputation at the courts of al-Mamun and al-Mutasim as translator, scientist, and philosopher. Like so many thinkers in that confident heyday of the Moslem mind, he was an omnivorous polymath, studying everything, writing 265 treatises about everything, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, meteorology, geography, physics, politics, music, medicine, philosophy. He agreed with Plato that no one could be a philosopher without being first a mathematician, and he struggled to reduce health, medicine, and music to mathematical relations. He studied the tides, sought the laws that determine the speed of a falling body, and investigated the phenomena of light in a book on optics which influenced Roger Bacon. He shocked the Moslem world by writing an apology for Christianity. He and an aide translated the apocryphal theology of Aristotle. He was deeply impressed by this forgery, and rejoiced in the thought that it reconciled Aristotle with Plato by turning both of them into Neoplatonists. Al-Kindi's philosophy was Neoplatonism restated. Spirit has three grades, God, the creative world soul or Logos, and its emanation, the soul of man. If a man trains his soul to right knowledge, he can achieve freedom and deathlessness. Apparently, Al-Kindi made heroic efforts to be orthodox, yet he took from Aristotle the distinction between the active intellect, which is divine, and the passive intellect of man, which is merely the capacity for thought. Avicenna would transmit this distinction to Averroes, who would set the world by the ears with it as an argument against personal immortality. Al-Kindi associated with the Mutazilites. When the reaction came, his library was confiscated and his deathlessness hung by a thread. He survived the storm, recovered his library, and lived till 873. In a society where government, law, and morality are bound up with a religious creed, any attack upon that creed is viewed as menacing the foundations of social order itself. All the forces that had been beaten down by the Arab conquest— Greek philosophy, Gnostic Christianity, Persian nationalism, Mazdakite communism, were rampantly resurgent. The Koran was questioned and ridiculed. A Persian poet was decapitated for proclaiming the superiority of his verses to the Koran in 784. The whole structure of Islam resting on the Koran seemed ready to collapse. In this crisis, three factors made orthodoxy victorious. A conservative caliph, the rise of the Turkish guard, and the natural loyalty of the people to their inherited beliefs. Al-Mutawakil, coming to the throne in 847, based his support upon the populace and the Turks, and the Turks, new converts to Mohammedanism, hostile to the Persians and strangers to Greek thought, gave themselves with a whole heart to a policy of saving the faith by the sword. Al-Mutawakil annulled and reversed the illiberal liberalism of Al-Mamun, Mutazilites and other heretics were expelled from governmental employ and educational positions. Any expression of heterodox ideas in literature or philosophy was forbidden. The eternity of the Koran was re-established by law. The Shia sect was proscribed, and the shrine of Hussein at Kerbila was destroyed in 851. The edict allegedly issued by Omar I against Christians and extended to the Jews by Harun in 807 and soon ignored again, was reissued by al-Mutawakkil in 850. Jews and Christians were ordered to wear a distinctive color of dress, put colored patches on the garments of their slaves, ride only on mules and asses, and affix wooden devils to their doors. New churches and synagogues were to be pulled down, and no public elevation of the cross was to be allowed in Christian ceremonies. No Christian or Jew was to receive education in Moslem schools. In the next generation, the reaction took a milder form. Some orthodox theologians, bravely accepting the gauge of logic, proposed to prove by reason the truth of the traditional faith. These mutakalimun, that is, logicians, were the scholastics of Islam. They undertook that same reconciliation of religious dogma with Greek philosophy, which Maimonides in the twelfth century would attempt for Judaism, and Thomas Aquinas in the thirteenth for Christianity. Abul Hassan al-Ashari of Basra, 
who lived from 873 to 935, after teaching Mutazilite doctrines for a decade, turned against them in his fortieth year, attacked them with the Mutazilite weapon of logic, and poured forth a stream of conservative polemics that shared powerfully in the victory of the old creed. He accepted the predestinarianism of Muhammad without flinching. God has predetermined every act and event, and is their primary cause. He is above all law and morals. He rules as a sovereign over his creatures, doing what he wills. If he were to send them all to hell, there would be no wrong. Not all the Orthodox relished this submission of the faith to intellectual debate. Many proclaimed the formula, Bila Kaif, believe without asking how. The theologians, for the most part, ceased to discuss basic issues, but lost themselves in the scholastic minutiae of a doctrine whose fundamentals they accepted as axioms. The ferment of philosophy subsided at Baghdad, only to emerge at minor courts. Saiful Dalla provided a house at Aleppo for Muhammad Abu Nasr al-Farabi, the first Turk to make a name in philosophy. Born at Farab in Turkestan, he studied logic under Christian teachers at Baghdad and Haran, read Aristotle's physics forty times and the De Anima two hundred times, was denounced as a heretic at Baghdad, adopted the doctrine and dress of a Sufi, and lived like the swallows of the air. He was the most indifferent of men to the things of this world, says Ibn Khali Khan. He never gave himself the least trouble to acquire a livelihood or possess a habitation. Saiful Dalla asked him how much he needed for his maintenance. Al-Farabi thought that four dirhams, or two dollars a day, would suffice. The prince settled this allowance on him for life. Thirty-nine works by Al-Farabi survive, many of them commentaries on Aristotle. His Isa al-Ulum, or Encyclopedia of Science, summarized the knowledge of his time in philology, logic, mathematics, physics, chemistry, economics, and politics. He answered with a straightforward negative the question that would soon agitate the scholastic philosophers of Christendom. Does the universal, the genus, the species, or the quality, exist apart from the specific individual? Deceived like the rest by the theology of Aristotle, he transformed the hard-headed stagyrite into a mystic, and lived long enough to subside into orthodox belief. Having in his youth professed a theoretical agnosticism, he progressed sufficiently in later life to give a detailed description of the deity. He took over Aristotle's proofs of God's existence very much as Aquinas would do three centuries later. A chain of contingent events requires for its intelligibility an ultimate necessary being. A chain of causes requires a first cause. A series of motions requires a prime mover unmoved. Multiplicity requires unity. The ultimate goal of philosophy, never quite attainable, is knowledge of the first cause. The best approach to such knowledge is purity of soul. Like Aristotle, Al-Farabi carefully managed to make himself unintelligible on immortality. He died at Damascus in 950. One work alone among his remains strikes us with its original force. Al-Medina al-Fadila, the ideal city. It opens with the description of the law of nature as one of perpetual struggle of each organism against all the rest, Hobbes's Bellum Omnium Contra Omnes. Every living thing, in the last analysis, sees in all other living things a means to its ends. Some cynics argue from this, says Al-Farabi, that in this inescapable competition the wise man is he who best bends others to his will and most fully achieves his own desires. How did human society emerge from this jungle law? If we may trust Al-Farabi's account, there were both Rousseauians and Nietzscheans among the Moslems who took up this question. Some thought that society had begun in an agreement among individuals that their survival required the acceptance of certain restraints through custom or law. Others laughed this social contract out of history and insisted that society or the state had begun as the conquest and regimentation of the weak by the strong. States themselves, said these Nietzscheans, are organs of competition. It is natural that states should struggle with one another for ascendancy, security, power, and wealth. War is natural and inevitable, and in that final arbitrament, as in the law of nature, the only right is might. Al-Farabi counters this view with an appeal to his fellow men to build a society not upon envy, power, and strife, but upon reason, devotion, and love. He ends safely by recommending a monarchy based upon strong religious belief. 
A pupil of a pupil of Al-Farabi established at Baghdad about 970 an association of savants, known to us only from its founder's place name as the Sijistani Society, for the discussion of philosophical problems. No questions were asked as to the national origin or religious affiliation of any member. The group seems to have drowned itself in logic and epistemology, but its existence indicates that intellectual appetite survived in the capital. Of greater moment or result was a similar but secret fraternity of scientists and philosophers organized at Basra about 983. These brethren of sincerity, or purity, Ikhwan al-Safa, were alarmed by the weakening of the caliphate, the poverty of the people, and the corruption of morals. They aspired to a moral, spiritual, and political renovation of Islam, and thought that this renewal might be founded upon a blend of Greek philosophy, Christian ethics, Sufi mysticism, Shia politics, and Muslim law. They conceived friendship as a collaboration of abilities and virtues, each party bringing to the union a quality of which the others had lack and need. Truth, they thought, comes more readily from a meeting of minds than from individual thought. So they privately met and discussed, with fine freedom, capillicity, and courtesy, all the basic problems of life, and finally issued fifty-one tracts as their considered and cooperative system and epitome of science, religion, and philosophy. A Spanish Moslem, traveling in the Near East about the year 1000, took a fancy to these treatises, collected them, and preserved them. In these 1134 pages we find scientific explanations of tides, earthquakes, eclipses, sound waves, and many other natural phenomena, a full acceptance of astrology and alchemy, and occasional dallying with magic and numerology. The theology, as in nearly all Moslem thinkers, is Gnostic and Neoplatonic. From the first cause, or God, emanates the active intelligence, logos, or reason, from which proceeds the world of bodies and souls. All material things are formed by and act through soul. Every soul is restless until it rejoins the active intelligence or world soul. This union demands absolute purity in the soul. Ethics is the art of attaining this purity. Science, philosophy, and religion are means to such purification. In seeking purity, we must try to model ourselves upon the intellectual devotion of Socrates, the universal charity of Christ, and the modest nobility of Ali. When the mind has been emancipated by knowledge, it should feel free to reinterpret through allegory and thereby reconcile with philosophy the crude expressions of the Koran which were adapted to the understanding of an uncivilized desert people. A sharp Persian retort to Arab pride. All in all, these fifty-one tracts constitute the fullest and most consistent expression that we possess of Moslem thought in the Abbasid age. The Orthodox leaders in Baghdad burned them as heresy in 1150, but they continued to circulate and exercised a pervasive influence upon Moslem and Jewish philosophy, upon al-Ghazali and Averroes, Ibn Gabirol and Judah Halivai, the philosophical poet Al-Mari, and perhaps upon the man who in his brief life rivaled the scope and depth and surpassed the rationality of this cooperative synthesis. For Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, was not content to be a scientist and a world-renowned authority on medicine. Doubtless he knew that a scientist completes himself only through philosophy. He tells us that he read Aristotle's metaphysics forty times without understanding it, and that when Al-Farabi's commentary enabled him to comprehend the book, he was so happy and grateful that he rushed into the street and scattered alms. Aristotle remained to the end his ideal in philosophy. Already in the Kanun he used of him that phrase, the philosopher, which was to become in the Latin world a synonym for Aristotle. He detailed his own philosophy in the Kitab al-Shifa, and then summarized it in the Najat. He had a flair for logic and insisted on precise definitions. He gave the classic medieval answer to the question whether universals or general ideas, man, virtue, redness, exist apart from individual things. They exist, one, anti-race, before the things, in the mind of God as platonic exemplars according to which the things are made, two, in rebus, in the things in which they appear or are exemplified, and three, post-race, after the things, as abstracted ideas in the human mind. But universals do not exist in the natural world apart from individual things. 
Abelar and Aquinas would, after a century of turmoil, give the same reply. Indeed, Avicenna's metaphysics is almost a summary of what, two centuries after him, the Latin thinkers would syncretize as the scholastic philosophy. He begins with a laborious restatement of Aristotle and Al-Farabi on matter and form, the four causes, the contingent and the necessary, the many and the one, and frets over the puzzle of how the contingent and changeable many, the multiplicity of mortal things, could ever have flowed from the necessary and changeless one. Like Plotinus, he thinks to solve the problem by postulating an intermediate active intelligence, distributed through the celestial, material, and human world as souls. Finding some difficulty in reconciling God's passage from non-creation to creation with the divine immutability, he proposes to believe with Aristotle in the eternity of the material world. But knowing that this will offend the mutakalimun, he offers them a compromise by a favorite scholastic distinction. God is prior to the world not in time, but logically, that is, in rank and essence and cause. The existence of the world depends at every moment upon the existence of its sustaining force, which is God. Avicenna concedes that all entities but God are contingent, that is, their existence is not inevitable or indispensable. Since such contingent things require a cause for their existence, they cannot be explained except by reverting in the chain of causes to a necessary being, one whose essence or meaning involves existence, a being whose existence must be presupposed in order to explain any other existence. God is the only being that exists by its own essence. It is essential that he exist, for without such a first cause nothing that is could have begun to be. Since all matter is contingent, that is, its essence does not involve existence, God cannot be material. For like reasons he must be simple and one. Since there is intelligence in created beings, there must be intelligence in their creator. The supreme intelligence sees all things, past, present, and future, not in time or sequence, but at once. Their occurrence is the temporal result of his timeless thought. But God does not directly cause each action or event. Things develop by an internal teleology. They have their purposes and destinies written in themselves. Therefore God is not responsible for evil. Evil is the price we pay for freedom of will, and the evil of the part may be the good of the whole. The existence of the soul is attested by our most immediate internal perception. The soul is spiritual for the same reason. We simply perceive it to be so. Our ideas are clearly distinct from our organs. The soul is the principle of self-movement and growth in a body. In this sense, even the celestial spheres have souls. The whole cosmos is the manifestation of a universal principle of life. By itself, a body can cause nothing. The cause of its every motion is its inherent soul. Every soul or intelligence possesses a measure of freedom and creative power akin to that of the first cause, for it is an emanation of that cause. After death, the pure soul returns to union with the world soul, and in this union lies the blessedness of the good. Avicenna achieved as well as any man the ever-sought reconciliation between the faith of the people and the reasoning of the philosophers. He did not wish, like Lucretius, to destroy religion for the sake of philosophy, nor, like Al-Ghazali in the ensuing century, to destroy philosophy for the sake of religion. He treats all questions with reason only, quite independently of the Koran, and gives a naturalistic analysis of inspiration. But he affirms the people's need of prophets, who expound to them the laws of morality and forms and parables popularly intelligible and effective. In this sense, as laying or preserving the foundations of social and moral development, the prophet is God's messenger. So Muhammad preached the resurrection of the body, and sometimes described heaven in material terms. The philosopher will doubt the immortality of the body, but he will recognize that if Muhammad had taught a purely spiritual heaven, the people would not have listened to him, and would not have united into a disciplined and powerful nation. Those who can worship God in spiritual love, entertaining neither hope nor fear, are the highest of mankind. But they will reveal this attitude only to their maturest students, not to the multitude. Avicenna's Shifa and Kanun mark the apex of medieval thought and constitute one of the major syntheses in the history of the mind. Much of it followed the lead of Aristotle and Al-Farabi, as much of Aristotle followed Plato. 
Only lunatics can be completely original. Avicenna occasionally talks what seems to our fallible judgment to be nonsense. But that is also true of Plato and Aristotle. There is nothing so foolish, but it may be found in the pages of the philosophers. Avicenna lacked the honest uncertainty, critical spirit, and ever-open mind of Alberuni, and made many more mistakes. Synthesis must pay that price as long as life is brief. He surpassed his rivals in the clarity and vivacity of his style, in the ability to relieve and illuminate abstract thought with illustrative anecdote and pardonable poetry, and in the unparalleled scope of his scientific and philosophical range. His influence was immense. It reached out to Spain to mold Averroes and Maimonides, and into Latin Christendom to help the great scholastics. It is astonishing how much of Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas goes back to Avicenna. Roger Bacon called him the chief authority in philosophy after Aristotle, and Aquinas was not merely practicing his customary courtesy in speaking of him with as much respect as of Plato. Arabic philosophy in the East almost died with Avicenna. Soon after his culminating effort, the orthodox emphasis of the Seljuks, the frightened fideism of the theologians, the victorious mysticism of al-Ghazali put a cloture on speculative thought. It is a pity that we know these three centuries, from 750 to 1050, of Arabic efflorescence so imperfectly. Thousands of Arabic manuscripts in science, literature, and philosophy lie hidden in the libraries of the Moslem world. In Constantinople alone there are thirty mosque libraries whose wealth has been merely scratched. In Cairo, Damascus, Mosul, Baghdad, Delhi, are great collections not even catalogued. An immense library in the Escorial near Madrid has hardly completed the listing of its Islamic manuscripts in science, literature, jurisprudence, and philosophy. What we know of Muslim thought in those centuries is a fragment of what survives. What survives is a fragment of what was produced. What appears in these pages is a morsel of a fraction of a fragment. When scholarship has surveyed more thoroughly this half-forgotten legacy, we shall probably rank the tenth century in Eastern Islam as one of the golden ages in the history of the mind. 5. Mysticism and Heresy At their peak, philosophy and religion meet in the sense and contemplation of universal unity, the soul untouched by logic, too weak of wing for the metaphysical flight from the many to the one, from incident to law, might reach that vision through a mystic absorption of the separate self in the soul of the world. And where science and philosophy failed, where the brief, finite reason of man faltered and turned blind in the presence of infinity, faith might mount to the feet of God by ascetic discipline, unselfish devotion, the unconditional surrender of the part to the whole. Muslim mysticism had many roots. The asceticism of the Hindu fakirs, the Gnosticism of Egypt and Syria, the Neoplatonist speculations of the later Greeks, and the omnipresent example of ascetic Christian monks. As in Christendom, so in Islam a pious minority protested against any accommodation of religion to the interests and practices of the economic world. They denounced the luxury of caliphs, viziers, and merchants, and proposed to return to the simplicity of Abu Bekr and Omar I. They resented any intermediary between themselves and the deity. Even the rigid ritual of the mosque seemed to them an obstacle to that mystic state in which the soul, purified of all earthly concerns, rose not only to the beatific vision, but to unity with God. The movement flourished mostly in Persia, perhaps through proximity to India, through Christian influence at Jundishapur, and through Neoplatonist traditions established by the Greek philosophers who fled from Athens to Persia in 529. Most Muslim mystics called themselves Sufis from the simple robe of wool or suf that they wore, but within that term were embraced sincere enthusiasts, exalted poets, pantheists, ascetics, charlatans, and men with many wives. Their doctrine varied from time to time and from street to street. The Sufis, said Averroes, maintain that the knowledge of God is found in our own hearts, after our detachment from all physical desires and the concentration of the mind upon the desired object. But many Sufis tried to reach God through external objects, too. Whatever we see of perfection or loveliness in the world is due to the presence or operation of divinity in them. O oh God, said one mystic, I never listen to the cry of animals or the quivering of trees or the murmur of water or the song of birds or the rustling wind or the crashing thunder without feeling them to be evidence of thy unity and a proof that there is nothing like unto thee. In reality, the mystic held, these individual things exist only by the divine power in them. 
Their sole reality is this underlying divinity. Therefore God is all. Not only is there no God but Allah, there is no being but God. Consequently, each soul is God, and the full-blooded mystic shamelessly avers that God and I are one. Verily I am God, said Abu Yazid, around nine hundred. There is no God but me. Worship me. I am he whom I love, said Hussein al-Halaj, and he whom I love is I. I am he who drowned the people of Noah. I am the truth. Halaj was arrested for exaggeration, scourged with a thousand stripes, and burned to death in 922. His followers claimed to have seen and talked with him after this interruption, and many Sufis made him their favorite saint. The Sufi, like the Hindu, believed in a course of discipline as necessary to the mystic revelation of God, purifying exercises of devotion, meditation, and prayer, the full obedience of the novice to a Sufi master or teacher, and the complete abandonment of any personal desire, even the desire for salvation or the mystical union. The perfect Sufi loves God for his own sake, not for any reward. The giver, said Abul Qasim, is better for you than the gift. Usually, however, the Sufi valued his discipline as a means of reaching a true knowledge of things, sometimes as a curriculum leading to a degree of miraculous power over nature, but almost always as a road to union with God. He who had completely forgotten his individual self in such union was called Al-Insanul Kamil, the perfect man. Such a man, the Sufis believed, was above all laws, even above the obligation to pilgrimage. Said a Sufi verse, all eyes toward the Kaaba turn, but ours to the Beloved's face. Until the middle of the eleventh century, the Sufis continued to live in the world, sometimes with their families and their children. Even the Sufis attached small moral worth to celibacy. The true saint, said Abu Sa'id, goes in and out amongst the people, eats and sleeps with them, buys and sells in the market, marries and takes part in social intercourse, and never forgets God for a single moment. Such Sufis were distinguished only by their simplicity of life, their piety and quietism, very much like the early Quakers, and occasionally they gathered around some holy teacher or exemplar, or met in groups for prayer and mutual stimulation to devotion. Already in the tenth century, those strange dervish dances were taking form which were to play so prominent a part in later Sufism. A few became recluses and tormented themselves, but asceticism was in this period discountenanced and rare. Saints, unknown to early Islam, became numerous in Sufism. One of the earliest was a woman, Rabia al Adawiyah, of Basra, who lived from 717 to 801. Sold as a slave in youth, she was freed because her master saw a radiance above her head while she prayed. Refusing marriage, she lived a life of self-denial and charity. Asked if she hated Satan, she answered, My love for God leaves me no room for hating Satan. Tradition ascribes to her a famous Sufi saying, O God, give to thine enemies whatever thou hast assigned to me of this world's goods, and to thy friends whatever thou hast assigned to me in the life to come. For thou thyself art sufficient for me. Let us take as an example of many Sufis the saint and poet Abu Sa'id ibn Abil Qair, who lived from 967 to 1049. This book is continued on Cassette 10, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 10, Side 1. Let us take as an example of many Sufis the saint and poet Abu Sa'id ibn Abil Qair, who lived from 967 to 1049. Born in Maihana in Khorasan, he knew Avicenna, story has it that he said of the philosopher, What I see, he knows, and that the philosopher said of him, What I know, he sees. In his youth he was fond of profane literature, and claims to have memorized thirty thousand verses of free Islamic poetry. One day in his twenty-sixth year he heard a lecture by Abu Ali, who took as text the ninth verse of the sixth surah of the Quran, Say Allah, then leave them to amuse themselves in their vain discourse. At the moment of hearing this word, Abu Sa'id relates, a door in my breast was opened, and I was rapt from myself. He collected all his books and burned them. The first step in Sufism, he would say, is the breaking of ink pots, the tearing up of books, the forgetting of all kinds of knowledge. He retired to a niche in a chapel of his home. There I sat for seven years, saying continually, Allah, Allah, 
Allah. Such repetition of the holy name was, with Muslim mystics, a favorite means of realizing fana, passing away from self. He practiced several forms of asceticism, wore the same shirt always, spoke only in dire need, ate nothing till sunset, and then only a piece of bread, never lay down to sleep, made an excavation in the wall of his niche or cell, just high and broad enough to stand in, often closed himself within it, and stuffed his ears to hear no sound. Sometimes at night he would lower himself by a rope into a well, head downward, and recite the entire Koran before emerging, if we were to believe the testimony of his father. He made himself a servant to other Sufis, begged for them, cleaned their cells and privies. Once, whilst I was seated in the mosque, a woman went up on the roof and bespattered me with filth, and still I heard a voice saying, Is not thy Lord enough for thee? At forty he attained to perfect illumination, began to preach, and attracted devoted audiences. Some of his hearers, he assures us, smeared their faces with his ass's dung to gain a blessing. He left his mark on Sufism by founding a monastery of dervishes, and formulating for it a set of rules that became a model for similar institutions in later centuries. Like Augustine, Abu Sayyid taught that only God's grace, not man's good works, would bring salvation. But he thought of salvation in terms of a spiritual emancipation independent of any heaven. God opens to man one gate after another, first the gate of repentance, then the gate of certainty, so that he accepts contumely and endures abasement and knows for certain by whom it is brought to pass. Then God opens to him the gate of love, but still he thinks, I love. Then God opens to him the gate of unity. Thereupon he perceives that all is he, all is by him. He recognizes that he has not the right to say I or mine. Desires fall away from him, and he becomes free and calm. Thou wilt never escape from thyself until thou slay it. Thyself, which is keeping thee far from God, and saying, So and so has treated me ill, such a one has done well by me, all this is polytheism. Nothing depends upon the creatures, all upon the Creator. This must thou know, and having said it, thou must stand firm. To stand firm means that when thou hast said one, thou must never again say two. Say Allah, and stand firm there. The same Hindu Emersonian doctrine appears in one of the many quatrains dubiously ascribed to Abu Sa'id. Said I, To whom belongs thy beauty? He replied, Since I alone exist to me. Lover, beloved, and love am I in one, beauty and mirror and the eyes that see. There being no church to canonize such heroes of ecstasy, they received the informal canonization of popular acclaim and by the twelfth century the Quranic discouragement of the worship of saints as a form of idolatry had been overwhelmed by the natural sentiments of the people. An early saint was Ibrahim ibn Adam, possibly eighth century, the Abu ben Adam of Lee Hunt. Popular imagination attributed miraculous powers to such saints. They knew the secrets of clairvoyance, thought reading, and telepathy. They could swallow fire or glass unhurt, pass through fire unburnt, walk upon water, fly through the air, and transport themselves over great distances in a moment's time. Abu Sayyid reports feats of mind-reading as startling as any in current mythography. Day by day the religion that some philosophers suppose to be the product of priests is formed and reformed by the needs, sentiment, and imagination of the people, and the monotheism of the prophets becomes the polytheism of the populace. Orthodox Islam accepted Sufism within the Muslim fold and gave it considerable latitude of expression and belief. But this shrewd policy was refused to heresies that concealed revolutionary politics or preached an anarchism of morality and law. Of many half-religious, half-political revolts, the most effective was that of the Ismaila. In Shia doctrine, it will be recalled, each generation of Ali's descendants to the twelfth was headed by a divine incarnation or imam and each imam named his successor. The sixth, Jafar al-Sadiq, appointed his eldest son, Ismail, to succeed him. Ismail, it is alleged, indulged in wine. Jafar rescinded his nomination and chose another son, Musa, as seventh imam, this circa 760. Some Shiites held the appointment of Ismail to be irrevocable, and honored him or his son Muhammad as seventh and last imam. For a century these Ismailites remained a negligible sect. Then Abdullah ibn Qadda made himself their leader, 
and sent missionaries to preach the doctrine of the Seveners throughout Islam. Before initiation into the sect, the convert took an oath of secrecy and pledged absolute obedience to the Daid Duat, or Grand Master of the Order. The teaching was divided into exoteric and esoteric. The convert was told that after passing through nine stages of initiation, all veils would be removed. The talim, or secret doctrine, that God is all, would be revealed to him, and he would then be above every creed and every law. In the eighth degree of initiation, the convert was taught that nothing can be known of the Supreme Being, and no worship can be rendered him. Many survivors of the old communistic movements were drawn to the Ismaila by the expectation that a Mahdi, or Redeemer, would come, who would establish a regime of equality, justice, and brotherly love on the earth. This remarkable confraternity became in time a power in Islam. It won North Africa and Egypt, and founded the Fatimid dynasty. And late in the ninth century it gave birth to a movement that almost brought an end to the Abbasid Caliphate. When Abdullah ibn Qadar died in 874, an Iraqi peasant named Hamdan ibn al-Ashrat, popularly known as Karmat, became the leader of the Ismaili sect, and gave it such energy that for a time in Asia it was called after him Karamita, the Karmathians. Planning to overthrow the Arabs and restore the Persian Empire, he secretly enlisted thousands of supporters and persuaded them to contribute a fifth of their property and income to a common treasury. Again, an element of social revolution entered into what was ostensibly a form of mystical religion. The Carmathians advocated a communism of both property and women, organized workmen into guilds, preached universal equality, and adopted an allegorical, free-thinking interpretation of the Koran. They disregarded the rituals and fasts prescribed by orthodoxy and laughed at the asses who offered worship to shrines and stones. In 899, they established an independent state on the west shore of the Persian Gulf. In 900, they defeated the caliph's army, leaving hardly a man of it alive. In 902, they ravaged Syria to the gates of Damascus. In 924, they sacked Basra, then Kufa. In 930, they plundered Mecca, slew 30,000 Muslims, and carried off rich booty, including the veil of the Kaaba and the Black Stone itself. The movement exhausted itself in its successes and excesses. Citizens united against its threat to property and order, but its doctrines and violent ways were passed on in the next century to the Ismaili of Alamut, the Hashish-inspired assassins. 6. Literature in Islam, life and religion had drama, but literature had none. It is a form apparently alien to the Semitic mind. And as in other medieval literatures, there was here no novel. Most writing was heard rather than silently read, and those who cared for fiction could not rise to the concentration necessary for a complex and continued narrative. Short stories were as old as Islam or Adam. The simpler Muslims listened to them with the ardor and appetite of children, but the scholars never counted them as literature. The most popular of these stories were the fables of Bidpai and the Thousand Nights and a Night. The fables were brought to Persia from India in the 6th century, were translated into Pallavi, and thence in the 8th century into Arabic. The Sanskrit original was lost, the Arabic version survived, and was rendered into 40 languages. Al-Masudi, who died in 597, speaks in his Meadows of Gold of a Persian book, Hazar Afsana, or Thousand Tales, and of its Arabic translation, Auflai La Wa Lai La. This is the earliest known mention of the thousand nights and a night. The plan of the book, as described by al Masudi, was that of our Arabian nights. Such a framework for a series of stories was already old in India. A great number of these tales circulated in the Oriental world. Various collections might differ in their selection, and we are not sure that any story in our present editions appeared in the texts known to al Masudi. Shortly after 1700, an incomplete Arabic manuscript, not traceable beyond 1536, was sent from Syria to the French Orientalist Antoine Galland. Fascinated by their whimsical fantasy, their glimpses of intimate Moslem life, perhaps by their occasional obscenity, he issued at Paris in 1704 their first European translation, the Mille et une Nuit. The book succeeded beyond any expectation. Translations were made into every European language, and children of all nations and ages began to talk of Sinbad the Sailor, Aladdin's Lamp, and Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. Next to the Bible, itself Oriental, the Fables and the Knights are the most widely read books in the world. 
Literary prose in Islam is a form of poetry. The Arabic temperament was inclined to strong feeling. Persian manners made for ornate speech, and the Arabian language, then common to both peoples, invited rhyme by the similarity of its inflectional endings. So literary prose usually rhymed. Preachers and orators and storytellers used rhymed prose. It was in this medium that Badi al-Hamadani, who died in 1008, wrote his famous Mahamat, or assemblies, Tales told the various gatherings about a wandering rapscallion with less morals than wit. The peoples of the Near East were ear-minded, as were all men before printing. To most Moslems, literature was a recited poem or narrative. Poems were written to be read aloud or sung, and everyone in Islam, from peasant to caliph, heard them gladly. Nearly everyone, as in samurai Japan, composed verses. In the educated classes, it was a popular game for one person to finish in rhyme a couplet or stanza begun by another, or to compete in forming extempore lyrics or poetic epigrams. Poets rivaled one another in fashioning complex patterns of meter and rhyme. Many rhymed the middle as well as the end of a line. A riot of rhyme scurried through Arab verse and influenced the rise of rhyme in European poetry. Probably no civilization or period, not even China in the days of Li Po and Tu Fu, nor Weimar when it had a hundred citizens and ten thousand poets, ever equaled Abbasid Islam in the number and prosperity of its bards. Abul Faraj of Isfahan, who lived from 897 to 967, toward the end of this age, collected and recorded Arabic poetry in his Kitab al aghani or Book of Songs. Its twenty volumes suggest the wealth and variety of Arabic verse. Poets served as propagandists and were feared as deadly satirists. Rich men bought praise by the meter, and caliphs gave high place and fat sums to poets who turned for them a pleasant stanza or celebrated the glory of their deeds or their tribe. The caliph Hisham, wishing to recall a poem, sent for the poet Hamad, who luckily remembered it all. Hisham rewarded him with two slave girls and 50,000 dinars, or $237,500. No poet will believe the tale. Arabic poetry, which once had sung to Bedouins, now addressed itself to courts and palaces. Much of it became artificial, formal, delicately trivial, politely insincere, and a battle of ancients and moderns ensued in which the critics complained that there were great poets only before Muhammad. Love and war outbid religion as poetic themes. The poetry of the Arabs, this would not be true of the Persians, was seldom mystical. It preferred songs of battle, passion, or sentiment. And as the century of conquest closed, Eve overcame both Mars and Allah as the inspiration of Arab verse. The poets of Islam thrilled with auto-intoxication in describing the charms of woman, her fragrant hair, jewel eyes, berry lips, and silver limbs. In the deserts and holy cities of Arabia the troubadour motifs took form. Poets and philosophers spoke of adab as in one phase the ethic and etiquette of love. This tradition would pass through Egypt and Africa to Sicily and Spain, and thence to Italy and Provence, and hearts would break in rhyme and rhythm and many tongues. Hassan ibn Hani won the name of Abu Nuwas, father of the curl, from his abounding locks. Born in Persia, he found his way to Baghdad, became a favorite of Harun, and may have had with him one or two of the adventures ascribed to them in the thousand nights and a night. He loved wine, woman, and his songs, offended the caliph by too conspicuous toping, agnosticism, and lechery, was often imprisoned and often released, came by leisurely stages to virtue, and ended by carrying beads and the Koran with him everywhere. But the society of the capital liked best the hymns that he had written to wine and sin. Come, Suleiman, sing to me, and the wine, quick, bring to me. While the flask goes twinkling round, pour me a cup that leaves me drowned with oblivion. Ne'er so nigh let the shrill muezzin cry. Accumulate as many sins as thou canst, the Lord is ready to relax his ire. When the day comes, forgiveness thou wilt find before a mighty king and gracious sire. And gnaw thy fingers all that joy regretting which thou didst leave through terror of hellfire. The minor courts had their poets too, and Saifu Dola provided a place for one who, almost unknown to Europe, is reckoned by the Arabs as their best. His name was Ahmad ibn Hussein, but Islam remembers him as al Mutanabi the pretender to prophecy. Born at Kufa in 915, he studied at Damascus, announced himself as a prophet, was arrested and released, and settled down at the Aleppo court. Like Abu Nuwas, 
He made his own religion and notoriously neglected to fast or pray or read the Quran. Though he denounced life as not quite up to his standards, he enjoyed it too much to think of eternity. He celebrated Saifu's victories with such zest and verbal artifice that his poems are as popular in Arabic as they are untranslatable into English. One couplet proved mortal to him. I am known to the horse troop, the night and the desert's expanse, not more to paper and pen than to sword and the lance. Attacked by robbers, he wished to flee. His slave inopportunely reminded him of these swashbuckling verses. Al-Mutanabi resolved to live up to them, fought and died of his wounds in 965. Eight years later, the strangest of all Arab poets, Abul Ala al-Mari, was born at Al-Maratu near Aleppo. Smallpox left him blind at four. Nevertheless, he took up the career of a student, learned by heart the manuscripts that he liked in the libraries, traveled widely to hear famous masters, and returned to his village. During the next fifteen years, his annual income was thirty dinars, some twelve dollars a month, which he shared with servant and guide. His poems won him fame, but as he refused to write encomiums, he nearly starved. In 1008 he visited Baghdad, was honored by poets and scholars, and perhaps picked up among the free thinkers of the capital some of the skepticism that spices his verse. In 1010 he went back to Almoratu, became rich, but lived to the end with the simplicity of a sage. He was a vegetarian à l'outrance, avoiding not only flesh and fowl, but milk, eggs, and honey as well. To take any of these from the animal world, he thought, was rank robbery. On the same principle, he rejected the use of animal skins, blamed ladies for wearing furs, and recommended wooden shoes. He died at eighty-four, and a pious pupil relates that one hundred eighty poets followed his funeral, and eighty-four savants recited eulogies at his grave. We know him now chiefly through the one thousand five hundred ninety-two short poems, called briefly Luzumiat, or Obligations. Instead of discussing woman and war like his fellow poets, Almari deals boldly with the most basic questions. Should we follow revelation or reason? Is life worth living? Is there a life after death? Does God exist? Every now and then the poet professes his orthodoxy. He warns us, however, that this is a legitimate precaution against martyrdom, which was not to his taste. I lift my voice to utter lies absurd. But speaking truth, my hushed tones scarce are heard. He deprecates indiscriminate honesty. Do not acquaint rascals with the essence of your religion, for so you expose yourself to ruin. In simple fact, Almari is a rationalist, agnostic pessimist. Some hope that an imam with prophet's gaze will rise and all the silent ranks amaze. O oh, idle thought, there's no imam but reason to point the morning and the evening ways. Shall we in these old tales discover truth, or are they worthless fables told to youth? Our reason swears that they are only lies, and reason's tree bears verity for truth. How oft, when young, my friends, I would defame, if our religious faiths were not the same. But now my soul has traveled high and low, now all save love to me is but a name. He denounces the Moslem divines who make religion serve the pelf of man, who fill the mosque with terror when they preach, but conduct themselves no better than some who drink to a tavern tune. You have been deceived, honest man, by a cunning knave who preaches to the women. To his own sordid ends the pulpit he ascends, and though he disbelieves in resurrection, makes all his hearers quail whilst he unfolds a tale of last-day scenes that stun the recollection. The worst scoundrels, he thinks, are those who manage the holy places in Mecca. They will do anything for money. He advises his hearers not to waste their time in pilgrimage and to be content with one world. The body nothing feels when soul is flown. Shall spirit feel, unbodied and alone? We laugh, but inept is our laughter. We should weep and weep sore, who are shattered like glass, and thereafter remolded no more. And he concludes, if by God's decree I shall be made into a clay pot that serves for ablutions, I am thankful and content. He believes in a God omnipotent and wise, and marveled at a physician who denies the Creator after having studied anatomy. But here, too, he raises difficulties. 
Our natures did not become evil by our choice, but by the fate's command. Why blame the world? The world is free of sin. The blame is yours and mine. Grapes, wine, and drinker, these are three. But who was at fault, I wonder, he that pressed the grapes or he that sipped the wine? I perceive, he writes with Voltaire and sarcasm, that men are naturally unjust to one another, but there is no doubt of the justice of him who created injustice. And he breaks out into the angry dogmatism of a Diderot. O fool, awake! The rights ye sacred hold are but a cheat contrived by men of old, who lusted after wealth and gained their lust, and died in baseness, and their law is dust. Offended by what seemed to him the lies and cruelties of men, Almari became a pessimist recluse, the Timon of Islam. Since the evils of society are due to the nature of man, reform is hopeless. The best thing is to live apart, and to meet only a friend or two, to vegetate like some placid, half-solitary animal. Better yet is never to be born, for once born we must bear torment and tribulation until death yields us peace. Life is a malady whose one medicine is death. All come to die, alike householder and wanderer. The earth seeketh, even as we, its livelihood day by day apportioned. It eats and drinks of human flesh and blood. Meseemeth the crescent moon that shines in the firmament is death's curved spear, its point well sharpened, and splendor of breaking day a saber unsheathed by the dawn. We cannot escape these reapers ourselves, but we can, like good Schopenhauerians, cheat them of the children we might have begotten. If ye unto your sons would prove by act how dearly them ye love, then every voice of wisdom joins to bid you leave them in your loins. He obeyed his own counsel, and wrote for himself the pithiest, bitterest epitaph, My sire brought this on me, but I on none. We do not know how many Moslems shared the skepticism of Almari. The revival of orthodoxy after his time served as a conscious or unconscious censor of the literature transmitted to posterity, and, as in Christendom, may mislead us into minimizing medieval doubt. Al-Mutanabi and Al-Mari marked the zenith of Arabic poetry. After them, the supremacy of theology and the silencing of philosophy drove Arabic verse into the insincerity, artificial passion, and flowering elegance of courtly and trivial lays. But at the same time, the resurrection of Persia and its self-liberation from Arab rule were stirring the nation to a veritable renaissance. The Persian tongue had never yielded to Arabic in the speech of the people. Gradually, in the 10th century, reflecting the political and cultural independence of the Tabarid, Samanid, and Ghaznavid princes, it reasserted itself as the language of government and letters, and became new or modern Persian, enriched itself with Arabic words, and adopted the graceful Arabic script. Persia now broke out in magnificent architecture and lordly poetry. To the Arab Qasida, or Ode, Kita, or Fragment, and Ghazal, or Love Poem, the poets of Iran added the Matnawi, or Poetic Narrative, and the Rubai, the plural being Rubaiyat, or Quatrain. Everything in Persia, patriotism, passion, philosophy, pederasty, piety, now blossomed into verse. This efflorescence began with Rudagi, who died in 954, who improvised poetry, sang ballads, and played the harp at the Samanid court of Bukhara. There, a generation later, Prince Nu ibn Mansur asked the poet Takiki to put into verse the Kodainama, or Book of Kings, wherein Danishwar, circa 651, had gathered the legends of Persia. Takiki had written a thousand lines when he was stabbed to death by his favorite slave. Firdausi completed the task and became the Homer of Persia. Abul Qasim Mansur, or Hassan, was born at Tus, near Mashhad, about 934. His father held an administrative post at the Samanid court and bequeathed to his son a comfortable villa at Baz, near Tus. Spending his leisure in antiquarian research, Abul Qasim became interested in the Kodainama and undertook to transform those prose stories into a national epic. He called his work Shanama, Book of the Shahs, and in the fashion of the time took a pen name, Firdausi, or Garden, perhaps from the groves of his estate. After twenty-five years of labor, he finished the poem in its first form, and set out for Ghazni, possibly in 999, hoping to present it to the great and terrible Mahmud. 
An early Persian historian assures us that there were then 400 poets in constant attendance on Sultan Mahmud. It should have been an unsurpassable barrier, but Firdausi succeeded in interesting the vizier, who brought the immense manuscript to the Sultan's attention. Mahmud, says one account, gave the poet comfortable quarters in the palace, turned over to him reams of historical material, and bade him incorporate these in the epic. All variations of the story agree that Mahmud promised him a gold dinar, or four dollars seventy cents, for each couplet of the revised poem. For an unknown time Firdausi labored. At last, circa 1010, the poem reached its final form in sixty thousand couplets and was sent to the Sultan. When Mahmud was about to remit the promised sum, certain courtiers protested that it was too much, and added that Firdausi was a Shiite and Mutazilite heretic. Mahmud sent sixty thousand silver dirhams, or thirty thousand dollars. The poet, in anger and scorn, divided the money between a bath attendant and a sherbet seller, and fled to Herat. He hid for six months in a bookseller's shop until Mahmud's agents, instructed to arrest him, gave up the search. He found refuge with Shariyar, prince of Shirzad in Tabaristan. There he composed a bitter satire on Mahmud. But Shariyar, fearful of the Sultan, bought the poem for a hundred thousand dirhams and destroyed it. If we may believe these figures and our equivalents, poetry was one of the most lucrative professions in medieval Persia. Firdausi went to Baghdad, and there wrote a long narrative poem, Yusuf and Zuleika, a variant of the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Then, an old man of seventy-six, he returned to Tus. Ten years later, Mahmud, struck by the vigor of a couplet that he heard quoted, asked the author's name. When he learned that it was by Firdausi, he regretted his failure to reward the poet as promised. He dispatched to Firdausi a caravan carrying sixty thousand gold dinars worth of indigo and a letter of apology. As the caravan entered Tus, it encountered the poet's funeral, possibly in 1020. The Shahnama is one of the major works of the world's literature, if only in size. There is something noble in the picture of a poet putting aside trivial subjects and easy tasks, and giving thirty-five years of his life to telling his country's story in 120,000 lines, far exceeding the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. Here was an old man mad about Persia, enamored of every detail in its record, whether legend or fact. His epic is half finished before it reaches history. He begins with the mythical figures of the Avesta, tells of Gaia Murt, the Zoroastrian Adam, and then of Gaia Murt's mighty grandson, Jamshid, who reigned over the land seven hundred years. The world was happier because of him. Death was unknown, neither sorrow nor pain. But after a few centuries his heart was lifted up with pride, and he forgot whence came his wheel. He beheld only himself on the earth, called himself God, and sent forth his image to be worshipped. At last we come to the hero of the epic, Rustam, son of the feudal noble Zal. When Rustam is five hundred years old, Zal falls in love with a slave girl, and through her gives Rustam a brother. Rustam serves and saves three kings, and retires from military life at the age of four hundred. His faithful steed Raksh ages as leisurely, is almost as great a hero, and receives from Firdausi the affectionate attention bestowed by any Persian upon a fine horse. There are pretty love stories in the Shanama, and something of the troubadour's reverence for woman. There are charming pictures of fair women, one of the queen Sudava, who was veiled that none might behold her beauty, and she went with the men as the sun marches behind a cloud. But in the case of Rustam, the love motif plays a minor part. Firdausi recognizes that the dramas of parental and filial love can be more affecting than those of sexual romance. Amid a distant campaign, Rustam has an amour with the Turkish lady, Tamana, and then loses track of her. She brings up their son, Sorab, in sorrow and pride, telling the youth of his great but vanished father. In a war of Turks against Persians, son and sire, neither knowing the other, meet spear to spear. Rustam admires the courage of the handsome lad, and offers to spare him. The boy disdainfully refuses, fights bravely, and is mortally wounded. Dying, he mourns that he has never yet seen his father, Rustam. The victor perceives that he has slain his son. Sorab's horse, riderless, regains the Turkish camp, and the news is brought to Sorab's mother in one of the finest scenes of the epic. The strong emotion choked her panting breath. Her veins seemed withered by the cold of death. The trembling matrons hastened round her, mourned with piercing cries, till fluttering life returned. 
Then gazing up distraught, she wept again, and frantic, seeing midst her pitying train the favorite steed, now more than ever dear, its limbs she kissed and bathed with many a tear. Clasping the male Sarab in battle war, with burning lips she kissed it o'er and o'er. His martial robes she in her arms compressed, and like an infant strained them to her breast. It is a vivid narrative, moving rapidly from episode to episode, and finding unity only from the unseen presence of the beloved fatherland in every line. We, who have less leisure than men had before so many labor-saving devices were invented, cannot spare the time to read all these couplets and bury all these kings. But which of us has read every line of the Iliad, or the Aeneid, or the Divine Comedy, or Paradise Lost? Only men of epic stomach can digest these epic tales. After two hundred pages we tire of Rustam's victories over demons, dragons, magicians, Turks. But we are not Persians. We have not heard the sonorous roll of the original verse. We cannot be moved as Persians are, who in a single province have named three hundred villages after Rustam. In 1934, the educated world of Asia, Europe, and the Americas joined in commemorating the millennial anniversary of the poet whose massive book has been for a thousand years the bulwark of the Persian soul. 7. Art This section is particularly indebted to the Survey of Persian Art, edited by Arthur Upham Pope, and especially to the chapters written by himself. His devoted work in this field, like that of James H. Breasted on Egypt, is an enduring monument of meticulous scholarship and discriminating philanthropy. When the Arabs invaded Syria, their sole art was poetry. Muhammad was believed to have forbidden sculpture and painting as accomplices of idolatry, and music, rich silks, gold and silver ornaments as Epicurean degeneracy. And though all these prohibitions were gradually overcome, they almost confined Muslim art in this period to architecture, pottery, and decoration. The Arabs themselves, so recently nomads or merchants, had no mature facility in art. They recognized their limitations and employed the artists and artisans, adapted the art forms and traditions of Byzantium, Egypt, Syria, Mesopotamia, Iran, and India. The Dome of the Rock at Jerusalem and the Mosque of Walid II at Damascus were purely Byzantine, even in their decoration. Farther east, the old Assyrian and Babylonian tile decoration and current Armenian and Nestorian church forms were adopted. And in Persia, after much destruction of Sasanian literature and art, Islam saw the advantages of the column cluster, the pointed arch, the vault, and those styles of floral and geometrical ornament, which finally flowered into the arabesque. The result was no mere imitation, but a brilliant synthesis that justified all borrowing. From the Alhambra in Spain to the Taj Mahal in India, Islamic art overrode all limits of place and time, laughed at distinctions of race and blood, developed a unique and yet varied character, and expressed the human spirit with a profuse delicacy never surpassed. Muslim architecture, like most architecture in the Age of Faith, was almost entirely religious. The dwellings of men were designed for brief mortality, but the house of God was to be, at least internally, a thing of beauty forever. Nevertheless, though the remains are scant, we hear of bridges, aqueducts, fountains, reservoirs, public baths, fortresses, and turreted walls built by engineer architects who in the first centuries after the Arab conquest were in many cases Christian, but in after centuries were predominantly Muslim. The Crusaders found excellent military architecture at Aleppo, Baalbek, and elsewhere in the Islamic East, learned there the uses of machicolated walls, and took from their foes many an idea for their own incomparable castles and forts. The Alcazar at Seville and the Alhambra at Granada were fortresses and palaces combined. Of Umayyad palaces little survives except a country house at Qusayr Amra, in the desert east of the Dead Sea, where the ruins show vaulted baths and frescoed walls. The palace of Badud al-Dala at Shiraz, we are assured, had 360 rooms, one for each day of the year, each painted in a unique color combination. One of its largest rooms was a library two stories high, arcaded and vaulted. There was no book on any subject, says an enthusiastic Moslem, of which there was not here a copy. Scheherazade's descriptions of Baghdad mansions are fiction, but suggest an ornate magnificence of internal decoration. Rich men had villas in the country as well as homes in the city. Even in the city they had formal gardens. But around their villas these gardens became paradises. 
parks with springs, brooks, fountains, tiled pool, rare flowers, shade, fruit and nut trees, and usually a pavilion for enjoying the open air without the glare of the sun. In Persia there was a religion of flowers. Rose festivals were celebrated with sumptuous displays. The roses of Shiraz and Firuzabad were world famous. Roses with a hundred petals were gifts grateful to a caliph or a king. The houses of the poor were then, as they are now, rectangles of sun-dried brick cemented with mud and roofed with a mixture of mud, stalks, branches, palm leaves, and straw. Better homes had an interior court with a water basin, perhaps a tree, sometimes a wooden colonnade and cloister between court and rooms. Houses rarely faced or opened upon the street. They were citadels of privacy, built for security and peace. Some had secret doors for sudden escape from arrest or attack, or for the inconspicuous entry of a paramour. In all but the poorest houses there were separate quarters for the women, occasionally with their own court. Rich houses had a complicated suite of bathrooms, but most dwellings had no plumbing. Water was carried in, waste was carried out. Fashionable homes might have two stories, with a central living room rising to a dome, and a second-story balcony facing the court. All except the poorest houses had at least one window grill, mashrabiya, a lattice of woodwork to let in light without heat, and allow the occupants to look out unseen. These grills were often elegantly carved, and served as models for the stone or metal screens that adorned the palace or the mosque. There was no fireplace. Heat was provided by charcoal-burning portable braziers. Walls were of plaster, usually painted in many colors. Floors were covered with handwoven rugs. There might be a chair or two, but the Moslem preferred to squat. Near the wall, on three sides of the room, the floor was raised a foot or so, forming a diwan, and was furnished with cushions. There were no specific bedrooms. The bed was a mattress which during the day was rolled up and placed in a closet, as in modern Japan. Furniture was simple. Some vases, utensils, lamps, and perhaps a niche for books. The Oriental is rich in the simplicity of his needs. For the poor and pious Moslem it was enough that the mosque itself should be beautiful. It was built with his labor and dirhems. It gathered up his arts and crafts and laid them like a rich carpet at Allah's feet. And that beauty and splendor all men might enjoy. Usually the mosque was situated near the marketplace, easily accessible. It was not always impressive from without. Except for its facade, it might be indistinguishable from, even physically attached to, the neighboring structures. It was rarely built of any more lordly material than stucco-faced brick. Its functions determined its forms, a rectangular court to hold the congregation, a central basin and fountain for ablutions, a surrounding arcaded portico for shelter, shade, and schools, and on the side of the court facing Mecca, the mosque proper, usually an enclosed section of the portico. It too was rectangular, allowing the worshippers to stand in long lines, again facing Mecca. The edifice might be crowned with a dome, almost always built of bricks, each layer projecting a bit inward beyond the layer beneath, with a surface of plaster to conceal the deviations. As in Sasanian and Byzantine architecture, the transition from rectangular base to circular dome was mediated by pendentives or squinches. More characteristic of mosque architecture was the minaret, from Minara, a lighthouse. Probably the Syrian Moslems developed it from the Babylonian ziggurat and the bell tower of Christian churches. The Persian Moslems took the cylindrical form from India, and the African Moslems were influenced in its design by the four-cornered pharos or lighthouse of Alexandria. Perhaps the four corner towers of the old temple area at Damascus influenced the form. In this early period the minaret was simple and mostly unadorned. Only in the following centuries would it achieve the lofty slenderness, fragile balconies, decorative arcades and faience surfaces that would lead Ferguson to call it the most graceful form of tower architecture in the world. The most brilliant and varied decoration was reserved for the interior of the mosque. Mosaics and brilliant tiles on floor and mirab, exquisite shapes and hues of glass in windows and lamps, rich carpets and prayer rugs on the pavement, facings of colored marble for the lower panels of the walls, lovely friezes of Arabic script running round mirabs or cornices, delicate carvings of wood or ivory or graceful molding of metal in doors, ceilings, pulpits and screens. The pulpit itself, or minbar, was of wood carefully carved and inlaid with ebony or ivory. Near it was the dika, a reading desk supported by small columns and holding the Koran. The book itself, of course, was a work of calligraphic and miniaturist art. To show the Qibla, or direction of Mecca, a niche was cut into the wall, 
possibly an imitation of the Christian apse. This mirab was elaborated until it became almost an altar or chapel, and all the skill of Moslem artists was deployed to make it beautiful with faience or mosaic, floral or scriptural moldings or reliefs, and colorful patterns in brick, stucco, marble, terracotta, or tile. We probably owe this splendor of ornament to the Semitic prohibition of human or animal forms in art, as if in compensation, the Moslem artist invented or adopted an overflowing abundance of non-representational forms. He sought an outlet first in geometrical figures, line, angle, square, cube, polygon, cone, spiral, ellipse, circle, sphere. He repeated these in a hundred combinations and developed them into swirls, guilloches, reticulations, entrelacs, and stars. Passing to floral forms, he designed in many materials wreaths, vines, or rosettes of lotus, acanthus, or palm tendrils or leaves. In the 10th century, he merged all these in the arabesque, and to them all, as a unique and major ornament, he added the Arabic script. Taking usually the Kufic characters, he lifted them vertically, or expanded them laterally, or dressed them in flourishes and points, and turned the alphabet into a work of art. As religious prohibitions slackened, he introduced new motifs of decoration by representing the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, or strange composite animals that dwelt only in his whimsical fantasy. His flair for adornment enriched every form of art, mosaic, miniature, pottery, textiles, rugs. And in nearly every case the design had the disciplined unity of a dominant form or motif developed from center to border or from beginning to end as in the elaboration of a musical theme. No material was thought too obdurate for such ornament. Metal, wood, brick, stucco, stone, terracotta, glass, tile, and faience became the vehicles of such a poetry of abstract forms as no art, not even the Chinese, had ever achieved before. So illuminated, Islamic architecture raised in Arabia, Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, Persia, Transoxiana, India, Egypt, Tunisia, Sicily, Morocco, and Spain, an endless chain of mosques in which masculine strength of outward form was always balanced by feminine grace and delicacy of interior ornament. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 10, Side 2. So illuminated, Islamic architecture raised in Arabia, Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, Persia, Transoxiana, India, Egypt, Tunisia, Sicily, Morocco, and Spain, an endless chain of mosques in which masculine strength of outward form was always balanced by feminine grace and delicacy of interior ornament. The mosques of Medina, Mecca, Jerusalem, Ramleh, Damascus, Kufa, Basra, Shiraz, Nishapur and Ardabil, the Mosque of Jafar at Baghdad, the Great Mosque of Samara, the Zakaria Mosque of Aleppo, the Mosque of Ibn Tulun, and the El Azhar in Old Cairo, the Great Mosque of Tunis, the Sidi Okba Mosque of Kairouan, the Blue Mosque of Cordova. We can do no less and no more than name them, for of the hundreds such that were built in this period, only a dozen remain distinguishable. Indiscriminate time has leveled the rest through earthquake, negligence, or war. Persia alone, a fraction of Islam, has yielded to recent research such unsuspected architectural splendor as marks a major event in our rediscovery of the past. The revelation was too long delayed. Already many masterpieces of Persian architecture had crumbled to earth. Mukadasi ranked the Mosque of Fasa with that of Medina and the Mosque of Turshiz with the Great Mosque of Damascus. The mosque of Nishapur, with its marble columns, gold tiles, and richly carved walls, was one of the wonders of the time. And no mosque in Khorasan or Sistan equaled in beauty the mosque of Herat. We may vaguely judge the exuberance and quality of Persian architecture in the ninth and 10th centuries from the stucco reliefs and carved columns and capitals of the Mirab and the Congregational Mosque at Nayin, now mostly destroyed, and the two lovely minarets that survive at Damgan. The Friday Mosque at Ardistan, from 1055, still shows a handsome mirab and portal, and many elements that were to later appear in Gothic, pointed arches, groined pendentives, cross vaults, and ribbed dome. In these and most Persian mosques and palaces, the building material was brick, 
as in Sumerian and Mesopotamian antiquity. Stone was rare and costly, clay and heat were plentiful. Yet the Persian artist transformed brick layers with light and shade, novel patterns and divers attitudes into such variety of decoration as that modest substance had never known before. Over the brick, in special places like portals, minbars and mirabs, the Persian potter laid berry-colored mosaics and most brilliant tiles. And in the eleventh century he made bright surfaces more resplendent still, with luster-painted faience. So every art in Islam hum humbly and proudly served the mosque. Sculpture, forbidden to make statues lest idolatry return, devoted itself to decorative reliefs. Stone was skillfully carved, and stucco, before it hardened, was shaped by hand into a rich diversity of designs. One impressive sample remains. At Mashata, in the Syrian desert east of the Jordan, Walid II began, circa 743, and left unfinished, a winter palace. Along the lower surface of the façade ran a sculptured stone frieze of extraordinary excellence. Triangles, rosettes, and borders intricately carved with flowers, fruits, birds, beasts, and trailing arabesques. This chef d'oeuvre, transferred to Berlin in 1904, has survived the Second World War. Woodworkers beautified windows, doors, screens, balconies, ceilings, tables, lecterns, pulpits, and mirabs, with such exquisite carving as may be seen in a panel from Takrit in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Workers in ivory and bone adorned mosques, Korans, furniture, utensils, and persons with carvings and inlays. From this age only one piece has come to us, an elephant rook, in the National Museum at Florence, precariously ascribed to the ninth century and to a chess set allegedly sent by Harun to Charlemagne. The metal workers of Islam acquired Sasanian techniques, made great bronze, brass, or copper lamps, ewers, bowls, jugs, mugs, cups, basins, and braziers, cast them playfully into the forms of lions, dragons, sphinxes, peacocks, and doves, and sometimes incised them with exquisite patterns, as in a lace-like lamp in the Art Institute of Chicago. Some craftsmen filled incised designs with silver or gold and made damascened metal an art practiced but not originated at Damascus. The swords of Damascus were of highly tempered steel, adorned with reliefs or inlaid with arabesques, scripts, or other patterns in gold or silver thread. The metal workers of Islam stood at the very top of their art. When the Muslim conquest settled down to cultural absorption, Mohammedan pottery found itself heir, in Asia, Africa, and Spain, to five ceramic traditions, Egyptian, Greco-Roman, Mesopotamian, Persian, Chinese. Saar discovered at Samara some Tang pottery, including porcelain, and early Islamic Persian wares were frankly copied from Chinese prototypes. Pottery centers developed at Baghdad, Samara, Rai, and many other towns. By the 10th century, Persian potters were making almost every kind of pottery except porcelain, in every form from hand spittoons to monstrous vases large enough to hold at least one of the forty thieves. At its best, Persian pottery showed a subtlety of conception a splendor of color, a refinement of workmanship, second only to the Chinese and Japanese. For six centuries it had no rival the side of the Pamirs. It was a favorite and congenial art with the Persians. Aristocrats collected its masterpieces jealously, and poets like Almari and Omar Khayyam found in it many a metaphor for their philosophy. We hear of a ninth-century banquet at which poems were composed and dedicated to the bowls that adorned the board. In that century, the potters of Samara and Baghdad distinguished themselves by making, perhaps inventing, lustered pottery. The decoration was painted in a metallic oxide upon the glazed coating of the clay, and the vessel was then submitted to a smoky and subdued second firing, which reduced the pigment to a thin layer of metal and gave the glaze an iridescent glow. Lovely monochromes were produced in this manner, and lovelier still polychromes in gold, green, brown, yellow, and red, in a hundred almost fluid tints. The luster technique was applied also to the ancient Mesopotamian art of decorative tiles. The rich colors of these squares and their harmonious combinations gave unique splendor to the portals or mirabs of a hundred mosques and to many a palace wall. In the allied art of working glass, the Moslems inherited all the skill of Egypt and Syria. Brilliant lampshades were made in glass adorned with medallions, inscriptions, or floral designs. And perhaps in this period, Syria inaugurated the art of enameled glass, which would reach its peak of excellence in the 13th century. 
When we recall the exuberant and omnipresent use of painting and sculpture in Catholic cathedrals and its importance as a vehicle of Christian creed and story, we are struck by the absence of the representative arts in Islam. The Quran had forbidden sculpture, but it had said nothing about painting. However, a tradition ascribed to Aisha reported the Prophet as condemning pictures too. Muslim law, Shiite as well as Sunnite, enforced the double prohibition. Doubtless, Muhammad had been influenced by the Second Commandment and Judaic teaching, and partly by the notion that the artist, in giving form to living things, usurped the function of the Creator. Some theologians relaxed the prohibition, permitting pictures of inanimate things. Some winked at the portrayal of animal or human figures on objects intended only for secular use. Certain Umayyad caliphs ignored the prohibitions. About 712, Walid I adorned his summer palace at Kusair Amra, with Hellenistic frescoes depicting hunters, dancing girls, women bathing, and himself on his throne. The Abbasid caliphs professed piety but had murals in their private chambers. Al-Mutasim hired artists, probably Christian, to paint hunting scenes, priests, and naked dancing girls on the walls of his palace at Samara. And Al-Mutawakil, who persecuted heretics, permitted Byzantine painters to add to these frescoes one that represented Christian monks and a Christian church. Mahmud of Ghazni decorated his palace with pictures of himself, his armies, and his elephants. And his son, Masud, shortly after being deposed by the Seljuk Turks, covered the walls of his chambers at Herat with scenes based on Persian or Indian manuals of erotic techniques. A story tells how, at the home of a vizier, two artists vied with each other in realistic representation. Ibn Aziz proposed to paint a dancing girl so that she would seem to be coming out of the wall. Al-Qasir undertook a harder task to paint her so that she would seem to be going into the wall. Each succeeded so well that the vizier gave them robes of honor and much gold. Many other violations of the interdict could be listed. In Persia particularly we find living things pictured in joyous abundance and in every form of pictorial art. Nevertheless, the prohibition, supported by the people to the point of occasionally mutilating or destroying works of art, delayed the development of Islamic painting, largely restricted it to abstract ornament, almost excluded portraiture, yet we hear of forty portraits of Avicenna, and left the artists completely dependent upon royal or aristocratic patronage. From this age no Moslem murals survive save those of Kusair Amra and Samara. They reveal a strange and barren marriage of Byzantine techniques with Sasanian designs. As if in compensation, Islamic miniatures are among the finest in history. Here fruition came to a varied heritage. Byzantine, Sasanian, and Chinese, and zealous hands carried on an art so intimately beautiful that one almost resents Gutenberg. Like chamber music in modern Europe, so in medieval Islam the illumination of manuscripts with miniature paintings was an art for the aristocratic few. Only the rich could maintain an artist in the devoted poverty that produced these patient masterpieces. Here again decoration subordinated representation. Perspective and modeling were deliberately ignored. A central motif or form, perhaps a geometrical figure or a single flower, was extended and in a hundred variations, until nearly every inch and even the border of the page was filled with lines as carefully drawn as if incised. In secular works, men, women, and animals might be introduced in scenes of hunting, humor, or love. But always the ornament was the thing, the fanciful play of delicate line, the liquid flow of harmonious colors, the cool perfection of abstract beauty intended for a mind at peace. Art is significance rendered with feeling through form, but the feeling must accept discipline, and the form must have structure and meaning, even if the meaning outreached the realm of words. This is the art of illumination, as of the profoundest music. Calligraphy was an integral part of illumination. One must go as far as China to find again so fraternal a union of writing and design. From Kufa had come the Kufic letters, clumsily angular, crudely sharp, the calligraphers clothed these meager bones with vowel, inflectional, prosodic, diacritical marks, and little floral flourishes. So redeemed, the Kufic script became a frequent feature of architectural decoration. For cursive writing, however, the Nashki form of the Arabic alphabet proved more attractive. Its rounded characters and sinuous horizontal flow were of themselves a decoration. In all the world is no writing or print that equals it in beauty. By the 10th century it had gained the upper hand over Kufic and all but monumental or ceramic lettering. Most of the Moslem books that have reached us from the Middle Ages are in Nashki script. 
The majority of these surviving volumes are Qurans. Merely to copy the holy book was a work of piety sure of divine reward. To illustrate it with pictures was accounted sacrilege, but to lavish beautiful handwriting upon it was deemed the noblest of the arts. Whereas miniaturists were hired artisans poorly paid, calligraphers were sought and honored with royal gifts and numbered kings and statesmen in their ranks. A scrap of writing by a master's hand was a priceless treasure. Already in the tenth century there were bibliophiles who lived and moved and had their being in their collections of fine manuscripts, written on parchment with inks of black, blue, violet, red, and gold. Only a few such volumes have reached us from this age. The oldest is a Koran in the Cairo library, dated 7884. When we add that such works were bound in the softest, strongest leather, tooled or stamped with unexcelled artistry, and the cover itself in many instances adorned with an elegant design, we may without hyperbole rank Islamic books of the ninth to the eighteenth century as the finest ever issued. Which of us can be published in such splendor today? In the embellishment of Islamic life all the arts mingled like the interlaces of a decorative theme. So the patterns of illumination and calligraphy were woven into textiles, burned into pottery, and mounted on portals and mirabs. If medieval civilization made little distinction between artist and artisan, it was not to belittle the artist, but to ennoble the artisan. The goal of every industry was to become an art. The weaver, like the potter, made undistinguished products for ephemeral use. But sometimes his skill and patience found expression, his dream found form in robes or hangings, rugs or coverings, embroideries or brocades woven for many lifetimes, designed with the finesse of a miniature, and dyed in the gorgeous colors so favored of the East. Byzantine, Coptic, Sasanian, Chinese textiles were already famous when the Moslems conquered Syria, Persia, Egypt, and Transoxiana. Islam was quick to learn, and though the Prophet had proscribed silk, Moslem factories soon issued the sinful substance in bold abundance for men and women who sought forgiveness for their bodies as well as their souls. A robe of honor was the most precious present the Caliph could offer his servitors. The Moslems became the leading silk merchants of the medieval world. Persian silk tafta was bought for European ladies as taffeta. Shiraz was famous for its woolen cloth, Baghdad for its baldachin hangings and tabby silks, Khuzestan for fabrics of camels or goat's hair, Khurasan for its sofa, from the Arabic sufa, covers, Tyre for its carpets, Bokhara for its prayer rugs, Herat for its gold brocades. No samples of these products from this period have survived the wear and tear of time. We can only surmise their excellence from later work and the witness of the writers of their age. An entry in the archives of Harun al-Rashid notes 400,000 pieces of gold, the price of a robe of honor for Jafar, the son of Yahya the vizier. 8. Music Music, like sculpture, was at first a sin in Islam. It was not forbidden in the Quran, but if we may believe a dubious tradition, the Prophet, fearful of the songs and dances of promiscuous women, denounced musical instruments as the devil's muezzin call to damnation. The theologians and all the four schools of orthodox law frowned upon music as raising the winds of passion, but some generously conceded that it was not sinful in itself. The people, always healthier in their conduct than in their creeds, held it as a proverb that wine is as the body, music is as the soul, joy is their offspring. Music accompanied every stage of Moslem life and filled a thousand and one Arabian nights with songs of love and war and death. Every palace and many mansions engaged minstrels to sing the songs of the poets or their own. In the startling judgment of an historian fully competent to judge, the cultivation of music by the Arabs in all its branches reduces to insignificance the recognition of the art in the history of any other country. No Western ear, except after long training, can quite appreciate the quality of Arabian music. Its preference of melodic elaboration, arabesques of sound, to harmony and counterpoint, its division of tones not into halves, but into thirds, its florid oriental patterns of structure and rhythm. To us it seems repetitiously simple, monotonously mournful, formlessly weird. To the Arabs, European music seems deficient in the number and subtlety of its tones, and vulgarly addicted to useless complexity and monumental noise. The meditative tenderness of Arabian music deeply affects the Moslem soul. Saadi speaks of a boy singing such a plaintive melody as would arrest a bird in its flight. Al-Ghazali defined ecstasy as the state that comes from listening to music. 
One Arabic book gives a chapter to those who fainted or died while listening to Muslim music. And religion, which at first announced it, later adopted music for the intoxicating dervish ritual. Muslim music began with ancient Semitic forms and tunes, developed in contact with Greek modes that were themselves of Asiatic origin, and felt strong influences from Persia and India. A musical notation and much musical theory were taken from the Greeks. Al-Kindi, Avicenna, and the Brethren of Sincerity wrote at length on the subject. Al-Farabi's grand book on music is the outstanding medieval production on the theory of music, equal if not superior to anything that has come down to us from Greek sources. As early as the 7th century, the Moslems wrote mensurable music, apparently unknown to Europe before 1190. Their notation indicated the duration as well as the pitch of each note. Among a hundred musical instruments, the chief were the lute, lyre, pandor, psaltery, and flute, occasionally reinforced by horn, cymbals, tambourine, castanets, and drum. The lyre was a small harp. The lute was like our mandolin, with a long neck and a curved sounding board made of small glued segments of maple wood. The strings of catgut were plucked by the fingers. There were a dozen sizes and varieties of lute. The large lute was called kitara, from the Greek kithara. Our words guitar and lute, or Arabic al-lud, are from the Arabic. Some string instruments were played with a bow, and the organ was known in both its pneumatic and its hydraulic forms. Certain Muslim cities, like Seville, were celebrated for making fine musical instruments, far superior to anything produced in contemporary Islam. Nearly all instrumental music was intended to accompany or introduce song. Performances were usually confined to four or five instruments at a time, but we also read of large orchestras, and tradition ascribes to the Medina musician Suraj the first use of the baton. Despite the Muslim madness for music, the status of musicians, except for renowned virtuosos, was low. Few men of the higher classes condescended to study the intoxicating art. The music of a rich household was provided by female slaves, and a school of law held that the testimony of a musician could not be accepted in court. Dancing, likewise, was almost confined to slaves trained and hired. It was often erotic, often artistic. The caliph Amin personally directed an all-night ballet in which a large number of girls danced and sang. Contact of the Arabs with Greeks and Persians raised the status of the musician. Umayyad and Abbasid caliphs showered largesse upon the great performers of their time. Suleiman I offered prizes as high as 20,000 pieces of silver, or $10,000, for a competition among the musicians of Mecca. Walid II held song tournaments, at one of which the first prize was 300,000 pieces of silver, or $150,000. These figures are presumably oriental exaggerations. Mahdi invited to his court the Meccan singer Siyat, whose soul warmed and chilled more than a hot bath. And Harun al-Rashid took into his service Siyat's pupil, Ibrahim al-Mosili, that is, of Mosul, gave him 150,000 dirhams, or $75,000, 10,000 more per month, and 100,000 for a single song. Harun so loved music that, against the want of his class, he encouraged the talent of his young half-brother, Ibrahim ibn al-Mahdi, who had a voice of tremendous power and three octaves range. Time seems an impish circle when we hear that he led a kind of romantic movement in Arabian music against the classical school of Ishak, son of Ibrahim al-Masili. Ishaq was by general consent the greatest musician ever produced by Islam. Al-Mamun used to say of him, He never sang to me but what I felt that my possessions were increased. We get a pleasant picture of Muslim society and of the stir made by music in the Muslim soul in a story told by Ibrahim al-Masili's pupil, Mukarik. We need not believe it to feel its significance. After drinking with the caliph a whole night, I asked his permission to take the air, which he granted. While I was walking, I saw a damsel who appeared as if the rising sun beamed from her face. She had a basket, and I followed her. She stopped at a fruiterer's and bought some fruit, and observing that I was following her, she looked back and abused me several times, but still I followed her until she arrived at a great door. When she had entered and the door was closed behind her, I sat down opposite to it, deprived of my reason by her beauty. The sun went down upon me while I sat there and at length there came two handsome young men on asses, and they knocked at the door, and when they were admitted, I entered with them, the master of the house thinking that I was their companion, and they imagining that I was one of his friends. 
A repast was brought us, and we ate and washed our hands and were perfumed. The master of the house then said to the two young men, Have ye any desire that I should call such a one? Mentioning a woman's name. They answered, If thou wilt grant us the favour well. So he called for her, and she came, and lo, she was the maiden whom I had seen. A servant maid preceded her, bearing her lute, which she placed in her lap. Wine was then brought, and she sang, while we drank and shook with delight. Whose heir is that? they asked. She answered, My master Mukarik's. She then sang another air, which she said was also mine, while they drank by pints. She looked aside doubtfully at me until I lost my patience, and called out to her to do her best. But in attempting to do so, singing a third air, she overstrained her voice, and I said, Thou hast made a mistake. Upon which she threw the lute from her lap in anger, saying, Take it thyself, and let us hear thee. I answered, Well. And having taken it and tuned it perfectly, I sang the first of the airs which she had sung before me, whereupon all of them sprang to their feet and kissed my head. I then sang the second air and the third, and their reason almost fled with ecstasy. The master of the house, after asking his guests and being told by them that they knew me not, came to me, and kissing my hand, said, By Allah, my master, who art thou? I answered, By Allah, I am the singer Mukarik. And for what purpose, he said, kissing both my hands, camest thou hither? I replied, As a sponger, and I related what had happened with respect to the maiden. Thereupon he looked toward his two companions and said to them, Tell me, by Allah, do ye not know that I gave for that girl thirty thousand dirhams, and have refused to sell her? They answered, It is so. Then said he, I take you as witnesses that I have given her to him. And we, said the two friends, will pay thee two-thirds of her price. So he put me in possession of the girl, and in the evening when I departed he presented me also with rich robes and other gifts, with all of which I went away. And as I passed the places where the maiden had abused me, I said to her, Repeat thy words to me. But she would not for shame. Holding the girl's hand, I went with her to the caliph, whom I found in anger at my long absence. But when I related my story to him, he was surprised and laughed and ordered that the master of the house and his two friends should be brought before him, that he might requite them. To the former he gave forty thousand dirhams, to each of his two friends thirty thousand, and to me one hundred thousand. And I kissed his feet and departed. Chapter 13 Western Islam 641 to 1086 1. The Conquest of Africa the Near East was but a part of the Islamic world. Egypt under the Moslems resurrected her pharaonic glory. Tunis, Sicily, and Morocco recovered orderly government under Arab leadership, and a passing brilliance illuminated Kairouan, Palermo, and Fez. Moorish Spain was a peak in the history of civilization, and later the Moslem moguls ruling India would build like giants and finish like jewelers. While Khalid and other conquerors subdued the East, Amr ibn al-As, only seven years after Muhammad's death, set out from Gaza in Palestine, captured Pelusium and Memphis, and marched upon Alexandria. Egypt had ports and naval bases, and Arab power needed a fleet. Egypt exported corn to Constantinople, and Arabia needed corn. The Byzantine government in Egypt had for centuries used Arab mercenaries as police. These were no hindrance to the conquerors. The Monophysite Christians of Egypt had suffered Byzantine persecution. They received the Moslems with open arms, helped them to take Memphis, guided them to Alexandria. When it fell to Amr after a siege of twenty-three months in 641, he wrote to the Caliph Omar, It is impossible to enumerate the riches of this great city, or to describe its beauty. I shall content myself with observing that it contains four thousand palaces, four hundred baths, four hundred theatres. Amr prevented pillage, preferring taxation. Unable to understand the theological differences among the Christian sects, he forbade his monophysite allies to revenge themselves upon their orthodox foes and upset the custom of centuries by proclaiming freedom of worship for all. Did Amr destroy the Alexandrian library? The earliest mention of this story is found in Abd al-Latif, who lived from 1162 to 1231, a Muslim scientist. It is more fully given in Bar Hebraeus, who lived from 1226 to 1286, a Christianized Jew of eastern Syria who wrote in Arabic under the name of Abu faraj an epitome of world history. In his account, an Alexandrian grammarian, John Philoponus, asked Amr to give him the manuscripts of the library. Amr wrote to Omar for permission. The caliph, we are told, replied, If these writings of the Greeks agree with the book of God, they are useless and need not be preserved. If they disagree, they are pernicious and should be destroyed. 
Legend shortens this probably legendary answer to burn the libraries, for they are contained in one book, the Quran. According to Bar Hebraeus, Amr distributed the contents of the library among the city's public baths, whose 4,000 furnaces were fueled for six months with the papyrus and parchment rolls, this in 642. Against this story, it should be noted that, one, a large part of the library had been destroyed by Christian ardor under the patriarch Theophilus in 392. Two, the remainder had suffered such hostility and neglect that most of the collection had disappeared by 642. And three, in the 500 years between the supposed event and its first reporter, no Christian historian mentions it, though one of them, Eutychius, Archbishop of Alexandria in 933, described the Arab conquest of Alexandria in great detail. The story is now generally rejected as a fable. In any case, the gradual dissolution of the Alexandrian library was a tragedy of some moment, for it was believed to contain the complete published works of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Polybius, Livy, Tacitus, and a hundred others, who have come down to us in mangled form. Full texts of the pre-Socratic philosophers, who survive only in snatches, and thousands of volumes of Greek, Egyptian, and Roman history, science, literature, and philosophy. Amr administered Egypt competently. Part of the oppressive taxation financed the repair of canals and dikes, and the reopening of an eighty-mile canal between the Nile and the Red Sea. Ships could now sail from the Mediterranean into the Indian Ocean. This canal was again choked with sand in 723 and was abandoned. Amr built a new capital on the site where he had pitched his camp in 641. It was called Al-Fustat, apparently from the Arabic for tent. It was the first form of Cairo. There, for two centuries, from 661 to 868, Moslem governors ruled Egypt for the caliphs of Damascus or Baghdad. Every conquest creates a new frontier, which, being exposed to danger, suggests further conquest. To protect Moslem Egypt from flank attack by Byzantine Cyrene, an army of 40,000 Moslems advanced through the desert to Barca, took it, and marched to the neighborhood of Carthage. The Moslem general planted his spear in the sand some 80 miles south of the modern Tunis, built a camp, and so founded, in 670, one of Islam's major cities, Kairouan, the resting place. Realizing that the capture of Carthage would give the Moslems control of the Mediterranean and an open road to Spain, the Greek emperor sent troops and a fleet. The Berbers, forgetting for a moment their hatred of Rome, joined in defending the city, and it was not till 698 that Carthage was subdued. Soon thereafter Africa was conquered to the Atlantic shores. Berbers were persuaded, almost on their own terms, to accept Moslem rule, and presently the Moslem faith. Africa was divided into three provinces, Egypt with its capital at Al-Fustat, Ifriqiya with its capital at Kaiwan, Maghreb or Morocco with its capital at Fez. For a century even these provinces acknowledged the eastern caliphs as their sovereigns, but the difficulties of communication and transport were increased by the removal of the caliphate to Baghdad and one by one the African provinces became independent kingdoms. An Idrisid dynasty from 789 to 974 ruled at Fez, an Aglabid dynasty from 800 to 909 at Kaiwan, and a Tulunid dynasty from 869 to 905 in Egypt. That ancient granary, no longer robbed of its product by foreign masters, entered into a minor renaissance. Ahmad ibn Tulun from 869 to 884 conquered Syria for Egypt, built a new capital at Katai, a suburb of Al-Fustat, promoted learning and art, raised palaces, public baths, a hospital, and the great mosque that still stands as his monument. His son, Kumara Wai, from 884 to 895, transmuted this energy into luxury, walled his palace with gold, and taxed his people to provide himself with a pool of quicksilver on which his bed of inflated leather cushions might gently float to win him sleep. Forty years after his death, the Tulunids were replaced by another Turkish dynasty, the Ikshidid, from 935 to 969. These African monarchies, having no roots in the blood or traditions of the people, had to base their rule on military force and leadership. And when wealth weakened their martial ardor, their power melted away. The greatest of the African dynasties reinforced its military supremacy by associating itself with an almost fanatical religious belief. About 905, Abu Abdallah appeared in Tunisia, preaching the Ismaili doctrine of the seven imams, proclaiming the early coming of the Mahdi or Savior, 
and won such a following among the Berbers that he was able to overthrow the Aglabid rule in Kairwan. To meet the expectations he had aroused, he summoned from Arabia Obedallah ibn Muhammad, alleged grandson of the Ismaili prophet Abdallah, hailed him as the Mahdi, made him king in 909, and was soon put to death by his king's command. Obedallah claimed descent from Fatima and gave her name to his dynasty. Under the Aglabids and Fatimids, North Africa renewed the prosperity it had known in the heyday of Carthage and under imperial Rome. In the youth of their vigor, the Moslem conquerors in the ninth century opened three routes, 1,500 to 2,000 miles long, across the Sahara to Lake Chad and Timbuktu. Northward and westward, they established forts at Bone, Oran, Ceuta, and Tangier. A fructifying commerce bound the Sudan with the Mediterranean and eastern Islam with Morocco and Spain. Spanish Moslem refugees brought to Morocco the art of leather. Fez flourished as a center of exchange with Spain and became famous for its dyes, perfumes, and rimless cylindrical red hats. In 969, the Fatimids wrested Egypt from the Ikshidids and soon thereafter spread their rule over Arabia and Syria. The Fatimid Caliph Muiz transferred his capital to Cahira, now Cairo. As Katai had been a northeastern extension of Fustat, so Cahira, the victorious, was a northeastern prolongation of Katai, and like its predecessors, began as a military camp. Under Muiz, from 953 to 975, and his son Aziz, from 975 to 996, the vizier Yaqub ibn Kilis, a Baghdad Jew converted to Islam, reorganized the administration of Egypt and made the Fatimids the richest rulers of their time. When Muiz's sister Rashida died, she left 2,700,000 dinars and 12,000 robes. When his sister Abda died, she left 3,000 silver vases, 400 swords damascened in gold, 30,000 pieces of Sicilian textiles, and a hoard of jewelry. But nothing fails like success. The next caliph, al-Hakim, from 996 to 1021, went half mad with wealth and power. He arranged the assassination of several viziers, persecuted Christians and Jews, burned many churches and synagogues, and ordered the demolition of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The execution of this order was a contributory cause of the Crusades. As if to repeat the career of Caligula, he proclaimed himself a god and sent missionaries to establish his cult among the people. When some of these preachers were killed, he took Christians and Jews back into favor and rebuilt their shrines. He was assassinated at the age of 36. Despite these royal prerogatives, Egypt prospered as the commercial link between Europe and Asia. Increasingly, the merchants of India and China sailed past the Persian Gulf and up the Red Sea and the Nile into Egypt. The wealth and power of Baghdad declined, those of Cairo grew. Nasiri Khosru, visiting the new capital in 1047, described it as having 20,000 houses, mostly of brick, rising to five or six stories, and 20,000 shops so filled with gold, jewelry, embroideries, and satins that there was no room to sit down. The main streets were protected against the sun and were lighted at night by lamps. Prices were fixed by the government, and anyone caught charging more was paraded through the city on a camel, ringing a bell and confessing his crime. Millionaires were numerous. One merchant, a Christian, fed the whole population at his own expense during five years of famine caused by the low level of the Nile and Yaqub ibn Kilis left an estate of some thirty million dollars. Such men joined with the Fatimid caliphs in building mosques, libraries, and colleges, and fostering the sciences and the arts. Despite occasional cruelties, wasteful luxuries, the usual exploitation of labor, and the proper number of wars, the rule of the Fatimids was in general beneficent and liberal, and could compare in prosperity and culture with any age in Egyptian history. The wealth of the Fatimids reached its peak in the long reign of Mustansir from 1036 to 1094, the son of a Sudanese slave. He built for himself a pleasure pavilion and lived a life of music, wine, and ease. This, he said, is more pleasant than staring at the black stone, listening to the muezzin's drone, and drinking impure water, meaning from Mecca's holy well of Zemzem. In 1067, his Turkish troops rebelled, raided his palace, and carried away as loot priceless treasures of art, great quantities of jewelry, and twenty-five camel loads of manuscripts. Some of these served the Turkish officers as fuel to heat their homes, while exquisite leather bindings mended the shoes of their slaves. When Mustansir died, the Fatimid Empire fell to pieces. Its once powerful army broke into quarreling factions of Berbers, Sudanese, and Turks. 
Ifriqiya, and Morocco had already seceded, Palestine revolted, Syria was lost. When, in 1171, Saladin dethroned the last Fatimid caliph, one more Egyptian dynasty had followed its predecessors through power and pleasure to decay. 2. Islamic Civilization in Africa, 641 to 1058 The courts of Cairo, Kairouan, and Fez rivaled one another in the support of architecture, painting, music, poetry, and philosophy. But nearly all the surviving manuscripts of Islamic Africa in this period are hidden in libraries which Western scholarship is just beginning to explore. Much of the art has perished, and only the mosques proclaim the vigor and spirit of the age. At Kairouan stands the mosque of Sidi Okba, originally built in 670, seven times restored and mostly dating from 838. Its cloisters of round arches are upheld by hundreds of Corinthian columns from the ruins of Carthage. Its pulpit is a masterpiece of wood carving, its mirab a splendor of porphyry and faience, its square and massive minaret, the oldest in the world, set a Syrian style for the minarets of the West. This mosque made Kairouan the fourth holy city of Islam, one of the four gates to paradise. Only less sacred and magnificent were the mosques of Fez and Marrakesh, of Tunis and Tripoli. In Cairo the mosques were many and immense. Three hundred still adorn that charming capital. The mosque of Amr, begun in 642, was built in the 10th century. Nothing remains of its early constituents except the fine Corinthian columns, judiciously rescued from Roman and Byzantine ruins. The mosque of Ibn Tulun, from 878, precariously preserves its first form and ornament. A high crenellated wall surrounds its roomy court. Within are pointed arches older than any others in Egypt except the arch of the Nilometer, from 865, a structure built on an island in the Nile to measure the rise of the river. Possibly this graceful and convenient form of the arch passed from Egypt through Sicily and the Normans to Gothic Europe. In the ziggurat-like minaret and in the domed tomb of Ibn Tulun are horseshoe arches, one of the less pleasing features of Moslem art. It is told of Ibn Tulun that he had intended to raise the arches on three hundred columns, but when he learned that these could be secured only by dismantling Roman or Christian edifices, he decided instead to support the arches with massive piers of brick. Here again this mosque may have suggested a characteristic element of the Gothic style. Finally, as if to make the building a stepping stone to Chartres, some of the windows were filled with colored glass, some with grills of stone in rosette or stellar or other geometrical designs. These, however, are of uncertain date. In 970 to 972, Jawahar, the converted Christian slave who had conquered Egypt for the Fatimids, built the mosque of El Azhar, the brilliant. Some of the original structure is still in place. Here, too, are pointed arches, rising on 380 columns of marble, granite, or porphyry. The Mosque of Al-Hakim, dating from 990 to 1012, was built of stone, and most of it survives, though in disuse and decay. Some conception of its medieval splendor may be gathered from its elegant stucco arabesques and the fine Kufic inscription of the frieze. Once these mosques, now as forbidding as fortresses, and doubtless so designed, were glorified with exquisite carving and lettering, mosaic and tiled mirabs, and chandeliers that have become museum rarities. The Mosque of Ibn Tulun had 18,000 lamps, many of vari-colored enameled glass. The minor arts were practiced in Islamic Africa with Moslem patience and finesse. Lustered tiles appear in the Kairwan Mosque. Nasiri Kosru, in 1050, described Kairin pottery so delicate and translucent that the hand placed on the outside can be seen from within. Egyptian and Syrian glass continued their ancient excellence. Fatimid rock crystal wares, preserved intact through a thousand years, are treasured in Venice, Florence, and the Louvre. Wood carvers delighted the eye with their work on mosque doors, pulpit panels, mirabs, and window lattices. From their Coptic subjects, the Egyptian Muslims took the art of decorating boxes, chests, tables, and other objects with inlay or marquetry of wood, ivory, bone, or mother of pearl. Jewelry abounded. When Turkish mercenaries raided the chambers of Al-Mustansir, they came away with thousands of articles in gold. Inkstands, chessmen, vases, birds, artificial trees set with precious stones. Among the spoils were curtains of silk brocade worked with gold thread and bearing the pictures and biographies of famous kings. From the Copts, again, the Muslims learned to stamp and print patterns upon textiles with wooden blocks. This technique was apparently carried from Islamic Egypt to Europe by crusaders and may have shared in the development of printing. 
European merchants rated Fatimid textiles above all others and told with awe of Kyrene and Alexandrian fabrics so fine that a robe could be drawn through a finger ring. We hear of luxurious Fatimid rugs and of tents made of velvet, satin, damask, silk, and cloth of gold, and decorated with paintings. A tent made for Yazuri, al-Mustansir's vizier, required the labor of 150 men over nine years, cost 30,000 dinars, and claimed to picture all the known animal species of the world except Homo lupus. All that remains of Fatimid paintings is some fragmentary frescoes in the Arab Museum at Cairo. No miniatures survive from Fatimid Egypt, but Makrizi, who in the 15th century wrote a history of painting, tells us that the library of the Fatimid caliphs contained hundreds of richly illuminated manuscripts, including 2,400 Qurans. In the days of al-Hakim, the caliphal library at Cairo had 100,000 volumes. In al-Mustansir's time, 200,000. This book is continued on cassette 11, side 1. The library at Cairo had 100,000 volumes. In al-Mustansir's time, 200,000. We are told that the manuscripts were lent without charge to all responsible students. In 988, the vizier, Yaqub ibn Kilis, persuaded the caliph Aziz to provide tuition and maintenance for 35 students in the mosque of El-Azhar. Thus began the oldest existing university. As this madrasa developed, it drew pupils from all the Muslim world, as the University of Paris, a century later, would draw them from all Europe. Caliphs, viziers, and rich individuals added year by year to the scholarships, until in our time El-Azhar had some 10,000 students and 300 professors. One of the most pleasant sights of world travel is the assemblage of students in the cloisters of this thousand-year-old mosque, each group squatting in a semicircle at the base of a pillar before a seated savant. Famous scholars from all Islam came here to teach grammar, rhetoric, mathematics, poetry, logic, theology, hadith, Quranic exegesis, and law. The students paid no fees, the teachers received no salaries. Dependent upon governmental subsidy and private philanthropy, the famous university tended to ever more zealous orthodoxy, and its directing ulamas, or learned men, had a discouraging effect upon Fatimid literature, philosophy, and science. We hear of no great poets under this dynasty. Al-Hakim set up in Cairo a Dar al-Hikmah, or Hall of Wisdom. Its main function was to teach Ismaili Shiite theology, but its curriculum included astronomy and medicine. Al-Hakim financed an observatory and helped Ali ibn Yunus, who died in 1009, perhaps the greatest of Muslim astronomers. After 17 years of observations, Yunus completed the Hakamite tables of astral movements and periods and gave more precise values than before to the inclination of the ecliptic, the precession of the equinoxes, and solar parallax. The brightest name in Muslim Egyptian science is that of Muhammad ibn al-Haytam, known to medieval Europe as al-Hazan. Born at Basra in 965, he won repute there as a mathematician and engineer. Hearing that al-Haytam had a plan for regulating the annual inundation of the Nile, al-Hakim invited him to Cairo. The plan proved impracticable, and al-Haytam had to hide in obscurity from the incalculable caliph. Fascinated, like all medieval thinkers, by Aristotle's attempt to formulate a rational synthesis of knowledge, he composed several commentaries on the works of the philosopher. None of these commentaries has reached us. We know al-Haytam chiefly by his Kitab al-Manazir, or Book of Optics. Of all medieval productions, this is probably the most thoroughly scientific in its method and thought. Al-Haytam studied the refraction of light through transparent mediums like air and water, and came so close to discovering the magnifying lens that Roger Bacon, Vitello, and other Europeans three centuries later based upon his work their own advances toward the microscope and the telescope. He rejected the theory of Euclid and Ptolemy that vision results from a ray leaving the eye and reaching the object. Rather, the form of the perceived object passes into the eye and is transmitted there by the transparent body, the lens. He remarked the effect of the atmosphere in increasing the apparent size of sun or moon when near the horizon, showed that through atmospheric refraction the light of the sun reaches us even when the sun is as much as 19 degrees below the horizon, and on this basis he calculated the height of the atmosphere at 10 English miles. He analyzed the correlation between the weight and the density of the atmosphere and the effect of atmospheric density upon the weight of objects. He studied with complex mathematical formulas the action of light on spherical or parabolic mirrors and through the burning glass. He observed the half-moon shape of the sun's image during eclipses on the wall opposite a small hole made in the window shutters. 
this is the first known mention of the camera obscura, or dark chamber, on which all photography depends. We could hardly exaggerate the influence of Al-Haytam on European science. Without him, Roger Bacon might never have been heard of. Bacon quotes him or refers to him at almost every step in that part of the Opus Maius, which deals with optics. And part six rests almost entirely on the findings of the Kyrene physicist. As late as Kepler and Leonardo, European studies of light were based upon Al-Haytam's work. The most striking of all effects produced by the Arab conquest of North Africa was the gradual but almost complete disappearance of Christianity. The Berbers not only accepted Mohammedanism, they became its most fanatical defenders. Doubtless economic considerations entered, non-Muslims paid a head tax, and converts were for a time freed from it. When in 744 the Arab governor of Egypt offered this exemption, 24,000 Christians went over to Islam. Occasional but severe persecutions of Christians may have influenced many to conform to the ruling faith. In Egypt, the Coptic minority held out bravely, built their churches like fortresses, maintained their worship in secret, and survived to this day. But the once crowded churches of Alexandria, Cyrene, Carthage, and Hippo were emptied and decayed. The memory of Athanasius, Cyril, and Augustine faded out, and the disputes of Arians, Donatists, and Monophysites gave way to the quarrels of Sunni and Ismaili Mohammedanism. The Fatimids propped up their power by gathering the Ismailites into a grand lodge of complex initiations and hierarchical degrees. The members were used for political espionage and intrigue. The forms of the order were transmitted to Jerusalem and Europe and strongly influenced the organization, ritual, and garb of the Templars, the Illuminati, and other secret fraternities of the Western world. The American businessman is periodically a zealous Mohammedan, proud of his secret doctrine, his Moroccan fez, and his Moslem shrine. 3. Islam in the Mediterranean, 649 to 1071. Having conquered Syria and Egypt, the Muslim leaders realized that they could not hold the coast without a fleet. Soon their men of war seized Cyprus and Rhodes and defeated the Byzantine navy in 652 and 655. Corsica was occupied in 809, Sardinia in 810, Crete in 823, Malta in 870. In 827, the old struggle between Greece and Carthage for Sicily was resumed. The Aglabid caliphs of Kairouan sent expedition after expedition, and the conquest proceeded with leisurely bloodshed and rapine. Palermo fell in 831, Messina in 843, Syracuse in 878, Taormina in 902. When the Fatimid caliphs succeeded to the Aglabid power in 909, they inherited Sicily as part of their domain. When the Fatimids removed their seat to Cairo, their governor of Sicily, Hussein al Khaldi, made himself emir with nearly sovereign authority and established that Kalbite dynasty under which Muslim civilization in Sicily reached its height. Fortified by mastery of the Mediterranean, the Saracens now looked appreciatively on the cities of southern Italy. As piracy was quite within the bounds of honored custom at this time, and Christians and Moslems raided Moslem or Christian shores to capture infidels for sale as slaves, Saracen fleets, mostly from Tunisia or Sicily, began in the 9th century to attack Italian ports. In 841, the Moslems took Bari, the main Byzantine base in southeastern Italy. A year later, invited by the Lombard Duke of Benevento to help him against Salerno, they swept across Italy and back, despoiling fields and monasteries as they went. In 846, 1,100 Moslems landed at Ostia, marched up to the walls of Rome, freely plundered the suburbs and the churches of St. Peter and St. Paul, and leisurely returned to their ships. Seeing that no civil authority could organize Italian defense, Pope Leo IV took charge, bound Amalfi, Naples, Gaeta and Rome in alliance, and had a chain stretched across the Tiber to halt any enemy. In 849, the Saracens made another attempt to seize the citadel of Western Christianity. The united Italian fleet, blessed by the Pope, gave them battle and routed them, a scene pictured by Raphael in the Stanze of the Vatican. In 866, the Emperor Louis II came down from Germany and drove the marauding Moslems of South Italy back upon Bari and Toronto. By 884, they were expelled from the peninsula. But their raids continued, and central Italy lived through a generation of daily fear. In 876, they pillaged the Campania. Rome was so endangered that the Pope paid the Saracens a yearly bribe of 25,000 mancusi, about $25,000, to keep the peace. In 884, they burned the great monastery of Monte Cassino to the ground. In sporadic attacks, they ravaged the valley of the Anio. Finally, the combined forces of the Pope, the Greek and German emperors, and the cities of southern and central Italy defeated them on the Gariliano, this in 916, and a tragic century of invasion came to an end. Italy, perhaps Christianity, had had a narrow escape. Had Rome fallen, 
the Saracens would have advanced upon Venice, and Venice taken, Constantinople would have been wedged in between two concentrations of Moslem power. On such chances of battle hung the theology of billions of men. Meanwhile, the polyglot culture of Sicily, yielding with the grace of habit to new conquerors, took on a Moslem veneer. Sicilians, Greeks, Lombards, Jews, Berbers, and Arabs mingled in the streets of the Moslem capital, ancient Panormus, Arabic Balerm, Italian Palermo, all hating one another religiously, but living together with no more than a Sicilian average of passion, poetry, and crime. Here, Ibn Hakal, about 970, found some 300 mosques and 300 school teachers who were highly regarded by the inhabitants in spite of the fact, says the geographer, that school teachers are notorious for their mental deficiency and light brains. With sunshine and rain cooperating to make a lush vegetation, Sicily was an agricultural paradise, and the clever Arabs reaped the fruits of a well-managed economy. Palermo became a port of exchange between Christian Europe and Muslim Africa. Soon it was one of the richest cities in Islam. The Muslim flair for fine dress, brilliant jewelry, and the arts of decoration made for a life of otium cum dignitate, leisure without vulgarity. The Sicilian poet Ibn Hamdis, circa 1055 to 1132, describes the vivacious hours of Palamitan youth, the midnight revels, the jolly raid on a convent to buy wine from a surprised but genial nun, the gay mingling of men and women in festival, when the king of the revels has outlawed care, and singing girls tease the lute with slender fingers and dance like resplendent moons on the stems of willowy trees. There were thousands of poets in the island, for the Moors loved wit and rhyme, and Sicilian love offered rich themes. There were scholars, for Palermo boasted a university, and great physicians, for Sicilian Moslem medicine influenced the medical school at Salerno. Half the brilliance of Norman Sicily was an Arab echo, an oriental legacy of crafts and craftsmen to a young culture willing to learn from any race or creed. The Norman conquest of Sicily from 1060 to 1091 helped time to efface the vestiges of Islam in the island. Count Roger was proud that he had leveled Saracen cities, castles, and palaces built with marvelous art. But Moslem style left its mark on the Palace of Laziza and on the ceiling of the Capella Palatina. In this chapel of the Palace of the Norman Kings, Moorish ornament serves the Shrine of Christ. 4. Spanish Islam, 711 to 1086. 1. Caliphs and Emirs. It was at first the Moors, not the Arabs, who conquered Spain. Tariq was a Berber, and his army had 7,000 Berbers to 300 Arabs. His name is embedded in the rock at whose foot his forces landed. The Moors came to call it Gebel al-Tariq, the mountain of Tariq, which Europe compressed into Gibraltar. Tariq had been sent to Spain by Musa ibn Nusayr, Arab governor of North Africa. In 712, Musa crossed with 10,000 Arabs and 8,000 Moors, besieged and captured Seville and Merida, rebuked Tariq for exceeding orders, struck him with a whip, and cast him into prison. The Caliph Walid recalled Musa and freed Tariq, who resumed his conquests. Musa had appointed his son, Abdalaziz, governor of Seville. Suleiman, Walid's brother, suspected Abdalaziz of plotting to make himself independent sovereign of Spain, and dispatched assassins to kill him. The head was brought to Suleiman, now Caliph, at Damascus. He sent for Musa, who asked, Grant me his head that I may close his eyes. Within a year, Musa died of grief. We may believe that the story is only a bloody legend. The victors treated the conquered leniently, confiscated the lands only of those who had actively resisted, exacted no greater tax than had been levied by the Visigothic kings, and gave to religious worship a freedom rare in Spain. Having established their position in the peninsula, the Moslems scaled the Pyrenees and entered Gaul, intent upon making Europe a province of Damascus. Between Tours and Poitiers, a thousand miles north of Gibraltar, they were met by the united forces of Udes, Duke of Aquitaine, and Charles, Duke of Austrasia. After seven days of fighting, the Moslems were defeated in one of the most crucial battles of history, this in 732. Again, the faith of countless millions was determined by the chances of war. Thenceforth, Charles was Carolus Martellus, or Martel, Charles the Hammer. In 735, the Moslems tried again and captured Arles. In 737, they took Avignon and ravaged the valley of the Rhone to Lyon. In 759, Pepin the Short finally expelled them from the south of France, but their forty years of circulation there may have influenced Languedoc's unusual tolerance of diverse faiths, its colorful gaiety, its flair for songs of unpermitted love. The caliphs of Damascus undervalued Spain. Till 756 it was merely the district of Andalusia, and was governed from Kaiwan. But in 755 a romantic figure landed in Spain, 
Armed only with royal blood and destined to establish a dynasty that would rival in wealth and glory the caliphs of Baghdad. When in 750 the triumphant Abbasids ordered all princes of the Umayyad family slain, Abder Rahman, grandson of the caliph Hisham, was the only Umayyad who escaped. Hunted from village to village, he swam the broad Euphrates, crossed into Palestine, Egypt, and Africa, and finally reached Morocco. News of the Abbasid revolution had intensified the factional rivalry of Arabs, Syrians, Persians, and Moors in Spain. An Arab group loyal to the Umayyads, fearing that the Abbasid caliph might question their titles to lands given them by Umayyad governors, invited Abder Rahman to join and lead them. He came and was made emir of Cordova in 756. He defeated an army commissioned by the caliph al-Mansur to unseat him and sent the head of its general to be hung before a palace in Mecca. Perhaps it was these events that saved Europe from worshipping Muhammad. Muslim Spain, weakened with civil war and deprived of external aid, ceased to conquer and withdrew even from northern Spain. From the 9th to the 11th century, the peninsula was divided into Muslim and Christian by a line running from Coimbra through Saragossa and along the Ebro River. The Muslim South, finally pacified by Abderrahman I and his successors, blossomed into riches, poetry, and art. Abderrahman II, from 822 to 852, enjoyed the fruits of this prosperity. Amid border wars with the Christians, rebellions among his subjects, and Norman raids on his coasts, he found time to beautify Cordova with palaces and mosques, rewarded poets handsomely, and forgave offenders with an amiable lenience that may have shared in producing the social disorder that followed his reign. Abder Rahman III, from 912 to 961, is the culminating figure of the Sumayyad dynasty in Spain. Coming to power at 21, he found Andalus, torn by racial faction, religious animosity, sporadic brigandage, and the efforts of Seville and Toledo to establish their independence of Cordoba. Though a man of refinement, famous for his generosity and courtesy, he laid a firm hand upon the situation, quelled the rebellious cities, and subdued the Arab aristocrats who wished, like their French contemporaries, to enjoy a feudal sovereignty on their rich estates. He invited to his councils men of diverse faiths, adjusted his alliances to maintain a balance of power among his neighbors and his enemies, and administered the government with Napoleonic industry and attention to detail. He planned the campaigns of his generals, often took the field in person, repulsed the invasions of Sancho of Navarre, captured and destroyed Sancho's capital, and discouraged further Christian forays during his reign. In 929, knowing himself as powerful as any ruler of his time, and realizing that the Caliph of Baghdad had become a puppet of Turkish guards, he assumed the Caliphal title, Commander of the Faithful and Defender of the Faith. When he died, he left behind him, in his own handwriting, a modest estimate of human life. I have now reigned above fifty, Mohammedan, years, in victory or peace. Riches and honors, powers and pleasures have waited on my call. Nor does any earthly blessing appear to have been wanting to my felicity. In this situation I have diligently numbered the days of pure and genuine happiness which have fallen to my lot. They amount to fourteen. O oh man, place not thy confidence in this present world. His son, Hakam II, from 961 to 976, profited wisely from this half-century of unhappy competence. Secure from external danger and internal revolt, he gave himself to the adornment of Cordova and other cities, built mosques, colleges, hospitals, markets, public baths, and asylums for the poor, made the University of Cordova the greatest educational institution of his time, and helped hundreds of poets, artists, and savants. The Muslim historian al makari writes, the Caliph Hakam surpassed every one of his predecessors in love of literature and the sciences, which he himself cultivated and fostered. He converted Andalus into a great market, whereto the literary products of every clime were immediately brought for sale. He employed agents to collect books for him in distant countries, and remitted to them large sums of money until the number of books thus conveyed to Andalus exceeded all calculation. He would likewise send gifts of money to celebrated authors in the East to encourage the publication of works or to obtain the first copies of them. In this way, knowing that Abu Faraj of Isfahan had written a work entitled Kitab Ulagani, he sent him one thousand dinars of pure gold, upon which the author forwarded him a copy of this work, even before it had appeared in Iraq. While the scholar caliph attended to the amenities of life, he left the administration of the government, even the guidance of national policy, to his able Jewish prime minister, Hastai ibn Shaprut, and the leadership of his armies to a brilliant and unscrupulous general who, under the name of Almanzar, was to provide material for many a Christian drama or romance. His real name was Muhammad ibn Abi Amir. He came of an old Arab family with more genealogy than means. He earned a living by writing petitions for persons who wished to address the caliph, 
became a clerk in the office of the chief cadi or attorney general, and in 967, at the age of 26, was appointed to manage the, the property of Al-Hakam's eldest son, another Abder Rahman. He ingratiated himself with the lad's mother, Queen Soub, charmed her with courtesies and compliments, and impressed her with his tireless ability. Soon he was managing her property as well as her son's, and within a year he was named master of the mint. He now became so generous to his friends that rivals accused him of malversation. Al-Hakam summoned him to clear his account, knowing that he could not... Ibn Abi Amir asked a rich friend to advance him the deficit. So armed, he went to the palace, faced his accusers, and carried the matter off so triumphantly that the caliph appointed him concurrently to several lucrative posts. When Hakam died, Ibn Abi Amir secured the succession to Hakam's son Hisham II, who ruled from 976 to 1009 and from 1010 to 1013, by personally directing the murder of a rival claimant. A week later, he was made vizier. Hisham II was a weakling, altogether incapable of rule. From 978 to 1002, Ibn Ali was a caliph in all but name. His enemies charged him, quite rightly, with loving philosophy more than the Muslim faith. To silence them, he invited the orthodox theologians to weed out from al-Hakam's great library and burn all volumes that in any way impugned the Sunni creed. And by this act of dastardly vandalism, he earned a useful reputation for piety. At the same time, he drew the intellectual classes to his support by secretly protecting the philosophers, welcoming men of letters at his court, and housing there a bevy of poets who drew stipends from the treasury, followed his campaigns, and sang his victories. He built a new town, Zahira, east of Cordova, for his palace and administrative offices, while the young caliph, carefully trained to absorption in theology, remained almost a neglected prisoner in the ancient royal residence. To consolidate his position, Ibn Abi Amir reorganized the army mainly with Berber and Christian mercenaries, who, hostile to the Arabs, felt no obligations to the state, but rewarded with personal loyalty his liberality and tact. When the Christian state of Leon aided a domestic rebellion against him, he destroyed the rebels, severely defeated the Leonese, and returned in triumph to his capital. Thereafter, he assumed the surname of Al-Mansur, the Victorious. Plots against him were numerous, but he circumvented them with pervasive espionage and judicious assassination. His son, Abdullah, joined one of the conspiracies, was detected, and was beheaded. Like Sulla, al-Mansur never left a favor unrewarded, nor an injury unavenged. The people forgave his crimes because he effectively suppressed other criminals and secured an impartial provision of justice for rich and poor. Never had life or property been so safe in Cordoba. Men could not help admire his persistence, intelligence, and courage. One day, while holding court, he felt a pain in his leg. He sent for a physician who advised cautery. With no interruption to the session, Al-Mansur allowed his flesh to be burned without giving any sign of discomfort. The assembly, says Al-Makari, perceived nothing until they smelled the burned flesh. As a further aid to popularity, he enlarged the mosque of Cordoba with the labor of Christian captives, and himself wielded pick and shovel, trowel and saw. Having learned that statesmen who organize successful wars, just or unjust, are exalted by both contemporaries and posterity, he renewed the war with Leon, captured and raised its capital, and massacred the population. Nearly every spring he sallied forth on a new campaign against the infidel north, and never returned without victory. In 997 he took and destroyed the city of Santiago de Compostela, leveled to the ground its famous shrine to St. James, and made Christian captives carry the gates and bells of the church on their shoulders in his triumphal entry into Cordova. In later years the bells would be returned to Compostela on the backs of Muslim prisoners of war. Though sovereign, in fact, of Muslim Spain, Almansur was not content. He longed to be sovereign in name and to found a dynasty. In 991, he resigned his office to his 18-year-old son, Abd al-Malik, added the names Said, Lord, and Malik Karim, noble king, to his other titles, and ruled with absolute power. He had wished to die on the battlefield, and prepared for this consummation, took his burial shroud with him on his campaigns. In 1002, aged 61, he invaded Castile, captured cities, destroyed monasteries, ravaged fields. On the homeward march, he fell ill, refusing medical attendance, he called for his son and told him that death would come within two days. When Abd al-Malik wept, al-Mansur said, This is a sign that the empire will soon decay. A generation later, the Cordovan Caliphate collapsed. The history of Moorish Spain after al-Mansur is a chaos of brief reigns, assassinations, racial strife, and class war. The Berbers, scorned and impoverished in the realm that their arms had won, and relegated to the arid plains of Estremadura or the cold mountains of Leon, periodically revolted against the ruling Arab aristocracy. The exploited workers of the towns hated their employers and changed them spasmodically with murderous insurrection. All classes united in one hatred. 
of that Amarid family, the heirs of Al-Mansur, which, under his son, almost monopolized the offices of government and the perquisites of power. In 1008, Abd al-Malik died and was succeeded as prime minister by his brother, Abd rahman Shanjul. Shanjul drank wine in public and had a kind word for sin. He preferred to carouse rather than to govern. In 1009, he was deposed by a revolution in which nearly all factions joined. The revolutionary masses got out of hand, plundered the Amarid palaces at Zahira, and burned them to the ground. In 1012, the Berbers captured and pillaged Cordova, slew half the population, exiled the rest, and made Cordova a Berber capital. So briefly does a Christian historian recount the French Revolution of Islamic Spain. But the ardor that destroys is seldom mated with the patience that builds. Under Berber rule, disorder, brigandage, and unemployment mounted. Cities, subject to Cordova, seceded and withheld tribute and even the owners of great estates made themselves sovereign on their lands. Gradually, the surviving Cordovans recovered. In 1023, they expelled the Berbers from the capital and gave the throne to Abd rahman V. Seeing no advantage in a return to the old regime, the proletariat of Cordova captured the royal palace and proclaimed one of their leaders, Muhammad al-Mustakfi, as caliph in 1023. Muhammad appointed a weaver as his prime minister. The weaver was assassinated, the proletarian caliph was poisoned, and in 1027 a union of upper and middle classes elevated Hisham III. Four years later, the army took its turn, killed Hisham's prime minister, and demanded Hisham's abdication. A council of leading citizens, perceiving that competition for the throne was making government impossible, abolished the Spanish caliphate and replaced it with a council of state. Ibn Jawar was chosen first consul and ruled the new republic with justice and wisdom. But it was too late. The political authority and cultural leadership had been irrevocably destroyed. Scholarship and poetry, frightened by civil war, had fled from the gem of the world to the courts of Toledo, Granada, and Seville. Muslim Spain disintegrated into 23 taifas, or city-states, too busy with intrigue and strife to stop the gradual absorption of Mohammedan by Christian Spain. Granada prospered under the able ministry, from 1038 to 1073, of Rabbi Samuel Halivai, known to the Arabs as Ismail ibn Nagdela. Toledo declared its independence of Cordova in 1035, and 50 years later submitted to Christian rule. Seville succeeded to the glory of Cordova. Some thought it fairer than that capital. People loved it for its gardens, palm trees, and roses, and a gaiety always ready with music, dance, and song. Anticipating the fall of Cordova, it made itself independent in 1023. Its chief justice, Abul Qasim Muhammad, found a matmaker resembling Hisham II, hailed him as caliph, housed and guided him, and persuaded Valencia, Tortosa, even Cordova to recognize him. By this simple device, the subtle jurist founded the brief Abadid dynasty. When he died in 1042, his son Abad al-Mutadid succeeded him, ruled Seville with skill and cruelty for 27 years, and extended his power till half of Muslim Spain paid him tribute. His son al-Mutamid, from 1068 to 1091, at the age of 26, inherited his realm, but neither his ambition nor his cruelty. Al-Mutamid was the greatest poet of Muslim Spain. He preferred the company of poets and musicians to that of politicians and generals, and rewarded his able rivals in poetry with an envious hand. He thought it not too much to give a thousand ducats for an epigram. He liked Ibn Omar's poetry and made him vizier. He heard a girl slave, Rumaikia, improvise excellent verses. He bought her, married her, and loved her passionately till his death, while not neglecting the other beauties of his harem. Rumaikia filled the palace with her laughter and drew her lord into a spiral of gaiety. Theologians blamed her for her husband's coolness to religion and the near emptiness of the city's mosques. Nevertheless, Al-Mutamid could rule as well as love and sing. When Toledo attacked Cordova and Cordova asked his aid, he sent troops who saved the city from Toledo and made it subject to Seville. The poet king stood for a precarious generation at the head of a civilization as brilliant as Baghdad's under Harun, as Cordova's under Al-Mansur. 2. Civilization in Moorish Spain Never was Andalusia so mildly, justly, and wisely governed as by her Arab conquerors. It is the judgment of a great Christian Orientalist, whose enthusiasm may require some discounting of his praise. But after due deductions, his verdict stands. The emirs and caliphs of Spain were as cruel as Machiavelli thought necessary to the stability of a government. Sometimes they were barbarously and callously cruel, as when Mutadid grew flowers in the skulls of his dead foes, or as when the poetic Mutamid hacked to pieces the lifelong friend who had at last betrayed and insulted him. Against these stray instances, al-Makari gives a hundred examples of the justice, liberality, and refinement of the Umayyad rulers of Spain. They compare favorably with the Greek emperors of their time, and they were certainly an improvement upon the illiberal Visigothic regime that had preceded them. Their management of public affairs was the most competent in the Western world of that age. Laws were rational and humane, and were administered by a well-organized judiciary. 
For the most part, the conquered in their internal affairs were governed by their own laws and their own officials. Towns were well policed. Markets, weights, and measures were effectively supervised. A regular census recorded population and property. Taxation was reasonable compared with the imposts of Rome or Byzantium. The revenues of the Cordovan Caliphate under Abder Rahman III reached 12,045,000 gold denies, or $57,213,750, probably more than the United Government revenues of Latin Christendom. But these receipts were due not so much to high taxes as to well-governed and progressive agriculture, industry, and trade. The Arab conquest was a transient boon to the native peasantry. The overgrown estates of the Visigothic nobles were broken up, and the serfs became proprietors. But the forces that in these centuries were making for feudalism operated in Spain too, though better resisted than in France. The Arab leaders in their turn accumulated large tracts and farmed them with tenants verging on serfdom. Slaves were slightly better treated by the Moors than by their former owners, and the slaves of non-Moslems could free themselves merely by professing Islam. The Arabs, for the most part, left the actual work of agriculture to the conquered. However, they used the latest manuals of agronomy, and under their direction, agricultural science developed in Spain far in advance of Christian Europe. The leisurely oxen, hitherto universally used in Spain for plowing or draft, were largely replaced by the mule, the ass, and the horse. Stock breeding of Spanish with Arab strains produced the noble steed of the Arab horseman and the Spanish caballero. Muslim Spain brought from Asia and taught to Christian Europe the culture of rice, buckwheat, sugarcane, pomegranates, cotton, spinach, asparagus, silk, bananas, cherries, oranges, lemons, quinces, grapefruit, peaches, dates, figs, strawberries, ginger, myrrh. The cultivation of the vine was a major industry among the Moors whose religion forbade wine. Market gardens, olive groves, and fruit orchards made some areas of Spain, notably around Cordova, Granada, and Valencia, garden spots of the world. The island of Majorca, won by the Moors in the 8th century, became under their husbandry a paradise of fruits and flowers, dominated by the date palm that later gave its name to the capital. The mines of Spain enriched the Moors with gold, silver, tin, copper, iron, lead, alum, sulfur, mercury. Coral was gathered along Andalusia's shores, pearls were fished along the Catalonian coasts, rubies were mined at Baja and Malaga. Metallurgy was well developed. Murcia was famous for its iron and brass works, Toledo for its swords, Cordoba for shields. Handicraft industry flourished. Cordoba made Cordovan leather for the cordwainers, or cordobanes, of Europe. There were 13,000 weavers in Cordova alone. Moorish carpets, cushions, silk curtains, shawls, divans found eager buyers everywhere. According to al makari Ibn Firnas of Cordova in the 9th century invented spectacles, complex chronometers, and a flying machine. A merchant fleet of over a thousand ships carried the products of Spain to Africa and Asia and vessels from a hundred ports crowded the harbors of Barcelona, Almeria, Cartagena, Valencia, Malaga, Cadiz, and Seville. A regular postal service was maintained for the government. The official coinage of gold dinars, silver dirhams, and copper fowls preserved a relative stability in comparison with the currencies of contemporary Latin Christendom. But these Moorish coins, too, gradually deteriorated in weight, purity, and purchasing power. Economic exploitation proceeded here as elsewhere. Arabs who had extensive estates and merchants who squeezed producer and consumer alike absorbed the wealth of the land. For the most part, the rich lived in country villas and left the cities to a proletarian population of Berbers, renegades, or Christian converts to Mohammedanism, Mazarabs, or non-Muslims accepting Muslim ways and Arabic speech, and a sprinkling of palace eunuchs, Slav officers and guardsmen, and household slaves. The court of Ancalus, feeling themselves unable to end exploitation without discouraging enterprise, compromised by devoting a quarter of their land income to the relief of the poor. The desperate faith of the indigent gave a subtle power to the faqis, or theologians of the law. Innovations in creed or morals were so abhorred by the populace that heresy and speculation usually hid their heads in obscurity of place or speech. Philosophy was silenced or professed with most respectable conclusions. Apostasy from Islam was punishable with death. Cordovan caliphs themselves were often men of liberal views, but they suspected the Egyptian Fatimid caliphs of using wandering scholars as spies, and occasionally they joined the Faqis in persecuting independent thought. On the other hand, the Moorish authorities gave freedom of worship to all non-Muslim faiths. The Jews, harshly hounded by the Visigoths, had helped the Muslim conquest of Spain. They lived now, until the 12th century, in peace with the conquerors, developed wealth and learning, and sometimes rose to high place in the government. Christians faced greater obstacles to political preferment, but many succeeded nevertheless. 
Christian males, like all males, were subject to compulsory circumcision as a measure of national hygiene. Otherwise, they were ruled by their own Visigothic Roman law, administered by magistrates of their own choosing. In return for exemption from military service, free and able Christian males paid a land tax, normally 48 dirhems, or $24 per year for the rich, 24 for the middle classes, 12 for manual workers. Christians and Muslims intermarried freely. Now and then they joined in celebrating a Christian or Muslim holy day, or used the same building as church and mosque. Some Christians, conforming to the custom of the country, established harems, or practiced pederasty. Clerics and laymen from Christian Europe came in safety and freedom to Cordova, Toledo, or Seville as students, visitors, or travelers. One Christian complained of the results in terms that recall ancient Hebrew criticism of Hellenizing Jews. My fellow Christians delight in the poems and romances of the Arabs. They study the works of Mohammedan theologians and philosophers, not to refute them, but to acquire a correct and elegant Arabic style. Alas, the young Christians who are most conspicuous for their talent have no knowledge of any literature or language save the Arabic. They read and study with avidity Arabic books. They amass whole libraries of them at great cost. They everywhere sing the praises of Arabic lore. We may judge the attractiveness of Islam to Christians from a letter of 1311, which gives the Mohammedan population of Granada at that time as 200,000, of whom all but 500 were descendants of Christians converted to Islam. Christians frequently expressed their preference of Muslim to Christian rule. But there was another side to the picture, and it darkened with time. Though Christians were free, the church was not. Most of her landed property had been confiscated by a decree affecting all active resistors to the conquest. Many churches had been destroyed, and new ones were prohibited. The Muslim emirs inherited from the Visigoth kings the right to appoint and depose bishops, even to summon ecclesiastical councils. The emirs sold bishoprics to the highest bidder, though he might be a skeptic or a libertine. Christian priests were liable to abuse by Muslims in the streets. Muslim theologians commented freely on what seemed to them absurdities in Christian theology, but it was dangerous for Christians to reply in kind. Under such tense relations, a minor incident could lead to a major tragedy. A pretty girl of Cordova, known to us only as Flora, was the child of a mixed marriage. When her Mohammedan father died, she resolved to become a Christian. She fled from her brother's guardianship to a Christian home, was caught and beaten by him, persisted in apostasy, and was turned over to a Muslim court. The Qadi, who might have condemned her to death, ordered her flogged. She escaped again to a Christian home, and there met a young priest, Eulogius, who conceived for her a passionate spiritual attachment. While she hid in a convent, another priest, Perfectus, achieved martyrdom by telling some Muslims what he thought of Mohammed. They had promised not to betray him, but the vigor of his exposition so shocked them that they denounced him to the authorities. Perfectus might have saved himself by a retraction. Instead, he repeated to the judge his conviction that Mohammed was the servant of Satan. The judge remanded him to jail for some months, hoping for a change of mood. None came, and Perfectus was condemned to death. He marched to the scaffold, cursing the prophet as an impostor, an adulterer, a child of hell. The Muslims gloated over his decapitation. The Christians of Cordova buried him with pomp as a saint. This in 850. His death inflamed the theological hatred of both sides. A group of Christian zealots formed, led by Eulogius. They were determined to denounce Muhammad publicly and to accept martyrdom joyfully as a promise of paradise. Isaac, a Cordovan monk, went to the Qadi and professed a desire for conversion. But when the judge, well pleased, began to expound Mohammedanism, the monk interrupted him. Your prophet, he said, has lied and deceived you. May he be accursed, who has dragged so many wretches with him down to hell. The Qadi reproved him and asked if he had been drinking. The monk replied, I am in my right mind. Condemn me to death. The Qadi had him imprisoned, but asked permission of Abdel Rahman II to dismiss him as insane. The caliph, incensed by the splendor of Perfectus's funeral, ordered the monk to be executed. Two days later, Sancho, a Frank soldier of the palace guard, publicly denounced Mohammed. He was beheaded. On the following Sunday, six monks appeared before the Qadi, cursed Mohammed, and asked for not death only, but your sharpest tortures. They were beheaded. A priest, a deacon, and a monk followed their example. The zealots rejoiced, but many Christians, priests as well as laymen, condemned this lust for martyrdom. The sultan, they said to the zealots, allows us to exercise our religion and does not oppress us. Why then this fanatical zeal? A council of Christian bishops, summoned by Abdel Rahman, reproved the zealots and threatened action against them if they continued the agitation. Eulogius denounced the council as cowards. Meanwhile, Flora, her ardor raised by the zealot movement, left her convent and with another girl, Mary, went before the Qadi. They both assured him that Mohammed was an adulterer, an imposter, and a villain, and that Mohammedanism was an invention of the devil. The Qadi committed them to jail. The entreaties of their friends had inclined them to retract when Eulogius prevailed upon them to accept martyrdom. They were beheaded in 851, and Eulogius, much encouraged, called for new martyrs. 
priests, monks, and women marched to the court, denounced Muhammad, and obtained decapitation in 852. Eulogius himself earned martyrdom seven years later. After his death, the movement subsided. We hear of two cases of martyrdom between 859 and 983, and none thereafter under Muslim rule in Spain. Among the Muslims, religious ardor declined as wealth grew. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 11, Side 2. Among the Muslims, religious ardor declined as wealth grew. Despite the rigor of Muslim law, a wave of skepticism rose in the 11th century. Not only did the mild heresies of the Mutazilites finally enter Spain, a sect arose that declared all religions false and laughed at commandments, prayer, fasting, pilgrimage, and alms. Another group, under the name of Universal Religion, deprecated all dogmas and pled for a purely ethical religion. Some were agnostics. The doctrines of religion, they said, may or may not be true. We neither affirm nor deny them. We simply cannot tell. But our consciences will not allow us to accept doctrines whose truth cannot be demonstrated. The theologians fought back with vigor. When disaster came to Spanish Islam in the 11th century, they pointed to irreligion as its cause. And when for a time Islam prospered again, it was under rulers who once more rooted their power in religious belief and restricted the controversy between religion and philosophy to the privacy and amusement of their courts. Despite the philosophers, gleaming cupolas and gilded minarets marked the thousand cities or towns that made Moslem Spain in the 10th century the most urban country in Europe, probably in the world. Cordoba, under Al-Mansur, was a civilized city, second only to Baghdad and Constantinople. Here, says Al-Makari, were 2,077 houses, 60,300 palaces, 600 mosques, and 700 public baths. The statistics are slightly oriental. Visitors marveled at the wealth of the upper classes and at what seemed to them an extraordinary general prosperity. Every family could afford a donkey. Only beggars could not ride. Streets were paved, had raised sidewalks, and were lighted at night. One could travel for ten miles by the light of street lamps and along an uninterrupted series of buildings. Over the quiet Guadalquivir, Arab engineers threw a great stone bridge of seventeen arches, each fifty spans in width. One of the earliest undertakings of Abderrahman I was an aqueduct, that brought to Cordova an abundance of fresh water for homes, gardens, fountains, and baths. The city was famous for its pleasure gardens and promenades. Abderrahman I, lonesome for his boyhood haunts, planted in Cordova a great garden like that of the villa in which he had spent his boyhood near Damascus, and built in it his Palace of the Risafa. Later, Caliphs added other structures, to which Moslem fancy gave florid names. Palace of the Flowers, of the Lovers, of Contentment, of the Diadem. Cordova, like later Seville, had its Alcazar, or al Qasr, castle from the Latin castrum, a combination of palace and fortress. Muslim historians describe these mansions as equaling in luxury and beauty those of Nero's Rome, majestic portals, marble columns, mosaic floors, gilded ceilings, and such refined decoration as only Muslim art could give. The palaces of the royal family, the lords and magnates of land and trade, line for miles the banks of the stately stream. A concubine of Abderrahman III left him a large fortune. He proposed to spend it ransoming such of his soldiers as had been captured in war. Proud searchers claimed they could find none, whereupon the caliph's favorite wife, Zara, proposed that he build a suburb and palace to commemorate her name. Twenty-five years, from 936 to 961, 10,000 workmen and 1,500 beasts toiled to realize her dream. The royal palace of Alzara that rose three miles southwest of Cordova was lavishly designed and equipped. Twelve hundred marble columns sustained it. Its harem could accommodate six thousand women. Its hall of audience had ceiling and walls of marble and gold, eight doors inlaid with ebony, ivory, and precious stones, and a basin of quicksilver whose undulating surface reflected the dancing rays of the sun. Alzara became the residential center of an aristocracy renowned for the grace and polish of its manners, the refinement of its tastes, and the breadth of its intellectual interests. At the opposite end of the city, Al-Mansur constructed in 978 a rival palace, Al-Zahira, which also gathered about of the suburb of lords, servants, minstrels, poets, and courtesans. Both suburbs were burned to the ground in the Revolution of 1010. Normally, the people forgave the luxury of their princes if these would raise to Allah shrines, exceeding their palaces in splendor and scope. The Romans had built in Cordova a temple to Janus. The Christians had replaced it with a cathedral. Abderrahman I paid the Christians for the site, demolished the church, and replaced it with the Blue Mosque. 
In 1238, the Reconquista would turn the mosque into a cathedral. So the good, the true, and the beautiful fluctuate with the fortunes of war. The project became the consolation of Abderrahman's troubled years. He left his suburban for his city home to superintend the operations, and hoped that he might before his death lead the congregation in grateful prayer in this new and majestic mosque. He died in 788, two years after laying the foundation. His son, Al-Hishan, continued the work. Each caliph, for two centuries, added a part, till in Al-Mansur's time it covered an area 740 feet two by 472 feet. The exterior showed a battlemented wall of brick and stone with irregular towers, and a massive minaret that surpassed in size and beauty all the minarets of the time, so that it too was numbered among the innumerable wonders of the world. Nineteen portals, surmounted by horseshoe arches, elegantly carved with floral and geometrical decoration in stone, led into the court of ablutions, now the Patio de los Naranjos, or Court of Oranges. In this rectangle, paved with colored tiles, stood four fountains, each cut from a block of solid marble so large that seventy oxen had been needed to haul it from the quarry to the site. The mosque proper was a forest of twelve hundred ninety columns, dividing the interior into eleven naves and twenty-one aisles. From the column capitals sprang a variety of arches, some semicircular, some pointed, some in horseshoe form, most of them with voussoir or wedge stones, alternately red or white. The columns of jasper, porphyry, alabaster, or marble, snatched from the ruins of Roman or Visigothic Spain, gave by their number the impression of limitless and bewildering space. The wooden ceiling was carved into cartouches, bearing Quranic and other inscriptions. From it hung two hundred chandeliers holding seven thousand cups of scented oil, fed from reservoirs of oil in inverted Christian bells also suspended from the roof. Floor and walls were adorned with mosaics. Some of these were of enameled glass, baked in rich colors, and often containing silver or gold. After a thousand years of wear, these dados still sparkle like jewels in the cathedral walls. One section was marked off as a sanctuary. It was paved with silver and enameled tiles, guarded with ornate doors, decorated with mosaics, roofed with three domes, and marked off with a wooden screen of exquisite design. Within the sanctuary were built the mirab and minbar, upon which the artists lavished their maturest skill. The mirab itself was an heptagonal recess walled with gold, brilliantly ornamented with enameled mosaics, marble tracery, and gold inscriptions on a ground of crimson and blue, and crowned by a tier of slender columns and trefoil arches as lovely as anything in Gothic art. The pulpit was considered the finest of its kind. It consisted of 37,000 little panels of ivory and precious woods, ebony, citron, aloe, red and yellow sandal, all joined by gold or silver nails and inlaid with gems. On this minbar, in a jeweled box covered with gold-threaded crimson silk, rested a copy of the Koran written by the Caliph Otman and stained with his dying blood. To us who prefer to adorn our theaters with gilt and brass rather than clothe our cathedrals in jewelry and gold, the decoration of the blue mosque seems extravagant. The walls encrusted with the blood of exploited generations, the columns confusingly numerous, the horseshoe arch is structurally weak and aesthetically offensive as obesity on bow legs. Others, however, have judged differently. Al Makari, who lived from 1591 to 1632, thought this mosque unequaled in size or beauty of design or tasteful arrangement of its ornaments or boldness of execution. And even its diminished Christian form is ranked as, by universal consent, the most beautiful Moslem temple in the world. It was a common saying in Moorish Spain that when a musician dies at Cordoba and his instruments are to be sold, they are sent to Seville. When a rich man dies at Seville and his library is to be sold, it is sent to Cordoba. For Cordoba in the 10th century was the focus and summit of Spanish intellectual life, though Toledo, Granada, and Seville shared actively in the mental exhilaration of the time. Moslem historians picture the Moorish cities as beehives of poets, scholars, jurists, physicians, and scientists. al Makari fills 60 pages with their names. Primary schools were numerous, but charged tuition. Hakan II added 27 schools for the free instruction of the poor. Girls as well as boys went to school. Several Moorish ladies became prominent in literature or art. Higher education was provided by independent lecturers in the mosques. Their courses constituted the loosely organized University of Cordova, which in the 10th and 11th centuries was second in renown only to similar institutions in Cairo and Baghdad. Colleges were established also at Granada, Toledo, Seville, Mercia, Almeria, Valencia, Cadiz. The technique of papermaking was brought in from Baghdad, and books increased and multiplied. Moslem Spain had 70 libraries. Rich men displayed their Morocco bindings, and bibliophiles collected rare or beautifully illuminated books. 
The scholar Al-Hadran, at an auction in Cordoba, found himself persistently outbid for a book he desired, until the price offered far exceeded the value of the volume. The successful bidder explained that there was a vacant place in his library, into which this book would precisely fit. I was so vexed, adds Al-Hadran, that I could not help saying to him, he gets the nut who has no teeth. Scholars were held in awesome repute in Moslem Spain, and were consulted in simple faith that learning and wisdom are one. Theologians and grammarians could be had by the hundred, rhetoricians, philologists, lexicographers, anthologists, historians, biographers, were legion. Abu Muhammad Ali ibn Hazm, from 994 to 1064, besides serving as vizier to the last Umayyads, was a theologian and historian of great erudition. His book of religions and sects, discussing Judaism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity, and the principal varieties of Mohammedanism, is one of the world's earliest essays in comparative religion. If we wish to know what an educated Moslem thought of medieval Christianity, we need only read one of his paragraphs. Human superstition need never excite our astonishment. The most numerous and civilized nations are thralls to it. So great is the multitude of Christians that God alone can number them, and they can boast of sagacious princes and illustrious philosophers. Nevertheless, they believe that one is three and three are one, that one of the three is the Father, the other the Son, and the third the Spirit, that the Father is the Son and is not the Son, that a man is God and not God, that the Messiah has existed from all eternity and yet was created. A sect of theirs, the Monophysites, numbered by hundreds of thousands, believes that the Creator was scourged, buffeted, crucified, and that for three days the universe was without a ruler. Ibn Hazm, for his part, believed that every word of the Quran was literally true. Science and philosophy in Muslim Spain were largely frustrated by the fear that they would damage the people's faith. Maslama ibn Ahmad, who died in 1007 of Madrid and Cordoba, adapted the astronomic tables of Al-Khwarizmi to Spain. A work doubtfully attributed to him describes one of the many experiments by which alchemy was transmuted into chemistry, the production of mercuric oxide from mercury. Ibrahim al-Zarqali, who lived circa 1029 to 1087, of Toledo, made an international name by improving astronomical instruments. Copernicus quoted his treatise on the astrolabe. His astronomical observations were the best of his age, and enabled him to prove for the first time the motion of the solar apogee with reference to the stars. His Toledan tables of planetary movements were used throughout Europe. Abul Qasim al-Zarawi, who lived from 936 to 1013, physician to Abder Rahman III, was honored in Christendom as Abul Qasis. He stands at the top of Muslim surgeons. His medical encyclopedia, Al-Tasrif, included three books on surgery which, translated into Latin, became the standard text of surgery for many centuries. Cordoba was in this period the favorite resort of Europeans for surgical operations. Like every civilized city, it had its quota of quacks and money-mad physicians. One Harani announced a secret specific against intestinal troubles and sold it at 50 dinars, or $237.50, a file to moneyed fools. We forbear, says al Nakari, to mention the poets who flourished under Hishan the Second and Al Mansur, for they were as numerous as the sands of the ocean. Among them was the Princess Walada, who died in 1087. Her home at Cordova was a veritable salon of the French Enlightenment. Wits, scholars, and poets gathered round her. She made love to a score of them and wrote about her amours with a freedom that would have shocked Madame Recamier. Her friend Muga outdid her in beauty of person and licentiousness of verse. Almost everyone in Andalusia was a poet in those days, and exchanged improvised rhythms at any provocation. The caliphs joined in the sport, and there was seldom a Moorish prince who did not have at his court a poet not only honored but paid. This royal patronage did some injury as well as good. The poetry that has reached us from this age is too often artificial, flowery, lame with laborious similes, and clogged with petty conceits. The theme was love, carnal or platonic. In Spain, as in the East, the Moslem singers anticipated the methods, moods, and philosophy of the troubadours. From this dancing galaxy we take one star, Said ibn Judi, son of the prefect of Cordoba, an excellent warrior, a constant lover in the plural sense, a master of all the qualities that in Moslem judgment make a perfect gentleman, liberality, courage, skillful horsemanship, good looks, eloquence, poetic talent, strength, and the arts of fencing, wielding the spear, and bending the bow. He was never sure which he loved the more, love or war. Sensitive to the slightest touch of a woman, he suffered a series of infatuations, each of which had every promise of perpetuity. Like a good troubadour, he loved most ardently where he had seen least. His warmest ode was to Jehan, of whom he had seen only a lily hand. He was a candid Epicurean and felt that the burden of proof was always on the moralist. The sweetest morsel in life, he said, is when the wine cup goes around. 
when, after a quarrel, the lovers are reconciled, embrace, and are at peace. I traverse the circle of pleasures as a frenzied warhorse that has taken the bit in its teeth. I leave no desire unsatisfied. Steadfast when the angel of death hovers over my head in the day of battle, a pair of bright eyes can sway me as they will. His fellow warriors sometimes resented his seduction of their wives. One officer caught him in situ and killed him in 897. A more heroic end came to a greater poet, Al-Mutamid, in the of Seville. Like other kinglets of disintegrating Spain, he had for several years paid tribute to Alfonso VI of Castile as a bribe to Christian peace. But a bribe always leaves a balance to be paid on demand. With the sinews of war provided by his prey, Alfonso pounced upon Toledo in 1085, and Al-Mutamid perceived that Seville might be next. The city-states of Muslim Spain were now too weakened by class and internecine war to offer any adequate resistance. But across the Mediterranean there had arisen a new Muslim dynasty. It was called Amoravid, from the Marabout, or patron saint of northwestern Africa. Founded on religious fanaticism, it had turned almost every man into a soldier of Allah, and its armies had easily conquered all Morocco. At this juncture, the Amoravid king, Yusuf ibn Tashfin, a man of courage and cunning, received from the princes of Spain an invitation to rescue them from the Christian dragon of Castile. Yusuf transported his army across the strait, received reinforcements from Malaga, Granada, and Seville, and met the forces of Alfonso at Zalica, near Badajoz, in 1086. Alfonso sent a courtly message to Yusuf. Tomorrow, Friday, is your holy day, and Sunday is ours. I propose, therefore, that we join battle on Saturday. Yusuf agreed. Alfonso attacked on Friday. Al-Mutamid and Yusuf fought well. The Muslims celebrated their holy day with victorious slaughter, and Alfonso barely escaped with five hundred men. Yusuf astonished Spain by returning bootyless to Africa. Four years later he came back. Al-Mutamid had urged him to destroy the power of Alfonso, who was rearming for a fresh assault. Yusuf fought the Christians indecisively and assumed sovereign power over Muslim Spain. The poor welcomed him, always preferring new masters to old. The intellectual classes opposed him as representing religious reaction. The theologians embraced him. He took Granada without a blow and delighted the people by abolishing all taxes not prescribed in the Quran, this in 1090. Al-Mutamid and other emirs joined in a league against him and formed a holy alliance with Alfonso. Yusuf besieged Cordoba. Its populace delivered it to him. He surrounded Seville. Al-Mutamid fought heroically, saw his son killed, broke down in grief, and surrendered. By 1091, all Andalusia except Saragossa was in Yusuf's hands, and Muslim Spain, ruled from Morocco, was again a province of Africa. Al-Mutamid was sent as a prisoner to Tangier. While there, he received from a local poet, Husri, some verses praising him and asking for a gift. The ruined emir had now only thirty-five ducats, or eighty-seven dollars, in all the world. He sent them to Husri with apologies for the smallness of the gift. Al-Mutamid was transferred to Agmat, near Morocco, and lived there for some time in chains, always in destitution, still writing poetry till his death in 1095. One of his poems might have served as his epitaph. Woo not the world too rashly, for behold, beneath the painted silk embroidering, it is a faithless and inconstant thing. Listen to me, Mutamid, growing old. And we, that dreamed youth's blade would never rust, hoped wells from the mirage, roses from the sand, the riddle of the world shall understand, and put on wisdom with the robe of dust. Chapter 14 The Grandeur and Decline of Islam 1058 to 1258. 1. The Islamic East, 1058 to 1250. When Tugrilberg died in 1063, he was succeeded as Seljuk Sultan by his nephew, Al-Farslan, then twenty-six years of age. A well-disposed Muslim historian describes him as tall, with mustaches so long that he used to tie up their ends when he wished to shoot, and never did his arrows miss the mark. He wore so lofty a turban that men will want to say that from its top to the end of his mustaches was a distance of two yards. He was a strong and just ruler, generally magnanimous, swift to punish tyranny or extortion among his officials, and extremely charitable to the poor. He was also devoted to the study of history, listening with great pleasure and interest to chronicles of former kings and to works that threw light on their characters, institutions, and methods of administration. Despite these scholarly inclinations, Al-Farslan lived up to his name, the lion-hearted hero, by conquering Herat, Armenia, Georgia, and Syria. The Greek emperor, Romanus IV, collected 100,000 buried and ill-disciplined troops to meet Arslan's 15,000 experienced warriors. The Seljuk leader offered a reasonable peace. Romanus rejected it scornfully, gave battle at Manzikert in Armenia in 1071, fought bravely amid his cowardly troops, was defeated and captured, and was led before the sultan. 
What would have been your behavior, asked Aslan, had fortune smiled upon your arms? I would have inflicted upon thy body many a stripe, answered Romanus. Aslan treated him with all courtesy, released him on the promise of a royal ransom, and dismissed him with rich gifts. A year later, Aslan died by an assassin's knife. His son, Malik Shah, from 1072 to 1092, was the greatest of the Seljuk sultans. While his general, Suleiman, completed the conquest of Asia Minor, he himself took Transoxiana as far as Bukhara and Kashgar. His able and devoted prime minister, Nizam al-Mulk, brought to this and Aslan's reign much of the brilliance and prosperity that the Barmakids had given to Baghdad in the days of Harun al-Rashid. For thirty years, Nizam organized and controlled administration, policy, and finance, encouraged industry and trade, improved roads, bridges, and inns, and made them safe for all wayfarers. He was a generous friend to artists, poets, scientists, raised splendid buildings in Baghdad, founded and endowed a famous college there, and directed and financed the erection of the Great Dome Chamber in the Friday Mosque at Isfahan. It was apparently at his suggestion that Malik Shah summoned Omar Khayyam and other astronomers to reform the Persian calendar. An old tale tells how Nizam, Omar, and Hassan ibn al-Sabah, when schoolmates, vowed to share with one another any later good fortune. Like so many good stories, it is probably a legend, for Nizam was born in 1017, while both Omar and Hassan died in 1123 and 1124. There is no indication that either of these was a centenarian. At the age of 75, Nizam wrote down his philosophy of government in one of the major works of Persian prose, the Siyasat Nama, or Book of the Art of Rule. He strongly recommended religious orthodoxy and people and king, considered no government secure without a religious base, and deduced from religion the divine right and authority of the sultan. At the same time, he did not spare his divine monarch some human advice on the duties of a sovereign. A ruler must avoid excess in wine and levity, must detect and punish official corruption or tyranny, and must twice a week hold public audiences at which even the lowliest subject may present petitions or grievances. Nizam was humane but intolerant. He mourned that Christians, Jews, and Shiites were employed by the government, and he denounced the Ismailite sect with special violence as threatening the unity of the state. In 1092, an Ismaili devotee approached him in the guise of a suppliant and stabbed him to death. The assassin was a member of the strangest sect in history. About 1090, an Ismaili leader, the same Hassan ibn al-Sabah, whom legend allied with Omar and Nizam, seized the mountain fortress of Alamut, or Eagle's Nest, in northern Persia, and from that stronghold, 10,000 feet above the sea, waged a campaign of terror and murder against the opponents and persecutors of the Ismaili faith. Nizam's book charged the group with being lineally descended from the communistic Mazdakites of Sasanian Persia. It was a secret fraternity with diverse grades of initiation, and a grand master whom the crusaders called the Old Man of the Mountain. The lowest degree of the order included the Fidais, who were required to obey without hesitation or scruple any of their leader's commands. According to Marco Polo, who passed by Alamut in 1271, the master had arranged behind the fortress a garden peopled like the Mohammedan paradise with ladies and damsels who dallied with the men to their heart's content. The candidates for admission to the order were given hashish to drink. When stupefied by it, they were brought into the garden, and on recovering their senses they were told that they were in paradise. After four or five days of wine, women, and good food, they were again drugged with hashish and were carried from the garden. Waking, they asked for the lost paradise and were told that they would be readmitted to it and forever if they should obey the master faithfully or be slain in his service. The youths who complied were called hashashin, drinkers of hashish, whence the word assassin. Hassan ruled Alamut for thirty-five years and made it a center of assassination, education, and art. The organization long survived him. It seized other strongholds, fought the crusaders, and, it is alleged, killed Conrad of Montferrat at the behest of Richard Coeur de Lyon. In 1256, the Mongols under Hulagu captured Alamut and other assassin centers. Thereafter, the members of the order were hunted and slain as nihilist enemies of society. Nevertheless, it continued as a religious sect and became in time peaceable and respectable. Its zealous adherents in India, Persia, Syria, and Africa acknowledge the Aga Khan as their head and yearly pay him a tenth of their revenues. Malik Shah died a month after his vizier. His sons fought a war of succession, and in the ensuing chaos, no united Muslim resistance was offered to the Crusades. Sultan Sinjar at Baghdad restored the Seljuk splendor for a reign, from 1117 to 1157, and literature prospered under his patronage. But after his death, the Seljuk realm disintegrated into independent principalities of petty dynasties and warring kings. At Mosul, one of Malik Shah's Kurd slaves, Zangi, founded in 1127 the Atabeg, father of the Prince dynasty, which fought the Crusaders zealously and extended its rule over Mesopotamia. Zangi's son, Nuruddin Mahmud, from 1146 to 1173, 
conquered Syria, made Damascus his capital, ruled with justice and diligence, and plucked Egypt from the dying Fatimids. The same decadence that had subjected the Abbasids to Bawayid and Seljuk domination had, two centuries later, debased the caliphs of Cairo to the role of Shia priests in a state actually ruled by their soldier viziers. Immersed in a numerous harem, hedged in by eunuchs and slaves, emasculated by comfort and concubines, the Fatimids allowed their prime ministers to take the title of kings and to dispense at will the offices and perquisites of government. In 1164, two candidates competed for this royal vizierate. One of them, Shawar, asked the help of Nuruddin, who sent him a small force under Shirku. Shirku slew Shawar and made himself vizier. When Shirku died in 1169, he was succeeded by his nephew, Al-Malik al-Nasir Salahuddin Yusuf ibn Ayyub, that is, the king, the defender, the honor of the faith, Joseph, son of Job, known to us as Saladin. He was born in 1138 at Tikrit, on the upper Tigris of Kurd, that is, non-Semitic stock. His father Ayyub rose to be governor first of Baalbek under Zangi, then of Damascus under Nuruddin. Saladin, brought up in those cities and courts, learned well the arts of statesmanship and war. But with these he combined orthodox piety, a zealous study of theology, and an almost ascetic simplicity of life. The Moslems number him among their greatest saints. His chief garment was a coarse woolen cloth, his only drink was water, and his sexual temperance, after some early indulgence, aroused all but the emulation of his contemporaries. Sent with Shirku to Egypt, he gave so good an account of himself as a soldier that he was put in command over Alexandria, which he successfully defended against the Franks in 1167. Made vizier at thirty, he devoted himself to restoring orthodox Mohammedanism in Egypt. In 1171 he had the name of the Shia Fatimid Caliph replaced in the public prayers by that of the Abbasid Caliph, now merely the orthodox pontiff of Baghdad. Al-Adib, last of the Fatimids, was at the time ill in his palace and did not notice this ecclesiastical revolution. Saladin kept him fully uninformed, so that the wastrel might die in peace. This the caliph did presently, and as no successor was appointed, the Fatimid dynasty came to a quiet end. Saladin made himself governor instead of vizier, and acknowledged Nuruddin as his sovereign. When he entered the caliphal palace at Cairo, he found there twelve thousand occupants, all women except the male relatives of the caliph, and such a wealth in jewelry furniture, ivory, porcelain, glass, and other objects of art, as could hardly be rivaled by any other dignitary of that era. Saladin kept nothing of all this for himself, gave the palace to his captains, and continued to live in the vizier's chambers, a life of fortunate simplicity. On Nuruddin's death, in 1173, the provincial governors refused to acknowledge his eleven-year-old son as king, and Syria verged again on chaos. Alleging fear that the crusaders would take the country, Saladin left Egypt with a force of seven hundred horsemen, and in swift campaigns made himself master of Syria. Returning to Egypt, he took the title of king, and thereby inaugurated the Ayyubid dynasty, this in 1175. Six years later he set out again, made Damascus his capital, and conquered Mesopotamia. There, as at Cairo, he continued to display the stern orthodoxy of his faith. He built several mosques, hospitals, monasteries, and madrasas, or theological schools. He encouraged architecture, discountenanced secular science, and shared Plato's disdain for poetry. All wrongs that came to his knowledge were speedily redressed, and taxes were lowered at the same time that public works were extended and the functions of government were carried on with efficiency and zeal. Islam gloried in the integrity and justice of his rule, and Christendom acknowledged in him an infidel gentleman. We shall not detail the medley of local dynasties that divided eastern Islam after his death in 1193. His sons lacked his ability, and the Ayyubid rule in Syria ended in three generations, in 1260. In Egypt it flourished till 1250 and reached its zenith under the enlightened Malik al-Kamil, who ruled from 1218 to 1238, friend of Frederick II. In Asia Minor the Seljuks established, from 1077 to 1327, the Sultanate of Rum, or Rome, and for a time made Konya, St. Paul's Iconium, the center of a lettered civilization. Asia Minor, which had been half Greek since Homer, was now de-Hellenized and became as Turkish as Turkestan. There, today, Turkey holds its precarious seat in a once Hittite capital. An independent tribe of Turks ruled Khwarezm from 1077 to 1231 and extended its power from the Urals to the Persian Gulf. It was in this condition of political atomism that Genghis Khan found Asiatic Islam. Yet even in these declining years, Islam led the world in poetry, science, and philosophy and rivaled the Hohenstaufens in government. The Seljuk sultans, Tugril Beg, Alparslan, Malik Shah, Sinjar, 
were among the ablest monarchs of the Middle Ages. Nizam al-Mulk ranks with the greatest statesmen. Nuruddin, Saladin, and Al-Kamil were the equals of Richard I, Louis IX, and Frederick II. All these Muslim rulers, and even the minor kings, continued the Abbasid support of literature and art. At their courts we shall find poets like Omar, Nizami, Sadi, and Jalal Uddin Rumi. And though philosophy faded out under their cautious orthodoxy, architecture flourished more splendidly than before. The Seljuks and Saladin persecuted Muslim heresy, but they were so lenient to Christians and Jews that Byzantine historians told of Christian communities inviting Seljuk rulers to come and oust oppressive Byzantine governors. Under the leadership of the Seljuks and the Ubids, Western Asia again prospered in body and mind. Damascus, Aleppo, Mosul, Baghdad, Isfahan, Rai, Herat, Amada, Nishapur, and Merv were in this period among the best adorned and most cultured cities in the white man's world. It was a brilliant decay. 2. The Islamic West, 1086 to 1300. In 1249, Al-Sali, last Egyptian sultan of the Ayyubid line, passed away. His widow and former slave, Sajar al-Dur, connived at the murder of her stepson and proclaimed herself queen. To save their masculine honor, the Muslim leaders of Cairo chose another former slave, Ibak, as her associate. She married him, but continued to rule, and when he attempted the Declaration of Independence, she had him murdered in his bath in 1257. She herself was presently battered to death with wooden shoes by Ibak's women slaves. Ibak had lived long enough to found the Mamluk dynasty. Mamluk meant owned, and was applied to white slaves, usually strong and fearless Turks or Mongols employed as palace guards by the Ayyubid sultans. As in Rome and Baghdad, so in Cairo, the guards became the kings. For 267 years, from 1250 to 1517, the Mamluks ruled Egypt, and sometimes Syria, from 1271 to 1516. They incarnadined their capital with assassinations and beautified it with art. Their courage saved Syria and Egypt, even Europe, when they routed the Mongols at Ein Jalut in 1260. They received less wide acclaim for saving Palestine from the Franks and driving the last Christian warrior from Asia. The greatest and least scrupulous of the Mamluk rulers was Al-Malik Baybars, from 1260 to 1277. Born a Turkish slave, his brave resourcefulness raised him to high command in the Egyptian army. It was he who defeated Louis IX at Mansoura in 1250, and ten years later he fought with fierce skill under the Sultan Kutuz at Ein Jalut. He murdered Kutuz on the way back to Cairo, made himself Sultan, and accepted with winning grace the triumph that the city had prepared for his victorious victim. He renewed repeatedly the war against the Crusaders, always with success. And for these holy campaigns, Muslim tradition honors him next to Harun and Saladin. In peace, says a contemporary Christian chronicler, he was sober, chaste, just to his people, even kind to his Christian subjects. He organized the government of Egypt so well that no incompetence among his successors availed to unseat the Mamluks till their overthrow by the Ottoman Turks in 1517. He gave Egypt a strong army and navy, cleared its harbors, roads, and canals, and built the mosque that bears his name. Another Turkish slave deposed Baybar's son and became Sultan al-Mansur Saif al-Din Kalaun from 1279 to 1290. History remembers him chiefly for the great hospital that he built at Cairo and which he endowed with an annuity of a million dirhams. His son Nasir, from 1293 to 1340, was thrice enthroned but only twice deposed, built aqueducts, public baths, schools, monasteries, and thirty mosques, dug with the forced labor of a hundred thousand men a canal connecting Alexandria with the Nile, and exemplified Mamluk ways by slaughtering twenty thousand animals for the marriage feast of his son. When Nasir traveled through the desert, forty camels bore on their backs a garden of rich earth to provide him with fresh vegetables every day. He depleted the treasury and condemned his successors to a slow decline of the Mamluk power. These sultans do not impress us as favorably as the Seljuks or Ayyubids. They undertook great public works, but most of these were accomplished by peasants and proletaires, exploited to the limit of human tolerance, and for a government completely irresponsible to either the nation or an aristocracy. Assassination was the only known form of recall. At the same time, these brutal rulers had good taste and a large spirit in literature and art. The Mamluk period is the most brilliant in the history of medieval Egyptian architecture. Cairo is now, from 1250 to 1300, the richest city west of the Indus. Markets teeming with all the necessaries and many of the superfluities of life, the great slave mart where one could buy and sell men and maidens, little shops nestling in the walls and crowded with goods of flexible price, alleys crawling with men and beasts, noisy with peddlers and carts, deliberately narrow for shade and crooked for defense, homes hidden behind stern facades, rooms dark and cool amid the glare and heat and bustle of the streets, 
and breathing from an inner court or garden close. Interiors lushly furnished with hangings, carpets, embroideries, and works of art. Men chewing hashish to produce a dreamy intoxication. Women gossiping in the zanana or furtively flirting in a window bay. Music strummed from a thousand lutes and weird concerts in the citadel. Public parks redolent with flowers and picnicking. Canals and the great river dotted with cargo barges, passenger vessels, and pleasure boats. This was the Cairo of medieval Islam. One of its poets sang, Beside that garden flowed the placid Nile. Oft have I steered my dahabiyah there. Oft have I landed to repose a while and bask and revel in the sunny smile of her whose presence made the place so fair. Meanwhile, in North Africa, a succession of dynasties had their day. Zyrids from 972 to 1148 and Hafsids from 1228 to 1534 ruled Tunisia. Hamadids from 1007 to 1152 governed Algeria. Almoravids from 1056 to 1147 and Almohads from 1130 to 1269, held sway in Morocco. In Spain, the victorious Almoravids, once the frugal warriors of Africa, rapidly learned the luxurious ways of the Cordovan and civilian princes, whom they had replaced. The discipline of war gave way to the blandishments of peace. Courage yielded to money as the standard of excellence and the goal of desire. Women won by their grace and charms, a power rivaled only by theologians promising like joys in paradise. Officials became corrupt, and administration, which had been competent under Yusuf ibn Tashfin from 1090 to 1106, was already debased under Ali, his son, from 1106 to 1143. As governmental negligence grew, brigandage spread. Roads became unsafe. Commerce languished. Wealth declined. The kings of Catholic Spain seized their opportunity and raided Cordova, Seville, and other cities of Moorish Spain. Again, the Moslems turned to Africa for deliverance. There, in 1121, a religious revolution had raised a new sect to power and violence. Abdullah ibn Tumart denounced both the anthropomorphism of the orthodox and the rationalism of the philosophers. He demanded a return to simplicity of life and creed, and ended by proclaiming himself the Mahdi or Messiah promised in the Shia faith. The barbarous tribes of the Atlas Range flocked to him, organized themselves under the name of Almohads or Unitarians, overthrew the Almoravid rulers in Morocco, and found it an easy matter to do the like in Spain. Under the Almohad emirs, Abd al-Mumin from 1145 to 1163, and Abu Yaqub Yusuf from 1163 to 1184, order and prosperity returned to Andalusia and Morocco. Literature and learning once more raised their heads, and philosophers were protected in the quiet understanding that they would make their works unintelligible. But Abu Yusuf Yaqub, from 1184 to 1199, yielded to the theologians, forsook philosophy, and ordered all philosophical works to be burned. His son, Muhammad al-Nasir, from 1199 to 1214, cared for neither philosophy nor religion. He neglected government, specialized in pleasure, and was overwhelmingly defeated by the united armies of Christian Spain at Las Navas de Tolosa in 1212. Almohad Spain broke into small and independent states, which were conquered by the Christians one by one, Cordova in 1236, Valencia in 1238, Seville in 1248. The harassed Moors retired to Granada, where the Sierra Nevada or Snowy Ridge provided some defense, and well-rivered fields flowered into vineyards, olive orchards, and orange groves. A succession of prudent rulers sustained Granada and its dependencies, Jerez, Jaén, Almeria, and Malaga, against repeated Christian assaults. Commerce and industry revived, art flourished, the people gained renown for their gay dress and joyous fates, and the little kingdom survived till 1492 as the last European foothold of a culture that had made Andalusia for many centuries an honor to mankind. 11. Glimpses of Islamic Art, 1058-1250 It was in this age of Berber domination that Muslim Spain raised the Alhambra at Granada and the Alcazar and Giralda at Seville. This book is continued on Cassette 12, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4. The Age of Faith, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 12, Side 1. It was in this age of Berber domination that Muslim Spain raised the Alhambra at Granada and the Alcazar and Giralda at Seville. The new architectural style is often called Morisco, as having entered from Morocco, but its elements came from Syria and Persia, and mark as well the Taj Mahal in India. So wide and rich was the realm of Muslim art. It was a feminine style, aiming no longer at impressive strength as in the mosques of Damascus, Cordova, and Cairo, but at a delicate beauty in which all skill seemed absorbed in decoration and the sculptor engulfed the architect. The Almohads were enthusiastic builders. 
First, they built for defense and surrounded their major cities with mighty walls and towers, like the Torre del Oro, or Tower of Gold, that guarded the Guadalquivir at Seville. The Alcazar there was a union of fortress and palace, and showed a plain, blunt front to the world. Designed by the Toledan architect Jalubi for Abu Yaqub Yusuf in 1181, it became, after 1248, the favorite domicile of the Christian kings. It was modified, repaired, restored, or enlarged by Pedro I in 1353, Charles V in 1526, and Isabella in 1833. It is now predominantly Christian in origin, but predominantly Moorish, or Christian Moorish, or Mudajar, in workmanship and style. The same Abu Yaqub Yusuf, who began the Alcazar, built in 1171 the Great Mosque of Seville, of which nothing remains. In 1196, the architect Jabir raised the magnificent minaret of the mosque, known to us as the Hiralda. The conquering Christians transformed the mosque into a church in 1235. In 1401, this was torn down, and on its site, partly with its materials, was erected the vast cathedral of Seville. Of the Giralda, the lowest 230 feet are of the original structure. The remaining 82 are a Christian supplement from 1568, completely harmonious with the Moorish base. The upper two-thirds are richly ornamented with arcaded balconies and lace-like trellises of stucco and stone. At the top is a powerful bronze figure of faith from 1568, which hardly symbolizes the ever-religious mood of Spain by turning with the winds, hence the Spanish name Giralda, that which turns. Towers almost as beautiful were raised by the Moors at Marrakesh in 1069 and Rabat in 1197. At Granada in 1248, Muhammad ibn al-Akhmar, from 1232 to 1273, ordered the erection of Spain's most famous edifice, the Alhambra, that is, the Red, the chosen site was a mountain crag bounded by deep ravines and looking down upon two rivers, the Daro and the Hinil. The emir found there a fortress, the Alcazaba, dating from the ninth century. He added to it, built the great outer walls of the Alhambra and the earlier of its palaces, and left everywhere his modest motto, There is no conqueror but Allah. The immense structure has been repeatedly extended and repaired by Christians as well as Moors. Charles V added his own palace in square Renaissance style, solemn, incongruous, and incomplete. Following the principles of military architecture as developed in Eastern Islam, the unknown architect designed the enclosure first as a fortress capable of holding 40,000 men. The more luxurious taste of the next two centuries gradually transformed this fortress into a congeries of halls and palaces, nearly all distinguished by unsurpassed delicacy of floral or geometrical decoration, carved or stamped in colored stucco, brick, or stone. In the court of the myrtles, a pool reflects the foliage and the fretted portico. Behind it rises the battlemented Tower of Comares, where the besieged thought to find a last and impregnable redoubt. Within the tower is the ornate hall of the ambassadors. Here the emirs of Granada sat enthroned, while foreign emissaries marveled at the art and wealth of the tiny kingdom. Here Charles V, looking out from a balcony window upon the gardens, groves, and stream below, mused, How ill-fated the man who lost all this! In the main courtyard, the Patio de los Leones, a dozen ungainly marble lions guard a majestic alabaster fountain. The slender columns and flowered capitals of the surrounding arcade, the stalactite archivolts, the Kufic lettering, the time-subdued tints of the filigree arabesques, make this the masterpiece of the Morisco style. Perhaps in their enthusiasm and their luxury, the Moors here press their art beyond elegance to excess. Where all is ornament, the eye and soul grow weary even of beauty and skill. This delicacy of decoration leaves a sense of frailty and sacrifices that impression of secure strength which architecture should convey. And yet nearly all this frosting has survived a dozen earthquakes. The ceiling of the Hall of the Ambassadors fell, but the rest remained. In sum, this picturesque ensemble of gardens, palaces, fountains, and balconies suggests both the climax and the decay of Moorish art in Spain. A wealth gone to extravagance, a conquering energy relaxed into a flair for ease, a taste for beauty that has subsided from power and grandeur to elegance and grace. In the 12th century, Moorish art flowed back from Spain into North Africa, and Marrakesh, Fez, Tlemcen, Tunis, Safax, 
and Tripoli reached the apogee of their splendor with handsome palaces, dazzling mosques, and labyrinth and slums. In Egypt and the East, a new virility was brought into Islamic art by the Seljuks, the Ayyubids, and the Mamluks. Southeast of Cairo, Saladin and his successors, using the forced labor of captured crusaders, raised the immense citadel, probably an imitation of the castles built by the Franks in Syria. At Aleppo, the Ayyubids reared the great mosque and citadel, and at Damascus, the mausoleum of Saladin. Meanwhile, an architectural revolution transformed the old courtyard style of mosque into the madrasa or collegiate mosque throughout eastern Islam. As mosques increased in number, it was no longer necessary to design them with a large central court to hold a numerous congregation, and the rising demand for schools required new educational facilities. From the mosque proper, now almost always crowned with a dominating dome, four wings or transepts spread, each with its own minarets, a richly decorated portal, and a spacious lecture hall. Normally, each of the four orthodox schools of theology and law had its own wing. As an honest sultan said, it was desirable to support all four schools so that at least one would in any case be found to justify the actions of the government. This revolution in design was continued by the Mamluks in mosques and tombs firmly built in stone, guarded with massive doors of damascened bronze, lighted by windows of stained glass, with brilliant mosaics, carvings in colored stucco, and such enduring tiles as only Islam knew how to make. Of Seljuk architectural monuments, not one in a hundred has survived. In Armenia, the Mosque of Ani, at Konya, the magnificent portal of the Mosque of Diwariji, the immense Mosque of Aludin, the cavernous porch and embroidery-like facade of the Sirjeli Madrasa, in Mesopotamia, the great Mosque of Mosul, and the Mosque of Mustansir at Baghdad, in Persia, the Tower of Tugril Beg at Rai, the Tomb of Sinjar at Merv, the dazzling Mirab of the Alavian Mosque at Hamadan, the ribbed vault and unique squinches of the Friday Mosque at Kasvin, and there, too, the great arches and Mirab of the Hyderia Mosque. These are but a few of the structures that remain to prove the skill of Seljuk architects and the taste of Seljuk kings. But more beautiful than any of these, rivaled in Persia only by the later tomb of Imam Riza at Mashhad, is the masterpiece of the Seljuk age, the Masjidi Jami, or Friday Mosque of Isfahan. Like Chartres or Notre Dame, it bears the labor and stamp of many centuries. Begun in 1088, it was several times restored or enlarged and reached its present form only in 1612. But the larger of the great brick domes carries the inscription of Nizam al muk and the date 1088, the porch and the sanctuary portals, 180 feet high, are adorned with mosaic faience hardly rivaled in all the history of that art. The inner halls are roofed with ribbed vaults, complex squinches, and pointed arches springing from massive piers. The mirab from 1310 has a stucco relief of vine and lotus foliage and Kufic lettering unsurpassed in Islam. Such monuments laugh out of court the notion that the Turks were barbarians. Just as the Seljuk rulers and viziers were among the most capable statesmen in history, so the Seljuk architects were among the most competent and courageous builders of an age of faith distinguished by massive and audacious designs. The Persian flair for ornament was checked by the heroic mold of the Seljuk style, and the union of the two moods brought an architectural outburst in Asia Minor, Iraq and Iran, strangely contemporary with the Gothic flowering in France. Instead of hiding the mosque in a corner of a court, as the Arabs had done, the Seljuks gave it a bold and brilliant façade, raised its height, and led it up to a circular or conical dome that brought all the edifice into unity. The pointed arch, the vault, and the dome were now perfectly combined. All the arts reached their Moslem zenith in this strange age of grandeur and decay. Pottery seemed to the Persians an indispensable amenity of life, and seldom has the ceramic art reached so heterogeneous an excellence. The techniques of luster decoration, of monochrome or polychrome painting over or under glaze, of enamel, tile, faience, and glass, now perfected their Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Sasanian, and Syrian heritage. Chinese influence entered, especially in the painting of figures, but it did not dominate the Persian style. Porcelain was imported from China, but the scarcity of kaolin in the Near and Middle East discouraged the Muslim manufacture of this translucent ware. Nevertheless, during the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, Persian pottery remained unrivaled, superior in variety of forms, elegance of proportions, 
brilliance of decoration, grace and delicacy of line. In general, the minor arts in Islam hardly deserved so slighting a name. Aleppo and Damascus in this period produced frail marvels of glass with enameled designs, and Cairo made for mosques and palaces enameled glass lamps, which are among the prizes of art collectors today. The Fatimid treasury dispersed by Saladin contained thousands of crystal or sardonyx vases whose artistry seems beyond our skill today. The old Assyrian art of metalwork reached now an unprecedented height in Syria and Egypt, whence it passed to Venice in the 15th century. Copper, bronze, brass, silver, gold were cast or beaten into utensils, weapons, arms, lamps, ewers, basins, bowls, trays, mirrors, astronomical instruments, flower vases, chandeliers, pen boxes, inkstands, braziers, perfume burners, animal figures, Koran cases, andirons, keys, scissors, delicately engraved and in many instances inlaid with precious metals or stones. Brass tabletops were incised with superabundant designs, and magnificent metal grills were made for sanctuaries, doors, or tombs. A silver salver engraved with ibexes, geese, and the name of Alparslan, and dated 1066, now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, has been judged the outstanding silver piece of the Islamic period of Persian art, and the most important single object surviving from Seljuk times. Sculpture remained a dependent art, confined to reliefs and carvings of stone or stucco, to ornamental scripts and arabesques. A reckless ruler might have a statue made of himself or his wife or a singing girl, but such figures were secret sins, rarely exposed to public gaze. Wood carving, however, flourished. Doors, pulpits, mirabs, lecterns, screens, ceilings, tables, lattice windows, cabinets, boxes, combs, were cut in lace-like designs or were laboriously rounded by cross-legged turners revolving their lathes with a bow. A still more incredible patience produced silks, satins, brocades, embroideries, gold-woven velvets, hangings, tents, and rugs of such delicate weave or fascinating design as set the world wonderingly envious. Marco Polo, visiting Asia Minor about 1270, noted there the most beautiful rugs in the world. John Singer Sargent thought a certain Persian rug worth all the pictures ever painted. Yet expert opinion judges extant Persian carpets to be imperfect examples of an art in which Persia has for centuries led the world. Only tattered fragments remain of Iranian rugs from the Seljuk age, but we may surmise their excellence from their representation in the miniatures of the Mongol period. Painting in Islam was a major art in miniatures, and a never less minor art in murals and portraiture. The Fatimid Caliph Amir, from 1101 to 1130, engaged artists to paint in his rooms at Cairo the portraits of contemporary poets. Apparently, the old prohibition of graven images was weakening. Seljuk painting reached its height in Transoxiana, where Sunnite prejudices against representation was diluted by distance, and Turkish manuscripts picture their heroes abundantly. No certainly Seljuk miniature has reached us, but the heyday of the art in the ensuing Mongol period of Eastern Islam leaves little doubt of its flourishing in Seljuk times. Subtle minds and hands may made ever lovelier Korans for Seljuk, Ayyubid or Mamluk mosques, monasteries, dignitaries, and schools, and engraved upon the leather or lacquer bindings designs as delicate as a spider's web. Rich men spent small fortunes in engaging artists to make the most beautiful books ever known. A corps of papermakers, calligraphers, painters, and bookbinders in some cases worked for seventeen years on one volume. Paper had to be of the best. Brushes were put together, we are told, from the white neck hairs of kittens not more than two years old. Blue ink was sometimes made from powdered lapis lazuli and could be worth its weight in gold. And liquid gold was not thought too pre precious for some lines or letters of design or text. Imagination, said a Persian poet, cannot grasp the joy that reason draws from a fine-drawn line. 4. The Age of Omar Khayyam, 1038-1122 The artists of this age were apparently equaled in number by the poets and savants. Cairo, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Baalbek, Aleppo, Damascus, Mosul, Emesa, Tus, Nishapur, and many other cities boasted colleges. Baghdad alone had thirty in 1064. A year later, Nizam al-Muk added another, the Nizamiya. 
In 1234, the Caliph Mustansir founded still another, which in size, architecture, and equipment surpassed all the rest. One traveler called it the most beautiful building in the city. It contained four distinct law schools in which qualified students received free tuition, food, and medical care, and a monthly gold dinar for other expenses. It contained a hospital, a bathhouse, and a library freely open to students and staff. Women probably attended college in some cases, for we hear of a shaika, a lady professor whose lectures, like Aspasia's or Hypatia's, drew large audiences, circa 1178. Libraries were now richer and more numerous than ever in Islam. Moslem Spain alone had 70 public libraries. Grammarians, lexicographers, encyclopedists, and historians continued to flourish. Collective biography was a Moslem hobby and fort. Ibn al-Kifti, who died in 1248, wrote the lives of 414 philosophers and scientists. Ibn Abi Usaibiya, who lived from 1203 to 1270, performed a like service for 400 physicians. Muhammad Afi, in 1228, achieved an encyclopedia of 300 Persian poets without mentioning Omar Khayyam. And Muhammad ibn Khalikan, who lived from 1211 to 1282, surpassed all other single-handed works of this kind in his Obituaries of Men of Note, containing brief anecdotal lives of 865 distinguished Mohammedans. It is remarkably accurate for a book covering so wide a field. Ibn Kali Khan nevertheless apologized for its imperfections, saying in its final words that God has allowed no book to be faultless except the Quran. Muhammad al-Shawrastani, in a book of religions and sects of 1128, analyzed the leading faiths and philosophies of the world and summarized their history. No contemporary Christian could have written so learned and impartial a work. Muslim fiction never rose above the episodic, picaresque proliferation of tales, unified only by the persistence of a single character. After the Quran, The Thousand Nights and a Night, and the Fables of Bidpai, the most popular book in Islam was the Mukamat, or Discourses, of Abu Muhammad al-Hariri, from 1054 to 1122, of Basra. Here, in rhymed Arabic prose, are the adventures of the charming scoundrel Abu Zayd, who wins forgiveness for his pranks, crimes, and blasphemies by his genial humor, resourceful cleverness, and tempting philosophy. Obey not the fool who forbids thee to pull beauty's rose when in full bloom thou art free to possess it. Pursue thine end still, though it seem past thy skill. Let them say what they will. Take thy pleasure and bless it. Nearly every literate Moslem now wrote poetry, and nearly every ruler encouraged it. If we may take the word of Ibn Khaldun, hundreds of poets could be found at the Almoravid and Almohad courts in Africa and Spain. At a gathering of rival poets in Seville, El Ama e Tuteli, that is, the blind poet of Tudela, won the prize with lines that sum up half the poetry of the world. When she laughs, pearls appear. When she removes her veil, the moon is seen. The universe is too narrow to contain her, yet she is enclosed in my heart. The other poets, we are told, tore up their verses unread. In Cairo, Zuhair sang of love long after his hair was white. In Eastern Islam, the breakup of the empire into small kingdoms increased the number and rivalry of patrons and helped literature, as in 19th century Germany. Persia was the richest of the nations in her poets. Anwari of Khorasan, who flourished around 1185, rhymed for a time at the court of Sinjar, whom he praised only next to himself. I have a soul ardent as fire, a tongue fluent as water, a mind sharpened by intelligence and verse devoid of flaw. Alas, there is no patron worthy of my eulogies. Alas, there is no sweetheart worthy of my odes. Quite as confident was his contemporary Kagani, who lived from 1106 to 1185, whose arrogance provoked his tutor to a genealogical barb. My dear Kagani, skillful though you be, in verse one little hint I give you free. Mock not with satire any older poet. Perhaps he's your sire, though you don't know it. Europe knows Persian poetry chiefly through Omar Khayyam. Persia classes him among her scientists and considers his quatrains the casual amusement of one of the greatest mathematicians of medieval times. Abul Fatumar Khayyami ibn Ibrahim was born at Nishapur in 1038. His cognomen meant tent maker, but proves nothing about his trade or that of his father Abraham. Occupational names in Omar's time had lost their literal application as among the smiths, tailors, bakers, and porters of our land. 
History knows little of his life, but records several of his works. His algebra, translated into French in 1857, made significant advances both on al khwarizmi and on the Greeks. Its partial solution of cubic equations has been judged perhaps the very highest peak of medieval mathematics. Another of his works on algebra, a manuscript in the Leiden Library, studied critically the postulates and definitions of Euclid. In 1074, the Sultan Malik Shah commissioned him and others to reform the Persian calendar. The outcome was a calendar that required a day's correction every 3,770 years, slightly more accurate than ours, which requires a day's correction every 3,330 years. We may leave the choice to the next civilization. Mohammedan religion proved stronger than Muslim science, and Omar's calendar failed to win acceptance over Mohammed's. The astronomer's repute is reflected in an anecdote told by Nizami Iarudi, who had known him at Nishapur. In the winter of A.H. 508, that is, A.D. 1114 to 1115, the king sent a messenger to Merv, bidding its governor tell Umar al Kayami to select a favorite time for him to go hunting. Umar looked into the matter for two days, made a careful choice of the desirable time, and himself went to superintend the mounting of the king. When the king had gone a short distance, the sky became overcast, a wind rose, and snow and mist supervened. All present felt a laughing, and the king wished to turn back. But Umar said, Have no anxiety, for this very hour the clouds will clear away, and during these five days there will be no drop of moisture. So the king rode on, and the clouds opened, and during those five days there was no wet, and no cloud was seen. The Rubaya, or quatrain, from Rubai, meaning composed of four, is in its Persian form a poem of four lines rhyming A-A-B-A. It is an epigram in the Greek sense, as the expression of a completed thought in terse poetic form. Its origin is unknown, but it long antedated Omar. In Persian literature it is never part of a longer poem, but forms an independent whole. Hence, Persian collectors of Rubaiyat arrange them not by their thought sequence, but in the alphabetical order of the final letter of the rhyming syllables. Thousands of Persian quatrains exist, mostly of uncertain authorship. Over 1,200 of them have been attributed to Omar, but often questionably. The oldest Persian manuscript of the Rubaiyat of Omar, in the Bodleian Library at Oxford, goes back only to 1460 and contains 158 stanzas alphabetically arranged. Several of these have been traced to Omar's predecessors, some to Abu Sa'id, one to Avicenna. It is hardly possible, save in a few cases, to assert positively that Omar wrote any particular one of the quatrains ascribed to him. The German orientalist von Hammer, in 1818, was the first European to call attention to Omar's Rubaiyat. In 1859, Edward Fitzgerald translated 75 of them into English verse of a unique and pithy excellence. The first edition, though its price was a penny, found few purchasers. Persistent and enlarged reissues, however, succeeded in transforming the Persian mathematician into one of the most widely read poets in the world. Of the 110 quatrains translated by Fitzgerald, 49, in the judgment of those familiar with the original, are faithful paraphrases of single quatrains in the Persian text. Forty-four are composites, each taking something from two or more quatrains. Two reflect the whole spirit of the original poem. Six are from quatrains, sometimes included in Omar's text, but probably not his. Two were influenced by Fitzgerald's reading of Hafiz. Three have no source in any extant text of Omar, were apparently fathered by Fitzgerald, and were suppressed by him in his second edition. Of stanza 81, O thou, who man of baser earth didst make, and e'en the paradise devised the snake, for all the sin wherewith the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. No corresponding passage can be found in Omar. For the rest, a comparison of Fitzgerald's version with a literal translation of the Persian text indicates that Fitzgerald always reflects the spirit of Omar and is as true to the original as may reasonably be expected of so poetic a paraphrase. The Darwinian mood of Fitzgerald's time moved him to ignore Omar's kindly humor and to deepen the anti-theological strain. But Persian authors only a century later than Omar describe him in terms quite consistent with Fitzgerald's interpretation. Mirsad Ali Bad, in 1223, called him an unhappy philosopher, atheist, and materialist. Al-Kifti's History of the Philosophers of 1240 ranked him as without an equal in astronomy and philosophy, but termed him an advanced freethinker, constrained by prudence to bridle his tongue.
Al-Sharazuri in the 13th century represented him as an ill-tempered follower of Avicenna and listed two works by Omar on philosophy, now lost. Some Sufis sought a mystic allegory in Omar's quatrains, but the Sufi Najmuddin Razi denounced him as the arch-free thinker of his time. Influenced perhaps by science, perhaps by the poems of Al-Mari, Omar rejected theology with patient scorn and boasted of stealing prayer rugs from the mosque. He accepted the fatalism of the Muslim creed and, shorn of hope for an afterlife, fell into a pessimism that sought consolation in study and wine. Stanzas 132 to 133 of the Bodleian Manuscript raise intoxication almost to a world philosophy. "'Tis I who have swept with my moustaches the wine-shop to what is good and ill of both worlds said good-bye. Should both worlds fall like a polo ball into the street, you shall seek me out. A sleeping like a drunkard I shall be. From all that is, save wine, to refrain is well, to be inebriate, squalid, and vagrant is well. One draught of wine is well from moon to fish. That is, from one end of the sky to the other. But when we note how many Persian poets chant similar eulogies to unconsciousness, we wonder, is not this Bacchic piety a pose and literary form, like Horace's ambigendrous loves? Probably such incidental quatrains give a false impression of Omar's life. They doubtless played a minor role in his eighty-five years. We should picture him not as a drunkard sprawling in the street, but as an old savant quietly content with cubic equations, a few constellations and astronomic charts, and an occasional cup with fellow scholars star-scattered on the grass. He seems to have loved flowers with the passion of a people bound to a parched terrain. And if we trust Nizami Iarudi, he was granted his wish to lie where flowers bloomed. In the year A.H. 506, that is, A.D. 1112 to 1113, Umar Kayami and Muzaffar e. Isfizari had alighted in the city of Balkh, in the house of Emir Abu Sa'd, and I had joined that assembly. In this friendly gathering I heard that proof of the truth, Omar, say, My grave will be in a spot where trees will shed their blossoms on me twice a year. This seemed to me impossible, though I knew that one such as he would not speak idle words. When I arrived at Nishapur in the year 530, or 1135, it being then some thirteen years since that great man had veiled his countenance in the dust, I went to visit his grave. His tomb lay at the foot of a garden wall, over which pear trees and peach trees thrust their heads, and on his grave had fallen so many flower petals that his dust was hidden beneath them. Then I remembered his words at Balk, and I fell to weeping, because on the face of the earth in all the regions of the habitable globe I nowhere saw one like unto him. 5. The Age of Sadi, 1150-1291 Five years after Omar's death, a poet far more honored in Persia was born at Ganza, now Kirovabad, near Tiflis. As if in foil to Omar, Ilyas Abu Muhammad, later known as Nizami, lived a life of genuine piety, rigorously abstained from wine, and devoted himself to parentage and poetry. His romance of Laila and Majnun, from 1188, is the most popular of all love stories in Persian verse. Kais Majnun, that is, the mad, becomes enamored of Lila, whose father compels her to marry another man. Majnun, delirious with disappointment, retires from civilization to the wilderness. Only when Lila's name is mentioned does he return to brief sanity. Widowed, she joins him but dies soon afterward, and Romeo Kais kills himself on her grave. Translation cannot render the melodious intensity of the original. Even the mystics sang of love, but we have their solemn assurance that the passion they portrayed was but a symbol for the love of God. Muhammad ibn Ibrahim, known to literature as Farid al-Dinatar, Pearl of Faith, Druggist, was born near Nishapur in 1119 and received his final name from vending perfumes. Feeling a call to religion, he left his shop and entered a Sufi monastery. His forty books, all in Arabic, include 200,000 lines of poetry. His most famous work was the Mantik al Tair, or Discourse of the Birds. Thirty birds, that is, Sufis, plan a united search for the king of all birds, Simurg, or Truth. They pass through six valleys, search, love, knowledge, detachment, that is, from all personal desire, unification, where they perceive that all things are one, and bewilderment, from losing all sense of individual existence. 
Three of the birds reach the seventh valley, annihilation, that is, of the self, and knock at the door of the hidden king. The royal chamberlain shows each of them a record of its deeds. They are overcome with shame and collapse into the dust. But from this dust they rise again as forms of light, and now they realize that they and Simurg, which means thirty birds, are one. They lose themselves henceforth in Simurg, as shadows vanish in the sun. In other works, Attar put his pantheism more directly. Reason cannot know God, for it cannot understand itself. But love and ecstasy can reach to God, for He is the essential reality and power in all things, the sole source of every act and motion, the spirit and life of the world. No soul is happy until it loses itself as a part in this spirit as the whole. Longing for such union is the only true religion. Self-effacement in that union is the only true immortality. The Orthodox denounced all this as heresy. A crowd attacked Attar's house and burned it to the ground. However, he was relatively indestructible. Tradition claims for him a life of 110 years. Before he died, we are told, he laid his hands in blessing upon the child who would hail him as master and eclipse his fame. Jalal Uddin Rumi, who lived from 1201 to 1273, was a native of Balkh, but lived most of his life at Konya. A mysterious Sufi, Shamsi Tabrizi, came there to preach, and Jalal was so moved by him that he founded the famous order of Malawi, or Dancing Dervishes, which still makes Konya its capital. In a comparatively short life, Jalal wrote several hundred poems. The shorter ones, collected in his Divan, or Book of Odes, are marked by such depth of feeling, sincerity, and richness yet naturalness of imagery as place them at the top of all religious poetry composed since the Psalms. Jalal's main work, the Matnawi i Manawi, Spiritual Couplets, is a diffuse exposition of Sufism, a religious epic outweighing in bulk all the legacy of Homer. It has passages of great beauty, but a thing of beauty laden with words is not a joy forever. The theme, again, is universal unity. One knocked at the Beloved's door, and a voice asked from within, Who is there? And he answered, It is I. Then the voice said, This house will not hold me and thee, and the door stayed shut. Then went the lover into the desert, and in solitude fasted and prayed. After a year he returned, and knocked again at the door. And again the voice asked, Who is there? And the lover said, It is thyself. And the door was opened to him. I looked about me to find him. He was not on the cross. I went to the idol temple, to the ancient pagoda. No trace of him was visible there. I bent the reins of search to the Kaaba. He was not in that resort of old and young. I questioned Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, of his state. He was not in Ibn Sina's range. I gazed into my own heart. There I saw him. He was nowhere else. Every form you see has its archetype in the placeless world. If the form perishes, no matter, since its original is everlasting. Every fair shape you have seen, every deep saying you have heard, be not cast down that it perished, for that is not so. While the fountains flow, the rivers run from it. Put grief out of your head and keep quaffing this river water. Do not think of the water failing, for this water is without end. From the moment you came into the world of being, a ladder was placed before you that you might escape. First you were mineral, later you turned to plant. Then you became animal. How should this be a secret to you? Afterwards you were made man with knowledge, reason, faith. When you have traveled on from now, you will doubtless become an angel. Pass again from angelhood. Enter that ocean, that your drop may become a sea. Leave aside this sun. Say ever one with all your soul. And lastly, Saadi. His real name, of course, was much longer. Musharif Uddin ibn Musli Uddin Abdallah. His father held a post at the court of the Atabeg Saad ibn Zangi at Shiraz. When the father died, the Atabeg adopted the boy, and Saadi, following Moslem custom, added his patron's name to his own. Scholars debate the dates of his earthly stay, 1184 to 1283, 1184 to 1291, 1193 to 1291. In any case, he almost spanned a century. In my youth, he tells us, I was overmuch religious, scrupulously pious and abstinent. After graduating from the Nizamiya College at Baghdad in 1226, he began those extraordinary Vandayara which took him for thirty years through all the Near and Middle East, India, Ethiopia, Egypt, and North Africa. He knew every hardship and all degrees of poverty. He complained that he had no shoes, 
until he met a man without feet, whereupon I thanked Providence for its bounty to myself. In India he exposed the mechanism of a miracle-working idol and killed the hidden Brahman who was the god of the machine. In his later rollicking verse he recommended a like summary procedure with all quacks. You too, should you chance to discover such trick, make away with the trickster. Don't spare him, be quick. For if you should suffer the scoundrel to live, be sure that to you he no quarter will give. So I finished the rogue, notwithstanding his wails, with stones, for dead men, as you know, tell no tales. He fought against the crusaders, was captured by the infidels, and was ransomed. Gratefully, he married the daughter of his ransomer. She turned out to be an intolerable vixen. The ringlets of the lovely, he wrote, are a chain on the feet of reason. He divorced her, encountered more ringlets, assumed more chains. He outlived his second wife, retired at fifty to a garden hermitage in Shiraz, and stayed there the last fifty years of his life. Having lived, he began to write. All his major works, we are told, were composed after this retirement. The Pantnama is a book of wisdom. The Divan is a collection of short poems, mostly in Persian, some in Arabic, some pious, some obscene. The Bustan, or Orchard, expounds in didactic verse Sadi's general philosophy, relieved by passages of tender sensuality. Never had I known moments more delicious. That night I clasped my lady to my breast and gazed into her eyes, swimming with sleep. I said to her, Beloved, my slender cypress tree, now is not the time to sleep. Sing, my nightingale. Let thy mouth open as unfolds the rosebud. Sleep no more, turmoil of my heart. Let thy lips offer me the filter of thy love. And my lady looked upon me and murmured low, Turmoil of thy heart, yet dost thou wake me? Thy lady has repeated all this time that she has never belonged to another. And thou dost smile, for thou knowest that she lies. But what matter? Are her lips less warm beneath thy lips? Are her shoulders less soft beneath thy caress? They say the breeze of May is sweet as the perfume of the rose, the song of the nightingale, the green plain, and the blue sky. O oh, thou who knowest not, all these are sweet only when one's lady is there. The Gulistan, or Rose Garden, of 1258, is a medley of instructive anecdotes interspersed with delectable poetry. An unjust king asked a holy man, What is more excellent than prayer? The holy man said, For you to remain asleep till midday, that for this one interval you may not afflict mankind. Ten dervishes can sleep on one rug, but two kings cannot be accommodated in a whole kingdom. If you court riches, ask not for contentment. The religious man who can be vexed by an injury is as yet a shallow brook. Never has anyone acknowledged his own ignorance, except that person who, while another is talking and is not yet finished, begins to speak. Had you but one perfection and seventy faults, your lover would discern only that one perfection. Hurry not. Learn deliberation. The Arab horse makes a few stretches at full speed and breaks down. The camel, at its deliberate pace, travels night and day and gets to the end of its journey. Acquire knowledge, for no reliance can be placed on riches or possessions. Were a professional man to lose his fortune, he need not feel regret, for his knowledge is of itself a mine of wealth. The severity of the schoolmaster is more useful than the indulgence of the father. Were intellect to be annihilated from the face of the earth, nobody could be brought to say, I am ignorant. Levity in a nut is a sign of its being empty. Sadi was a philosopher, but he forfeited the name by writing intelligibly. His was a healthier philosophy than Omar's. It understood the consolations of faith and knew how to heal the sting of knowledge with the simple blessings of a kindly life. Sadi experienced all the tragedies of the human comedy and yet insisted on a hundred years. But he was a poet as well as a philosopher sensitive to the form and texture of every beauty from a woman's cypress limbs to a star that for a moment possesses by itself all the evening sky, and capable of expressing wisdom or platitude with brevity, delicacy, and grace. He was never at a loss for an illuminating comparison or an arresting phrase. To give education to the worthless is like throwing walnuts upon a dome. A friend and I were associating like two kernels and one almond shell. If the orb of the sun had been in the wallet of this stingy merchant, nobody would have seen daylight in the world till Judgment Day. In the end, despite his wisdom, Sadi remained the poet, surrendering his wisdom with a whole heart to the rich slavery of love. Fortune suffers me not to clasp my sweetheart to my breast, nor lets me forget my exile long in a kiss on her sweet lips pressed. 
the noose wherewith she is wont to snare her victims far and wide, I will snatch away, so that one day I may lure her to my side. Yet I shall not dare caress her hair with a hand that is overbold, for snare therein like birds in a gin are the hearts of lovers untold. A slave am I to that gracious form, which, as I picture it, is clothed in grace with a measuring rod, as tailors a garment fit. O cypress tree, with silver limbs, this color and scent of thine, have shamed the scent of the myrtle plant and the bloom of the eglantine. Judge with thine eyes, and set thy foot in the fair and free, and tread the jasmine under thy foot, and the flowers of the Judas tree. O wonder not if in time of spring thou dost rouse such jealousy, that the cloud doth weep while the floweret smile, and all on account of thee. If o'er the dead thy feet should tread, those feet so fair and fleet, no wonder it were if thou shouldst hear a voice from his winding sheet. Distraction is banned from this our land in the time of our Lord the King. Say that I am distracted with love of thee, and men with the songs I sing. 6. Moslem Science, 1057-1258 to 1258. Moslem scholars divided the medieval peoples into two classes, those that cultivated science and those that did not. In the first class they named the Hindus, Persians, Babylonians, Jews, Greeks, Egyptians, and Arabs. These, in their view, were the elite of the world. The others, of whom the Chinese and the Turks were the best, resembled animals rather than men. The judgment sinned cheaply against the Chinese. The Moslems continued in this period their unchallenged ascendancy in science. In mathematics, the most signal advances were made in Morocco and Azerbaijan. Here we see again the range of Islamic civilization. In 1229, Hassan al marakushi that is, of Marrakesh, published tables of signs for each degree and tables of versed signs, arc signs, and arc cotangents. A generation later, Nasir uddin al-Tusi, that is, of Tus, issued the first treatise in which trigonometry was considered as an independent science rather than an appendage to astronomy. This Kitab Shakal al kata remained without a rival in its field until the De Triangulus of Regio Montanus, two centuries later. Perhaps Chinese trigonometry, which appears in the second half of the 13th century, was of Arabic origin. The outstanding work of physical science in this age was the Kitab Mizan al-Hikmah, or Book of the Balance of Wisdom, written about 1122 by a Greek slave from Asia Minor, Abul Fat al kuzini It gave a history of physics, formulated the laws of the lever, compiled tables of specific gravity from any liquids and solids, and proposed a theory of gravitation as a universal force drawing all things towards the center of the earth. Water wheels, known to the Greeks and Romans, were improved by the Moslems. The Crusaders saw such wheels raising water from the Orontes and introduced them into Germany. Alchemists flourished. They knew, said Al-Latif, 300 ways of making dupes. One alchemist drew from Nuruddin a substantial loan for alchemical research and disappeared. A wit, apparently unreproved, published a list of fools in which Nuruddin's name led all the rest, and offered, if the alchemist would return, to substitute his name for that of the sultan. In 1081, Ibrahim al-Sadi of Valencia constructed the oldest known celestial globe, a brass sphere 209 millimeters, or 81.5 inches, in diameter. Upon its surface, in 47 constellations, were engraved 1,015 stars in their respective magnitudes. The Giralda of Seville, from 1190, was an observatory as well as a minaret. There, Jabir ibn Afla made the observations for his Isla al-Majisti, or Correction of the Almagest, of 1240. The same reaction against Ptolemaic astronomy marked the works of Abu Ishaq al-Bitruji, or Alpatragius, of Cordova, who paved the way for Copernicus by destructively criticizing the theory of epicycles and eccentrics through which Ptolemy had sought to explain the paths and motions of the stars. The age produced two geographers of universal medieval renown. This book is concluded on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 1, by Will Durant. Concluded. The age produced two geographers of universal medieval renown. Abu Abdallah Muhammad al Idrisi was born at Ceuta in 1100, studied at Cordoba, and wrote in Palermo, at the behest of King Roger II of Sicily, his Kitab al-Rujari, or Roger's Book. 
It divided the earth into seven climatic zones, and each zone into ten parts. Each of the seventy parts was illustrated by a detailed map. These maps were the crowning achievement of medieval cartography, unprecedented in fullness, accuracy, and scope. Alidrisi, like most Muslim scientists, took for granted the sphericity of the earth. Rivaling him for the honor of being the greatest medieval geographer was Abu Abdallah Yakut, who lived from 1179 to 1229. Born a Greek in Asia Minor, he was captured in war and enslaved. But the Baghdad merchant who bought him gave him a good education and then freed him. He traveled much, first as a merchant, then as a geographer, fascinated by places and their diverse populations, dress, and ways. He rejoiced to find ten libraries at Merv, one containing twelve thousand volumes. The discriminating curators allowed him to take as many as two hundred volumes at a time to his room. Those who have loved books as the lifeblood of great men will sense the dusty joy he felt in these treasures of the mind. He moved on to Kiva and Balk. There the Mongols almost caught him in their murderous advance. He fled, naked but clutching his manuscripts, across Persia to Mosul. While buttering the bread of poverty as a copyist, he completed his Mujam al-Budan of 1228, a vast geographical encyclopedia which summed up nearly all medieval knowledge of the globe. Yakut included almost everything— astronomy, physics, archaeology, ethnography, history, giving the coordinates of cities, and the lives and works of their famous men. Seldom has any man so loved the earth. Botany, almost forgotten since Theophrastus, revived with the Moslems of this age. Alidrisi wrote a herbal, but stressed the botanical rather than merely the medicinal interest of 360 plants. Abul Abbas of Seville in 1216 earned the surname of Al-Nabati, the botanist, by his studies of plant life from the Atlantic to the Red Sea. Abu Muhammad ibn Baitar of Malaga, from 1190 to 1248, gathered all Islamic botany into a vast work of extraordinary erudition, which remained the standard botanical authority till the 16th century, and marked him as the greatest botanist and pharmacist of the Middle Ages. Ibn Alawan of Seville, in 1190, won a like preeminence in agronomy. His Kitab al-Falaha, Book of the Peasant, analyzed soils and manures, described the cultivation of 585 plants and 50 fruit trees, explained methods of grafting, and discussed the symptoms and cures of plant diseases. This was the most complete treatment of agricultural science in the whole medieval period. In this, as in the preceding age, the Muslims produced the leading positions of Asia, Africa, and Europe. They excelled especially in ophthalmology, perhaps because eye diseases were so prevalent in the Near East. There, as elsewhere, medicine was paid most to cure, least to prevent. Operations for cataract were numerous. Khalifa ibn Abil Mahasin of Aleppo, in 1256, was so confident of his skill that he operated for cataract on a one-eyed man. Ibn Baitar's Kitab al-Jami made medicinal botanical history. It listed 1,400 plants, foods, and drugs, 300 of them new analyzed their chemical constitution and healing power, and added acute observations on their use in therapy. But the greatest name in this acme of Muslim medicine is Abu Marwan ibn Zur, who lived from 1091 to 1162, of Seville, known to the European medical world as Avanzoer. He was the third in six generations of famous physicians, all of one family line, and each at the top of his profession. His Kitab al-Tasir, or Book of Simplification on Therapeutics and Diet, was written at the request of his friend Averroes, who, himself the greatest philosopher of the age, considered him the greatest physician since Galen. Ibn Zur's fort was clinical description. He left classical analyses of mediastinal tumors, pericarditis, intestinal tuberculosis, and pharyngeal paralysis. Translations of the Tasir into Hebrew and Latin deeply influenced European medicine. Islam led the world also in the equipment and competence of its hospitals. One founded by Nuruddin at Damascus in 1160 gave free treatment and drugs during three centuries. For 267 years, we are told, its fires were never extinguished. Ibn Jubayr, coming to Baghdad in 1184, marveled at the great Bimaristan Adadi, a hospital rising like some royal palace along the banks of the Tigris. Here, food and drugs were given to the patients without charge. In Cairo, in 1285, Sultan Kalaun began the Maristan al-Mansur, the greatest hospital of the Middle Ages. Within a spacious quadrangular enclosure, four buildings rose around a courtyard adorned with arcades and cooled with fountains and brooks. There were separate wards for diverse diseases and for convalescents, laboratories, a dispensary, outpatient clinics, 
diet kitchens, baths, a library, a chapel, a lecture hall, and particularly pleasant accommodations for the insane. Treatment was given gratis to men and women, rich and poor, slave and free, and a sum of money was dispersed to each convalescent on his departure so that he need not at once return to work. The sleepless were provided with soft music, professional storytellers, and perhaps books of history. Asylums for the care of the insane existed in all the major cities of Islam. 7. Al-Ghazali and the Religious Revival Amid these advances of science, the old orthodoxy fought to keep the loyalty of the educated classes. The conflict between religion and science led many to skepticism, some to open atheism. Al-Ghazali divided Muslim thinkers into three groups, theists, deists or naturalists, and materialists, and denounced all three groups alike as infidels. The theists accepted God and immortality, but denied creation and the resurrection of the body, and called heaven and hell spiritual conditions only. The deists acknowledged a deity, but rejected immortality and viewed the world as a self-operating machine. The materialists completely rejected the idea of God. A semi-organized movement, the Dariya, professed a frank agnosticism. Several of these doubting Thomases lost their heads to the executioner. You torment yourself for nothing, said the Isbahan ibn Kara to a pious faster during Ramadan. Man is like a seed of grain that sprouts and grows up and is then mowed down to perish forever. Eat and drink. It was in reaction against such skepticism that Mohammedanism produced its greatest theologian, the Augustan and the Kant of Islam. Abu Hamid al-Ghazali was born at Tus in 1058, lost his father early, and was reared by a Sufi friend. He studied law, theology, and philosophy. At thirty-three, he was appointed to the chair of law at the Nizamiya College in Baghdad. Soon all Islam acclaimed his eloquence, erudition, and dialectical skill. After four years of this glory, he was laid low by a mysterious disease. Appetite and digestion failed, paralysis of the tongue occasionally distorted his speech, and his mind began to break down. A wise physician diagnosed his case as mental in origin. In truth, as al-Ghazali later confessed in his remarkable autobiography, he had lost belief in the capacity of reason to sanction the Mohammedan faith, and the hypocrisy of his orthodox teaching had become unbearable. In 1094 he left Baghdad, ostensibly on a pilgrimage to Mecca. Actually, he went into seclusion, seeking silence, contemplation, and peace. Unable to find in science the support he sought for his crumbling faith, he turned from the outer to the internal world. There he thought he found a direct and immaterial reality which offered a firm basis for belief in a spiritual universe. He subjected sensation, on which materialism seemed to rest, to critical scrutiny, accused the senses of making the stars appear small when, to be so visible from afar, they must be vastly larger than the earth, and concluded from a hundred such examples that sensation by itself could be no certain test of truth. Reason was higher, and corrected one sense with another, but in the end it too rested on sensation. Perhaps there was in man a form of knowledge, a guide to truth surer than reason. Al-Ghazali felt that he had found this in the introspective meditation of the mystic. The Sufi came closer than the philosopher to the hidden core of reality. The highest knowledge lay in gazing upon the miracle of mind until God appeared within the self, and the self itself disappeared in the vision of an all-absorbing one. In this mood, al-Ghazali wrote his most influential book, Tahafut al-Filasifa, The Destruction of Philosophy. All the arts of reason were turned against reason. By a transcendental dialectic as subtle as Kant's, the Muslim mystic argued that reason leads to universal doubt, intellectual bankruptcy, moral deterioration, and social collapse. Seven centuries before Hume, al-Ghazali reduced reason to the principle of causality and causality to mere sequence. All that we perceive is that B regularly follows A, not that A causes B. Philosophy, logic, science cannot prove the existence of God or the immortality of the soul. Only direct intuition can assure us of these beliefs, without which no moral order and therefore no civilization can survive. In the end, al-Ghazali returned through mysticism to all orthodox views. The old fears and hopes of his youth flowed back upon him, and he professed to feel the eyes and threats of a stern deity close over his head. He proclaimed anew the horrors of the Mohammedan hell, and urged their preaching as necessary to popular morality. He accepted again the Koran and the Hadith. In his 
Iya Ulum al-Din, Revival of the Science of Religion, he expounded and defended his renovated orthodoxy with all the eloquence and fervor of his prime. Never in Islam had the skeptics and the philosophers encountered so vigorous a foe. When he died in 1111, the tide of unbelief had been effectually turned. All orthodoxy took comfort from him. Even Christian theologians were glad to find in his translated works such a defense of religion and such an exposition of piety as no one had written since Augustine. After him, and despite Averroes, philosophy hid itself in the remote corners of the Moslem world. The pursuit of science waned, and the mind of Islam more and more buried itself in the Hadith and the Quran. The conversion of al-Ghazali to mysticism was a great victory for Sufism. Orthodoxy now accepted Sufism, which for a time engulfed theology. The mullahs, learned exponents of Moslem doctrine and law, still dominated the official religious and legal world, but the field of religious thought was yielded to Sufi monks and saints. Strangely contemporary with the rise of the Franciscans in Christendom, a new monasticism took form in 12th century Islam. Sufi devotees now abandoned family life, lived in religious fraternities under a sheikh or master, and called themselves dervish or fakir, a Persian and an Arabic word for poor man or mendicant. Some by prayer and meditation, some by ascetic self-denial, others in the exhaustion that followed wild dancing, sought to transcend the self and rise to a wonder-working unity with God. Their doctrine received formulation in the 150 books of Muyi al-Din ibn al-Arabi, who lived from 1165 to 1240, a Spanish Moslem domiciled in Damascus. The world was never created, said al-Arabi, for it is the external aspect of that which in inward view is God. History is the development of God to self-consciousness, which he achieves at last in man. Hell is temporary. In the end, all will be saved. Love is mistaken when it loves a physical and transitory form. It is God who appears in the Beloved, and the true lover will find and love the author of all beauty in any beautiful form. Perhaps recalling some Christians of Jerome's time, Al-Arabi taught that he who loves and remains chaste until death dies a martyr and achieves the highest reach of devotion. Many married dervishes profess to live in such chastity with their wives. Through the gifts of the people, some Moslem religious orders became wealthy and consented to enjoy life. Formerly, complained a Syrian sheikh about 1250, the Sufis were a fraternity dispersed in the flesh but united in the spirit. Now they are a body well-clothed carnally and ragged in divine mystery. The populace smiled tolerantly at these sacred worldlings, but lavished worship upon sincere devotees, ascribed to them miraculous deeds and powers, honored them as saints, celebrated their birthdays, prayed for their intercession with Allah, and made pilgrimages to their tombs. Mohammedanism, like Christianity, was a developing and adjustable religion which would have startled a reborn Mohammed or Christ. As orthodoxy triumphed, toleration waned. From Harun al-Rashid on, the so-called Ordinance of Omar, formerly ignored, was increasingly observed. Theoretically, though not always in practice, non-Muslims were now required to wear distinguishing yellow stripes on their clothing. They were forbidden to ride on horseback, but might use an ass or a mule. They were not to build new churches or synagogues, but might repair old ones. No cross was to be displayed outside a church. No church bell should ring. Non-Muslim children were not to be admitted to Muslim schools, but could have schools of their own. This is still the letter of the law, not always enforced in Islam. Nevertheless, there were 45,000 Christians in 10th century Baghdad. Christian funeral processions passed unharmed through the streets, and Muslim protests continued against the employment of Christians and Jews in high office. Even in the heat and challenge of the Crusades, Saladin could be generous to the Christians in his realm. 8. Averroes For a time, philosophy survived in Muslim Spain by judiciously sprinkling professions of orthodoxy among the timid tentatives of critique and thought found a precarious freedom in the courts of rulers who enjoyed in private the speculations that they accounted harmful to the populace. So the Almoravid governor of Saragossa chose as his minister and friend Abu Bekr ibn Baja, who had been born there about 1106. Avampase, as Europe would call him, had reached even in youth an extraordinary proficiency in science, medicine, philosophy, music, and poetry. Ibn Khaldun tells how the governor so admired some verses of the young scholar that he vowed the poet should always walk on gold when entering his presence. Whereupon Ibn Baja, lest this vow should abate his welcome, put a gold coin in each of his shoes. When Saragossa fell to the Christians, the poet-scientist minister fled to Fez, where he found himself destitute among Moslems who accused him of atheism. 
He died at the age of 30, allegedly by poison. His lost treatise on music was accounted the masterpiece on that subtle subject in the literature of Western Islam. His most famous work, A Guide to the Solitary, renewed a basic theme of Arabic philosophy. The human intellect, said Ibn Baja, is composed of two parts, the material intellect, which is bound up with the body and dies with it, and the active intellect, or impersonal cosmic mind, which enters into all men and is alone immortal. Thought is man's highest function. By thought, rather than by mystic ecstasy, man can attain to knowledge of and union with the active intellect or God. But thinking is a perilous enterprise, except in silence. The wise man will live in quiet seclusion, shunning doctors, lawyers, and the people. Or perhaps a few philosophers will form a community where they may pursue knowledge in tolerant companionship far from the maddened crowd. Abu Bekr ibn Tufail, Europe's Abubaser, who lived possibly from 1107 to 1185, continued the ideas of Ibn Baja and almost realized his ideals. He too was scientist, poet, physician, and philosopher. He became the doctor and vizier of the caliph Abu Yaqub Yusuf at Marrakesh, the Almohad capital in Morocco. He managed to spend most of his waking hours in the royal library and found time to write, among more technical works, the most remarkable philosophical romance in medieval literature. It took its title from Ibn Sina, and through Ockley's English translation in 1708, may have suggested Robinson Crusoe to Defoe. Hai Ibn Yaqzan, which translates as Alive, Son of Vigilant, who gives his name to the tale, was cast in infancy upon an uninhabited island. Nursed by a she-goat, he grew in intelligence and skill, made his shoes and clothes from animal skins, studied the stars, dissected animals alive or dead, and arrived at the highest degree of knowledge in this kind which the most learned naturalists ever attained. He passed from science to philosophy and theology, demonstrated to himself the existence of an all-powerful creator, practiced asceticism, forswore meat, and achieved an ecstatic union with the active intellect. High was now forty-nine and ripe for an audience. Fortunately, a mystic named Asal now had himself deposited on the island, seeking solitude. He met Hai, who for the first time discovered the existence of mankind. Asal taught him language, and rejoiced to find that Hai had arrived unaided at a knowledge of God. He confessed to Hai the coarseness of the popular religion in the land from which he, Asal, had come, and mourned that a modicum of morality had been achieved only by promises of heaven and threats of hell. Hai resolved to go and convert this benighted people to a higher and more philosophical religion. Arrived, he preached his pantheism in the marketplace. The populace ignored him or did not understand him. Hai concluded that Muhammad was right, that the people can be disciplined to social order only by religion of myth, miracle, ceremony, and supernatural punishments and rewards. He apologized for his intrusion, returned to his island, and lived there with Asal in daily companionship with placid animals and the active intellect and thus they continued serving God until they died. It was with a rare absence of jealousy that Ibn Tufail, about 1153, introduced to the favor of Abu Yaqub Yusuf, a young lawyer and physician, known to Islam as Abu al-Walid Muhammad ibn Rushd, and to medieval Europe as Averroes, who lived from 1126 to 1198, the most influential figure in Islamic philosophy. His grandfather and his father had in turn been chief justice of Cordoba, and had lavished on him all the education that the old capital could provide. One of his pupils has transmitted what purports to be Averroes's own account of his first interview with the emir. When I was presented to the Prince of Believers, I found him alone with Ibn Tufail, who sounded my praises to him with compliments that I did not deserve. The emir opened the conversation by asking, What opinion did the philosophers hold about the heavens? Are they eternal, or did they have a beginning? I was overcome with terror and confusion, and sought some pretext for not answering. But the emir, perceiving my trouble, turned to Ibn Tufail, and began to discourse with him on the question, recalling the opinions of Plato and Aristotle and other philosophers, and the objections that had been made to them by Moslem theologians, all with such fullness of memory as I should not have expected even of professional philosophers. The emir put me at my ease and tested my knowledge. When I had retired, he sent me a sum of money, a riding horse, and a costly robe of honor. In 1169, Averroes was appointed Chief Justice of Seville, in 1172 of Cordoba. Ten years later, Abu Yaqub called him to Marrakesh to serve as court physician, and he continued in this capacity when, in 1184, Yaqub was succeeded by Yaqub al-Mansur. 
In 1194 he was banished to Lucena, near Cordova, to satisfy public resentment of his heresies. He was forgiven and recalled in 1198, but died in that year. His tomb may still be seen at Marrakesh. His work in medicine has almost been forgotten in his fame as a philosopher. He was, however, one of the greatest physicians of his time, the first to explain the function of the retina, and to recognize that an attack of smallpox confers subsequent immunity. His Encyclopedia of Medicine, Kitab al Kuliat Filtib, translated into Latin, was widely used as a text in Christian universities. Meanwhile, the Emir Abu Yaqub had expressed the wish that someone would write a clear exposition of Aristotle, and Ibn Tufail recommended the task to Averroes. The suggestion was welcomed, for Averroes had already concluded that all philosophy was contained in the Stagirite, who merely needed interpretation to be made contemporary with any age. He resolved to prepare for each major work of Aristotle first a summary, then a brief commentary, then a detailed commentary for advanced students, a mode of progressively complex exposition habitual in Muslim universities. Unfortunately, he knew no Greek and had to rely on Arabic translations of Syriac translations of Aristotle. Nevertheless, his patience, perspicuity, and keen analysis won him throughout Europe the name of the commentator and placed him at once near the head of Moslem philosophy, second only to the great Avicenna himself. To these writings he added several works of his own on logic, physics, psychology, metaphysics, theology, law, astronomy, and grammar, and a reply to al-Ghazali's Destruction of Philosophy under the title of Destruction of the Destruction, Tahafut al-Tahafut. He argued, as Francis Bacon would, that though a little philosophy might incline a man to atheism, unhindered study would lead to a better understanding between religion and philosophy. For though the philosopher cannot accept in their literal sense the dogmas of the Koran, the Bible, and other revealed books, he perceives their necessity in developing a wholesome piety and morality among the people who are so harassed with economic importunities that they find no time for more than incidental, superficial, and dangerous thinking on first and last things. Hence the mature philosopher will neither utter nor encourage any word against the established faith. In return, the philosopher should be left free to seek the truth, but he should confine his discussions within the circle and comprehension of the educated and make no propaganda among the populace. Symbolically interpreted, the doctrines of religion can be harmonized with the findings of science and philosophy. Such interpretation of sacred texts through symbol and allegory has been practiced, even by divines, for centuries. Averroes does not explicitly teach, he merely implies the doctrine imputed to him by Christian critics, that a proposition may be true in philosophy, among the educated, and false or harmful in religion and morals. Hence the opinions of Averroes must be sought not in the minor treatises which he composed for a general audience, but in his more recondite commentaries on Aristotle. He defines philosophy as an inquiry into the meaning of existence with a view to the improvement of man. The world is eternal. The movements of the heavens never began and will never end. Creation is a myth. The partisans of creation argue that the agent, or God, produces a new being without needing for its production any pre-existing material. It is such imagining that has led the theologians of the three religions existing in our day to say that something can issue from nothing. Motion is eternal and continuous. All motion has its cause in a preceding motion. Without motion there is no time. We cannot conceive of motion having either a beginning or an end. Nonetheless, God is the creator of the world in the sense that it exists at any moment only through his sustaining power and undergoes, so to speak, continuous creation through the divine energy. God is the order, force, and mind of the universe. From this supreme order and intelligence there emanates an order and intelligence in the planets and the stars. From the intelligence in the lowest of the celestial circles, that of the moon, comes the active or effective intellect which enters into the body and mind of individual men. The human mind is composed of two elements. One is the passive or material intellect, a capacity and possibility of thought forming a part of the body and dying with it. The other is the active intellect, a divine influx which activates the passive intellect into actual thought. This active intellect has no individuality. It is the same in all men, and it alone is immortal. Averroes compares the operation of the active intellect upon the individual or passive intellect with the influence of the sun, whose light makes many objects luminous, but remains everywhere and permanently one. And as fire reaches out to a combustible body, so the individual intellect aspires to be united with the active intellect. In this union the human mind becomes like unto God, 
for it holds all the universe potentially in the grasp of its thought. Indeed, the world and its contents have no existence for us and no meaning except through the mind that apprehends them. Only the perception of truth through reason can lead the mind to that union with God which the Sufis think to reach by ascetic discipline or intoxicating dance. Averroes has no use for mysticism. His notion of paradise is the quiet and kindly wisdom of the sage. This was Aristotle's conclusion, too, and, of course, the theory of the active and passive intellect, nous poeticas and nous patheticas, goes back to Aristotle's De Anima, as interpreted by Alexander of Aphrodisias and the Mischus of Alexandria, transformed into the emanation theory of the Neoplatonists and transmitted in philosophic dynasty through Al-Farabi, Avicenna, and Ibn bin Bajah. Here at the end, as in its beginning, Arabic philosophy was Aristotle Neoplatonized. But whereas in most Muslim and Christian philosophers Aristotle's doctrines were retailored to meet the needs of theology, in Averroes, Mohammedan dogmas were reduced to a minimum to reconcile them with Aristotle. Hence, Averroes had more influence in Christendom than in Islam. His Muslim contemporaries persecuted him, Muslim posterity forgot him, and allowed most of his works to be lost in their Arabic form. Jews preserved many of them in Hebrew translation, and Maimonides followed in Averroes's steps in seeking to reconcile religion and philosophy. In Christendom, the commentaries, translated into Latin from the Hebrew, fed the heresies of Sujet de Brabant and the rationalism of the school of Padua, and threatened the foundations of Christian belief. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote his Sumai to stem this Averroistic tide, but he followed Averroes in the method of his commentaries, in divers interpretations of Aristotle, in choosing matter as the principle of individuation, in the symbolical explanation of anthropomorphic scriptural texts, in admitting the possible eternity of the world, in rejecting mysticism as a sufficient basis for theology, and in recognizing that some dogmas of religion are beyond reason and can be accepted by faith alone. Roger Bacon ranked Averroes next to Aristotle and Avicenna, and added, with characteristic exaggeration, the philosophy of Averroes today, speaking circa 1270, obtains the unanimous suffrage of wise men. In 1150, the Caliph Mustanjid at Baghdad ordered burned all the philosophical works of Avicenna and the Brethren of Sincerity. In 1194, the Emir Abu Yusuf Yaqub al-Mansur, then at Seville, ordered the burning of all works by Averroes except a few on natural science. He forbade his subjects to study philosophy and urged them to throw into a fire all books of philosophy wherever found. These instructions were eagerly carried out by the people, who resented attacks upon a faith that for the most of them was the dearest solace of their harassed lives. About this time, Ibn Habib was put to death for studying philosophy. After 1200, Islam shunned speculative thought. As political power declined in the Muslim world, it sought more and more the aid of the theologians and lawyers of orthodoxy. That aid was given, but in return for the suppression of independent thought. Even so, the aid did not suffice to save the state. In Spain, the Christians advanced from city to city, until only Granada remained Muslim. In the east, the Crusaders captured Jerusalem, and in 1258, the Mongols took and destroyed Baghdad. 9. The Coming of the Mongols, 1219-1258 Once again, history illustrated the truism that civilized comfort attracts barbarian conquest. The Seljuks had brought new strength to eastern Islam, but they too had succumbed to ease and had allowed the empire of Malik Shah to break down into autonomous kingdoms culturally brilliant and militarily weak. Religious fanaticism and racial antipathies divided the people into bitter sects and frustrated any united defense against the Crusades. Meanwhile, on the plains and deserts of northwestern Asia, the Mongols thrived on hardships and primitive fertility. They lived in tents or the open air, followed their herds to fresh pastures, clothed themselves in ox hides, and studied with relish the arts of war. These new Huns, like their kin of eight centuries back, were experts with dagger and sword, and arrows aimed from their flying steeds. If we may believe the Christian missionary Giovanni de Piano Carpini, they eat anything edible, even lice and they had as little repugnance to feeding on rats, cats, dogs, and human blood as our most cultured contemporaries to eating eels and snails. Genghis Khan, that is, the great king, 1167 to 1227, disciplined them with severe laws into an irresistible force and led them to the conquest of Central Asia from the Volga to the Chinese Wall. During the absence of Genghis Khan from his capital at Karakorum, 
A Mongol chieftain rebelled against him and formed a league with Ala al-Din Muhammad, the Shah of the independent state of Khwarezm. Genghis suppressed the rebellion and sent the Shah an offer of peace. The offer was accepted, but shortly thereafter two Mongol merchants in Transoxiana were executed as spies by Muhammad's governor, Otrar. Genghis demanded the extradition of the governor. Muhammad refused, beheaded the chief of the Mongol embassy, and sent its other members back without their beards. Genghis declared war, and the Mongol invasion of Islam began in 1219. An army under the Khan's son Juji defeated Muhammad's 400,000 troops at Jand. The Shah fled to Samarkand, leaving 160,000 of his men dead on the field. Another army under Genghis's son Jagatai captured and sacked Otrar. A third army under Genghis himself burned Bokhara to the ground, raped thousands of women, and massacred 30,000 men. Samarkand and Balkh surrendered at his coming, but suffered pillage and wholesale slaughter. A full century later, Ibn Battuta described these cities as still largely in ruins. Genghis's son Tuli led 70,000 men through Khorasan, ravaging every town on their march. The Mongols placed captives in their van and gave them a choice between fighting their fellow men in front or being cut down from behind. Merv was captured by treachery and was burned to the ground. Its libraries, the glory of Islam, were consumed in the conflagration. Its inhabitants were allowed to march out through the gates with their treasures, only to be massacred and robbed in detail. This slaughter, the Muslim historians of Zabur, occupied thirteen days and took one million three hundred thousand lives. Nishapur resisted long and bravely, but succumbed in 1221. Every man, woman, and child there was killed, except four hundred artisan artists who were sent to Mongolia. And the heads of the slain were piled up in a ghastly pyramid. The lovely city of Rai, with its three thousand mosques and its famous pottery kilns, was laid in ruins. And, a Muslim historian tells us, its entire population was put to death. Muhammad's son, Jalaluddin, collected a new army of Turks, gave Genghis battle on the Indus, was defeated, and fled to Delhi. Herat, having rebelled against its Mongol governor, was punished with the slaughter of 60,000 inhabitants. This ferocity was part of the military science of the Mongols. It sought to strike a paralyzing terror into the hearts of later opponents and to leave no possibility of revolt among the defeated. The policy succeeded. Genghis now returned to Mongolia, enjoyed his 500 wives and concubines, and died in bed. His son and successor, Ogatai, sent a horde of 300,000 men to capture Jalaluddin, who had formed another army at Diyarbekir. Jalal was defeated and killed, and the unhindered Mongols ravaged Azerbaijan, northern Mesopotamia, Georgia, and Armenia, this in 1234. Hearing that a rebellion led by the assassins had broken out in Iran, Hulagu, a grandson of Genghis, led a Mongol army through Samarkand and Balkh, destroyed the assassin stronghold at Alamut, and turned toward Baghdad. Al-Mustasim Bilah, last of the Abbasid caliphs of the East, was a learned scholar, a meticulous calligrapher, a man of exemplary gentleness, devoted to religion, books, and charity. This was an enemy to Hulagu's taste. The Mongol accused the caliph of sheltering rebels and of withholding promised aid against the assassins. As penalty, he demanded the submission of the caliph to the great Khan and the complete demilitarization of Baghdad. Al-Mustasim returned a boastful refusal. After a month of siege, Al-Mustasim sent Hulagu presents and an offer of surrender. Lured by a promise of clemency, he and his two sons gave themselves up to the Mongol. On February 13, 1258, Hulagu and his troops entered Baghdad and began forty days of pillage and massacre. Eight hundred thousand of the inhabitants, we are told, were killed. Thousands of scholars, scientists, and poets fell in the indiscriminate slaughter. Libraries and treasures accumulated through centuries were in a week plundered or destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of volumes were consumed. Finally, the caliph and his family, after being forced to reveal the hiding place of their secret wealth, were put to death. So ended the Abbasid Caliphate in Asia. Hulagu now returned to Mongolia. His army remained behind, and under other generals it advanced to the conquest of Syria. At Ain Jalut it met an Egyptian army under the Mamluk leaders Kutuz and Baibars, and was destroyed in 1260. Everywhere in Islam and Europe men of all faiths rejoiced. The spell of fear was broken. In 1303 a decisive battle near Damascus ended the Mongol threat and saved Syria for the Mamluks, perhaps Europe for Christianity. 
Never in history had a civilization suffered so suddenly, so devastating a blow. The barbarian conquest of Rome had been spread over two centuries. Between each blow and the next, some recovery was possible, and the German conquerors respected, some tried to preserve, the dying empire which they helped to destroy. But the Mongols came and went within forty years. They came not to conquer and stay, but to kill, pillage, and carry their spoils to Mongolia. When their bloody tide ebbed, it left behind a fatally disrupted economy, canals broken or choked, schools and libraries in ashes, governments too poor, divided and weak to govern, and a population cut in half and shattered in soul. Epicurean indulgence, physical and mental exhaustion, military incompetence and cowardice, religious sectarianism and obscurantism, political corruption and anarchy, all culminating in a piecemeal collapse before external attack. This and no change of climate turned Western Asia from world leadership to destitution, from a hundred teeming and cultured cities in Syria, Mesopotamia, Persia, the Caucasus, and Transoxiana, into the poverty, disease, and stagnation of modern times. 10. Islam and Christendom The rise and decline of Islamic civilization is one of the major phenomena of history. For five centuries, from 700 to 1200, Islam led the world in power, order, and extent of government, in refinement of manners, in standards of living, in humane legislation and religious toleration, in literature, scholarship, science, medicine, and philosophy. In architecture, it yielded the palm in the twelfth century to the cathedrals of Europe, and Gothic sculpture found no rival in inhibited Islam. Moslem art exhausted itself in decoration and suffered from narrowness of range and monotony of style. But within its self-imposed limits, it has never been surpassed. In Islam, art and culture were more widely shared than in medieval Christendom. Kings were calligraphers, and merchants, like physicians, might be philosophers. In sexual morality during these centuries, Christendom probably excelled Islam, though there was not much to choose. Christian monogamy, however evaded in practice, kept the sexual impulse within bounds and slowly raised the status of woman, while Islam darkened the face of woman with purda and the veil. The Church succeeded in limiting divorce, and homosexual diversions seem never to have attained, even in Renaissance Italy, the spread and freedom allowed them not in Mohammedan law, but in Moslem life. The Moslems seem to have been better gentlemen than their Christian peers. They kept their word more frequently, showed more mercy to the defeated, and were seldom guilty of such brutality as marked the Christian capture of Jerusalem in 1099. Christian law continued to use ordeal by battle, water, or fire, while Moslem law was developing an advanced jurisprudence and an enlightened judiciary. The Mohammedan religion, less original than the Hebrew, less embracing in eclecticism than the Christian, kept its creed and ritual simpler and purer, less dramatic and colorful than the Christian, and made less concession to the natural polytheism of mankind. It resembled Protestantism in scorning the aid and play that Mediterranean religion offered to the imagination and the senses. But it bowed to popular sensualism in its picture of paradise. It kept itself almost free from sacerdotalism, but fell into a narrow and dulling orthodoxy just when Christianity was entering into the most exuberant period of Catholic philosophy. The influence of Christendom on Islam was almost limited to religion and war. Probably from Christian exemplars came Mohammedan mysticism, monasticism, and the worship of the saints. The figure and story of Jesus touched the Moslem soul and appeared sympathetically in Moslem poetry and art. The influence of Islam upon Christendom was varied and immense. From Islam, Christian Europe received foods, drinks, drugs, medicaments, armor, heraldry, art motives and tastes, industrial and commercial articles and techniques, maritime codes and ways, and often the words for these things, orange, lemon, sugar, syrup, sherbet, julep, elixir, jar, azure, arabesque, mattress, sofa, muslin, satin, fustian, bazaar, caravan, check, tariff, traffic, duan, magazine, risk, sloop, barge, cable, admiral. The game of chess came to Europe from India via Islam and picked up Persian terms on the way. Checkmate is from the Persian shamat, the king is dead. Some of our musical instruments bear in their names evidence of their Semitic origin. Lute, rebeck, guitar, tambourine. The poetry and music of the troubadours came from Moslem Spain into Provence and from Moslem Sicily into Italy and Arabic descriptions of trips to heaven and hell may have shared in forming the divine comedy. Hindu fables and numerals entered Europe in Arabic dress or form. Moslem science preserved and developed Greek mathematics, physics, chemistry, astronomy, and medicine, and transmitted this Greek heritage, considerably enriched, to Europe. 
and Arabic scientific terms, algebra, zero, cipher, azimuth, alembic, zenith, almanac, still lie embedded in European speech. Muslim medicine led the world for half a millennium. Muslim philosophy preserved and corrupted Aristotle for Christian Europe. Avicenna and Averroes were lights from the East for the schoolmen, who cited them as next to the Greeks in authority. The ribbed vault is older in Islam than in Europe, though we cannot trace the route by which it came into Gothic art. Christian spire and belfry owe much to the minaret, and perhaps Gothic window tracery took a lead from the cussed arcading of the Hiralda Tower. The rejuvenation of ceramic art in Italy and France has been attributed to the importation of Moslem potters in the 12th century and to the visits of Italian potters to Moslem Spain. Venetian workers in metal and glass, Italian bookbinders, Spanish armorers learned their techniques from Moslem artisans. And almost everywhere in Europe, weavers looked to Islam for models and designs. Even gardens received a Persian influence. We shall see later by what avenues these influences came, through commerce and the Crusades, through a thousand translations from Arabic into Latin, through the visits of scholars like Gerbert, Michael Scott, and Adelard of Bath to Moslem Spain, through the sending of Christian youths by their Spanish parents to Moslem courts to receive a knightly education, for the Moslem aristocrats were accounted knights and gentlemen, albeit Moors, through the daily contact of Christians with Moslems in Syria, Egypt, Sicily, and Spain. Every advance of the Christians in Spain admitted a wave of Islamic literature, science, philosophy, and art into Christendom. So the capture of Toledo in 1085 immensely furthered Christian knowledge of astronomy and kept alive the doctrine of the sphericity of the earth. Behind this borrowing smoldered an undying hate. Nothing save bread is so precious to mankind as its religious beliefs, for man lives not by bread alone, but also by the faith that lets him hope. Therefore his deepest hatred greets those who challenge his sustenance or his creed. For three centuries Christianity saw Islam advance, saw it capture and absorb one Christian land and people after another, felt its constricting hand upon Christian trade, and heard it call Christians infidels. At last the potential conflict became actual. The rival civilizations clashed in the Crusades, and the best of the East or West slew the best of the West or East. Back of all medieval history lay this mutual hostility, with a third faith, the Jewish, caught between the main combatants and cut by both swords. The West lost the Crusades, but won the War of Creeds. Every Christian warrior was expelled from the holy land of Judaism and Christianity, but Islam, bled by its tardy victory and ravaged by Mongols, fell in turn into a dark age of obscurantism and poverty, while the beaten West, matured by its effort and forgetting its defeat, learned avidly from its enemy, lifted cathedrals into the sky, wandered out on the high seas of reason, transformed its crude new languages into Dante, Chaucer, and Villon, and moved with high spirit into the Renaissance. The general reader will marvel at the length of this survey of Islamic civilization, and the scholar will mourn its inadequate brevity. Only at the peaks of history has a society produced in an equal period so many illustrious men in government, education, literature, philology, geography, history, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, philosophy, and medicine, as Islam in the four centuries between Harun al-Rashid and Averroes. Part of this brilliant activity fed on Greek leavings, but much of it, above all in statesmanship, poetry, and art, was original and invaluable. In one sense, this zenith of Islam was a recovery of the Near East from Greek domination. It reached back not only to Sasanian and Achaemenid Persia, but to the Judea of Solomon, the Assyria of Ashurbanipal, the Babylonia of Hammurabi, the Akkad of Sargon, and the Sumeria of unknown kings. So the continuity of history reasserts itself. Despite earthquakes, epidemics, famines, eruptive migrations, and catastrophic wars, the essential processes of civilization are not lost. Some younger culture takes them up, snatches them from the conflagration, carries them on imitatively, then creatively, until fresh youth and spirit can enter the race. As men are members of one another and generations are moments in a family line, so civilizations are units in a larger whole whose name is history. They are stages in the life of man. Civilization is polygenetic. It is the cooperative product of many people's ranks and faiths, and no one who studies its history can be a bigot of race or creed. Therefore the scholar, though he belongs to his country through affectionate kinship, feels himself also a citizen of that country of the mind which knows no hatreds and no frontiers. He hardly deserves his name if he carries into his study political prejudices or racial discriminations or religious animosities, and he accords his grateful homage to any people that has borne the torch and enriched his heritage. This concludes the reading of The Age of Faith, Part 1, by Will Durant. Part 2 continues the story and is available through the books on tape service. This book was read by Alexander Adams. 
Will you please wind or rewind the tape as appropriate so the book will be in order for the next person to enjoy? Thank you. 1978 by Will Durant. This recording of the full-length reading of The Age of Faith was published by arrangement with Monica Ariel Mahel, trustee Ethel B. Durant Trust, Monica Ariel Mahel, and William James Durant Easton, and was produced in 1995 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. Book 3. Judaic Civilization, 135 to 1300. Chapter 15. The Talmud. 1. The Exiles, 135 to 565. Within Islam and Christendom, a remarkable people maintained through every adversity its own unique culture, consoled and inspired by its own creed, living by its own laws and morality, producing its own poets, scientists, scholars, and philosophers, and serving as the living carriers of fertile seeds between two hostile worlds. The rebellion of Bar Kokhba, from 132 to 135, was not the last effort of the Jews to regain for Judea the freedom that Pompey and Titus had destroyed. Under Antoninus Pius, from 138 to 161, they tried again and failed. Their holy city was forbidden them except on the bitter anniversary of its destruction, when they were allowed for a consideration to come and mourn by the walls of their shattered temple. In Palestine, where 985 towns had been wiped out and 580,000 men and women had been slain, in Bar Kokhba's revolt, the Jewish population had sunk to half its former volume and to such an abyss of poverty that cultural life was almost wholly dead. Nevertheless, within a generation after Bar Kokhba, the Beth Din, or Jewish National Council, a court of seventy-one rabbinical scholars and legists, was established in Tiberias. Synagogues and schools were opened, and hope rose again. The triumph of Christianity brought new difficulties. Before his conversion, Constantine had placed the religion of the Jews on a footing of legal equality with those of his other subjects. After his conversion, the Jews were oppressed with new restrictions and exactions, and Christians were forbidden to associate with them. Constantius banished the rabbis in 337 and made the marriage of a Jew with a Christian woman a capital crime. Julian's brother Gallus taxed the Jews so heavily that many of them sold their children to meet his demands. In 352 they rebelled again, and were again suppressed. Sepphoris was razed to the ground, Tiberias and other cities were partly destroyed, thousands of Jews were killed, thousands were enslaved. The condition of the Palestinian Jews now, in 359, sank so low, and their communication with other Jewish communities was so difficult that their patriarch, Hillel I, resigned their right to determine for all Jews the dates of the Jewish festivals, and issued for the independent computation of these dates a calendar that remains in use among the Jews of the world to this day. From these afflictions the Jews were saved for a moment by the accession of Julian. He reduced their taxes, revoked discriminatory laws, lauded Hebrew charity, and acknowledged Yahweh as a great God. He asked Jewish leaders why they had abandoned animal sacrifice. When they replied that their law did not permit this except in the temple at Jerusalem, he ordered that the temple should be rebuilt with state funds. Jerusalem was again opened to the Jews. They flocked to it from every quarter of Palestine, from every province of the empire. Men, women, and children gave their labor to the rebuilding, their savings and jewelry to the furnishing of the new temple. We can imagine the happiness of a people that for three centuries had prayed for this day, this occurring in 361. But as the foundations were being dug, flames burst from the ground and burnt several workmen to death. The work was patiently resumed, but a repetition of the phenomenon, presumably due to the explosion of natural gas, interrupted and discouraged the enterprise. The Christians rejoiced at what seemed a divine prohibition. The Jews marveled and mourned. Then came Julian's sudden death. State funds were withdrawn, the old restrictive laws were reenacted and made more severe, and the Jews, again excluded from Jerusalem, returned to their villages, their poverty, and their prayers. Soon thereafter, Jerome reported the Jewish population of Palestine as but a tenth part of their previous multitude. In 425, Theodosius II abolished the Palestinian Patriarchate. Greek Christian churches replaced the synagogues and schools, and after a brief outburst in 614, Palestine surrendered its leadership of the Jewish world. 
The Jews could hardly be blamed if they hoped to fare better in less Christian lands. Some moved east into Mesopotamia and Persia, and reinvigorated that Babylonian Jewry which had never ceased since the captivity of 597 B.C. In Persia, too, the Jews were excluded from state office, but as all Persians except the nobility were likewise excluded, there was less offense in the restriction. And there were several persecutions of Jews in Persia, but taxation was less severe, the government was normally cooperative, and the exilarch, or head of the Jewish community, was recognized and honored by the Persian kings. The soil of Iraq was then irrigated and fertile. The Jews there became prosperous farmers as well as clever traders. Some, including famous scholars, grew rich by brewing beer. The Jewish communities in Persia multiplied rapidly, for Persian law permitted, and the Jews practiced polygamy, for reasons that we have seen under Mohammedan law. The good rabbis Rab and Nachman, when traveling, were accustomed to advertise in each city for temporary wives, to give local youth an exemplar of matrimonial as against a promiscuous life. In Nahardia, Sura, and Pambaditha, schools of higher education rose, whose scholarship and rabbinical decisions were honored throughout the dispersion. Meanwhile, the dispersion of the Jews continued through all the Mediterranean lands. Some went to join old Jewish communities in Syria and Asia Minor. Some went to Constantinople, despite the hostility of Greek emperors and patriarchs. Some turned south from Palestine into Arabia, dwelt in peace and religious freedom with their Arab fellow Semites, occupied whole regions like Khyber, almost equaled the Arabs in Yathrib, or Medina, made many converts, and prepared the Arab mind for the Judaism of the Quran. Some crossed the Red Sea into Abyssinia, and multiplied so rapidly there that in 315 they were reputed to be half the population. Jews controlled half the shipping of Alexandria, and their prosperity in that excitable city fed the flames of religious animosity. Jewish communities developed in all the North African cities, and in Sicily and Sardinia. In Italy they were numerous, and though occasionally harassed by the Christian population, they were for the most part protected by pagan emperors, Christian emperors, Theodoric, and the popes. In Spain there had been Jewish settlements before Caesar, and they had developed there without molestation under the pagan empire. They prospered under the Aryan Visigoths, but suffered disheartening persecutions after King Recared, from 586 to 601, adopted the Nicene Creed. We hear of no persecution of Jews in Gaul until the severe enactments of the Third and Fourth Councils of Orléans in 538 and 541, a generation after the conquest of Arian Visigothic Gaul by the Orthodox Christian Clovis. About 560, the Christians of Orléans burned down a synagogue. The Jews petitioned Guntram, king of the Franks, to rebuild it at public cost, as Theodoric in like case had done. Guntram refused. O king glorious for wonderful wisdom, exclaimed Bishop Gregory of Tours. From such tribulations the Jews of the dispersion always recovered. Patiently they rebuilt their synagogues and their lives, toiled, traded, lent money, prayed and hoped, increased and multiplied. Each settlement was required to maintain at communal expense at least one elementary and one secondary school, both of them usually in the synagogue. Scholars were advised not to live in any town that lacked such schools. The language of worship and instruction was Hebrew. The language of daily speech was Aramaic in the East, Greek in Egypt and Eastern Europe. Elsewhere, the Jews adopted the language of the surrounding population. The central theme of Jewish education was religion. Secular culture was now almost ignored. Dispersed Jewry could maintain itself in body and soul only through the law, and religion was the study and observance of the law. The faith of their fathers became more precious to the Jews the more it was attacked, and the Talmud and the synagogue were the indispensable support and refuge of an oppressed and bewildered people whose life rested on hope and their hope on faith in their God. 2. The Makers of the Talmud in the temple, the synagogues, and the schools of Palestine and Babylonia, the scribes and the rabbis composed those enormous bodies of law and commentary known as the Palestinian and Babylonian Talmuds. Moses, they held, had left to his people not only a written law in the Pentateuch, but also an oral law which had been handed down and expanded from teacher to pupil, from generation to generation. It had been the main point of issue between the Pharisees and the Sadducees of Palestine whether this oral law was also of divine origin and binding force. 
As the Sadducees disappeared after the dispersion of A.D. 70, and the rabbis inherited the tradition of the Pharisees, the oral law was accepted by all Orthodox Jews as God's commandment, and was added to the Pentateuch to constitute the Torah, or law, by which they lived, and in which, quite literally, they had their being. The thousand-year-long process by which the oral law was built up, given form, and put into writing as the Mishnah, the eight centuries of debate, judgment, and elucidation that accumulated the two Gemaras as commentaries on the Mishnah, the union of the Mishnah with the shorter of these Gemaras to make the Palestinian, and with the longer to make the Babylonian, Talmud. This is one of the most complex and astonishing stories in the history of the human mind. The Bible was the literature and religion of the ancient Hebrews. The Torah was the life and blood of the medieval Jews. Because the law of the Pentateuch was written, it could not meet all the needs and circumstances of a Jerusalem without freedom, or a Judaism without Jerusalem, or a Jewry without Palestine. It was the function of the Sanhedrin teachers before the dispersion, and of the rabbis after it, to interpret the legislation of Moses for the use and guidance of a new age or place. Their interpretations and discussions, with majority and minority opinions, were transmitted from one generation of teachers to another. Perhaps to keep this oral tradition flexible, possibly to compel its memorizing, it was not written down. The rabbis who expounded the law might on occasion call in the help of persons who had accomplished the feat of committing it to memory. In the first six generations after Christ, the rabbis were called Tanaim, teachers of the oral law. As the sole experts in the law, they were at once the teachers and the judges of their communities in Palestine after the fall of the temple. The rabbis of Palestine and of the dispersion constituted the most unique aristocracy in history. They were no closed or hereditary class. Many of them rose from the poorest ranks. Most of them earned their living as artisans, even after achieving international repute. And until near the end of this period they received no payment for their work as teachers and judges. Rich men sometimes made them silent partners in business enterprises, or took them into their homes, or married their daughters to them to free them from toil. A few of them were spoiled by the high status accorded to them in their communities. Some were humanly capable of anger, jealousy, hatred, undue censoriousness, pride. They had frequently to remind themselves that the true scholar is a modest man, if only because wisdom sees the part in the light of the whole. The people loved them for their virtues and their faults, admired them for their learning and their devotion, and told a thousand stories about their judgments and their miracles. To this day no people so honors the student and the scholar as do the Jews. As rabbinical decisions accumulated, the task of memorizing them became unreasonable. Hillel, Akiva, and Meir attempted various classifications and mnemonic devices, but none of these received general acceptance. Disorder in the transmission of the law became the order of the day. The number of men who knew the entire oral law by heart was dangerously reduced, and dispersion was scattering those few to distant lands. About the year 189, at Sephoris in Palestine, Rabbi Jehuda Hanasi took over and transformed the work of Akiva and Meir, rearranged the whole oral law, and wrote it down with some personal additions as the Mishnah of Rabbi Jehuda. It was so widely read that it became in time the Mishnah, the authoritative form of the oral law of the Jews. As we have it, the Mishnah, that is, oral teaching, is the result of much editing and interpolation since Jehuda. Even so, it is a compact summary designed for memorizing by repetition, and therefore tantalizingly terse and obscure to one who comes to it from any background except that of Jewish life and history. Babylonian and European as well as Palestinian Jews accepted it, but each school placed upon its maxims an individual interpretation. As six generations, from A.D. 10 to 220, of rabbinical Tanaim had shared in formulating the Mishnah, so now six generations, from 220 to 500, of rabbinical Amoraim, or expounders, accumulated those two masses of commentary, the Palestinian and the Babylonian Gemaras. The new teachers did to the Mishnah of Jehuda what the Tanaim had done to the Old Testament. They debated, analyzed, explained, amended, and illustrated the text to apply it to the new problems and circumstances of their place and time. Towards the end of the fourth century, the schools of Palestine coordinated their commentaries in the form known as the Palestinian Gemara. About the same time, 397, Rabashi, head of the Sura College, began to codify the Babylonian Gemara and worked on it for a generation. A hundred years later, in 499, Rabbinah II Bar Samuel, also at Sura, brought this work to completion. 
If we note that the Babylonian Gemara is eleven times as long as the Mishnah, we shall begin to understand why its compilation spanned a century. Through an additional 150 years, from 500 to 650, rabbinical saboraim, or reasoners, revised this vast commentary and gave the finishing touches to the Babylonian Talmud. The word Talmud means teaching. Among the Amoraeum it was applied only to the Mishnah. In modern usage it includes both the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is the same in both the Palestinian and the Babylonian Talmuds. The two differ only in the Gemara or commentary, which is four times longer in the Babylonian than in the Palestinian form. The language of the two Gemaras is Aramaic. That of the Mishnah is Neo-Hebraic, with many borrowings from neighbor languages. The Mishnah is concise, stating a law in a few lines. The Gemaras are deliberately discursive, giving the diverse opinions of leading rabbis on the Mishnah text describing the circumstances that might require modification of the law, and adding illustrative material. The Mishnah is mostly halakha, law. The Gemaras are partly halakha, restating or discussing a law, and partly Haggadah, or story. Haggadah has been lazily defined as anything in the Talmud that is not halakha. For the most part, Haggadah includes illustrative anecdotes or examples, bits of biography, history, medicine, astronomy, astrology, magic and theosophy, and exhortations to virtue and obedience to the law. Often, a Haggadah relieved the minds of the students after some complex and tiring debate. So we read, Rab Ami and Rab Asi were conversing with Rabbi Isaac Napka, when one of them said to him, Tell us, sir, some pretty legend. And the other said, Pray explain to us rather some nice point of law. When he began the legend, he displeased the one, and when he began to explain a point of law, he offended the other whereupon he took up this parable. I am like the man with the two wives, the one young and the other old. The young one plucked out all his gray hairs that he might look young. The old wife pulled out all his black hairs that he might look old. And so between the two he became bald. So it is with me between you. 3. The Law If now with offensive brevity and ecumenical ignorance we attempt to sketch some phases of this immense Talmud that entered into every cranny of medieval Hebrew life, let us confess that we are but scratching a mountain, and that our external approach condemns us to error. 1. Theology First, said the rabbis, one must study the law, written and oral. Greater is study of Torah than the rebuilding of the temple. Every day when a man busies himself with the study of the law, he should say to himself, It is as if this day I received it from Sinai. No other study is necessary. Greek philosophy, secular science, may be studied only at that hour which is neither day nor night. Every word of the Hebrew Scriptures is literally the word of God. Even the Song of Songs is a hymn inspired by God to portray allegorically the union of Yahweh with Israel as His chosen bride. Since without the law there would be moral chaos, the law must have existed before the creation of the world in the bosom or mind of God. Only its communication to Moses was an event in time. The Talmud, so far as it is halakha, is also God's eternal word. It is the formulation of laws orally communicated to Moses by God and by Moses to his successors, and its decrees are as binding as anything in the Scriptures. Some rabbis rank the Mishnah above the Scriptures in authority as being a later and revised form of the law. Certain rabbinical edicts frankly voided laws of the Pentateuch or interpreted them into harmlessness. During the Middle Ages, from 476 to 1492, the Jews of Germany and France studied the Talmud far more than the Scriptures. The Talmud, like the Bible, takes for granted the existence of an intelligent and omnipotent God. There were occasional skeptics among the Jews, like the learned Elisha ben Abuya, whom the pious Rabbi Meir befriended. But they were apparently a tiny and hardly vocal minority. The Talmud's God is frankly anthropomorphic. He loves and hates, gets angry, laughs, weeps, feels remorse, wears phylacteries, sits on a throne surrounded by a ministering hierarchy of cherubim and seraphim, and studies the Torah three times a day. The rabbis acknowledged that these human attributes were a bit hypothetical, we borrow terms from his creatures to apply to him, they said, in order to assist the understanding. It was not their fault if the commonality could think only in pictures. They also represented God as the soul of the universe, invisible, pervasive, 
vitalizing, at once transcendent and imminent, above the world and yet present in every nook and fragment of it. This universal divine presence, the Shekinah, or dwelling, is especially real in sacred places, persons, and things, and in moments of study or prayer. Nevertheless, this omnipresent God is one. Of all ideas, the most distasteful to Judaism is that of a plurality of gods. The unity of God is passionately reiterated against the polytheism of the pagans and the apparent tritheism of the Christian trinity. It is proclaimed in the most famous and universal of Jewish prayers, the Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. No Messiah, no prophet, no saint is to have a place beside him in his temple or worship. The rabbis forbade, except on rare occasions, the utterance of his name, hoping to deter profanity and magic, to avoid the sacred tetragrammaton, J-H-V-H, they used the word Adonai, Lord, and recommended even for this such substitutions as the Holy One, the Merciful One, the Heavens, and Our Father which is in Heaven. God can and does work miracles, especially through great rabbis, but these marvels are not to be thought of as infractions of nature's laws. There are no laws but the will of God. Everything created has a divine and beneficent purpose. God created the snail as a cure for the scab, the fly as a cure for the sting of the wasp, and the gnat as a cure for the bite of the serpent, and the serpent as a cure for a sore. Between God and man there is a continuous relation. Every step of man's life is taken in the inescapable sight of God. Every deed or thought of man's day honors or dishonors the divine presence. All men are descended from Adam. Nevertheless, man was first created with a tail like an animal. And up to the generation of Enoch, the faces of the people resembled those of monkeys. Man is composed of body and soul. His soul is from God, his body is of the earth. The soul impels him to virtue, the body to sin. Or perhaps his evil impulses come from Satan and that multitude of malignant spirits which lurks about everywhere. Every evil, however, may be ultimately good. Without his earthy desires, man might neither toil nor breed. Come, says a jolly passage, let us ascribe merit to our ancestors, for if they had not sinned, we should not have come into the world. Sin is natural, but its guilt is not inherited. The rabbis accepted the doctrine of the fall of man, but not of original sin or divine atonement. A man suffers only for his own sins. If he suffers more on earth than his sins seem to warrant, that may be because we do not know the full measure of his sins. Or such excess of punishment may be a great blessing, as entitling the sufferer to exceptional rewards in heaven. Therefore, said Akiva, a man should rejoice in the multitude of his misfortunes. As for death, it came into the world through sin. A really sinless person would never die. Death is a debt owed by a sinful humanity to the author of all life. A midrash tells a touching story of death and Rabbi Meir. While Rabbi Meir was holding his weekly discourse on a Sabbath afternoon, his two beloved sons died suddenly at home. Their mother covered them with a sheet and forbore to mourn on the sacred day. When Rabbi Meir returned after evening services, he asked for his sons, whom he had not seen in the synagogue. She asked him to recite the Habdalah, a ceremony marking the close of the Sabbath, and gave him his evening meal. Then she said, I have a question to ask thee. A friend once gave me jewels to keep for him. Now he wishes them again. Shall I return them? Beyond doubt thou must, said Rabbi Meir. His wife took him by the hand, led him to the bed, and drew back the sheet. Rabbi Meir burst into bitter weeping, and his wife said, They were entrusted to us for a time. Now their master has taken back his very own. The Hebrew Scriptures had said little of an immortality of reward and punishment, but that idea now played a major role in rabbinical theology. Hell was pictured at Gehinnom, or Sheol, and divided like heaven into seven stories with graduated degrees of torment. Only the most wicked of the circumcised would enter it, and even confirmed sinners would not be punished forever. All who go down to hell shall come up again, except these three, he who commits adultery, he who shames another in public, and he who gives another a bad name. Heaven was called Gan Eden, and was represented as a garden of every physical and spiritual delight. The wine there would be of a vintage preserved from the six days of the creation. Perfumes would bless the air, and God himself would join the saved in a banquet whose supreme joy would be the sight of his face. 
However, some rabbis confess that no man can say what lies beyond the grave. The Jews thought of salvation in terms of the nation rather than of the individual. Driven across the earth with apparently irrational ruthlessness, they strengthened themselves with the belief that they were still the chosen and favored people of God. He was their father and a just God. It could not be that he would break covenant with Israel. Was it not to them that he had given those scriptures which both the Christians and the Moslems accepted and revered? In the depths of their despair they mounted to such compensatory pride that their rabbis, who had exalted them, had to humble them with reproof. Then, as now, they longed for the land of their nation's birth, and idealized it in loving memory. He who walks four ells in Palestine is sure of everlasting life, they said. He who lives in Palestine is without sin. Even the merest talk of those who dwell in Palestine is Torah. The central part of the daily prayers, the Shemona Ezra, or eighteen paragraphs, included a petition for the coming of the Son of David, the Messiah King who would make the Jews a nation again, united, free, worshipping God in their own temple with the ancient ritual and song. 2. Ritual What distinguished the Jews in this age of faith, but kept them one in their scattering, was not theology, but ritual, not a creed that Christianity had merely extended and that Islam would substantially adopt, but a ceremonial law of such burdensome complexity that only this proud and high-strung people showed the humility and patience required to obey it. Christianity sought unity through uniform belief, Judaism through uniform ritual. The laws were given, said Abba Areca, only for the purpose of disciplining and refining men by their observance. The ritual was first of all a law of worship. When the synagogue succeeded the temple, animal sacrifice was replaced by offerings and prayer. But no more in the synagogue than in the temple was any image of God or man allowed. Every approach to idol worship was shunned, and instrumental music permitted in the temple was forbidden in the synagogue. Here Christianity diverged, Mohammedanism stemmed from Judaism. The Semites developed a somber piety, the Christians a somber art. Prayer made every day, almost every hour, a religious experience for the Orthodox Jew. Morning prayers were to be said with phylacteries, small cases containing passages from the scriptures, affixed to the forehead and the arms. No meal was to be eaten without a brief grace before it, and a longer prayer of thanksgiving at its close. But these domestic prayers were not enough. Men can be held together only by doing things together, and the rabbis argued with oriental hyperbole that a man's prayer is heard by God only when offered in a synagogue. The public liturgy consisted mainly of the Shemona Ezra, the Shema Yisrael, readings from the Pentateuch, the Prophets, and the Psalms, a homily of scriptural explanation, the Kaddish, or prayers of praise and blessing for the living and the dead, and a concluding benediction. This remains the essential synagogue ritual to the present day. Far more detailed than these regulations of worship were the rules for cleanliness or ritual purity. Physical hygiene was considered favorable to spiritual health. The rabbis forbade living in a city in which there was no bathhouse, and gave almost medical instructions for the bath. If one bathes with hot water and does not follow it with cold water, it is like iron which is inserted into a furnace and not afterward plunged into cold water. The body, like the iron, must be tempered and steeled. Anointing should follow the bath. Hands were to be washed immediately upon rising, before and after each meal, and before ceremonial prayer or any other ritual observance. Corpses, sexual functions, menstruation, childbirth, vermin, pigs, and leprosy, that is, various skin diseases, were ritually, that is, by religious law, unclean. Persons touched or affected by any of these were to go to the synagogue and perform a purification ceremonial. A woman was considered unclean, not to be sexually approached, for forty days after bearing a son, eighty days after bearing a daughter. In accord with the biblical injunction, see Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14, a boy was to be circumcised on his eighth day. This was represented as a sacrifice to, and a covenant with, Yahweh. But the prevalence of the custom among Egyptians, Ethiopians, Phoenicians, Syrians, and Arabs suggests that it was a hygienic measure, indicated in a climate more favorable to sexual precocity and excitability than to cleanliness. And this conclusion is reinforced by the rabbinical command that no Jew should keep beyond twelve months an uncircumcised slave. The Talmud occasionally reads like a manual of home medicine rather than a code of religious laws. 
It had to be an encyclopedia of advice for its people. The Jews of the 4th and 5th centuries, like most Mediterranean peoples, were slipping back into the medical superstitions and makeshifts of the isolated and the poor. And a good deal of this popular and superstitious medicine entered into the Talmud. Nevertheless, we find in the Babylonian Gemara excellent descriptions of the esophagus, larynx, trachea, lungs, meninges, and genitals. Tumors of the lungs, cirrhosis of the liver, caseous degeneration, and many other diseases are accurately described. The rabbis note that flies in drinking cups may carry infection. And hemophilia is recognized as an hereditary ailment, making circumcision of the offspring inadvisable. Mingled with these ideas are magical formulas for exercising demons supposed to cause disease. The rabbis, like all of us, were experts on diet. Dietary wisdom begins with the teeth. These should never be extracted, no matter how they ache, for if a man chews well with his teeth, his feet will find strength. Vegetables and fruits, except the date, are highly recommended. Meat is a luxury which only the well-washed should have. The animal is to be killed in such a way as to minimize its pain and draw the blood out of the meat. To eat flesh with blood is an abomination. Hence the slaughter of animals for food must be left to trained persons who will also examine the viscera to make sure that the animal is not diseased. Meat and milk and dishes prepared with them must not be eaten at the same meal or even placed near each other in the kitchen. The flesh of swine is to be abhorred. Eat no eggs, onions, or garlic that have been left overnight without their shell or peel. Eat at stated hours only. Don't peck all day like hens. More people die from overeating than from undernourishment. Up to forty eating is beneficial. After that age, drinking is beneficial. Moderation in drinking is better than total abstinence. Wine is often a good medicine, and there is no gladness without it. Pursuing the subject of diet to its end, the rabbis argued that he who prolongs his stay in a privy lengthens his years, and recommended a prayer of thanksgiving after every answer to nature's call. They frowned upon asceticism and counseled their people to enjoy the good things of life where no sin was involved. Fasts were obligatory at certain periods and on some holy days, but perhaps here too religion was used as a prod to health. The wisdom of the race bade the Jews keep festival and make feast now and then, despite the overtones of sorrow and longing that sounded even in their joys. On a festival a man must make glad his wife and household. If possible, he must outfit them with new clothes. The Sabbath, greatest of Jewish inventions, was apparently a burden in Talmudic days. The pious Jew was then expected to speak as little as possible, light no fire in his home, and spend hours at the synagogue and in prayer. A long tractate discussed with head-splitting, hair-splitting, just what might and what might not be done on the Sabbath. But the casuistry of the rabbis was directed to mitigating rather than increasing the terrors of piety. Their subtlety devised convincing reasons for doing what one had to do on the day of rest. Moreover, the good Jew discovered a secret happiness in observing the ancient Sabbath ritual. He began it with a little ceremony of sanctification, or kiddush. Surrounded by his family and his guests, for this was a favorite day for entertaining friends, he took a full cup of wine, pronounced a benediction over it, drank, and passed the cup along for guests and wife and children to drink. Then he took bread and blessed it, thanking the God who bringeth forth bread from the earth, and passed portions of it to all who shared his table. No fasting or mourning was permitted on the Sabbath. Many holy days divided the year and gave new occasions for pious remembrance or grateful rest. Pesach, beginning on the 14th of Nisan, or April, commemorated through eight days the escape of the Jews from Egypt. In biblical times it had been called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because the Jews had fled with the dough of their bread still unleavened. Talmudic times called it Pesach, that is, Passover, because Yahweh, smiting the firstborn of the Egyptians, passed over those houses whose doorposts had been sprinkled by the Jewish occupants with the blood of the Lamb. On the first day of the feast the Jews celebrated the Paschal meal, or Seder. Each father acted as leader of the service for his gathered family, performed with them a ritual recalling those bitter mosaic days, and passed on, by questions and answers, their treasured story to the young. At Pentecost, seven weeks after Passover, the feast of Shavuot celebrated the wheat harvest and the revelation on Mount Sinai. On the first day of Tishri, the seventh month of the ecclesiastical, the first month of the Jewish civil year, corresponding roughly with the autumnal equinox, the Jews celebrated Rosh Hashanah, the feast of the new year and of the month's new moon, and blew the ram's horn, or shofar, to commemorate the revealing of the Torah, 
to call men to repentance and to anticipate the happy day when such a blast would summon all the Jews of the world to worship their God in Jerusalem. From the eve of Rosh Hashanah to the tenth day of Tishri were penitential days. On all but the ninth of those days, pious Jews fasted and prayed. And on the tenth, Yom Kippurim, the day of atonement, from sunset to sunset, they were not to eat or drink or wear shoes or labor or bathe or indulge in love. All day long they attended services in the synagogue, confessed and mourned their sins and those of their people, even from the worship of the golden calf. On the fifteenth day of Tishri came Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacles. For seven days the Jews were supposed to live in booths to commemorate the tents in which it was said their ancestors had slept during their forty years' sojourn in the wilderness. In the dispersion, a literal fulfillment of this old vintage or harvest festival offered difficulties, and the rabbis showed their goodwill by redefining sukkah to mean almost anything that could symbolize a habitation. On the twenty-fifth of the ninth month, Kislev, or December, and for seven days thereafter, the Feast of Hanukkah, or Dedication, recalled the purification of the temple by the Maccabees in 165 B.C., after its defilement by Antiochus Epiphanes. On the fourteenth of Adar, or March, the Jews celebrated Purim, or Lots, the deliverance of their people from the wiles of the Persian minister Haman by Esther and Mordecai. Gifts and good wishes were exchanged in a joyful and vinous feast. On that day, said Rab Rabba, a man should drink until he could no longer distinguish between Cursed be Haman and Cursed be Mordecai. We must not think of those Talmudic Jews as doer pessimists, sick with the pangs of despised talents, tossed about by the storms of doctrine and lost in longing for their ravished fatherland. Amid dispersion and oppression, atonement and poverty, they kept their heads erect, relished the tang and strife of life, the brief beauty of their burdened women, and the abiding splendor of earth and sky. Every day, said Rabbi Meir, a man should utter a hundred benedictions. And another said, for all of us, To walk even four ells without bowing the head is an offense to heaven. For is it not written, The whole earth is full of his glory? 3. Ethics of the Talmud The Talmud is not only an encyclopedia of Jewish history, theology, ritual, medicine, and folklore. It is also a treatise on agriculture, gardens, industry, the professions, commerce, finance, taxation, property, slavery, inheritance, theft, legal procedure, and penal law. To do the book justice it would be necessary with polymathic wisdom, to survey its judgments in all these fields. The Talmud is above all a code of ethics, so different from the Christian and so like the Moslem that even a running acquaintance with it challenges the view of the Middle Ages as merely the story of medieval Christianity. The three religions agreed in rejecting the practicability of a natural or non-religious morality. Most men, they believed, can be persuaded to tolerable behavior only by the fear of God. All three based their moral code on identical conceptions the all-seeing eye and all-recording hand of God, the divine authorship of the moral code, and the ultimate equalization of virtue with happiness by post-mortem punishments and rewards. In the two Semitic cultures, law, as well as ethics, was inseparable from religion. No distinction was admitted between crime and sin, between civil and ecclesiastical law. Every discreditable act is an offense against God, a profanation of His presence and holy name. The three religions agreed further on certain elements of morality, the sanctity of the family and the home, the honor due to parents and the old, the loving care of children, and charity to all. No people has surpassed the Jews in the order of beauty of family life. In Judaism, as in Islam, voluntary celibacy or childlessness was a major sin. To make a home and a family was a religious mandate, the first of the 613 precepts of the law. A childless person, says a Midrash, is accounted as dead. Jew, Christian, and Moslem agreed that the adequate continuance of the group is endangered when the religious command to parentage loses its force. Under certain circumstances, however, the rabbis permitted family limitation, preferably by contraception. There are three classes of women who should employ an absorbent, a minor lest pregnancy should prove fatal, a pregnant woman lest abortion should result, and a nursing mother lest she become pregnant and prematurely wean the child so that it dies. The Jews, like their contemporaries, were reluctant to have daughters, but rejoiced at the birth of a son. He, not she, could carry on the father's name, family, and property, and tend his grave. The daughter would marry into another, perhaps a distant household, and be lost to her parents as soon as her rearing was complete. 
But once children came, they were cherished without favoritism and with a wise mixture of discipline and love. If thou must strike a child, said one rabbi, do it with a shoestring. If one refrains from punishing a child, says another, it will end by becoming utterly depraved. Every sacrifice must be made to give the child an education, that is, to instruct the mind and train the character by a knowledge of the law and the prophets. The world is saved, said a Hebrew proverb, by the breath of school children. The Shekinah, or divine presence, shines in their faces. The child, in turn, must honor and protect the parents under all conditions to the end. Charity was an inescapable obligation. Greater is he who practices charity than he who performs all the sacrifices. Some Jews were niggardly, some were miserly, but by and large no other people has ever given as generously as the Jews. The rabbis had to forbid men to give more than a fifth of their property to charity, yet some were found at their death to have given half. On Abba Umna's face there was always a holy peace. He was a surgeon, but would never accept with his hands any payment for his service. He had a box placed in the corner of his consulting room, so that those who were able to pay could deposit what they wished, and those who could not afford to pay would not be shamed. Rav Huna, when he sat down to a meal, would open the doors and exclaim, Let whoever is in need enter and eat. Kama ben Eli gave bread to all who sought it, and kept his hand in his purse when he walked abroad, so that none need hesitate to ask. But the Talmud reproved conspicuous giving, and counseled a modest secrecy. He who dispenses charity in private is greater than Moses. To the institution of marriage the rabbis addressed all their learning and eloquence. On it and religion rested the whole structure of Jewish life. They did not condemn the sexual appetite, but they feared its force and labored to control it. Some advised that salt be eaten with bread to lessen the seminal fluid. Others felt that the only recourse against sexual temptation was hard work combined with the study of the Torah. If this availed not, let him go to a place where he is unknown, put on black clothes, and do what his heart desires, but let him not publicly profane the name. A man should avoid any situation that may excite his passions. He should not talk much with women, and he should never walk behind a woman along the road, not even his own wife. A man should walk behind a lion rather than behind a woman. The delightful humor of the rabbis appears again in the story of Reb Kahan. He was once selling ladies' baskets when he was exposed to temptation. He pleaded with his tempter to let him off and promised to return. But instead of returning, he went up to the roof of a house and threw himself down. Before he reached the ground, Elijah came and caught him and reproached him with having brought him a distance of four hundred miles to save him from self-destruction. The rabbis apparently felt that virginity is all right in its place, but that perpetual virginity is arrested development. In their view, the supreme perfection of a woman is perfect motherhood, as the supreme virtue of man is perfect fatherhood. Every father was urged to save and provide a dowry for each of his daughters, and a marriage settlement for each son, lest their marriage be unhealthily delayed. Early marriage was recommended, at fourteen for the girl, eighteen for the man. A girl might legally marry at twelve years and six months, a man at thirteen. Postponement of marriage was permitted to students engaged in the study of the law. Some rabbis argued that a man should get his economic footing before marrying. A man should first build a house, then plant a vineyard, then marry. But this was a minority opinion, and perhaps involved no contradiction if the parents provided the expected financial aid. The youth was advised to choose his mate not for her beauty, but for her prospective qualities as a mother. To send a step in choosing a wife, ascend a step in choosing a friend. To marry a woman above one's rank is to invite contumely. The Talmud, like the Old Testament and the Koran, allowed polygamy. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 1, Side 2. The Talmud, like the Old Testament and the Koran, allowed polygamy. A man may marry as many wives as he pleases, said one rabbi, but another passage in the same tractate limited the number to four and a third required the husband, when taking a second wife, to give a divorce to the first if she should ask for it. The institution of the leveret, by which a Jew was required to marry his brother's widow, presumed polygamy, and was probably due not only to kindly sentiment, but also to a desire for a high birth rate in a community which, like all ancient and medieval societies, suffered high mortality. Having allowed such freedom for mating for the man, the rabbis made adultery a capital crime. Some of them agreed with Jesus that 
one may commit adultery with the eyes. Some went further, saying, Whoever regards even the little finger of a woman hath already sinned in his heart. But Rabba Rekha was more humane. A man will have a demerit on his record on judgment day for everything he beheld with his eyes and declined to enjoy. Divorce by mutual consent was allowed. The husband could be divorced only with his consent, the wife without her consent. To divorce an adulterous wife was mandatory, and divorce was recommended where the wife had remained childless ten years after marriage. The school of Shammai had allowed the husband to put away his wife only for adultery. The school of Hillel allowed it if the husband found in her anything unseemly. Hillel's view prevailed in the Talmudic period, and Akiva went so far as to say that a husband may divorce his wife if he finds another woman more beautiful. A man might, without surrendering the marriage settlement, divorce a woman who transgresses Jewish law, such as going in public with uncovered head, spinning in the street, or conversing with all sorts of men. Or a loud-voiced woman, that is, one who talks in her house and her neighbors can hear what she says. Desertion by the husband gave no ground for divorce. Some rabbis permitted the wife to ask the court for divorce from a cruel, impotent, or unwilling husband, or one who did not support her properly, or was maimed, or stank. The rabbis did something to discourage divorce by requiring complex legal formalities, and in all but a few cases the forfeiture of both dowry and marriage settlement to the wife. The very altar sheds tears, said Rabbi Eliezer, on him who divorces the wife of his youth. All in all, Talmudic law, like the Mohammedan, was man-made law, and favored the male so strongly as to suggest in the rabbis a very terror of woman's power. Like the Christian fathers, they blamed her for extinguishing the soul of the world through Eve's intelligent curiosity. They considered woman light-minded, and yet admitted in her an instinctive wisdom missing in man. They deplored the loquacity of women at great length. Ten measures of speech descended to the world. Women took nine, men one. They condemned their addiction to the occult, to rouge and coal. They approved of a man spending generously on his wife's raiment, but wished she would beautify herself for her husband rather than for other men. In law, according to one rabbi, a hundred women are equal to only one witness. Their property rights were as limited in the Talmud as in eighteenth-century England. Their earnings and the income from any property they might own belonged to their husbands. Woman's place was in the home. In the utopian days of the Messiah, said a hopeful rabbi, woman will bear a child every day. A man who has a bad wife will never see the face of hell. On the other hand, no man is so rich, said Akiva, as one who has a wife noted for her good deeds. Everything derives from the woman, says a Midrash. According to Hebrew Proverbs, all the blessings of a household come through the wife. Therefore should her husband honor her. Let men beware of causing women to weep. God counts their tears. In the most delightful part of the Talmud, the little treatise Perke Avot, an unknown editor gathered the maxims of the great rabbis of the last two centuries before and the first two centuries after Christ. Many of these apothems praise wisdom and some define it. Ben Zoma said, Who is wise? He who learns from every man. Who is mighty? He who subdues his evil inclination. He that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh the city. Who is rich? He who rejoices in his lot. When thou eatest of the labor of thy hands, happy shalt thou be. Who is honored? He who honors his fellow men. Despise not any man nor anything, for there is no man that has not his hour, and there is nothing that has not its place. All my days I grew up among the sages, and I have found nothing better for a person than silence. Rabbi Eliezer used to say, One whose wisdom exceeds his deeds may be compared to a tree, whereof the branches are many and the roots few so that when the winds come it is uprooted and turned upon its face. But one whose deeds exceed his wisdom may be compared to a tree whereof the branches are few and the roots many, so that even if all the winds in the world blow upon it, they move it not from its place. 4. Life and the Law The Talmud is not a work of art. The task of reducing the thought of a thousand years into a coherent system proved too much even for a hundred patient rabbis. Several tractates are obviously in the wrong seder or order. Several chapters are in the wrong tractate. Subjects are taken up, dropped, and lawlessly resumed. It is not the product of deliberation. It is the deliberation itself. All views are recorded, and contradictions are often left unresolved. It is as if we had crossed fifteen centuries to eavesdrop on the most intimate discussions of the schools. 
and heard Akiva and Meir and Jehuda Hanasi and Rab in the heat of their debates. Remembering that we are interlopers, that these men and the others have had their casual words snatched from their mouths and cast into uncalculated contexts and sent hurtling down the years, we can forgive the casuistry, sophistry, legends, astrology, demonology, superstition, magic, miracles, numerology, and revelatory dreams, the Pelion Asa of argument crowning a web of fantasy, the consolatory vanity forever healing frustrated hope. If we resent the stringency of these laws, the intrusive minuteness of these regulations, the oriental severity of punishment for their violation, we must not take the matter too much to heart. The Jews made no pretense to keeping all these commandments, and the rabbis winked on every other page at the gap between their counsels of perfection and the stealthy frailties of men. If Israel should properly observe a single Sabbath, said a cautious rabbi, the son of David would come immediately. The Talmud was not a code of laws requiring strict obedience. It was a record of rabbinical opinion, gathered for the guidance of leisurely piety. The untutored masses obeyed only a choice few of the precepts of the law. There was in the Talmud a strong emphasis on ritual, but that was in part the Jews' reaction to the attempts of church and state to make him abandon his law. The ritual was a mark of identity, a bond of unity and continuity, a badge of defiance to a never-forgiving world. Here and there in these twenty volumes we find words of hatred for Christianity, but they were for a Christianity that had forgotten the gentleness of Christ, that persecuted the adherents of the law that Christ had bidden his followers to fulfill, and that had in the views of the rabbis abandoned the monotheism which was the inalienable essence of the ancient faith. Amid these ceremonial complexities and controversial barbs, we find hundreds of sage counsels and psychological insights, and occasional passages recalling the majesty of the Old Testament or the mythical tenderness of the New. The whimsical humor characteristic of the Jew lightens the burden of the long lesson. So one rabbi tells how Moses entered incognito into Akiva's classroom, sat in the last row, and marveled at the many laws derived by the great teacher from the Mosaic Code, and of which its amanuensis had never dreamed. For fourteen hundred years the Talmud was the core of Jewish education. Seven hours a day, through seven years, the Hebrew youth pored over it, recited it, sank it into his memory by sound and sight. And like the Confucian classics, similarly memorized, it formed mind and character by the discipline of its study and the deposit of its lore. The method of teaching was not by mere recitation and repetition. It was also by disputation between master and pupil, between pupil and pupil, and the application of old laws to the circumstances of the new day. The result was a sharpness of intellect, a retentiveness of memory that gave the Jew an advantage in many spheres requiring clarity, concentration, persistence, and exactitude, while at the same time it tended to narrow the range and freedom of the Jewish mind. The Talmud tamed the excitable nature of the Jew. It checked his individualism and molded him to fidelity and sobriety in his family and his community. Superior minds may have been hampered by the yoke of the law, but the Jews as a whole were saved. The Talmud can never be understood except in terms of history, as an organ of survival for a people exiled, destitute, oppressed, and in danger of utter disintegration. What the prophets had done to uphold the Jewish spirit in the Babylonian captivity, the rabbis did in this wider dispersion. Pride had to be regained, order had to be established, faith and morals maintained, health of body and mind rebuilt after a shattering experience. Through this heroic discipline, this rerouting of the uprooted Jew in his own tradition, stability and unity were restored through continents of wandering and centuries of grief. The Talmud, as Heine said, was a portable fatherland. Wherever Jews were, even as fearful enclaves in alien lands, they could put themselves again into their own world and live with their prophets and rabbis by bathing their minds and hearts in the ocean of the law. No wonder they loved this book, to us more undulant and diverse than a hundred Montaigne's. They preserved even fragments of it with fierce affection, took their turns in reading snatches of the enormous manuscript, paid great sums in later centuries to have it printed in all its fullness, wept when kings and popes and parliaments banned or confiscated or burned it, rejoiced to hear Reuchlin and Erasmus defend it, and made it even to our own time the most precious possession of their temples and their homes, the refuge, solace, and prison of the Jewish soul. Chapter 16. The Medieval Jews, 565-1300. to 1300. 1. The Oriental Communities. Israel now had a law, but no state, a book, but no home. 
To 614, Jerusalem was a Christian city, till 629, Persian, till 637, again Christian, then till 1099, a Muslim provincial capital. In that year the Crusaders besieged Jerusalem. The Jews joined the Moslems in its defense. When it fell, the surviving Jews were driven into a synagogue and were burned to death. A rapid growth of Palestinian Jewry followed the recapture of Jerusalem by Saladin in 1187. And Saladin's brother, the Sultan al-Adil, welcomed the 300 rabbis who in 1211 fled from England and France. Fifty-two years later, however, Nachmanides found there a mere handful of Jews. The holy city had become overwhelmingly Mohammedan. Despite conversions and occasional persecutions, Jews remained numerous in Muslim Syria, Babylonia, and Persia, and developed a vigorous economic and cultural life. In their internal affairs they continued, as under the Sasanian kings, to enjoy self-government under their exilarch and the directors of their rabbinical academies. The exilarch was accepted by the caliphs as the head of all the Jews in Babylonia, Armenia, Turkestan, Persia, and Yemen. According to Benjamin of Tudela, all subjects of the caliphs were required to rise in the presence of the prince of the captivity and to salute him respectfully. The office of exilarch was hereditary in one family, which traced its lineage to David. It was a political rather than a spiritual power, and its efforts to control the rabbinate led to its decline and fall. After 762, the directors of the academies elected and dominated the exilarch. The rabbinical colleges at Sora and Pambaditha provided religious and intellectual leadership for the Jews of Islam, and in less degree for those of Christendom. In 658, the Caliph Ali freed the Academy of Sura from the jurisdiction of the Exilarch. Thereupon its head, Mar Isaac, took the title Gayon, or Excellency, and inaugurated the Gayonet, the epic of the Gayonim in Babylonian religion and scholarship. As the College of Pambaditha rose in revenues and dignity from its proximity to Baghdad, its directors also assumed the title of Gayon. From the 7th to the 11th century, questions in Talmudic law were addressed to these Gayonim from all the Jewish world. Their responsa created a new legal literature for Judaism. The rise of the Gayonim coincided with, perhaps in some measure it was necessitated by, a heresy that now shook and divided Oriental Jewry. In 762, when the exilarch Solomon died, his nephew, Anan ben David, stood in line for the succession. But the heads of Sura and Pambaditha, discarding the hereditary principle, installed as exilarch Anan's younger brother, Chananya. Anan denounced the two Gayanim, fled to Palestine, established his own synagogue, and called upon Jews everywhere to reject the Talmud and obey only the law of the Pentateuch. This was a return to the position of the Sadducees. It corresponded to the repudiation of the traditions and exaltation of the Quran by the Shia sect in Islam, and to the Protestant abandonment of Catholic traditions for a return to the Gospels. Anon went further and re-examined the Pentateuch in a commentary that marked a bold advance in the critical study of the biblical text. He protested against the changes that the Talmudic rabbis had made in the Mosaic Law by their adaptive interpretations, and insisted on the strict fulfillment of the Pentateuch decrees. Hence his followers received the name of Karaites, adherents of the text. Anan praised Jesus as a holy man who had wished to set aside not the written law of Moses, but only the oral law of the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus, in Anan's view, had aimed not to found a new religion, but to cleanse and strengthen Judaism. The Karaites became numerous in Palestine, Egypt, and Spain. They declined in the twelfth century, and only a vanishing remnant survives in Turkey, South Russia, and Arabia. Karaites of the ninth century, presumably influenced by the Mutazilites of Islam, abandoned Anand's principle of literal interpretation and proposed that the resurrection of the body and certain physical descriptions of God in the Bible should be taken with a metaphorical grain of salt. The Orthodox Rabbinite Jews, reverting to literalism in their turn, insisted, like Orthodox Muslims, that phrases like God's hand or God sitting down were to be taken literally. Some expositors calculated the precise measurements of God's body, members, and beard. A few Jewish freethinkers, like Chivi al-Balki, rejected even the Pentateuch as a binding law. It was in this environment of economic prosperity, religious freedom, and lively debate that Judaism produced its first famous medieval philosopher. Sadia ben Joseph al-Fayumi was born at Dilaz, a village of the Fayum, in 892. He grew up in Egypt and married there. In 915 he migrated to Palestine, then to Babylonia. He must have been an apt student and sound teacher, 
for at the youthful age of thirty-six he was made Gaon or director of the college at Sura. Perceiving the inroads that Karaism and skepticism had made upon Orthodox Judaism, he set himself the same task that the Mutakalimun had undertaken in Islam, to demonstrate the full accord of the traditional faith with reason and history. In his brief life of fifty years, Sadia produced, mostly in Arabic, a mass of writings rivaled only by those of Maimonides in the record of medieval Jewish thought. His Agron, an Aramaic dictionary of Hebrew, founded Hebrew philology. His Kitab al luga or Book of Language, is the oldest known grammar of the Hebrew tongue. His Arabic translation of the Old Testament remained to our time the version used by Arabic-speaking Jews. His several commentaries on books of the Bible ranked him as perhaps the greatest Bible commentator of all time. His Kitab al amanat or Book of Philosophical Doctrines and Beliefs of 933, is the Summa Contra Gentiles of Jewish theology. Sadia accepts both revelation and tradition, the written and the oral law, but he also accepts reason and proposes to prove by reason the truth of revelation and tradition. Wherever the Bible clearly contradicts reason, we may assume that the passage is not meant to be taken literally by adult minds. Anthropomorphic descriptions of the deity are to be understood metaphorically. God is not like a man. The order and law of the world indicate an intelligent creator. It is unreasonable to suppose that an intelligent God would fail to reward virtue, but obviously virtue is not always rewarded in this life. Consequently, there must be another life, which will redeem the apparent injustice of this one. Perhaps the sufferings of the virtuous here are punishments for their occasional sins, so that they may enter paradise at once when they die. And the earthly triumphs of the wicked are rewards for their incidental virtues. But even those who achieve the highest virtue, prosperity and happiness on earth, feel in their hearts that there is a better state than this one of indefinite possibilities and limited fulfillments. And how could a God intelligent enough to create so marvelous a world allow such hopes to form in the soul if they were never to be realized? Sadia took a leaf or two from Moslem theologians and followed their methods of exposition, even now and then the details of their argument. In turn his work permeated the Jewish world and influenced Maimonides. Were it not for Sadia, said Ben Maimon, the Torah would almost have disappeared. It must be admitted that Sadia was a man of some acerbity, and that his quarrel with the exilarch David ben Zakkai injured Babylonian Jewry. In 930 David excommunicated Sadia, and Sadia excommunicated David. In 940 David died, and Sadia appointed a new exilarch. But this appointee was assassinated by Moslems, on the ground that he had disparaged Muhammad. Sadia appointed the victim's son to succeed him, whereupon this youth also was slain. The discouraged Jews decided to leave the office unfulfilled, and in 942 the Babylonian exilarchate closed its career of seven centuries. In that year Sadia died. The disintegration of the Baghdad Caliphate, the establishment of Egypt, North Africa, and Spain as independent Muslim states, weakened the bonds between Asiatic, African, and European Jewry. The Babylonian Jews shared in the economic decline of Eastern Islam after the 10th century. The College of Sura closed its doors in 1034, that of Pambaditha four years later, and in 1040 the Gayanate came to an end. The Crusades further isolated the Babylonian from the Egyptian and European Jews, and after the Mongol sack of Baghdad in 1258, the Babylonian Jewish community almost disappeared from history. Long before these catastrophes, many Oriental Jews had migrated to further Asia, Arabia, Egypt, North Africa, and Europe. Ceylon had 23,000 Hebrews in 1165. Several Jewish communities in Arabia survived the hostility of Muhammad. When Amr conquered Egypt in 641, he reported 40,000 tributary, that is, tax-paying, Jews in Alexandria. As Cairo spread its proliferation, its Jewish population, Orthodox and Karaite, increased. The Egyptian Jews enjoyed self-government in internal affairs under their Nagid, or prince. They rose to wealth in commerce and to a high place in the administration of the Moslem state. In 960, according to a tradition, four rabbis sailed from Bari in Italy. Their vessel was captured by a Spanish Moslem admiral, and they were sold into slavery. Rabbi Moses and his son Hanach at Cordova, Rabbi Shemaria at Alexandria, Rabbi Hushiel at Karwan. Each rabbi, we are told, was freed and founded an academy in the city where he had been sold. It is usually assumed, but not certain, that they were scholars from Sura. In any case, they brought the learning of Eastern Jewry to the West, 
and while Judaism declined in Asia, it entered upon its halcyon days in Egypt and Spain. 2. The European Communities Jews made their way into medieval Russia from Babylonia and Persia through Transoxiana and the Caucasus, and up the Black Sea coast from Asia Minor through Constantinople. In that capital and in the Byzantine realm, the Jews enjoyed a harassed prosperity from the 8th to the 12th century. Greece had several substantial Jewish communities, notably at Thebes, where their silk manufacturers earned high repute. Up through Thessaly, Thrace, and Macedonia, the Jews migrated into the Balkans and followed the Danube into Hungary. A handful of Hebrew merchants came to Poland from Germany in the 10th century. Jews had been in Germany since pre-Christian times. In the ninth century there were considerable Jewish settlements at Metz, Speyer, Mainz, Worms, Strasbourg, Frankfurt, and Cologne. These groups were too busy and mobile with commerce to contribute much to cultural history. However, Gershom ben Jehuda, from 960 to 1028, founded a rabbinical academy at Mainz, wrote a Hebrew commentary on the Talmud, and acquired such authority that German Jewry addressed to him rather than to the Geonim of Babylonia, their questions on Talmudic law. There were Jews in England in 691. Many more came in with William the Conqueror, and were at first protected by the Norman rulers as providers of capital and collectors of revenue. Their communities in London, Norwich, York, and other English centers were just outside the jurisdiction of local authorities and were subject only to the king. This legal isolation widened the barrier between Christian and Jew and played a part in the pogroms of the 12th century. Gaul had had Jewish merchants from the time of Caesar. By 600 there were Jewish colonies in all the major cities. The Merovingian kings persecuted them with pious ferocity. Kilperic ordered them all to accept Christianity or have their eyes torn out in 581. Charlemagne, while maintaining discriminatory laws against the Jews, protected them as useful and enterprising farmers and craftsmen, merchants, doctors, and financiers, and employed a Jew as his personal physician. In 787, according to a disputed tradition, he brought the Kalanamos family from Lucca to Mainz to encourage Jewish scholarship in the Frank realm. In 797, he sent a Jew as interpreter or as dragoman with an embassy to Harun al-Rashid. Louis the Pious favored the Jews as stimulators of commerce and appointed a magister judaiorum to guard their rights. Despite hostile legends, legal disabilities, and occasional minor persecutions, the Jews enjoyed in France in the ninth and 10th centuries a degree of prosperity and peace hardly known again by the Jews of Europe before the French Revolution. All through Italy there were little Jewish enclaves, from Trani to Venice and Milan. Jews were especially numerous in Padua, and may have influenced the growth of Averroism in the university there. Salerno, home of the first medieval school of scientific medicine in Latin Christendom, contained 600 Jews, several of them noted physicians. The emperor Frederick II had Jewish scholars at his court in Foggia, and Pope Alexander III, from 1159 to 1181, had several Jews in high position in his household. But Frederick joined with Pope Gregory IX in oppressive measures against the Jews of Italy. The Spanish Jews called themselves Sephardim and traced their origin to the royal tribe of Judah. After the conversion of King Recared, from 586 to 601, to Orthodox Christianity, the Visigothic government united with the powerful hierarchy of the Spanish church to make life less attractive to the Jews. They were excluded from public office and were forbidden to marry Christians or have Christian slaves. King Sisabit ordered all Jews to accept Christianity or emigrate in 613. His successor repealed this decree, but the Council of Toledo in 633 ruled that those Jews who had submitted to baptism and then returned to Judaism should be separated from their children and sold into slavery. King Kintala renewed Sisabit's decree in 638, and King Egica prohibited Jewish ownership of land and any business transaction between Christian and Jew in 693. When the Moors and Arabs invaded the peninsula in 711, the Jews helped them at every turn. The conquerors to repopulate the land invited immigration. 50,000 Jews came from Asia and Africa. Some towns, like Lucena, were inhabited almost wholly by Jews. Freed from economic disabilities, the Jews of Moslem Spain spread into every field of agriculture, industry, finance, and the professions. They adopted the dress, language, and customs of the Arabs, garbed themselves in turbans and silk robes, rode in carriages, and were hardly distinguishable from their Semitic cousins. 
Several Jews became court physicians, and one of these was made advisor to the greatest of the caliphs of Cordoba. Hastai ibn Shaprut, from 915 to 970, was to Abderrahman III what Nizam al-Muk in the next century would be to Malik Shah. Born in the wealthy and cultured Ibn Ezra family, his father taught him Hebrew, Arabic, and Latin. He studied medicine and other sciences at Cordoba, cured the caliph's ailments, and showed such wide knowledge and good judgment in politics that he was appointed to the diplomatic staff, apparently at the age of twenty-five. He was entrusted with ever larger responsibilities over the financial and commercial life of the state. He had no official title. The caliph hesitated to arouse resentment by making him officially vizier. But Hastai performed his many functions with such tact that he won the goodwill of Arabs, Jews, and Christians alike. He encouraged learning and literature, provided students with scholarships and books, and gathered about him a salon of poets, savants, and philosophers. When he died, Muslims vied with Jews in honoring his memory. There were similar if lesser figures elsewhere in Muslim Spain. At Seville, al-Mutamid invited to his court the scholar and astronomer Isaac ben Baruch, gave him the title of prince, and made him head rabbi of all the Jewish congregations there. At Granada, Samuel Halavi ibn Nagdala rivaled the power and wisdom and exceeded the learning of Hastai ibn Shaprut. Born in 933 and reared in Cordoba, he combined the study of the Talmud with that of Arabic literature, and both with the selling of spices. When Cordoba fell to the Berbers, he moved to Malaga, and there added to his modest income by composing letters for petitioners to King Habas of Granada. Struck with the calligraphy and diction of these letters, the king's vizier visited Samuel, took him to Granada, and installed him in the Alhambra as his secretary. Soon Samuel was also his advisor, and the vizier said that when Samuel gave counsel, the voice of God was heard. Dying, the vizier recommended Samuel as his successor, and in 1027 Samuel became the only Jew openly to hold the office and name of vizier in a Muslim state. This was the more feasible in Granada, where half the population in the eleventh century was Jewish. The Arabs soon applauded the choice, for under Samuel the little state flourished financially, politically, and culturally. He himself was a scholar, poet, astronomer, mathematician, and linguist, knowing seven tongues. He wrote chiefly in Hebrew twenty treatises on grammar, several volumes of poetry and philosophy, an introduction to the Talmud, and an anthology of Hebrew literature. He shared his fortune with other poets, came to the rescue of the poet and philosopher Ibn Gabirul, financed young students, and contributed to Jewish communities in three continents. While vizier to the king, he was also rabbi to the Jews, and lectured on the Talmud. His grateful people conferred upon him the title of Nagid, or prince, in Israel. When he died in 1055, he was succeeded as vizier and Nagid by his son, Joseph Ibn Nagdala. Those centuries, the 10th, 11th, and 12th, were the golden age of Spanish Jewry, the happiest and most fruitful period in medieval Hebrew history. When Moses ben Hanach, who died in 965, one of the Bari emigres, was ransomed in Cordoba, he organized there, with Hasdai's help, an academy that soon acquired the intellectual leadership of the Jewish world. Similar schools were opened at Lucena, Toledo, Barcelona, Granada, and whereas the schools of Eastern Jewry had almost confined themselves to religious education, these gave instruction also in literature, music, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, and philosophy. Such education gave to the upper half of the Jewish population in Spain a breadth and depth of culture and refinement at that time equaled only by their Muslim, Byzantine, and Chinese contemporaries. It was then a disgrace for a man of wealth or political position to be unacquainted with history, science, philosophy, and poetry. A Jewish aristocracy took form, graced by beautiful women. Perhaps it was too keenly conscious of its superiority, but it redeemed its pride by its sense that good birth and fortune are an obligation to generosity and excellence. The decline of Spanish Jewry might be dated from the fall of Joseph ibn Nagdala. He served the king almost as ably as his father had done, but not with the modest tact that had reconciled a population half Moorish to be ruled by a Jew. He took all power in his hands, dressed as royally as the king, and laughed at the Koran. Gossip called him an atheist. In 1066, the Arabs and Berbers revolted, crucified Joseph, massacred 4,000 Jews in Granada, and plundered their homes. The remaining Jews were compelled to sell their lands and emigrate. Twenty years later, the Almoravids came from Africa, aflame with orthodoxy, and the long honeymoon of Spanish Muslims and Jews was ended. A Mohammedan theologian announced that the Jews had promised Muhammad to accept Islam at the end of 500 years after the Hajira, if by that time their expected Messiah had not come. 
The five centuries were up in 1107 by Mohammedan reckoning. The Emir Yusuf demanded the conversion of all the Jews in Spain, but excused them on payment of an enormous sum into his treasury. When the Almohads replaced the Almoravids as rulers of Morocco and Moslem Spain in 1148, they gave the Jews and the Christians the same choice that King Sisabat had allowed the Jews 535 years before, apostasy or exile. Many Jews pretended conversion to Islam. Many followed the Christians into northern Spain. There at first they found a royal tolerance as magnanimous as that which they had enjoyed for four centuries under Islam. Alfonso the sixth and seventh of Castile treated the Jews well, made Jew and Christian equal before the law, and sternly repressed an anti-Semitic outbreak in Toledo in 1107, where there were then 72,000 Jews. A like entente between the mother and daughter religions prevailed for a century in Aragon. Indeed, King James I invited Jews to settle in Majorca, Catalonia, and Valencia, and in many cases gave Jewish settlers free homes and lands. In Barcelona they dominated commerce in the 12th century and owned a third of the soil. The Jews of Christian Spain were severely taxed, but they prospered and enjoyed internal autonomy. Trade flowed freely between Christian Jew and Moor. The three exchanged gifts on holidays. Now and then a king contributed to a synagogue building fund. From 1085 even to 1492, Jews could be found in high public office in Spanish Christian states as fiscal agents and diplomats, sometimes as ministers. During the 12th and 13th centuries, the Christian clergy joined in this Christian amity. The first outbreak of intolerance was among the Jews themselves. In 1149, Jehuda ibn Ezra, steward of the palace to Alfonso VII of Leon and Castile, turned the powers of his master's government against the Karaite Jews of Toledo. The details are unknown, but from that time the once numerous Spanish Karaites are heard of no more. In 1212, some Christian crusaders entered Spain to help free it from the Moors. For the most part, they treated the Jews well. One group attacked the Jews of Toledo and killed many of them, but the Christians of the city rose to the defense of their fellow citizens and stopped the persecution. Alfonso X of Castile included anti-Judaic legislation in his Law Code of 1265, but the code was not put into effect till 1348. Meanwhile, Alfonso employed a Jewish physician and treasurer, presented to the Jews of Seville three mosques to be turned into synagogues, and basked in the splendor that Jewish and Moslem scholarship shed upon his genial reign. In 1276, the military enterprises of Pedro III of Aragon required insufferable taxes. His finance minister and several other officials were Jews. A revolt of nobles and cities against the monarchy compelled the king to dismiss his Jewish aides and to confirm a resolution of the Cortes in 1283 against further employment of Jews in the government. The era of toleration ended when the Ecclesiastical Council of Zamora in 1313 decreed the imposition of the badge, the segregation of the Jewish from the Christian population, and a ban against the employment of Jewish physicians by Christians or of Christian servants by Jews. 3. Jewish Life in Christendom 1. Government Excepting Palermo and a few towns in Spain, the cities of medieval Christendom required no segregation of their Jewish population. Usually, however, the Jews lived in a voluntary isolation for social convenience, physical security, and religious unity. The synagogue was the geographical, social, and economic center of the Jewish quarter, and drew most Jewish dwellings toward it. There was, in consequence, much overcrowding to the detriment of public and private sanitation. In Spain, the Hebrew sections contained handsome residences, as well as hovels and tenements. In the rest of Europe, they verged on slums. Allowing for the universally greater influence of the rich in elections and appointments, the Jewish communities were semi-democratic enclaves in a monarchical world. The tax-paying members of a congregation chose the rabbis and officers of the synagogue. A small group of elected elders sat as a beth din, or communal court. This levied taxes, fixed prices, administered justice, issued ordinances, not always observed, on Jewish diet, dancing, morals, and dress. It was empowered to try Jewish offenders against Jewish law, and had executive officers to carry out its decrees. Penalties ranged from fines to excommunication or banishment. Capital punishment was rarely within the power or custom of the Beth Din. In its stead, the Jewish court used the harem, or full excommunication, a majestic and frightening ceremony of charges, curses, and candles extinguished one by one 
as a symbol of the culprit's spiritual death. The Jews, like the Christians, used excommunication too frequently, so that in both faiths it lost its terror and effectiveness. The rabbis, like the church, prosecuted heretics, outlawed them, and on rare occasions burned their books. Normally the Jewish community was not subject to local authority. Its only master was the king. Him it paid liberally for a charter protecting its religious and economic rights. Later it paid the liberated communes to confirm its autonomy. The Jews, however, were subject to the law of the state, and made it a principle to obey it. The law of the kingdom is law, said the Talmud. Pray for the welfare of the government, said another passage, since but for fear thereof men would swallow one another alive. The state laid upon the Jews a poll or head tax, property taxes running up to 33 percent, and taxes on meat, wine, jewelry, imports, and exports. In addition, it required voluntary contributions from them to help finance a war, a coronation, or a royal progress or tour. The English Jews, numbering in the twelfth century one quarter of one percent of the population, paid eight percent of the national taxes. They raised a fourth of the levy for the crusade of Richard I, and donated five thousand marks toward his ransom from German captivity, thrice the amount given by the city of London. The Jew was also taxed by his own community, and was periodically dunned for charity, education, and support of the harassed Jews in Palestine. At any moment, for cause or without, the king might confiscate part or all of the property of his Jews, for in feudal law they were all his men. When a king died, his agreement to protect the Jews expired. His successor could be induced to renew it only by a large gift. Sometimes this was a third of all Jewish property in the state. In 1463, Albrecht III, Margrave of Brandenburg, declared that every new German king may, according to old usage, either burn all the Jews or show them his mercy, and to save their lives, take the third penny, that is one-third, of their property. Bracton, the leading English jurist of the thirteenth century, summed up the matter simply. A Jew cannot have anything of his own, because whatever he acquires, he acquires not for himself, but for the king. 2. Economy To these political inconveniences were added economic restrictions. The Jews were not legally or generally prevented from owning land. At one time or another in the Middle Ages, they owned considerable tracts in Moslem or Christian Spain, in Sicily, Silesia, Poland, England, and France. But circumstances made such ownership increasingly impractical. Forbidden by Christian law to hire Christian slaves, and by Jewish law to hire Jewish slaves, the Jew had to work his holding with free labor, hard to get and costly to retain. Jewish law forbade the Jew to work on Saturday. Christian law usually forbade him to work on Sunday. Such leisure was a hardship. Feudal custom or law made it impossible for a Jew to find a place within the feudal system. Any such position required a Christian oath of fealty and military service. But the laws of nearly all Christian states forbade the Jews to carry arms. In Visigothic Spain, King Sisabut revoked all grants of land made to Jews by his predecessors. King Egica nationalized all Jewish holdings that had at any time belonged to Christians. And in 1293 the Cortes of Valladolid prohibited the sale of land to Jews. The ever-present possibility of expulsion or attack persuaded the Jews after the ninth century to avoid landed property or rural solitude. All these conditions discouraged Jewish agriculture and inclined the Jew to urban life to industry, trade, and finance. In the Near East and in Southern Europe the Jews were active in industry. Indeed, in several cases, it was they who brought advanced handicraft techniques from Islam or Byzantium to Western lands. Benjamin of Tudela found hundreds of Jewish glass workers at Antioch and Tyre. Jews in Egypt and Greece were renowned for the excellence of their dyed and embroidered textiles. And as late as the thirteenth century, Frederick II called in Jewish craftsmen to manage the state's silk industry in Sicily. There and elsewhere Jews engaged in the metal trades, especially in goldsmithing and jewelry. They worked at tin mines of Cornwall until 1290. Hebrew artisans in southern Europe were organized in strong guilds and competed successfully with Christian craftsmen. But in northern Europe the Christian guilds acquired a monopoly in many trades. State after state forbade the Jews to serve Christians as smiths, carpenters, tailors, shoemakers, millers, bakers, or physicians, or to sell wine, flour, butter, or oil in the markets, or to buy a home anywhere except in the Jewish quarter. 
So restricted, the Jews took the trade. Rob, the Babylonian Talmudist, had given his people a shrewd motto. Trade with a hundred florins, and you will afford meat and wine. Put the same sum into agriculture, and at most you may have bread and salt. The Jewish peddler was known in every city and town, the Jewish merchant at every market and fair. International commerce was their specialty, almost their monopoly before the eleventh century. Their packs, caravans, and ships crossed deserts, mountains, and seas, and in most instances they accompanied their goods. They served as commercial links between Christendom and Islam, between Europe and Asia, between the Slavic and the Western states. They handled most of the trade in slaves. They were helped by their skill and patience in learning languages, by the understanding of Hebrew and the similarity of laws and customs among widely separated Jewish communities, and by the hospitality of the Jewish quarter in every city to any foreign Jew. So Benjamin of Tudela traveled halfway across the world and found himself everywhere at home. Ibn Qurat Bey, director of the post for the Baghdad Caliphate in 870, told in his Book of Roots of Jewish merchants who spoke Persian, Greek, Arabic, Frank, Spanish, and Slavonic. And he described the land and sea routes by which they traveled from Spain and Italy to Egypt, India, and China. These merchants took eunuchs, slaves, brocades, furs, and swords to the Far East, and brought back musk, aloes, camphor, spices, and silks. The capture of Jerusalem by the Crusades and the conquest of the Mediterranean by the fleets of Venice and Genoa gave the Italian merchants an advantage over the Jews, and Jewish commercial leadership ended with the eleventh century. Even before the Crusades, Venice had forbidden the transport of Jewish merchants on Venetian ships, and soon afterward the Hanseatic League closed its ports on the North Sea and the Baltic to Jewish trade. By the twelfth century, Jewish commerce was mostly domestic, and even within that narrow scope it was limited by laws prohibiting the sale of divers' goods by Jews. They turned to finance. This book is continued on Cassette 2, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 1. They turned to finance. In a hostile environment, where popular violence might destroy or royal cupidity confiscate their immovable goods, the Jews were forced to the conclusion that their savings should be in liquid and mobile form. They took first to the simple business of money changing, then to receiving money for commercial investment, then to lending money at interest. The Pentateuch and the Talmud had forbidden this among Jews, but not between Jew and non-Jew. As economic life grew more complex and the need for financing became more acute with the expansion of commerce and industry, the Jews lent one another money through a Christian intermediary or through silent partnerships in an enterprise and its profits a device allowed by the rabbis and several Christian theologians. Since both the Koran and the Church forbade the charging of interest, and Christian moneylenders were consequently scarce before the thirteenth century, Moslem and Christian borrowers, including ecclesiastics, churches, and monasteries, applied to Jews for loans. So Aaron of Lincoln financed the building of nine Cistercian monasteries in the great abbey of St. Albans. In the thirteenth century, Christian bankers invaded the field, adopted the methods that had been developed by the Jews, and soon surpassed them in wealth and range. The Christian usurer, although he did not have to safeguard himself to anything like the same extent against the chances of murder and pillage, was no less exacting than the Jew. Both alike pressed the debtor with Roman severity, and the kings exploited them all. All moneylenders were subject to high taxation, and in the case of the Jews to occasional outright confiscation. The kings made it a principle to allow high interest rates and periodically to squeeze the profits out of the financiers. The cost of collection was high, and in many cases the creditor had to bribe officials to allow him to capture his due. In 1198 Innocent III commanded all Christian princes in preparation for the Fourth Crusade to compel full remission of interest demanded of Christians by Jews. Louis the Ninth, the saintly king of France, for the salvation of his own soul and those of his ancestors, freed all his subjects from a third of whatever they owed to Jews. English kings on occasion granted letters of release, cancelling interest or principal or both to subjects owing money to Jews. Not rarely the kings sold such letters, and noted in their registers the sums they received for their vicarious philanthropy. The British government required a copy of every loan agreement, an exchequer of the Jews was formed to file and supervise these agreements, 
and to hear cases concerning them. When a Jewish banker could not meet the taxes or levies laid upon him, the government, checking its record of his loans, confiscated all or part of them and notified the debtors to pay not the lender but the government. When in 1187 Henry II levied a special tax upon the people of England, the Jews were compelled to pay one-fourth, the Christians one-tenth, of their property. Nearly half the entire tax was paid by the Jews. At times the Jews financed the kingdom. In 1210 King John ordered all Jews in England, men, women, and children, to be imprisoned. A tallage of 66,000 marks was taken from them. Those suspected of concealing the full amount of their hoards were tortured by having a tooth pulled out each day till they confessed. In 1230, Henry III, charging that the Jews had clipped the coin of the realm, apparently some had, confiscated a third of all the movable property of the English Jews. The operation having proved profitable, it was repeated in 1239. Two years later, 20,000 silver marks were exacted from the Jews. 60,000 marks, a sum equal to the whole yearly revenue of the crown, were exacted in 1244. When Henry III borrowed 5,000 marks from the Earl of Cornwall, he consigned to him all the Jews of England as security. A series of imposts from 1252 to 1255 drove the Jews to such desperation that they begged permission to leave England en masse. Permission was refused. In 1275 Edward I strictly prohibited lending at interest. Loans continued nevertheless, and as the risk was greater, interest rates rose. Edward ordered all Jews in England arrested and their goods seized. Many Christian lenders were also arrested, and three of them were hanged. Of the Jews, 280 were hanged, drawn, and quartered in London. There were additional executions in the counties, and the property of hundreds of Jews was confiscated to the state. In the uneasy intervals between confiscations, the Jewish bankers prospered, and some became too visibly rich. They not only advanced capital to build castles, cathedrals, and monasteries, but they raised for themselves substantial houses. In England their homes were among the first dwellings built of stone. There were rich and poor among the Jews, despite Rabbi Eliezer's dictum that all men are equal before God, women and slaves, rich and poor. The rabbis sought to mitigate poverty and check profiteering wealth by a variety of economic regulations. They emphasized the responsibility of the group for the welfare of all and softened the stings of adversity with organized charity. They did not denounce riches, but they succeeded in giving to learning a prestige equal to that of wealth. They branded monopoly and corners as sins. They forbade the retailer to profit by more than a sixth of the wholesale price. They watched over weights and measures. They fixed maximum prices and minimum wages. Many of these regulations failed. The rabbis could not isolate the economic life of the Jews from that of their neighbors in Islam or Christendom, and the law of supply and demand of goods and services found a way around all legislation. 3. Morals The rich tried to atone for their accumulations by abundant charity. They acknowledged the social obligations of wealth, and perhaps they feared the curse or fury of the poor. No Jew is known to have died of hunger while living in a Jewish community. Periodically, and as early as the second century after Christ, each member of the congregation, however poor, was assessed by official overseers for a contribution to the kupa, or community chest, which took care of the old, poor, or sick, and the education and marriage of orphans. Hospitality was accorded freely, especially to wandering scholars. In some communities, incoming travelers were billeted in private homes by officers of the congregation. Jewish philanthropic societies grew to a great number as the Middle Ages advanced. Not only were there many hospitals, orphanages, poor houses, and homes for the aged, but there were organizations providing ransoms for prisoners, dowries for poor brides, visits to the sick, care for destitute widows, and free burial for the dead. Christians complained of Jewish greed and tried to stir Christians to charity by citing the exemplary generosity of the Jews. Class differences disported themselves in dress, diet, speech, and a hundred other ways. The simple Jew wore a long-sleeved and girdled robe or kaftan, usually black as if in mourning for his ruined temple and ravished land. But in Spain the well-to-do Jews proclaimed their prosperity with silks and furs, and the rabbis deplored in vain the handle given to hostility and discontent by such displays. When the king of Castile banned finery and raiment, the Jewish males obeyed, 
but continued to array their wives in splendor. When the king demanded an explanation, they assured him that the royal gallantry could never have meant the restrictions to apply to women, and the Jews continued throughout the Middle Ages to robe their ladies well. But they forbade them to appear in public with uncovered hair. Such an offense was ground for divorce, and the Jew was instructed not to pray in the presence of a woman whose hair was visible. The hygienic features of the law alleviated the effects of congested settlements. Circumcision, the weekly bath, the prohibition of wine or putrid meat as food, gave the Jews superior protection against diseases rampant in their Christian vicinities. Leprosy was frequent among the Christian poor, who ate salted meat or fish, but was rare among the Jews. Perhaps for like reasons, the Jews suffered less than Christians from cholera and kindred ailments. But in the slums of Rome, infested with mosquitoes from the Campania marshes, Jew and Christian alike shivered with malaria. The moral life of the medieval Jew reflected his Oriental heritage and his European disabilities. Discriminated against at every turn, pillaged and massacred, humiliated and condemned for crimes not his own, the Jew, like the physically weak everywhere, resorted to cunning in self-defense. The rabbis repeated again and again that to cheat a Gentile is even worse than to cheat a Jew. But some Jews took the chance, and perhaps Christians too bargained as shrewdly as they knew. Some bankers, Jewish or Christian, were ruthless in their resolve to be paid, though doubtless there were in the Middle Ages, as in the eighteenth century, moneylenders as honest and faithful as Meyer Anselm of the Rote Schild. Certain Jews and Christians clipped coins or received stolen goods. The frequent use of Jews in high financial office suggests that their Christian employers had confidence in their integrity. Of violent crimes, murder, robbery, rape, the Jews were seldom guilty. Drunkenness was rarer among them in Christian than in Moslem lands. Their sex life, despite a background of polygamy, was remarkably wholesome. They were less given to pederasty than other peoples of Eastern origin. Their women were modest maidens, industrious wives, prolific and conscientious mothers, and early marriage reduced prostitution to a human minimum. Bachelors were rarities. Rabbi Asher ben Yehiel ruled that a bachelor of twenty, unless absorbed in study of the law, might be compelled to marry by the court. Marriages were arranged by the parents. Few girls, says a Jewish document of the eleventh century, were indelicate or impudent enough to express their own fancies or preference. But no marriage was fully legal without the consent of both parties. The father might give his daughter in marriage in her early years, even at six. But such child marriages were not consummated till maturity, and when the daughter came of age, she could annul it if she wished. The betrothal was a formal act, making the girl legally the man's wife. They could not thereafter separate except by a bill of divorce. At the betrothal, a contract, or ketubah, was signed for the dowry and the marriage settlement. The latter was a sum set aside out of the husband's estate to be paid his wife in case the husband should divorce her or die, without a marriage settlement of at least two hundred zuzas, which could buy a one-family house, no marriage with a virgin bride was valid. Polygamy was practiced by rich Jews in Islamic lands, but was rare among the Jews of Christendom. Post-Talmudic rabbinical literature refers a thousand times to a man's wife, never to his wives. About the year 1000, Rabbi Gershom ben Judah of Mainz decreed the excommunication of any polygamous Jew, and soon thereafter, in all Europe except Spain, polygamy and concubinage became almost extinct among the Jews. Cases continued to occur, however, where a wife, barren for ten years after marriage, allowed her husband to take a concubine or an additional wife. Parentage was vital. The same decree of Gershom abolished the old right of the husband to divorce his wife without her consent or guilt. Divorces were probably less frequent in medieval Jewry than in modern America. Despite the comparative looseness of the marriage bond in law, the family was the saving center of Jewish life. External danger brought internal unity and hostile witnesses testified to the warmth and dignity, thoughtfulness, consideration, parental and fraternal affection that marked and mark the Jewish family. The young husband, merged with his wife in work, joy, and tribulation, developed a profound attachment for her as part of his larger self. He became a father, and the children growing up around him stimulated his reserve energies and engaged his deepest loyalties. He had probably known no woman carnally before marriage, and had, in so small and intimate a community, few chances for infidelity afterward. 
Almost from their birth he saved to provide a dowry for his daughters and a marriage settlement for his sons, and he took it for granted that he should support them in the early years of their married life. This seemed wiser than to let youth prepare with a decade of promiscuity for the restrictions of monogamy. In many cases the bridegroom came to live with the bride in her father's home, seldom to the increment of happiness. The authority of the oldest father in the home was almost as absolute as in Republican Rome. He could excommunicate his children and might beat his wife within reason. If he seriously injured her, the community fined him to the limit of his resources. Usually his authority was exercised with a sternness that never quite concealed a passionate love. The position of women was legally low, morally high. Like Plato, the Jew thanked God that he had not been born a woman, and the woman replied humbly, I thank God that I was made according to His will. In the synagogue the women occupied a separate place in the gallery or behind the men, a clumsy compliment to their distracting charms, and they could not be counted toward making a quorum. Songs in praise of a woman's beauty were considered indecorous, though the Talmud allowed them. Flirtation, if any, was by correspondence. Public conversation between the sexes, even between man and wife, was forbidden by the rabbis. Dancing was permitted, but only of woman with woman, of man with man. While the husband was by law the sole heir of his wife, the widow did not inherit from her husband. When he died, she received the equivalent of her dowry and the marriage settlement. For the rest, her sons, the natural heirs, were relied upon to support her decently. Daughters inherited only in the absence of sons, otherwise they had to depend upon brotherly affection, which seldom failed. Girls were not sent to school. In their case, a little knowledge was accounted an especially dangerous thing. However, they were allowed to study privately. We hear of several women who gave public lectures on the law, though sometimes the lecturer screened herself from her audience. Despite every physical and legal disadvantage, the deserving Jewish woman received after marriage full honor and devotion. Judah ben Moses ibn Tibbon, in 1170, quoted approvingly a Moslem sage, None but the honorable honor women, none but the despicable despise them. The parental relation was more nearly perfect than the marital. The Jew, with the vanity of the commonplace, prided himself on his reproductive ability and his children. His most solemn oath was taken by laying his hand upon the testes of the man receiving the pledge, hence the word testimony. Every man was commanded to have at least two children, usually there were more. The child was reverenced as a visitor from heaven, a very angel become flesh. The father was reverenced almost as a vicar of God. The son stood in the father's presence until bidden to be seated, and gave him a solicitous obedience that fully comported with the pride of youth. In the ceremony of circumcision the boy was dedicated to Yahweh by the covenant of Abraham, and every family felt obligated to train one son for the rabbinate. When the boy had completed his thirteenth year, he was received into manhood and into all the obligations of the law by a solemn ceremony of confirmation. The religion cast its awe and sanctity over every stage of development and eased the tasks of parentage. 4. Religion In like manner religion stood as a spiritual policeman over every phase of the moral code. Doubtless loopholes were found in the law, and legal fictions were concocted to restore the freedom of adaptation indispensable to an enterprising people. But apparently the medieval Jew accepted the law, by and large, as a bulwark saving him not only from eternal damnation, but, more visibly, from group disintegration. It harassed him at every turn, but he honored it as the very home and school of his growth, the vital medium of his life. Every home in Judaism was a church, every school was a temple, every father was a priest. The prayers and ritual of the synagogue had their briefer counterparts in the home. The fasts and festivals of the faith were celebrated there with educative ceremonies that bound the present with the past, the living with the dead and the yet unborn. Every Friday eve of the Sabbath the father called his wife, children, and servants around him, blessed them individually, and led them in prayer, religious readings, and sacred songs. To the doorpost of each major room was attached a tube, or mezuzah, containing a parchment roll inscribed with two passages from Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, and chapter 11, verses 13 through 21, reminding the Jew that his God is one, and must be loved with all thy heart and soul and strength. From the age of four the child was brought to the synagogue, and there religion was impressed upon him in his most formative years. The synagogue was not merely a temple, it was the social center of the Jewish community. 
Synagogue, like ecclesia, synod, and college, meant an assemblage, a congregation. In pre-Christian days it had been essentially a school. It is still called shula by Ashkenazic Jews. In the dispersion it took on a strange variety of functions. In some synagogues it was the custom to publish on the Sabbath the decisions reached by the Beth Din during the week, to collect taxes, advertise lost articles, accept complaints of one member against another, and announce the coming sale of property so that any claimant on it might protest the sale. The synagogue dispensed communal charity, and in Asia served as a lodging for travelers. The building itself was always the finest in the Jewish quarter. Sometimes, especially in Spain and Italy, it was an architectural masterpiece, expensively and lovingly adorned. Christian authorities repeatedly forbade the erection of synagogues equaling in height the tallest Christian church in the city. In 1221, Pope Honorius III ordered the destruction of such a synagogue in Bourges. Seville had twenty-three synagogues in the fourteenth century, Toledo and Cordova almost as many. One built in Cordova in 1315 is now maintained as a national monument by the Spanish government. Every synagogue had a school, Beth Hamidrash, house of study, the Arabic madrasa. In addition, there were private schools and personal tutors. Probably there was a higher relative literacy among the medieval Jews than among the Christians, though lower than among the Moslems. Teachers were paid by the community or the parents, but all were under communal supervision. Boys went off to school at an early hour, in winter before dawn. Some hours later they returned home for breakfast, then they went back to school till eleven, then home for lunch, back to school at noon, a respite between two and three, then more schooling till evening. Then at last they were released to their homes for supper, prayers, and bed. Life was a serious matter for the Jewish boy. Hebrew and the Pentateuch were the primary studies. At the age of ten, the student took up the Mishnah, at thirteen the major tractates of the Talmud. Those who were to be scholars continued the study of Mishnah and Gemara from thirteen to twenty or later. Through the diversity of subjects in the Talmud the student received a smattering of a dozen sciences, but almost nothing of non-Jewish history. There was much learning by repetition. The chorus of recitation was so vigorous that some localities excluded schools. Higher education was given in the yeshiva, or academy. The graduate of such an academy was called Talmud Hakam, scholar of the law. He was usually freed from community taxes, and though he was not necessarily a rabbi, all non-scholars were expected to rise on his coming or going. The rabbi was teacher, jurist, and priest. He was required to marry. He was paid little or nothing for his religious functions. Usually he earned a living in the secular world. He seldom preached. This was left to itinerant preachers, or magidim, schooled in sonorous and frightening eloquence. Any member of the congregation might lead it in prayer, read the scriptures, or preach. Usually, however, this honor was granted to some prominent or philanthropic Jew. Prayer was a complex ceremony for the Orthodox Hebrew. To be properly performed it required that he should cover his head as a sign of reverence, strap upon his arms and his forehead small cases containing passages from Exodus and Deuteronomy, and wear on the borders of his garments fringes inscribed with the basic commandments of the Lord. The rabbis explained these formalities as necessary reminders of the unity, presence, and laws of God. Simple Jews came to look upon them as magical amulets, possessed of miraculous powers. The culmination of the religious service was reading from the scroll of the law, contained in the little ark above the altar. The Jews of the dispersion at first frowned upon music in religion as hardly suited to a mood of grief for their lost home. But music and religion are as intimately related as poetry and love. The deepest emotions require, for their civilized expression, the most emotional of the arts. Music returned to the synagogue through poetry. In the sixth century, the Pythonim, or non-Hebraic poets, began to write religious verse, confused with acrostic and alliterative artificialities, but uplifted with the resounding splendor of Hebrew, and filled with that religious ardor which in the Jew now served for both patriotism and piety. The crude but powerful hymns of Eliezer ben Kalir, from the eighth century, still find a place in some synagogue rituals. Similar poetry appeared among the Jews of Spain, Italy, France, and Germany. One such hymn is sung by many Jews on the Day of Atonement. With the coming of thy kingdom, the hills shall break into song, and the islands laugh exultant that they to God belong. 
and all their congregations so loud thy praise shall sing, that the farthest peoples, hearing, shall hail thee crowned king. When such piutum, or sacred poems, were introduced into the synagogue service, they were sung by a precentor, and music re-entered the ritual. Furthermore, the scriptural readings and the prayers were in many synagogues chanted by a cantor, or by the congregation in a cantillation, whose musical tones were largely improvised, but occasionally followed patterns set in the plain song of the Christian chant. From the singing school of the monastery of St. Gaul in Switzerland, at some time before the eleventh century, came the complex chant for the famous Hebrew song called Nidri, All Vows. The synagogue never fully replaced the temple in the heart of the Jew. The hope that he might some day offer sacrifice to Yahweh before the Holy of Holies on Zion's hill inflamed his imagination and left him open to repeated deception by false messiahs. About 720, Sereni, a Syrian, announced himself to be the expected Redeemer and organized a campaign to recapture Palestine from the Moslems. Jews from Babylonia and Spain abandoned their homes to join his venture. He was taken prisoner, exposed as a charlatan by the caliph Yazid II, and was put to death. Some thirty years later, Obadiah Abu Isa ben Ishaq of Isfahan led a similar revolt. Ten thousand Jews took up the sword and fought bravely under his lead. They were defeated, Abu Isa was slain in battle, and the Isfahan Jews suffered indiscriminate punishment. When the First Crusade excited Europe, Jewish communities dreamed that the Christians, if victorious, would restore Palestine to the Jews. They awoke from this fantasy to a succession of pogroms. In 1160, David al-Rui aroused the Jews of Mesopotamia with the announcement that he was the Messiah and would restore them to Jerusalem and liberty. His father-in-law, fearing disaster for the Jews from such an insurrection, slew him in his sleep. About 1225 another Messiah appeared in southern Arabia and stirred the Jews to mass hysteria. Maimonides, in a famous letter to the south, exposed the impostor's claims, and reminded the Arabian Jews of the death and destruction that had followed such reckless attempts in the past. Nevertheless, he accepted the messianic hope as an indispensable support to the Jewish spirit in the dispersion, and made it one of the thirteen principal tenets of the Jewish faith. 4. Anti-Semitism, 500-1306 what were the sources of the hostility between non-Jew and Jew? The main sources have ever been economic, but religious differences have given edge and cover to economic rivalries. The Moslems, living by Mohammed, resented the Jewish rejection of their prophet. The Christians, accepting the divinity of Christ, were shocked to find that his own people would not acknowledge that divinity. Good Christians saw nothing unchristian or inhuman in holding an entire people through many centuries responsible for the actions of a tiny minority of Jerusalem Jews in the last days of Christ. The Gospel of Luke told how throngs of Jews welcomed Christ into Jerusalem, how, when He carried His cross to Golgotha, there followed Him a great company of people, and of women who also bewailed and lamented Him, and how, after the crucifixion, all the people that came together to that site smote their breasts. But these evidences of Jewish sympathy for Jesus were forgotten when, in every holy week, the bitter story of the Passion was related from a thousand pulpits. Resentment flared in Christian hearts, and on those days the Israelites shut themselves up in their own quarter and in their homes, fearful that the passions of simple souls might be stirred to a pogrom. Around that central misunderstanding rose a thousand suspicions and animosities. Jewish bankers bore the brunt of the hostility aroused by interest rates that reflected the insecurity of loans. As the economy of Christendom developed and Christian merchants and bankers invaded fields once dominated by Jews, economic competition fomented hate. And some Christian moneylenders actively promoted anti-Semitism. Jews in official positions, especially in the finance department of governments, were a natural target for those who disliked both taxes and Jews. Given such economic and religious enmity, everything Jewish became distasteful to some Christians, and everything Christian to some Jews. The Christian reproached the Jew for clannish exclusiveness, and did not excuse it as a reaction to discrimination and occasional physical assault. Jewish features, language, manners, diet, ritual, all seemed to the Christian eye offensively bizarre. The Jews ate when Christians fasted, fasted when Christians ate. Their Sabbath of rest and prayer had remained Saturday as of old, while that of the Christians had been changed to Sunday. 
The Jews celebrated their happy deliverance from Egypt in a Passover feast that came too close to the Friday on which Christians mourned the death of Christ. Jews were not allowed by their law to eat food cooked, to drink wine pressed, or to use dishes or utensils that had been touched by a non-Jew, or to marry any but a Jew. The Christian interpreted these ancient laws, formulated long before Christianity, as meaning that to a Jew everything Christian was unclean. And he retorted that the Israelite himself was not usually distinguished by cleanliness of person or neatness of dress. Mutual isolation begot absurd and tragic legends on both sides. Romans had accused Christians of murdering pagan children to offer their blood in secret sacrifice to the Christian God. Christians of the twelfth century accused Jews of kidnapping Christian children to sacrifice them to Yahweh, or to use their blood as medicine or in the making of unleavened bread for the Passover feast. Jews were charged with poisoning the wells from which Christians drank, and with stealing consecrated wafers to pierce them and draw from them the blood of Christ. When a few Jewish merchants flaunted their opulence in costly raiment, the Jews as a people were accused of draining the wealth of Christendom into Jewish hands. Jewish women were suspected as sorceresses. Many Jews, it was thought, were in league with the devil. The Jews retaliated with like legends about Christians and insulting stories about the birth and youth of Christ. The Talmud counseled the extension of Jewish charity to non-Jews. Baya praised Christian monasticism. Maimonides wrote that the teachings of Christ and Mohammed tend to lead mankind toward perfection. But the average Jew could not understand these courtesies of philosophy and returned all the hatred that he received. There were some lucid intervals in this madness. Ignoring state and church laws that forbade it, Christians and Jews often mingled in friendship, sometimes in marriage, above all in Spain and southern France. Christian and Jewish scholars collaborated, Michael Scott with Anatoly, Dante with Emmanuel. Christians made gifts to synagogues, and in Worms, a Jewish park was maintained through a legacy from a Christian woman. In Lyon, the market day was changed from Saturday to Sunday for the convenience of the Jews. Secular governments, finding the Jews an asset in commerce and finance, gave them a vacillating protection, and in several cases where a state restricted the public movements of Jews or expelled them from its territory, it was because it could no longer safeguard them from intolerance and violence. The attitude of the church in these matters varied with place and time. In Italy she protected the Jews as guardians of the law of the Old Testament, and as living witnesses to the historicity of the Scriptures and to the wrath of God. But periodically church councils, often with excellent intentions, and seldom with general authority, added to the tribulations of Jewish life. The Theodosian Code of 439, the Council of Clermont of 535, and the Council of Toledo of 589 forbade the appointment of Jews to positions in which they could impose penalties upon Christians. The Council of Orléans of 538 ordered Jews to stay indoors in Holy Week, probably for their protection, and prohibited their employment in any public office. The Third Council of the Lateran, in 1179, forbade Christian midwives or nurses to minister to Jews. And the Council of Béziers, in 1246, condemned the employment of Jewish physicians by Christians. The Council of Avignon, in 1209, retaliated Jewish laws of cleanliness by enjoining Jews and harlots from touching bread or fruit exposed for sale. It renewed church laws against the hiring of Christian servants by Jews, and it warned the faithful not to exchange services with Jews, but to avoid them as a pollution. Several councils declared null the marriage of a Christian with a Jew. In 1222 a deacon was burned at the stake for accepting conversion to Judaism and marrying a Jewess. In 1234 a Jewish widow was refused her dower on the ground that her husband had been converted to Christianity, thereby voiding their marriage. The Fourth Council of the Lateran of 1215 arguing that at times through error Christians have relations with the women of Jews or Saracens, and Jews or Saracens with Christian women, ruled that Jews and Saracens of both sexes in every Christian province and at all times shall be marked off in the eyes of the public from other people through the character of their dress. After their twelfth year they were to wear a distinctive color, the men on their hats or mantles, the women on their veils. This was in part a retaliation against older and similar laws of Moslems against Christians and Jews. The character of the badge was determined locally by state governments or provincial church councils. Ordinarily it was a wheel or circle of yellow cloth, some three inches in diameter, sewn prominently upon the clothing. 
The decree was enforced in England in 1218, in France in 1219, in Hungary in 1279. It was only sporadically carried out in Spain, Italy, and Germany before the 15th century, when Nicholas of Cusa and San Giovanni de la Capistrano campaigned for its full observance. In 1219 the Jews of Castile threatened to leave the country en masse if the decree should be enforced, and the ecclesiastical authorities consented to its revocation. Jewish physicians, scholars, financiers, and travelers were often exempted from the decree. Its observance declined after the 16th century and ended with the French Revolution. By and large, the popes were the most tolerant prelates in Christendom. Gregory I, though so zealous for the spread of the faith, forbade the compulsory conversion of Jews and maintained their rights of Roman citizenship in lands under his rule. When bishops in Terracina and Palermo appropriated synagogues for Christian use, Gregory compelled them to make full restitution. To the bishop of Naples he wrote, Do not allow the Jews to be molested in the performance of their services. Let them have full liberty to observe and keep all their festivals and holy days, as both they and their fathers have done for so long. Gregory VII urged Christian rulers to obey conciliar decrees against the appointment of Jews. When Eugenius III came to Paris in 1145 and went in pomp to the cathedral, which was then in the Jewish quarter, the Jews sent a delegation to present him with the Torah, or scroll of the law. He blessed them, they went home happy, and the Pope ate a paschal lamb with the king. Alexander III was friendly to Jews and employed one to manage his finances. Innocent III led the Fourth Lateran Council in its demand for a Jewish badge, and laid down the principle that all Jews were doomed to perpetual servitude because they had crucified Jesus. In a softer mood he reiterated papal injunctions against forcible conversions, and added, No Christian shall do the Jews any personal injury, or deprive them of their possessions, or disturb them during the celebration of their festivals, or extort money from them by threatening to exhume their dead. Gregory the Ninth, founder of the Inquisition, exempted the Jews from its operation or jurisdiction, except when they tried to Judaize Christians, or attacked Christianity, or reverted to Judaism after conversion to Christianity. And in 1235 he issued a bull denouncing mob violence against Jews. Innocent IV, in 1247, repudiated the legend of the ritual murder of Christian children by Jews. Certain of the clergy and princes, nobles and great lords, have falsely devised godless plans against the Jews, unjustly depriving them of their property by force and appropriating it to themselves. They falsely charge them with dividing among them on the Passover the heart of a murdered boy. In fact, in their malice, they ascribe to Jews every murder, wherever it chanced to occur. And on the ground of these and other fabrications they are filled with rage against them, rob them, oppress them by starvation, imprisonment, torture, and other sufferings, sometimes even condemning them to death so that the Jews, though living under Christian princes, are in worse plight than were their ancestors under the pharaohs. They are driven to leave in despair the land in which their fathers have dwelt since the memory of man. Since it is our pleasure that they shall not be distressed, we ordain that you behave toward them in a friendly and kind manner. Whenever any unjust attacks upon them come under your notice, redress their injuries, and do not suffer them to be visited in the future by similar tribulations." This noble appeal was widely ignored. In 1272, Gregory X had to repeat its denunciation of the ritual murder legend, and to give his words force he ruled that thereafter the testimony of a Christian against a Jew should not be accepted unless confirmed by a Jew. The issuance of similar bulls by later popes till 1763 attests both the humanity of the popes and the persistence of the evil. That the popes were sincere is indicated by the comparative security of the Jews and their relative freedom from persecution in the papal states. Expelled from so many countries at one time or another, they were never expelled from Rome or from papal Avignon. Had it not been for the Catholic Church, writes a learned Jewish historian, the Jews would not have survived the Middle Ages in Christian Europe. Before the Crusades, the active persecution of Jews in medieval Europe was sporadic. The Byzantine emperors continued for two centuries the oppressive policies of Justinian toward the Jews. Heraclius in 628 banished them from Jerusalem in retaliation for their aid to Persia, and did all he could to exterminate them. Leo the Isaurian sought to disprove the rumor that he was Jewish by a decree in 723 giving Byzantine Jews a choice between Christianity or banishment. Some submitted, some burned themselves to death in their synagogues rather than yield. 
Basil I, from 867 to 886, resumed the campaign to enforce baptism upon the Jews, and Constantine the Seventh, from 912 to 959, required from Jews in Christian courts a humiliating form of oath, more judaico, which continued in use in Europe till the 19th century. When in 1095 Pope Urban II proclaimed the First Crusade, some Christians thought it desirable to kill the Jews of Europe before proceeding so far to fight Turks in Jerusalem. Godfrey of Bouillon, having accepted the leadership of the crusade, announced that he would avenge the blood of Jesus upon the Jews, and would not leave one of them alive. And his companions proclaimed their intention to kill all Jews who would not accept Christianity. A monk further aroused Christian ardor by declaring that an inscription found on the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem made the conversion of all Jews a moral obligation of all Christians. The crusaders planned to move south along the Rhine, where lay the richest settlements in northern Europe. The German Jews had played a leading part in the development of Rhenish commerce, and had behaved with a restraint and piety that had won the respect of Christian laity and clergy alike. Bishop Rüdiger of Speyer was on cordial terms with the Jews of his district, and gave them a charter guaranteeing their autonomy and security. In 1095 the Emperor Henry IV issued a similar charter for all the Jews of his realm. Upon these peaceful Jewish congregations the news of the crusade, its proposed route, and the threats of its leaders broke with paralyzing terror. The rabbis proclaimed several days of fasting and prayer. Arrived at Speyer, the crusaders dragged eleven Jews into a church and ordered them to accept baptism. Refusing, the eleven were slain this on May 3, 1096. Other Jews of the city took refuge with Bishop Johansen, who not only protected them but caused the execution of certain crusaders who had shared in the murders at the church. As some crusaders neared Trier, its Jews appealed to Bishop Egelbert. He offered protection on condition of baptism. Most of the Jews consented, but several women killed their children and threw themselves into the Moselle, this June 1, 1096. At Mainz, Archbishop Rutard hid thirteen hundred Jews in his cellars. Crusaders forced their way in and killed one thousand fourteen. The bishop was able to save a few by concealing them in the cathedral, this on May 27, 1096. Four Mainz Jews accepted baptism but committed suicide soon afterward. As the crusaders approached Cologne, the Christians hid the Jews in their homes. The mob burned down the Jewish quarter and killed the few Jews upon whom they could lay their hands. Bishop Hermann, at great danger to himself, secretly conveyed the Jews from their Christian hiding places to Christian homes in the country. The pilgrims discovered the maneuver, hunted their prey in the villages, and killed every Jew they found, this in June 1096. In two of these villages, two hundred Jews were slain. In four others, the Jews, surrounded by the mob, killed one another rather than be baptized. Mothers delivered of infants during these attacks slew them at birth. At Worms, Bishop Alabrancus received such of the Jews as he could into his palace and saved them. Upon the rest the crusaders fell with the savagery of anonymity, killing many and then plundering and burning the homes of the Jews. Here many Jews committed suicide rather than repudiate their faith. Seven days later a crowd besieged the episcopal residence. The bishop told the Jews that he could no longer hold back the mob and advised them to accept baptism. The Jews asked to be left alone for a while. When the bishop returned, he found that nearly all of them had killed one another. The besiegers broke in and slew the rest. All in all, some eight hundred Jews died in this pogrom at Worms on August 20, 1096. Similar scenes occurred at Metz, Regensburg, and Prague. The Second Crusade of 1147 threatened to better the example of the first. Peter the Venerable, the saintly abbot of Cluny, advised Louis VII of France to begin by attacking the French Jews. I do not require you to put to death these accursed beings. God does not wish to annihilate them, but like Cain the fratricide they must be made to suffer fearful torments and be preserved for greater ignominy, for an existence more bitter than death. Abbot Suguet of Saint-Denis protested against this conception of Christianity, and Louis VII contented himself with capital levies on rich Jews. But the German Jews were not let off with mere confiscation. A French monk, Rodolphe, leaving his monastery without permission, preached a pogrom in Germany. At Cologne, Simon the Pious was murdered and mutilated. At Speyer, a woman was tortured on the rack to persuade her to Christianity. Again, the secular prelates did all they could to protect the Jews. 
Bishop Arnold of Cologne gave them a fortified castle as refuge and allowed them to arm themselves. The crusaders refrained from attacking the castle, but killed any unconverted Jew that fell into their clutches. Archbishop Henry at Mainz admitted into his house some Jews pursued by a mob. The mob forced a way in and killed them before his eyes. The archbishop appealed to St. Bernard, the most influential Christian of his time. Bernard replied with a strong denunciation of Rodolphe and demanded an end to violence against the Jews. When Rodolphe continued his campaign, Bernard came in person to Germany and forced the monk to return to his monastery. Shortly thereafter, the mutilated body of a Christian was found at Würzburg. Christians charged Jews with the crime, attacked them despite the protests of Bishop Embico, and killed twenty. Many others, wounded, were tended by Christians, this in 1147. And the bishop buried the dead in his garden. From Germany, the idea of beginning the Crusades at home passed back to France, and Jews were massacred at Carentan, Ramru, and Sully. In Bohemia, 150 Jews were murdered by Crusaders. After the terror had passed, the local Christian clergy did what it could to help the surviving Jews. And those who had accepted baptism under duress were allowed to return to Judaism without incurring the dire penalties of apostasy. These pogroms began a long series of violent assaults which continued till our time. In 1235 an unsolved murder at Baden was laid to the Jews, and a massacre ensued. In 1243 the entire Jewish population of Belitz, near Berlin, was burned alive on the charge that some of them had defiled a consecrated host. In 1283 the accusation of ritual murder was raised at Mainz, and despite all the efforts of Archbishop Werner, ten Jews were killed and Jewish homes were pillaged. In 1285 a like rumor excited Munich. 180 Jews fled for refuge to a synagogue. The mob set fire to it, and all 180 were burned to death. A year later, 40 Jews were killed at Oberwessel on the charge that they had drained the blood of a Christian. In 1298, every Jew in Rüttingen was burned to death on the charge of desecrating a sacramental wafer. Rindfleisch, a pious baron, organized and armed a band of Christians sworn to kill all Jews. They completely exterminated the Jewish community at Würzburg, and slew 698 Jews in Nuremberg. The persecution spread, and in half a year 140 Jewish congregations were wiped out. The Jews of Germany, having repeatedly rebuilt their communities after such attacks, lost heart, and in 1286 many Jewish families left Mainz, Worms, Speyer, and other German towns, and migrated to Palestine to live in Islam. As Poland and Lithuania were inviting immigrants, and had not yet experienced pogroms, a slow exodus of Jews from the Rhineland began to the Slavic East. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2. The Jews of England, excluded from landholding and from the guilds, became merchants and financiers. Some waxed rich through usury, and all were hated for it. Lords and squires equipped themselves for the Crusades, with money borrowed from the Jews. In return they pledged the revenues of their lands, and the Christian peasant fumed at the thought of moneylenders fattening on his toil. In 1144 young William of Norwich was found dead. The Jews were accused of having killed him to use his blood, and the Jewish quarter of the city was sacked and fired. King Henry II protected the Jews. Henry III did likewise, but took 422,000 pounds from them in taxes and capital levies in seven years. At the coronation of Richard I in London in 1190, a minor altercation, encouraged by nobles seeking escape from their debt to Jews, developed into a pogrom that spread to Lincoln, Stamford, and Lynn. In York in the same year, a mob led by Richard de Malabestia, who was deeply indebted to the Jews, killed 350 of them. In addition, 150 York Jews, led by their rabbi Yom Tob, slew themselves. In 1211, three hundred rabbis left England and France to begin life anew in Palestine. Seven years later, many Jews emigrated when Henry III enforced the Edict of the Badge. In 1255, rumors spread through Lincoln that a boy named Hugh had been enticed into the Jewish quarter and there had been scourged, crucified, and pierced with a lance in the presence of a rejoicing Jewish crowd. Armed bands invaded the settlement, seized the rabbi who was supposed to have presided over the ceremony, tied him to the tail of a horse, dragged him through the streets, and hanged him. Ninety-one Jews were arrested, eighteen were hanged. Many prisoners were saved by the intercession of courageous Dominican monks. During the civil war that disordered England between 1257 and 1267, 
The populace got out of hand, and pogroms almost wiped out the Jewish communities of London, Canterbury, Northampton, Winchester, Worcester, Lincoln, and Cambridge. Houses were looted and destroyed, deeds and bonds were burned, and the surviving Jews were left almost penniless. The English kings were now borrowing from the Christian bankers of Florence or Cahors. They no longer needed the Jews and found it troublesome to protect them. In 1290, Edward I ordered the 16,000 remaining Jews of England to leave the country by November 1st, abandoning all their immovable realty and all their collectible loans. Many were drowned in crossing the channel in small boats. Some were robbed by the ship's crews. Those who reached France were told by the government that they must leave by Lent of 1291. In France, too, the spiritual climate changed for the Jews with the crusades against the Turks in Asia and the Albigensian heretics of Languedoc. Bishops preached anti-Semitic sermons that stirred the people. At Béziers, an attack upon the Jewish quarter was a regular rite of Holy Week. Finally, in 1160, a Christian prelate forbade such preaching, but required the Jewish community to pay a special tax every Palm Sunday. At Toulouse, the Jews were forced to send a representative to the cathedral each Good Friday to receive publicly a box on the ears as a mild reminder of everlasting guilt. In 1171, several Jews were burned at Blois on a charge of using Christian blood in Passover rites. Seeing a chance to turn a pious penny, King Philip Augustus ordered all the Jews in his realm to be imprisoned as poisoners of Christian wells and then released them on payment of a heavy ransom, this in 1190. A year later he banished them, confiscated all their realty, and gave their synagogues to the church. In 1190 he had eighty Jews of Orange killed because one of his agents had been hanged by the city authorities for murdering a Jew. In 1198 he recalled the Jews to France and so regulated their banking business as to secure large profits to himself. In 1236 Christian crusaders invaded the Jewish settlements of Anjou and Poitou, especially those at Bordeaux and Angoulême and bade all Jews be baptized. When the Jews refused, the crusaders trampled three thousand of them to death under their horses' hoofs. Pope Gregory the Ninth condemned the slaughter, but did not raise the dead. St. Louis advised his people not to discuss religion with Jews. The layman, he told Joinville, when he hears any speak ill of the Christian faith, should defend it not with words, but with the sword, which he should thrust into the other's belly as far as it will go. In 1254 he banished the Jews from France, confiscating their property and their synagogues. A few years later he readmitted them and restored their synagogues. They were rebuilding their communities when Philip the Fair in 1306 had them all imprisoned, confiscated their credits and all their goods except the clothes they wore, and expelled them to the number of 100,000 from France with provisions for one day. The king profited so handsomely from the operation that he presented a synagogue to his coachman. So crowded a juxtaposition of bloody episodes scattered over two centuries makes a one-sided picture. In Provence, Italy, Sicily, and in the Byzantine Empire after the ninth century, there were only minor persecutions of the Jews, and they found means of protecting themselves in Christian Spain. Even in Germany, England, and France, the periods of peace were long, and a generation after each tragedy, the Jews there were again numerous, and some were prosperous. Nevertheless, their traditions carried down the bitter memory of those tragic interludes. The days of peace were made anxious by the ever-present danger of pogroms, and every Jew had to learn by heart the prayer to be recited in the moment of martyrdom. The pursuit of wealth was made more feverish by the harassed insecurity of its gains. The jibes of gamins in the street were ever ready to greet the wearers of the yellow badge. The ignominy of a helpless and secluded minority burned into the soul, broke down individual pride and interracial amity, and left in the eyes of the northern Jew that somber Judenschmerz, the sorrow of the Jews, which recalls a thousand insults and injuries. For that one death on the cross, how many crucifixions! Chapter 17 The Mind and Heart of the Jew, 500-1300 1. Letters In every age the soul of the Jew has been torn between the resolve to make his way in a hostile world and his hunger for the goods of the mind. A Jewish merchant is a dead scholar. He envies and generously honors the man who, escaping the fever of wealth, pursues in peace the love of learning and the mirage of wisdom. The Jewish traders and bankers who went to the fairs of Torah stopped on the way to hear the great Rashi expound the Talmud. 
So amid commercial cares or degrading poverty or mortal contumely, the Jews of the Middle Ages continued to produce grammarians, theologians, mystics, poets, scientists, and philosophers. And for a while, from 1150 to 1200, only the Moslems equaled them in widespread literacy and intellectual wealth. They had the advantage of living in contact or communication with Islam. Many of them read Arabic. The whole rich world of medieval Moslem culture was open to them. They took from Islam in science, medicine, and philosophy what they had given in religion to Muhammad and the Quran. And by their mediation they aroused the mind of the Christian West with the stimulus of Saracen thought. Within Islam, the Jews used Arabic in daily speech and written prose. Their poets kept the Hebrew, but accepted Arabic meters and poetic forms. In Christendom, the Jews spoke the language of the people among whom they lived, but wrote their literature and worshipped Yahweh in the ancient tongue. After Maimonides, the Jews of Spain, fleeing from Almohad persecution, abandoned Arabic for Hebrew as their literary medium. The revival of Hebrew was made possible by the devoted labors of Jewish philologists. The Old Testament text had become difficult to understand through lack of vowels and punctuation. Three centuries of scholarship, from the 7th to the 10th, evolved the Masoretic, or tradition-sanctioned text, by adding vowel points, accent strokes, punctuation marks, verse separations, and marginal notes. Thereafter, any literate Jew could read the scriptures of his people. Such studies compelled the development of Hebrew grammar and lexicography. The poetry and learning of Menachem ben Saruk from 910 to 970 attracted the attention of Hastai ben Shaprut. The great minister called him to Cordoba and encouraged him in the task of compiling a dictionary of biblical Hebrew. Menachem's pupil, Jehuda ibn Daud Chayuj, circa 1000, put Hebrew grammar upon a scientific basis with three Arabic works on the language of the Bible. Chayuj's pupil, Jonah ibn Janai, from 995 to 1050 of Saragossa, surpassed him with an Arabic book of critique that advanced Hebrew syntax and lexicography. Judah ibn Quraysh of Morocco, who flourished around 900, founded the comparative philology of the Semitic languages by his study of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. The Karaite Jew Abraham al-Fazi, that is, of Fez, circa 980, furthered the matter with a dictionary in which the words of the Old Testament were reduced to their roots alphabetically arranged. Nathan ben Yechiel of Rome, who died in 1106, excelled all other Jewish lexicographers with his dictionary of the Talmud. In Narbonne, Joseph Kimchi and his sons Moses and David, the latter of whom lived from 1160 to 1235, labored for generations in these fields. David's Michlal, or compendium, became for centuries the authoritative grammar of Hebrew and was a constant aid to King James's translators of the Bible. These names are chosen from a thousand. Profiting from this widespread scholarship, Hebrew poetry emancipated itself from Arabic exemplars, developed its own forms and themes, and produced in Spain alone three men quite equal to any triad in the Muslim or Christian literature of their age. Solomon ibn Gabiril, known to the Christian world as the philosopher Avicebron, was prepared by his personal tragedy to voice the feelings of Israel. This poet among philosophers and philosopher among poets, as Heine called him, was born at Malaga about 1021. He lost both parents early and grew up in a poverty that inclined him to morose contemplation. His verses caught the fancy of Yekutil ibn Hassan, a high official in the Muslim city-state of Saragossa. There for a time Gabiril found protection and happiness and sang the joy of life. But Yekutil was assassinated by enemies of the emir, and Gabiril fled. For years he wandered through Moslem Spain, poor and sick, and so thin that a fly could now bear me up with ease. Samuel ibn Nagdala, himself a poet, gave him refuge at Granada. There Solomon wrote his philosophical works and pledged his poetry to wisdom. How shall I forsake wisdom? I have made a covenant with her. She is my mother, I am her dearest child. She hath clasped her jewels about my neck. While life is mine, my spirit shall aspire unto her heavenly heights. I will not rest until I find her source. Presumably his impetuous pride caused his quarrel with Samuel. Still a youth in his late twenties, he resumed his wandering poverty. Misfortune humbled his spirit, and he turned from philosophy to religion. Lord, what is man? A carcass fouled and trodden a noxious creature brimming with deceit, 
a fading flower that shrivels in the heat. His poetry took at times the somber grandeur of the Psalms. Establish peace for us, O Lord, in everlasting grace, nor let us be of thee abhorred, who art our dwelling place. We wander ever to and fro, or sit in chains in exile drear, yet still proclaim where'er we go the splendor of our Lord is here. His masterpiece, Keter Makut, or Royal Crown, celebrated the greatness of God as his early poems had celebrated his own. From thee to thee I fly to win a place of refuge, and within thy shadow from thy anger hide, until thy wrath be turned aside. Unto thy mercy I will cling, until thou hearken, pitying, nor will I quit my hold of thee until thy blessing light on me. The richness and variety of Jewish culture in Moslem Spain was summed up in the Ibn Ezra family at Granada. Jacob Ibn Ezra held an important post in the government of King Habas under Samuel Ibn Nagdala. His home was a salon of literature and philosophy. Of his four sons, reared in this atmosphere of learning, three reached distinction. Joseph rose to high office in the state and to leadership of the Jewish community. Isaac was a poet, a scientist, and a Talmudist. Moses Ibn Ezra, who lived from 1070 to 1139, was a scholar, a philosopher, and the greatest Jewish poet of the generation before Halavi. His happy youth ended when he fell in love with a beautiful niece, whose father, his older brother Isaac, married her to his younger brother Abraham. Moses left Granada, wandered through strange lands, and fed his hopeless passion with poetry. Though thy lips drop honey for others to sip, live on, breathe myrrh for others to inhale. Thou art false to me, yet shall I be true to thee till the cold earth claims her own. My heart rejoices in the nightingale's song, though the singer soars above me and afar. In the end, like a birol, he turned his harp to piety and sang psalms of mystic surrender. Abraham ben Meir ibn Ezra, whom Browning used as a mouthpiece of Victorian philosophy, was a distant relative but an intimate friend of Moses ibn Ezra. Born in Toledo in 1093, his youth knew hunger and thirsted for knowledge in every field. He too wandered from town to town, from occupation to occupation, luckless in all. Were candles my merchandise, he said with the wry humor of the Jew, the sun would never set. If I sold burial shrouds, men would live forever. He traveled through Egypt and Iraq to Iran, perhaps to India, back to Italy, then to France and England. At seventy-five he was returning to Spain when he died, still poor, but acclaimed throughout Jewry for both his poetry and his prose. His works were as varied as his domiciles, on mathematics, astronomy, philosophy, religion. His poems ranged through love and friendship, God and nature, anatomy and the seasons, chess and the stars. He gave poetic form to ideas ubiquitous in the age of faith, and he anticipated Newman in a Hebrew melody. O God of earth and heaven, spirit and flesh are thine. Thou hast in wisdom given man's inward light divine. My times are in thy hand, thou knowest what is best, and where I fear to stand thy strength brings succor blessed. Thy mantle hides my sins, thy mercies are my sure defense, and for thy bounteous providence thou wilt demand no recompense. His contemporaries valued him chiefly for his biblical commentaries on every book of the Old Testament. He defended the authenticity and divine inspiration of the Hebrew Scriptures, but interpreted as metaphors the anthropomorphic phrases applied to the deity. He was the first to suggest that the book of Isaiah was the work of two prophets, not one. Spinoza considered him a founder of rational biblical criticism. The greatest European poet of his age was Jehuda Halavi, from 1086 to possibly 1147. Born at Toledo a year after its capture by Alfonso VI of Castile, he grew up in security under the most enlightened and liberal Christian monarch of the time. One of his early poems pleased Moses Ibn Ezra. The older poet invited Jehuda to come and stay with him in Granada. There Moses and Isaac Ibn Ezra entertained him for months in their homes. His verses were read, his epigrams were repeated, in every Jewish community in Spain. His poetry reflected his genial character and his fortunate youth. He sang of love with all the skill and artifice of a Moslem or Provençal troubadour, and with the sensuous intensity of the Song of Songs. One poem, The Garden of His Delight, put into fervent verse the frankest passages of that erotic masterpiece. 
Come down, her beloved. Why tarriest thou to feed amid her gardens? Turn aside to the couch of love to gather her lilies. Secret apples of her breasts give forth their fragrance. For thee she hideth in her necklaces precious fruits shining like light. She would shame but for her veil all the stars of heaven. Leaving the Ibn Ezra's courteous hospitality, Halavi went to Lucena and studied for several years in the Jewish academy there. He took up medicine and became an undistinguished practitioner. He founded a Hebrew institute in Toledo and lectured there on the scriptures. He married and had four children. As he grew older, he became more conscious of Israel's misfortunes than of his own prosperity. He began to sing of his people, their sorrows, and their faith. Like so many Jews, he longed to end his days in Palestine. O city of the world, Jerusalem, beauteous in proud splendor! O that I had eagles' wings, that I might fly to thee till I wet thy dust with my tears! My heart is in the east, while I tarry in the west. Comfortable Spanish Jews accepted such verses as a poetical pose, but Halavi was sincere. In 1141, leaving his family in good hands, he began an arduous pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Unfavorable winds drove his ship off course to Alexandria. There the Jewish community fated him and begged him not to venture into Jerusalem, then in the Crusaders' hands. After some delay he went on to Damietta and Tyre, and thence for some unknown reason to Damascus. There he disappeared from history. Legend says that he made his way to Jerusalem, knelt at the first sight of it, kissed the earth, and was trampled to death by an Arab horseman. We do not know if he ever reached the city of his dreams. We do know that at Damascus, perhaps in the last year of his life, he composed an ode to Zion that Goethe ranked among the greatest poems in world literature. Art thou not, Zion, fain to send forth greetings from thy sacred rock unto thy captive train who greet thee as the remnants of thy flock? Harsh is my voice when I bewail thy woes, but when in fancy's dream I see thy freedom, forth its cadence flows, sweet as the harps that hung by Babel's stream. I would that, where God's Spirit was of yore poured out unto thy holy ones, I might there too my soul outpour. The house of kings and throne of God wert thou, how comes it then that now slaves fill the throne where sat thy kings before? O oh, who will lead me on to seek the posts where, in far distant years, the angels in their glory dawned upon thy messengers and seers? O oh, who will give me wings that I may fly away, and there, at rest from all my wanderings, the ruins of my heart among thy ruins lay? I'll bend my face unto thy soil, and hold thy stones as precious gold. Thy air is life unto my soul. Thy grains of dust are myrrh, thy streams with honey flow. Naked and barefoot to thy ruined fanes, how gladly would I go. To where the ark was treasured, and in dim recesses dwelt the holy cherubim. Perfect in beauty, Zion, how in thee do love and grace unite. The souls of thy companions tenderly turn unto thee. Thy joy was their delight, and weeping they lament thy ruin now in distant exile. For thy sacred height they long, and toward thy gates in prayer they bow. The Lord desires thee for his dwelling place eternally, and blessed is he whom God has chosen for the grace within thy courts to rest. Happy is he that watches, drawing near, until he sees thy glorious lights arise, and over whom thy dawn breaks full and clear, set in the orient skies. But happiest he who, with exultant eyes, the bliss of thy redeemed ones shall behold, and see thy youth renewed as in the days of old. 2. The Adventures of the Talmud The Jews of that golden age in Spain were too prosperous to be as deeply religious as their poets became in declining years. They produced verses joyous and sensuous and graceful, and expressed a philosophy that confidently reconciled the holy scriptures with Greek thought. Even when Almohad fanaticism drove the Jews from Moslem into Christian Spain, they continued to prosper. And Jewish academies flourished under Christian tolerance in Toledo, Girona, and Barcelona in the 13th century. But in France and Germany the Jews were not so fortunate. They crowded their narrow quarters timidly and gave their best minds to the study of the Talmud. They did not bother to justify their faith to the secular world. They never questioned its premises. They consumed themselves in the law. 
The academy founded by Rabbi Gershom at Mainz became one of the most influential schools of its time. Hundreds of students gathered there and shared with Gershom in editing and clarifying through two generations of labor the Talmudic text. A similar role was played in France by Rabbi Shalomo ben Yitzhak from 1040 to 1105, fondly called Rashi from the first letters of his title and his name. Born at Troyes in Champagne, he studied in the Jewish academies of Worms, Mainz, and Speyer. Returning to Troyes, he supported his family by selling wine, but gave every leisure hour to the Bible and the Talmud. Though not officially a rabbi, he founded an academy at Troyes, taught there for forty years, and gradually composed commentaries on the Old Testament, the Mishnah, and the Gemara. He did not try, as some Spanish scholars had done, to read philosophical ideas into the religious texts. He merely explained these with such lucid learning that his Talmudic commentaries are now printed with the Talmud. The modest purity of his character and his life won him reverence among his people as a saint. Jewish communities everywhere in Europe sent him questions in theology and law and gave legal authority to his replies. His old age was saddened by the pogroms of the First Crusade. After his death, his grandsons Samuel, Jacob, and Isaac ben Meir continued his work. Jacob was the first of the Tosophists. For five generations after Rashi, the French and German Talmudists revised and amended his commentaries with Tosafoth, or supplements. The Talmud had hardly been completed when Justinian outlawed the book in 553 as a tissue of puerilities, fables, iniquities, insults, imprecations, heresies, and blasphemies. Thereafter, the Church seems to have forgotten the existence of the Talmud. Few theologians of the Latin Church could read the Hebrew or Aramaic in which it was written, and for seven hundred years the Jews were free to study the cherished volumes, so sedulously that they in turn seem almost to have forgotten the Bible. But in 1239 Nicholas Donat, a French Jew converted to Christianity, laid before Pope Gregory IX an indictment of the Talmud as containing shameful insults of Christ and the Virgin, and incitations to dishonesty in dealing with Christians. Some of the charges were true, for the assiduous compilers had so reverenced the Tanaim and Amoraim as to include in the Haggadic or popular portion of the Gemara occasional remarks in which irate rabbis had struck back at Christian critiques of Judaism. But Donat, now more Christian than the Pope, added several charges that could not be substantiated that the Talmud considered it permissible to deceive and meritorious to kill a Christian, no matter how good, that the Jews were allowed by their rabbis to break promises made under oath, and that any Christian who studied the Jewish law was to be put to death. Gregory ordered all discoverable copies of the Talmud in France, England, and Spain to be turned over to the Dominicans or the Franciscans, bade the monks examine the books carefully, and commanded that the books be burned if the charges proved true. No record has been found of the aftermath of this order. In France, Louis IX directed all Jews to surrender their copies of the Talmud on pain of death and summoned four rabbis to Paris to defend the book in public debate before the king, queen, Blanche, Donat, and two leading scholastic philosophers, William of Auvergne and Albertus Magnus. After three days' inquiry, the king ordered all copies of the Talmud to be burned in 1240. Walter Cornutus, Archbishop of Sens, interceded for the Jews, and the king allowed many copies to be restored to their owners. But the archbishop died soon afterward, and some monks were of opinion that this was the judgment of God on the royal lenience. Convinced by them, Louis ordered the confiscation of all copies of the Talmud. Twenty-four cartloads were brought to Paris and were committed to the flames in 1242. The possession of the Talmud was prohibited in France by a papal legate in 1248, and thereafter rabbinical studies in Hebrew literature declined in all of France except Provence. A similar debate took place in Barcelona in 1263. Raymond of Peñafort, a Dominican monk in charge of the Inquisition in Aragon and Castile, undertook to convert the Jews of these states to Christianity. To equip his preachers, he arranged for the teaching of Hebrew in the seminaries of Christian Spain. A converted Jew, Paul the Christian, assisted him, and so impressed Raymond with his knowledge of both Christian and Jewish theology that the monk arranged a disputation between Paul and Rabbi Moses ben Nachman of Girona before King James I of Aragon. Nachmanides came reluctantly, fearing victory as much as defeat. The debate continued for four days to the delight of the king. Apparently the amenities were reasonably observed. 
In 1264, an ecclesiastical commission commandeered all copies of the Talmud in Aragon, obliterated the anti-Christian passages, and returned the books to their owners. In an account that Nachmanides wrote of his debate for the Jewish synagogues of Aragon, he spoke of Christianity in terms that seemed to Raymond grossly blasphemous. The monk protested to the king, but it was not till 1266 that James, yielding to papal insistence, banished Nachmanides from Spain. A year later, the rabbi died in Palestine. 3. Science Among the Jews Jewish science and philosophy in the Middle Ages were almost entirely domiciled in Islam. Isolated and scorned, and yet influenced by their neighbors, the Jews of medieval Christendom took refuge in mysticism, superstition, and messianic dreams. No situation could have favored science less. Religion, however, encouraged the study of astronomy, for on this depended the correct determination of the holy days. In the 6th century, the Jewish astronomers of Babylonia substituted astronomic calculation for direct observation of the heavens. They based the year on the apparent movements of the sun and the months on the phases of the moon, gave Babylonian names to the months, made some months full with 30 days, some defective with 29, and then reconciled the lunar with the solar calendar by inserting a 13th month every 3rd, 6th, 8th, 11th, 14th, 17th, and 19th year in a 19-year cycle. In the East, the Jews dated events by the Seleucid calendar, which began at 312 B.C. In Europe, in the ninth century, they adopted the present Jewish era, Anno Mundi, year of the world, beginning with the supposed creation in 3761 B.C. The Jewish calendar is as clumsy and sacred as our own. One of the earliest astronomers in Islam was the Jewish scholar Mashala, who died circa 815. His De Scientia Motus Orbis, was translated from Arabic into Latin by Gerard of Cremona and won wide acclaim in Christendom. His treatise De Mercibus, on prices, is the oldest extant scientific work in the Arabic tongue. The foremost mathematical treatise of the age was the Hibur Hamishia, on algebra, geometry, and trigonometry, of Abraham ben Hia of Barcelona, who lived from 1065 to 1136, who also composed a lost encyclopedia of mathematics, astronomy, optics, and music, and the earliest surviving Hebrew treatise on the calendar. Abraham ibn Ezra, in the next generation, found no conflict between writing poetry and advancing combinatorial analysis. These two Abrahams were the first Jews to write scientific works in Hebrew rather than in Arabic. Through such books and a flood of translations from Arabic into Hebrew, Muslim science and philosophy invaded the Jewish communities of Europe and broadened their intellectual life beyond purely rabbinical lore. Profiting in some measure from Islamic science, but also recapturing their own traditions of the healing art, the Jews of this period wrote outstanding treatises on medicine and became the most esteemed physicians in Christian Europe. Isaac Israeli, who lived circa 855 to circa 955, acquired such fame as an ophthalmologist in Egypt that he was appointed physician to the Aglabid court at Kairwan. His medical works, translated from Arabic into Hebrew and Latin, were acclaimed as classics throughout Europe. They were used as textbooks at Salerno and Paris and were quoted after 700 years of life in Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy in 1621. Tradition describes Isaac as indifferent to wealth, an obstinate scholar, and a centenarian. Probably contemporary with him was Asaf Hajahudi, the obscure author of a recently discovered manuscript, reckoned to be the oldest extant medical work in Hebrew, and remarkable for its teaching that the blood circulates through the arteries and the veins. Had he surmised the function of the heart, he would have completely anticipated Harvey. In Egypt, after the arrival of Maimonides in 1165, the medical art was dominated by Jewish practitioners and texts. Abu al-Fada of Cairo wrote the principal ophthalmological treatise of the 12th century, and Al-Kuhin al-Attar composed circa 1275 a pharmacopoeia still used in the Muslim world. The Jewish physicians of southern Italy and Sicily served as one medium through which Arabic medicine entered Salerno. Shabbatai ben Abraham, who lived from 913 to 970, called Donalo, born near Otranto, was captured by Saracens, studied Arabic medicine at Palermo, and then returned to practice in Italy. Ben Venutus Grassus, a Jerusalem Jew, studied at Salerno, taught there and at Montpellier, and wrote a Practica Oculorum, circa 1250, 
which Islam and Christendom alike accepted as the definitive treatise on diseases of the eye. 224 years after its publication, it was chosen as the first book to be printed on its theme. Rabbinical schools, especially in southern France, gave courses in medicine, partly to provide rabbis with a secular income. Jewish physicians trained in the Hebrew Academy at Montpellier helped to develop the famous Montpellier School of Medicine. The appointment of a Jew as regent of the faculty in 1300 drew upon his people the wrath of the medical authorities in the University of Paris. The Montpellier School was forced to close its doors to Jews in 1301, and the Hebrew physicians of the city shared in the banishment of the Jews from France in 1306. By this time, however, Christian medicine had been revolutionized by Jewish and Muslim example and influence. The Semitic practitioners had long since put behind them the theory of sickness as possession by demons, and the success of their rational diagnosis and therapy had weakened the belief of the people in the efficacy of relics and other supernatural means of cure. The monks and secular clergy whose abbeys and churches housed relics and drew pilgrims found it hard to accept this revolution. The church condemned the intimate reception of Jewish doctors into Christian homes. She suspected that these men had more physic than faith, and she dreaded their influence upon sick minds. In 1246 the Council of Bézier forbade Christians to employ Jewish physicians. In 1267 the Council of Vienna forbade Jewish physicians to treat Christians. Such prohibitions did not prevent some prominent Christians from availing themselves of Jewish medical skill. Pope Boniface VIII, suffering from an eye ailment, called in Isaac ben Mordecai. Raymond Lully complained that every monastery had a Jewish physician. A papal legate was shocked to find that this was also the fate of many nunneries. And Christian kings of Spain enjoyed Jewish medical care down to the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella. Sheshet Benveniste of Barcelona, physician to King James I of Aragon, who lived from 1213 to 1276, wrote the chief gynecological treatise of his time. The Jews lost their ascendancy in the medical practice of Christendom only when Christian universities in the 13th century adopted rational medicine. For so mobile and scattered a people, the Jews contributed little to the science of geography. Nevertheless, the outstanding travelers of the 12th century were two Jews. Batakia of Radispan, and Benjamin of Tudela, who wrote valuable Hebrew narratives of their journeys through Europe and the Near East. Benjamin left Saragossa in 1160, leisurely visited Barcelona, Marseille, Genoa, Pisa, Rome, Salerno, Brindisi, Otranto, Corfu, Constantinople, the Aegean Isles, Antioch, every important city in Palestine, and Baalbek, Damascus, Baghdad, and Persia. He returned by ship through the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea to Egypt, Sicily, and Italy, and thence overland to Spain. He reached home in 1173 and died soon afterward. His main interest was in the Jewish communities, but he described with fair accuracy and objectivity the geographic and ethnic features of each country on his route. His account is less fascinating, but probably more reliable than the reports made by Marco Polo a century later. It was translated into nearly all European languages and remained till our time a favorite book with the Jews. 4. The Rise of Jewish Philosophy The life of the mind is a composition of two forces, the necessity to believe in order to live and the necessity to reason in order to advance. In ages of poverty and chaos, the will to believe is paramount, for courage is the one thing needful. In ages of wealth, the intellectual powers come to the fore as offering preferment and progress. Consequently, a civilization passing from poverty to wealth tends to develop a struggle between reason and faith, a warfare of science with theology. In this conflict, philosophy, dedicated to seeing life whole, usually seeks a reconciliation of opposites, a mediating peace, with the result that it is scorned by science and suspected by theology. In an age of faith where hardship makes life unbearable without hope, Philosophy inclines to religion, uses reason to defend faith, and becomes a disguised theology. Among the three faiths that divided white civilization in the Middle Ages, this was least true of Islam, which had most wealth, truer of Christendom, which had less, truest of Judaism, which had least. And Jewish philosophy ventured from faith chiefly in the prosperous Jewry of Moslem Spain. Medieval Jewish philosophy had two sources, Hebrew religion and Moslem thought. Most Jewish thinkers conceived of religion and philosophy as similar in content and result, differing only in method and form. What religion taught as divinely revealed dogma, philosophy would teach as rationally demonstrated truth. 
And most Jewish thinkers, from Sadia to Maimonides, made this attempt in a Muslim milieu, derived their knowledge of Greek philosophy from Arabic translations and Muslim commentaries, and wrote in Arabic for Muslims as well as Jews. Just as Ashari turned against the Mutazilites the weapons of reason and saved the orthodoxy of Islam, so Sadia, who left Egypt for Babylonia in the very year, 915, of Ashari's conversion from skepticism, saved Hebrew theology by his polemic industry and skill. And Sadia followed not only the methods of the Muslim Mutakalimun, but even the details of their arguments. Sadia's victory had the same effect in Eastern Judaism as Al-Ghazali's in Eastern Islam. It combined with political disorder and economic decline to smother Hebrew philosophy in the Orient. The rest of the story belongs to Africa and Spain. At Kairwan, Isaac Israeli found time, amid his medical practice and writing, to compose some influential philosophical works. His Essay on Definitions gave several terms to scholastic logic. His treatise on the elements introduced Aristotle's physics to Hebrew thought. His book of Soul and Spirit replaced the creation story of Genesis with a Neoplatonist scheme of progressive emanations, or splendors, from God to the material world. Here was one source of the Kabbalah. Ibn Gabiro had more influence as a philosopher than as a poet. It is one of the jeux d'esprit of history that the scholastics quoted him with respect as Avicebron, and thought him a Muslim or a Christian. Not till 1846 did Salomon Monk discover that Ibn Gabiro and Avicebron were one. The misunderstanding had almost been prepared by Gabiro's attempt to write philosophy in terms fully independent of Judaism. His anthology of Proverbs, Choice of Pearls, took nearly all its quotations from non-Jewish sources, though Hebrew folklore is peculiarly rich in pointed and pithy apothems. One pearl is quite Confucian. How shall one take vengeance on an enemy? By increasing one's good qualities. This is practically a summary of the treatise on the improvement of the moral qualities, which Gabiro seems to have composed at twenty-four when philosophy is unbecoming. By an artificial schematism, the young poet derived all virtues and vices from the five senses with platitudinous results. But the book had the distinction of seeking to construct, in the age of faith, a moral code unsupported by religious belief. With like audacity, Gabiro's chef d'oeuvre, Mekor Haigim, refrained from quoting either the Bible, the Talmud, or the Koran. It was this unusual supranationalism that made the book so offensive to the rabbis and, when translated into Latin as Fons Vitae, the Fountain of Life, so influential in Christendom. Gabiro accepted the Neoplatonism that permeated all Arabic philosophy, but he imposed upon it a voluntarism that stressed the action of the will in God and man. We must, said Gabiro, assume the existence of God as first substance, first essence, or primary will, in order to understand the existence or motion of anything at all. But we cannot know the attributes of God. The universe was not created in time, but flows in continuous and graduated emanations from God. Everything in the universe except God is composed of matter and form. These always appear together and can be separated only in thought. The rabbis repudiated this Avicennian cosmology as a disguised materialism. But Alexander of Hales, St. Bonaventure, and Duns Scotus accepted the universality of matter under God and the primacy of will. William of Auvergne nominated Gabiro as the noblest of all philosophers and thought him a good Christian. Jehuda Halavi rejected all speculation as vain intellectualism. Like Al-Ghazali, he feared that philosophy was undermining religion not merely by questioning dogma or ignoring it or interpreting the Bible metaphorically, but even more by substituting argument for devotion. Against the invasion of Judaism by Plato and Aristotle and the seduction of Jews by Mohammedanism and the continuing attacks of Karaite Jews upon the Talmud, the poet wrote one of the most interesting books of medieval philosophy, the Al-Khazari, circa 1140, he presented his ideas in a dramatic mise-en-scene, the conversion of the Khazar king to the Jewish faith. Luckily for Halavi, the book, though written in the Arabic language, used the Hebrew alphabet, which confined its audience to educated Jews. For the story, bringing a bishop, a mullah, and a rabbi before the curious king makes short work of both Mohammedanism and Christianity. When the Christian and the Moslem quote the Hebrew scriptures as the word of God, the king dismisses them and keeps the rabbi. 
and most of the book is the conversation of the rabbi instructing a docile and circumcised king in Judaic theology and ritual. Says the royal pupil to his teacher, There has been nothing new since your religion was promulgated except certain details concerning paradise and hell. So encouraged, the rabbi explains that Hebrew is the language of God and that God spoke directly only to the Jews and that only the Jewish prophets were divinely inspired. Halavi smiles at philosophers who proclaim the supremacy of reason and subject God and the heavens to their syllogisms and categories, while obviously the human mind is merely a fragile and infinitesimal fraction of a vast and complex creation. The wise man, who is not necessarily learned, will recognize the weakness of reason in transmundane affairs. He will keep to the faith given him in the scriptures, and he will believe and pray as simply as a child. Despite Halavi, the fascination of reason survived, and the Aristotelian invasion continued. Abraham ibn Daud, from 1110 to 1180, was as deeply Jewish as Halavi. He defended the Talmud against the Karaites, and proudly narrated the history of the Jewish kings in the Second Commonwealth. But along with countless Christians, Muslims, and Jews of the 12th and 13th centuries, he aspired to prove his faith with philosophy. Like Halavi, he was born in Toledo and made his living as a physician. His Arabic Kitab al akida al rafia Book of the Sublime Faith, gave the same answer to Halavi that Aquinas would give to the Christian enemies of philosophy. The peaceful defense of a religion against non-believers requires reasoning, and cannot rest upon simple faith. A few years before Averroes, 1126-1198, a generation before Maimonides, 1135-1204, a century before St. Thomas Aquinas, 1224-1274, Ibn Daud labored to reconcile the faith of his fathers with the philosophy of Aristotle. The Greek would have been amused to find himself the recipient of such a triple compliment, or to learn that the Jewish philosophers knew him only in the summaries of Al-Farabi and Avicenna, who knew him through imperfect translations and a Neoplatonist forgery. Truer than St. Thomas to their common Aristotelian source, Ibn Daud, like Averroes, claimed immortality only for the universal psyche, not for the individual soul. Here, Halavi might have complained, Aristotle triumphed over the Talmud as well as the Quran. Jewish philosophy, like medieval philosophy in general, had begun with Neoplatonism and piety, and was culminating in Aristotle and doubt. Maimonides would take his start from this Aristotelian stand of Ibn Daud, and would face with courage and skill all the problems of reason in conflict with faith. 5. Maimonides, 1135 to 1204. The greatest of medieval Jews was born in Cordova, son of the distinguished scholar, physician, and judge, Maimon ben Joseph. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 1. The greatest of medieval Jews was born in Cordova, son of the distinguished scholar, physician, and judge, Maimon ben Joseph. The boy received the name of Moses, and it became an adage among Jews that from Moses to Moses there arose none like Moses. His people knew him as Moses ben Maimon, or more briefly, Maimuni. When he became a famous rabbi, the initials of his title and his name were combined into the fond appellation Rambam, and the Christian world expressed his parentage by terming him Maimonides. The probably legendary story tells how the boy showed a distaste for study and how the disappointed father, calling him the butcher's son, packed him off to live with the father's former teacher, Rabbi Joseph ibn Megas. From this poor beginning, the second Moses became adept in biblical and rabbinical literature, in medicine, mathematics, astronomy, and philosophy. He was one of the two most learned men of his time. His only rival was Averroes. Strange to say, these outstanding thinkers, born in the same city only nine years apart, seem never to have met, and apparently Maimonides read Averroes only in old age, after his own books had been written. In 1148 Berber fanatics captured Cordova, destroyed churches and synagogues, and gave Christians and Jews a choice between Islam and exile. In 1159 Maimonides, with his wife and children, left Spain. For nine years they lived in Fez, pretending to be Moslems, for there too no Jews or Christians were allowed. Maimonides justified superficial adherence to Islam among endangered Jews in Morocco by arguing that 
We are not asked to render active homage to heathenism, but only to recite an empty formula. The Moslems themselves know that we utter it insincerely in order to circumvent bigots. The head rabbi of Fez did not agree with him and suffered martyrdom in 1165. Fearing the same fate, Maimonides left for Palestine. Thence he moved to Alexandria and old Cairo, where he lived till his death. Soon recognized as one of the ablest practitioners of his time, he became personal physician to Saladin's eldest son, Nuruddin Ali, and to Saladin's vizier, al-Qadi al-Fadil al-Baizani. He used his favorite court to secure protection for the Jews of Egypt, and when Saladin conquered Palestine, Maimonides persuaded him to let the Jews settle there again. In 1177, Maimonides was made Nagid, or head of the Jewish community in Cairo. A Muslim jurist indicted him in 1187 as an apostate from Islam and demanded the usual death penalty. Maimonides was saved by the vizier, who ruled that a man converted to Mohammedanism by force could not rightly be considered a Muslim. During these busy years in Cairo, he composed most of his books. Ten medical works in Arabic transmitted the ideas of Hippocrates, Galen, Dioscorides, Al-Razi, and Avicenna. Medical aphorisms reduced Galen to 1,500 short statements covering every branch of medicine. It was translated into Hebrew and Latin and was frequently quoted in Europe under the formula Dixit Rabbi Moises. For Saladin's son, he wrote a treatise on diet, and for Saladin's nephew, Al-Muzaffar I, Sultan of Hama, he composed an essay on intercourse, on sexual hygiene, impotence, priapism, aphrodisiacs. The introduction to this work struck an unhackneyed note. Our Lord His Majesty, Al-Muzaffar, may God prolong His power, ordered me to compose a treatise that would help him increase his sexual powers, as he had some hardship in this way. He does not wish to depart from his customs concerning sexual intercourse, is alarmed by the abatement of his flesh, and desires an augmentation of his virility on account of the increasing number of his female slaves. To these writings Maimonides added several monographs, on poisons, asthma, hemorrhoids, and hypochondria, and a learned glossary of drugs. Like all books, these medical works contain several items not in accord with the passing infallibilities of our time. For example, if the right testis is larger than the left, the first child will be male. But they are marked by an earnest desire to help the sick, by a courteous consideration of contrary opinions, and by wisdom and moderation of prescription and advice. Maimonides never prescribed drugs where diet could serve. He warned against overeating. The stomach must not be made to swell like a tumor. He thought that wine was healthful in moderation. He recommended philosophy as a training in the mental and moral balance and calm conducive to health and longevity. At the age of twenty-three, Maimonides began a commentary on the Mishnah and labored on it for a decade amid commerce, medicine, and perilous journeys by land and sea. Published at Cairo in 1158 as Kitab al-Siraj, or Book of the Lamp, its clarity, erudition, and good judgment at once placed Maimonides, still a youth of thirty-three, next to Rashi as a commentator on the Talmud. Twelve years later, he issued his greatest work, written in Neo-Hebraic and provocatively called Mishnah Torah. Here, in logical order and lucid brevity, were arranged all the laws of the Pentateuch and nearly all those of the Mishnah and the Gemaras. I have entitled this work Mishnah Torah, or Repetition of the Law, said the introduction, for the reason that a person who first reads the written law, or the Pentateuch, and then this compilation, will know the whole oral law without needing to consult any other book. He omitted some Talmudic regulations concerning omens, amulets, and astrology. He was among the few medieval thinkers who rejected astrology. He classified the 613 precepts of the law under 14 heads, devoted a book to each head, and undertook not only to explain each law, but to show its logical or historical necessity. Only one of the fourteen books has been translated into English. It forms a substantial volume. We may judge the immensity of the original. It is clear from this work and from the later Guide to the Perplexed that Maimonides was not openly a freethinker. He endeavored as far as he could to reduce scriptural miracles to natural causes, but he taught the divine inspiration of every word in the Pentateuch and the orthodox rabbinical doctrine that the whole oral law had been transmitted by Moses to the elders of Israel. Perhaps he felt that the Jews could not claim less for their scriptures than the Christians and Moslems claimed for them. Perhaps he too considered social order impossible without belief in the divine origin of the moral code. 
He was a stern and dictatorial patriot. All Israelites are bound to follow everything in the Babylonian Talmud, and we should force the Jews of every land to adhere to the customs established by the Talmudic sages. A bit more liberal than most Muslims and Christians of the time, he thought that a virtuous and monotheistic non-Jew would go to heaven. But he was as severe as Deuteronomy or Torquemada on heretics within the Hebrew Pale. Any Jew who repudiated the Jewish law should be put to death. And according to my opinion, all members of an Israelite community which has insolently and presumptuously transgressed any of the divine precepts must be put to death. He anticipated Aquinas in defending death for heresy on the ground that cruelty against those who mislead the people to seek vanity is real clemency to the world. And he accepted without trouble the scriptural penalty of death for witchcraft, murder, incest, idolatry, violent robbery, kidnapping, filial disobedience, and breaking the Sabbath. The condition of the Jews migrating from ancient Egypt and trying to form a state out of a destitute and homeless horde may have warranted these laws. The precarious status of the Jews in Christian Europe or Muslim Africa, always subject to attack, conversion, or demoralization, required a hard code to forge order and unity. But in these matters, and before the Inquisition, Christian theory and probably Jewish practice were more humane than Jewish law. A better side of this stern spirit shows in Maimonides' advice to the Jews of his age. If heathens should say to Israelites, Surrender one of your number to us that we may put him to death, they should all suffer death, rather than surrender a single Israelite to them. Pleasanter is his picture of the scholar growing into a sage. He approved the rabbinical saying that a bastard who is a scholar of the law takes precedence of an ignorant high priest. He advised the scholar to give three hours daily to earning a living, nine hours to studying the Torah. Believing environment more influential than heredity, he counseled the student to seek association with good and wise men. The scholar should not marry until he has reached the maturity of his learning, has acquired a trade, and has bought a home. He may marry four wives, but should cohabit with each of them only once a month. Although connubial intercourse with one's wife is always permitted, this relation too should be invested by the scholar with sanctity. He should not be always with his spouse like a rooster, but should fulfill his marital obligation on Friday nights. When cohabiting, neither husband nor wife should be in a state of intoxication, lethargy, or melancholy. The wife should not be asleep at the time. And so at last is produced the sage. He cultivates extreme modesty. He will not bare his head or his body. When speaking, he will not raise his voice unduly. His speech with all men will be gentle. He will avoid exaggeration or affected speech. He will judge everyone favorably. He will dwell on the merits of others and never speak disparagingly of anybody. He will avoid restaurants except in extreme emergency. The wise man will eat nowhere except at home and at his own table. He will study the Torah every day until his death. He will beware of false messiahs, but will never lose his faith that someday the real Messiah will come and restore Israel to Zion and bring all the world to the true faith and to abundance, brotherhood, and peace. The other nations vanish, but the Jews last forever. The Mishnah Torah irritated the rabbis. Few could forgive the presumption of aiming to displace the Talmud and many Jews were scandalized by the reported assertion of Maimonides that he who studies the law is higher than he who obeys it. Nevertheless, the book made its author the leading Jew of the time. All eastern Israel accepted him as its counselor and sent him questions and problems. It seemed for a generation that the Gaianate had been revived. But Maimonides, not pausing to enjoy his renown, began work at once on his next book. Having codified and clarified the law for Orthodox Jews, he turned to the task of restoring to the Jewish fold those who had been seduced by philosophy or lured into the Karaite communities of heretical Jews in Egypt, Palestine, or North Africa. After another decade of labor, he issued to the Jewish world his most famous work, The Guide to the Perplexed, in 1190. Written in Arabic with Hebrew characters, it was soon translated into Hebrew as More Nebuchim, and into Latin, and aroused one of the bitterest intellectual tempests of the 13th century. My primary object, says the introduction, is to explain certain words occurring in the prophetic books, that is, the Old Testament. Many biblical terms and passages have several meanings, literal, metaphorical, or symbolical. Taken literally, some of them are a stumbling block to persons sincerely religious but also respectful of reason as man's highest faculty. Such persons must not be forced to choose between religion without reason or reason without religion. 
Since reason was implanted in man by God, it cannot be contrary to God's revelation. Where such contradictions occur, Maimonides suggests, it is because we take literally expressions adapted to the imaginative and pictorial mentality of the simple, unlettered people to whom the Bible was addressed. Our sages have said it is impossible to give a full account of the creation to man. It has been treated in metaphors in order that the uneducated may comprehend it according to the measure of their faculties and the feebleness of their apprehension, while educated persons may take it in a different sense. From this starting point, Maimonides advances to a discussion of deity. That some supreme intelligence rules the universe he deduces from the evidences of design in nature. But he ridicules the notion that all things have been made for the sake of man. Things exist only because God, their source and life, exists. If it could be supposed that he does not exist, it would follow that nothing else could possibly exist. Since in this way it is essential that God exist, his existence is identical with his essence. Now, a thing which has in itself the necessity of existence cannot have for its existence any cause, whatever. Since God is intelligent, He must be incorporeal. Therefore, all biblical passages implying physical organs or attributes in God must be interpreted figuratively. In truth, says Maimonides, probably following the Mutazilites, we cannot know anything of God except that He exists. Even the non-physical terms that we use of Him intelligence, omnipotence, mercy, affection, unity, will, are homonyms. That is, they have different meanings when applied to God than is used of man. Just what their meaning is in God's case we shall never know. We can never define Him. We must not ascribe to Him any positive attributes, qualities, or predicates, whatever. When the Bible tells how God or an angel spoke to the prophets, we must not imagine a voice or sound. Prophecy consists in the most perfect development of the imaginative faculty. It is an emanation from the divine being through dream or ecstatic vision. What the prophets relate took place not in actuality, but only in such vision or dream, and must in many cases be interpreted allegorically. Some of our sages clearly stated that Job never existed, and that he is a poetic fiction, revealing the most important truths. Any man, if he develops his faculties to their height, is capable of such prophetic revelations. For human reason is a continuing revelation, not basically different from the vivid insight of the prophet. Did God create the world in time, or is the universe of matter and motion, as Aristotle thought, eternal? Here, says Maimonides, reason is baffled. We can prove neither the eternity nor the creation of the world. Let us therefore hold to our Father's faith in its creation. He proceeds to interpret the creation story of Genesis allegorically. Adam is active form or spirit. Eve is passive matter, which is the root of all evil. The serpent is imagination. But evil is no positive entity. It is merely the negation of good. Most of our misfortunes are due to our own fault. Other evils are evil only from a human or limited standpoint. A cosmic view might discover in every evil the good or need of the whole. God permits to man the free will that lets him be a man. Man sometimes chooses evil. God has foreseen the choice, but does not determine it. Is man immortal? Here Maimonides applies to the full his capacity for mystifying his readers. In the guide he avoids the question, except to say that the soul that remains after death is not the soul that lives in a man when he is born. The latter, the potential intellect, is a function of the body and dies with it. What survives is the acquired or active intellect, which existed before the body and is never a function of it. This Aristotelian Averroist view apparently denied individual immortality. In the Mishnah Torah, Maimonides rejected the resurrection of the body, ridiculed the Moslem notion of a physically epicurean paradise, and represented this in Islam and Judaism alike as a concession to the imagination and the moral needs of the populace. In the guide, he added that incorporeal entities can only be numbered when they are forces situated in a body, which seemed to imply that the incorporeal spirit which survived the body had no individual consciousness. As physical resurrection had become a central doctrine of both Judaism and Mohammedanism, many protests were aroused by these skeptical intimations. Transliterated into Arabic, the guide made a stir in the Muslim world. A Mohammedan scholar, Abd al-Latif, denounced it as undermining the principles of all faiths by the very means with which it appears to buttress them. Saladin was at this time engaged in a life-and-death struggle with the Crusaders. Always orthodox, he now more than ever resented heresy as threatening Muslim morale in the heat of a holy war. In 1191 he ordered the execution of Surawardi, a mystic heretic. In the same month Maimonides issued a makala, or discourse, 
on the resurrection of the dead. He again expressed his doubts about corporeal immortality, but announced that he accepted it as an article of faith. The storm subsided for a time, and he busied himself in his work as a physician and in writing responsa to doctrinal and ethical inquiries from the Jewish world. When in 1199 Samuel ben Judah ibn Tibbon, who was translating the guide into Hebrew, proposed to visit him, he warned him not to expect to confer with me on any scientific subject for even one hour, either by day or by night, for the following is my daily occupation. I dwell in Fustat, and the Sultan resides at Cairo, two Sabbath days' journey, a mile and a half, distant. My duties to the regent, Saladin's son, are very heavy. I am obligated to visit him every day, early in the morning, and when he or any of his children or any inmate of his harem is indisposed, I dare not quit Cairo, but must stay during the greater part of the day in the palace. I do not return to Fustat until the afternoon. Then I am almost dying with hunger." I find the antechambers filled with people, theologians, bailiffs, friends, and foes. I dismount from my animal, wash my hands, and beg my patients to bear with me while I partake of some refreshments, the only meal I take in twenty-four hours. Then I attend my patients until nightfall, sometimes until two hours in the night or even later. I prescribe while lying on my back from fatigue, and when night falls I am so exhausted I can scarcely speak. In consequence of this, no Israelite can have any private interview with me except on the Sabbath. On that day the whole congregation, or at least a majority, come to me after the morning service when I instruct them. We study together till noon when they depart. He was prematurely worn out. Richard I of England sought him as personal physician, but Maimonides could not accept the invitation. Saladin's vizier, seeing his exhaustion, pensioned him. He died in 1204, aged 69. His remains were conveyed to Palestine, where his tomb may still be seen in Tiberias. 6. The Maimonidean War Maimonides' influence was felt in Islam and Christendom as well as in the Jewish world. Mohammedan pundits studied the guide under the direction of Jewish teachers. Latin translations of it were used at the universities of Montpellier and Padua, and it was frequently quoted at Paris by Alexander of Hales and William of Auvergne. Albertus Magnus followed the lead of Maimonides on many points, and St. Thomas often considered the views of Rabbi Moises if only to reject them. Spinoza, with perhaps some lack of historical understanding, criticized Maimonides' allegorical interpretation of the Scriptures as a disingenuous attempt to preserve the authority of the Bible. But he hailed the great rabbi as the first who openly declared that Scripture must be accommodated to reason. And he took from Maimonides some ideas on prophecy, miracles, and the attributes of God. In Judaism itself, Maimonides' influence was revolutionary. His own posterity carried on his work as scholars and Jews. His son, Abraham ben Moses, succeeded him as Nagid and court physician in 1205. His grandson, David ben Abraham, and his great-grandson, Solomon ben Abraham, also succeeded to the leadership of the Egyptian Jews. And all three continued the Maimonidean tradition in philosophy. For a while it became fashionable to Aristotelize the Bible through allegorical ledger domain and to reject the historicity of its narratives. Abraham and Sarah, for example, were merely a legend representing matter and form, and Jewish ritual laws had only a symbolical purpose and truth. The whole structure of Judaic theology seemed about to fall upon the heads of the rabbis. Some of them fought back vigorously. Samuel ben Ali of Palestine, Abraham ben David of Posquier, Meir ben Todros Halavi Abu Lafia of Toledo, Donna Struk of Lunel, Solomon ben Abraham of Montpellier, Jonah ben Abraham Garandi of Spain, and many more. They protested against selling the Scriptures to the Greeks, denounced the attempt to replace the Talmud with philosophy, deplored Maimonides' doubts on immortality, and rejected his unknowable God as a metaphorical abstraction that would never stir a soul to piety or prayer. The followers of the mystic Kabbalah joined in the attack and desecrated Maimonides' tomb. The Maimonidean War divided the Jewish communities of southern France precisely when Orthodox Christianity was waging there a war of extermination against the Albigensian heresy. And as Christian Orthodoxy defended itself against rationalism by banning the books of Aristotle and Averroes from the universities, so Rabbi Solomon ben Abraham of Montpellier, perhaps to forestall Christian attacks upon Jewish congregations as harboring rationalists, took the unusual step of anathematizing the philosophical works of Maimonides and excommunicating all Jews who should study profane science or literature, 
or who should treat the Bible allegorically. The supporters of Maimonides, led by David Kimchi and Jacob ben Machir Tibbon, retaliated by persuading the congregations of Lunel, Béziers, and Narbonne in Provence, and those of Saragossa and Lerida in Spain, to excommunicate Solomon and his followers. Solomon now took a more startling step. He denounced the books of Maimonides to the Dominican Inquisition at Montpellier as containing heresies dangerous to Christianity as well as Judaism. The monks accommodated him, and all procurable publications of the philosopher were burned in public ceremonies at Montpellier in 1234 and at Paris in 1242. Forty days later the Talmud itself was burned at Paris. These events drove the supporters of Maimonides to bitter fury. They arrested the leading adherents of Solomon at Montpellier, convicted them of informing against fellow Jews, and condemned them to have their tongues cut out. Apparently Solomon was put to death. Rabbi Jonah, regretting his share in the burning of Maimonides' books, came to Montpellier, did public penance in the synagogue, and undertook a pilgrimage of repentance to Moses ben Maimon's grave. But Donastruk resumed the war by proposing a rabbinical ban on any study of the profane sciences. Machmanides and Asher ben Yehiel supported him, and in 1305 Solomon ben Abraham ben Adret, the revered and powerful leader of the Barcelona congregations, issued a decree of excommunication against any Jew who should teach, or should before the age of twenty-five dare to study any secular science except medicine or any non-Jewish philosophy. The liberals of Montpellier replied by excommunicating any Jew who debarred his son from the study of science. Neither ban had any wide effect. Jewish youths here and there continued to study philosophy. But the great influence of Adret and Asher in Spain, and the growth of persecution and fear throughout a Europe now subject to the Inquisition, drove the Jewish communities back into intellectual as well as ethnic isolation. The study of science declined among them. Purely rabbinical studies ruled the Hebrew schools. After its escapade with reason, the Jewish soul, haunted with theological terrors and an encompassing enmity, buried itself in mysticism and piety. 7. The Kabbalah the aisles of science and philosophy are everywhere washed by mystic seas. Intellect narrows hope, and only the fortunate can bear it gladly. The medieval Jews, like the Moslems and the Christians, covered reality with a thousand superstitions, dramatized history with miracles and portents, crowded the air with angels and demons, practiced magical incantations and charms, frightened their children and themselves with talk of witches and ghouls, lightened the mystery of sleep with interpretations of dreams, and read esoteric secrets into ancient tomes. Jewish mysticism is as old as the Jews. It received influences from the Zoroastrian dualism of darkness and light, from the Neoplatonist substitution of emanations for creation, from the Neopythagorean mysticism of number, from Gnostic theosophies of Syria and Egypt, from the Apocrypha of early Christianity, from the poets and mystics of India, Islam, and the medieval church. But its basic sources were in the Jewish mentality and tradition themselves. Even before Christ there had circulated among the Jews secret interpretations of the creation story in Genesis and of chapters 1 and 10 of Ezekiel. In the Mishnah it was forbidden to expound these mysteries except privately to a single and trustworthy scholar. Imagination was free to conceive accounts of what had preceded the creation or Adam or what would follow the destruction of the world. Philo's theory of the Logos or divine wisdom as the creative agency of God was a lofty sample of these speculations. The Essenes had secret writings which were zealously guarded from disclosure, and Hebrew Apocrypha, like the Book of Jubilees, expounded a mystic cosmogony. A mystery was made of the ineffable name of Yahweh. Its four letters, the Tetragrammaton, were whispered to hold a hidden meaning and miraculous efficacy to be transmitted only to the mature and discreet. Akiva suggests that God's instrument in creating the world was the Torah or Pentateuch, and that every word or letter of these holy books had an occult significance and power. Some Babylonian Geonim ascribed such occult powers to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet and to the names of the angels. He who knew those names could control all the forces of nature. Learned men played with white or black magic, marvelous capacities obtainable through alliance of the soul with angels or demons, necromancy, bibliomancy, Exorcism, amulets, incantations, divination, and casting of lots played their part in Jewish as in Christian life. All the wonders of astrology were included. The stars were letters, a mysterious sky-writing that only the initiate could read. 
Sometime in the first century A.D., there appeared in Babylonia an esoteric book called Sefer Yezira, the Book of Creation. Mystic devotees, including Jehuda Halavi, attributed its composition to Abraham and God. Creation, it taught, had been affected through the mediation of ten sephiroth, numbers or principles, the Spirit of God, three emanations therefrom, air, water, and fire, three spatial dimensions to the left, and three dimensions to the right. These principles determined the content, while the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet determined the forms through which creation could be understood by the human mind. The book elicited learned commentaries from Sadia to the nineteenth century. About 840, a Babylonian rabbi brought these mystic doctrines to the Jews of Italy, whence they spread to Germany, Provence, and Spain. Ibn Gabiro was probably influenced by them in his theory of the intermediate beings between God and the world. Abraham ben David of Posquier used the secret tradition as a means of drawing Jews away from the rationalism of Maimonides. His son Isaac the Blind and pupil Azrael were probably the authors, circa 1190, of the Sefer Habahir, or Book of Light, a mystical commentary on the first chapter of Genesis. Here the demiurgic emanations of the Sefer Yezira were changed into light, wisdom, and reason, and this triplication of the Logos was offered as a Jewish trinity. Eliezer of Worms, 1176 to 1238, and Abraham ben Samuel of Ulafia, 1240 to 1291, offered the secret doctrine as a more profound and rewarding study than the Talmud. Like Islamic and German mystics, they applied the sensuous language of love and marriage to the relation between the soul and God. By the thirteenth century, the word Kabbalah, tradition, had come into general use to describe the secret doctrine in all its phases and products. About 1295, Moses ben Shem Tob of Leon published the third Kabbalistic classic, the Sefer HaZohar, or Book of Splendor. He ascribed its composition to Simon ben Yohai, a Tanah of the second century. Simon, said Moses, had been inspired by the angels and the ten Sephiroth to reveal to his esoteric readers secrets formerly reserved for the days of the coming Messiah. All the elements of the Kabbalah were brought together in the Zohar. The all-inclusiveness of a God knowable only through love, the tetragrammaton, the creative demiurges and emanations, the platonic analogy of macrocosm and microcosm, the date and mode of the Messiah's coming, the pre-existence and transmigration of the soul, the mystical meaning of ritual acts, numbers, letters, points, and strokes, the use of ciphers, acrostics, and backward reading of words, the symbolical interpretation of biblical texts, and the conception of woman as sin, and yet as also the embodiment of the mystery of creation. Moses of Leon marred his performance by making Simon ben Yohai refer to an eclipse of 1264 in Rome, and used several ideas apparently unknown before the 13th century. He deceived many, but not his wife. She confessed that her Moses thought Simon an excellent financial device. The success of the book inspired similar forgeries, and some later Kabbalists paid Moses in his own counterfeit by publishing their speculations under his name. The influence of the Kabbalah was far-reaching. For a time, the Zohar rivaled the Talmud as the favorite study of the Jews. Some Kabbalists attacked the Talmud as antiquated, literalistic logic-chopping and some Talmudists, including the learned Nachmanides, were strongly influenced by the Kabbalistic school. Belief in the authenticity and divine inspiration of the Kabbalah was widespread among European Jews. Their work in science and philosophy suffered correspondingly, and the golden age of Maimonides ended in the brilliant nonsense of the Zohar. Even upon Christian thinkers, the Kabbalah exercised some fascination. Raymond Lully, possibly from 1235 to 1315, adapted from it the number and letter mysticism of his Ars Magna. Pico della Mirandola, 1463-1494, thought that he had found in the Kabbalah final proofs for the divinity of Christ. Paracelsus, Cornelius Agrippa, Robert Flood, Henry Moore, and other Christian mystics sped on its speculations. Johannes Reuchlin, 1455-1522, confessed to poaching upon the Kabbalah for his theology, and perhaps Kabbalistic ideas infected Jacob Burma. 1575 to 1624. If a greater proportion of Jews than of Moslems or Christians sought consolation in mystic revelations, it was because this world turned its worst face to them and forced them for life's sake to cloak reality in a web of imagination and desire. It is the unfortunate who must believe that God has chosen them for His own. 8. Release 
From mystic exaltation, messianic disillusionment, periodic persecution, and the hard routine of economic life, the medieval Jews found refuge in the obscurity of their congregations and the consolations of their ritual and creed. They celebrated with piety the festivals that recalled their history, their tribulations, and their ancient glory, and patiently adjusted to their urban existence the ceremonies that once had divided the agricultural year. The vanishing Karaites kept the Sabbath in darkness and cold, lest they violate the law by kindling fires or lighting lamps. But most Jews, while the rabbis winked, brought in Christian friends or servitors to keep the fires burning and tend the lights. Every chance for a banquet was seized with generosity and pomp. The family gave a feast on the circumcision or confirmation of a son, the betrothal or marriage of a son or daughter, the visit of a noted scholar or relative, the occurrence of some religious festival. Sumptuary regulations of the rabbis forbade the providers of such banquets to invite more than twenty men, ten women, five girls, and all relatives up to the third generation. A wedding feast sometimes lasted a week, and not even the Sabbath was allowed to interrupt it. The bridal pair were crowned with roses, myrtle, and olive branches. Their path was strewn with nuts and wheat. Barley grains were thrown over them as a hint of fertility. Songs and quips accompanied every stage of the event. And in later medieval days a professional jester was engaged to ensure full merriment. Sometimes his jests were mercilessly truthful, but almost always he accepted Hillel's genial decree that every bride is beautiful. So the passing generation celebrated its own replacement, rejoiced in its children's children, and subsided into a harassed but kindly old age. We see the faces of such old Jews in Rembrandt's portraits, features bearing the history of the people and the individual, beards breathing wisdom, eyes haunted with sad memories but softened with indulgent love. Nothing in Moslem or Christian morals could surpass the mutual affection of young and old in Judaism, the love that overlooks all faults, the quiet guidance of immaturity by experience, and the dignity with which the life fully lived accepts the naturalness of death. When he made his will, the Jew left not only worldly goods to his offspring, but spiritual counsel. Be one of the first in synagogue, reads the will of Eliezer of Mainz, circa 1337. Do not speak during prayers, repeat the responses, and after the service do acts of kindness. And then the final instruction. Wash me clean, comb my hair, trim my nails, as I was wont to do in my lifetime, so that I may go clean to my eternal resting place, just as I used to go on every Sabbath to the synagogue. Put me in the ground at the right hand of my father. If the space be a little narrow, I am sure that he loves me well enough to make room for me by his side. When the last breath was drawn, the eyes and mouth of the dead were closed by the eldest son or the most distinguished son or relative. The body was bathed and anointed with aromatic unguents and wrapped in spotless linen. Almost everyone belonged to a burial society, which now took the corpse, watched over it, gave it the last religious rites, and accompanied it to the grave. In the funeral the pallbearers walked with bare feet. The women preceded the bier, chanted a dirge, and beat a drum. Any stranger who encountered the procession was expected to fall in with it and accompany it to the grave. Usually the coffin was placed near those of dead relatives. To be buried was for a man to lie with his fathers, to be gathered unto his people. The mourners did not despair. They knew that, though the individual might die, Israel would carry on. Book 4. The Dark Ages, 566-1095 Chapter 18 The Byzantine World, 565-1095 1. Heraclius If now we turn from the oriental side of the endless duel between east and west, we are soon moved with sympathy for a great empire harassed at once with internal discord and on every side, external attack. Avars and Slavs were crossing the Danube and taking possession of imperial lands and towns. Persians were preparing to overrun Western Asia. Spain was lost to the Visigoths. And the Lombards, three years after Justinian's death, conquered half of Italy in 568. Plague swept the empire in 542 and again in 566. Famine in 569. Poverty, barbarism, and war broke down communications, discouraged commerce, stifled literature and art. Justinian's successors were men of ability, but only a century of Napoleons could have coped with their problems. Justin II, from 565 to 578, fought vigorously against an expanding Persia. Tiberius II, from 578 to 582, favored by the gods with almost every virtue, was taken by them after a brief and just reign. Maurice, from 582 to 602, attacked the invading Avars with courage and skill, but received little support from the nation. 
Thousands entered monasteries to escape military service, and when Maurice forbade the monasteries to receive new members until the danger was over, the monks clamored for his fall. The centurion Focus led a revolution of the army and the populace against the aristocracy and the government in 602. The five sons of Maurice were butchered before his eyes. The old emperor refused to let the nurse of his youngest child save it by substituting for it her own. He himself was beheaded, the six heads were hung up as a spectacle for the people, and the bodies were cast into the sea. The empress Constantina, with her three daughters and many of the aristocracy, were slain, usually with torture, with or without trial. Eyes were pierced, tongues were torn out, limbs were amputated. Once more the scenes of the French Revolution were rehearsed. Khosru II took advantage of the disorder and renewed the old war of Persia against Greece. Phocas made peace with the Arabs and transported the entire Byzantine army into Asia. He was everywhere defeated by the Persians, while the Avars, unresisted, seized nearly all the agricultural hinterland of Constantinople. The aristocracy of the capital appealed to Heraclius, the Greek governor of Africa, to come to the rescue of the empire and their property. He excused himself on the ground of age, but sent them his son. The younger Heraclius spitted out a fleet, sailed into the Bosporus, overthrew Phocas, exhibited the mutilated corpse of the usurper to the populace, and was hailed as emperor in 610. Heraclius deserved his title and his name. With almost the energy of Heracles, he set himself to reorganize the shattered state. He spent ten years in rebuilding the morale of the people, the strength of the army, and the resources of the treasury. He gave land to peasants on condition that the eldest son in each family should render military service. Meanwhile, the Persians captured Jerusalem in 614 and advanced to Chalcedon in 615. Only the Byzantine navy, still controlling the waters, saved the capital and Europe. Soon afterward, the Avar hordes marched up to the Golden Horn, raided the suburbs, and took thousands of Greeks into slavery. The loss of the hinterland and of Egypt cut off the city's supply of grain and compelled abolition of the dole in 618. Heraclius, desperate, thought of transporting his army to Carthage and thence attempting to retake Egypt. The people and the clergy refused to let him go, and the patriarch Sergius agreed to lend him the wealth of the Greek church at interest to finance a holy war for the recapture of Jerusalem. Heraclius made peace with the Avars, and at last, in 622, set out against the Persians. The campaigns that followed were masterpieces of conception and execution. For six years Heraclius carried the war to the enemy and repeatedly defeated Khosru. In his absence, a Persian army and a host of Avars, Bulgars, and Slavs laid siege to Constantinople in 626. An army dispatched by Heraclius defeated the Persians at Chalcedon, and the garrison and populace of the capital, roused by the patriarch, scattered the barbarian horde. Heraclius marched to the gates of Tesiphon. Khosru II fell. Persia pled for peace and surrendered all that Khosru had taken from the Greek Empire. After seven years' absence, Heraclius returned in triumph to Constantinople. He hardly deserved the fate that shamed his old age. Weakened by disease, he was devoting his last energies to strengthening the civil administration when suddenly wild Arab tribes poured into Syria in 634, defeated an exhausted Greek army, and captured Jerusalem in 638. And even as the emperor lay on his deathbed, Egypt fell in 641. Persia and Byzantium had fought each other to a common ruin. Under Constance II, from 642 to 668, the Arab victories continued. Thinking the empire beyond saving, Constance spent his last years in the west and was killed in Syracuse. His son Constantine IV Paganatus was abler or luckier. When through five crucial years, from 673 to 678, the Moslems made another effort to take Constantinople, Greek fire, now mentioned for the first time, saved Europe. The new weapon, allegedly invented by Callinicus of Syria, was akin to our flamethrowers, an incendiary mixture of naphtha, quicklime, sulfur, and pitch. It was thrown against enemy ships or troops on flaming arrows, or blown against them through tubes, or shot on iron balls bearing flax and tow soaked in oil. Or it was loaded and fired on small boats which were set adrift against the foe. The composition of the mixture was a secret successfully guarded for two centuries by the Byzantine government. To reveal any knowledge of it was treason and sacrilege. The Saracens finally discovered the formula and used Saracen fire against the Crusaders. Until the invention of gunpowder, it was the most talked-of weapon in the medieval world. The Moslems made another assault upon the Greek capital in 717. An army of 80,000 Arabs and Persians under Moslema crossed the Hellespont at Abydos and besieged Constantinople from the rear. 
At the same time, the Arabs fitted out a fleet of 1,800 vessels, presumably small. This armada entered the Bosporus, overshadowing the straits, said a chronicler, like a moving forest. It was the good fortune of the Greeks that in this crisis an able general, Leo the Isaurian, replaced the incompetent Theodosius III on the throne and assumed the organization of defense. He disposed the small Byzantine navy with tactical skill and saw to it that every ship was well supplied with Greek fire. In a little while the Arab vessels were aflame, and nearly every ship in the great fleet was destroyed. The Greek army made a sortie upon the besiegers and won so decisive a victory that Moslemo withdrew to Syria. 2. The Iconoclasts, 717 to 802. Leo III derived his cognomen from the district of Isauria in Cilicia. According to Theophanes, he was born there of Armenian parentage. His father moved thence to Thrace, raised sheep, and sent five hundred of them, with his son Leo in the bargain, as a present to the emperor Justinian II. Leo became a guardsman of the palace, then commander of the Anatolian legions, finally, by the convincing suffrage of the army, emperor. He was a man of ambition, strong will, and patient perseverance, a general who repeatedly defeated Moslem forces greatly superior to his own, a statesman who gave the empire the stability of just laws, justly enforced, reformed taxation, reduced serfdom, extended peasant proprietorship, distributed lands, repopulated deserted regions, and constructively revised the laws. His only fault was autocracy. Perhaps in his Asiatic youth Leo had imbibed from Moslems, Jews, Manichaeans, Monophysites, and Paulicians a Stoic Puritan conception of religion that condemned the addiction of popular Christianity to image worship, ceremonialism, and superstition. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 2. Perhaps in his Asiatic youth, Leo had imbibed from Moslems, Jews, Manichaeans, Monophysites, and Paulicians a Stoic Puritan conception of religion that condemned the addiction of popular Christianity to image worship, ceremonialism, and superstition. The Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15, had explicitly forbidden any graven image of any figure, male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth. The early church had frowned upon images as relics of paganism, and had looked with horror upon pagan sculptures purporting to represent the gods. But the triumph of Christianity under Constantine and the influence of Greek surroundings, traditions, and statuary in Constantinople and the Hellenistic East had softened this opposition. As the number of worshipped saints multiplied, a need arose for identifying and remembering them. Pictures of them and of Mary were produced in great number, and in the case of Christ, not only his imagined form but his cross became objects of reverence, even, for simple minds, magic talismans. A natural freedom of fancy among the people turned the holy relics, pictures, and statues into objects of adoration. People prostrated themselves before them, kissed them, burned candles and incense before them, crowned them with flowers, and sought miracles from their occult influence. In Greek Christianity especially, sacred images were everywhere, in churches, monasteries, houses, and shops, even on furniture, trinkets, and clothes. Cities in danger from epidemic, famine, or war tended to rely upon the power of the relics they harbored, or on their patron saint, rather than on human enterprise. Fathers and councils of the church repeatedly explained that the images were not deities, but only reminders thereof. The people did not care to make such distinctions. Leo III was offended by these excesses of popular faith. It seemed to him that paganism was in this manner reconquering Christianity, and he felt keenly the satire directed by Moslems, Jews, and Christian sects against the superstitions of the orthodox multitude. To weaken the power of the monks over the people and the government, and to win the support of Nestorians and Monophysites, he assembled a great council of bishops and senators, and with their consent he promulgated in 726 an edict requiring the complete removal of icons from the churches. Representations of Christ and the Virgin were forbidden, and church murals were to be covered with plaster. Some of the higher clergy supported the edict. The lower clergy and the monks protested, the people revolted. Soldiers trying to enforce the law were attacked by worshippers, horrified and infuriated by this desecration of the dearest symbols of their faith. In Greece and the Cyclades, rebel forces proclaimed a rival emperor and sent a fleet to capture the capital. Leo destroyed the fleet and imprisoned the leaders of the opposition. 
In Italy, where pagan forms of worship had never died, the people were almost unanimous against the edict. Venice, Ravenna, and Rome drove out the imperial officers, and a council of western bishops summoned by Pope Gregory II anathematized the iconoclasts, image-breakers, without naming the emperor. The patriarch of Constantinople joined the revolt and sought by it to restore the independence of the eastern church from the state. Leo deposed him in 730, but did him no violence, and the edict was so mildly enforced that when Leo died in 741, most of the churches retained their frescoes and mosaics unharmed. His son, Constantine V, from 741 to 775, continued his policy and received from hostile historians the genial epithet of Capronymus, named from Dung. A council of eastern bishops, called by him at Constantinople in 754, condemned image worship as abominable and charged that through such worship Satan had reintroduced idolatry, denounced the ignorant artist who with his unclean hands gives form to that which should be believed only by the heart, and decreed that all images in the churches should be erased or destroyed. Constantine executed the decree without moderation or tact, imprisoned and tortured resisting monks, Again, eyes or tongues were torn out, noses were cut off. The patriarch was tortured and beheaded in 767. Like Henry VIII, Constantine V closed monasteries and convents, confiscated their property, turned the buildings to secular uses, and bestowed monastic lands upon his favorites. At Ephesus, the imperial governor, with the approval of the emperor, assembled the monks and nuns of the province and forced them to marry one another as an alternative to death. The persecution continued for five years, from 765 to 771. Constantine exacted from his son Leo IV, from 775 to 780, an oath to continue the iconoclastic policy. Leo did what he could, despite his weak constitution. Dying, he named his ten-year-old son Constantine VI as emperor. He ruled from 780 to 797, and nominated his widow, the Empress Irene, as regent during the youth's minority. She ruled with ability and without scruple. Sympathizing with the religious feelings of the people and her sex, she quietly ended the enforcement of the iconoclast edicts, permitted the monks to return to their monasteries and their pulpits, and convened the prelates of Christendom in the Second Council of Nicaea in 787, where 350 bishops under the lead of papal legates restored the veneration, not the worship, of sacred images as a legitimate expression of Christian piety and faith. In 790, Constantine VI came of age. Finding his mother reluctant to surrender her power, he deposed and exiled her. Soon the amiable youth relented. He brought her back to court and associated her with him in the imperial power, this in 792. In 797 she had him imprisoned and blinded, and thereafter reigned under the title of emperor, not Basilissa, but Basilius. For five years she administered the empire with wisdom and finesse, lowered taxes, scattered largesse among the poor, founded charitable institutions, and beautified the capital. The people applauded and loved her, but the army fretted at being ruled by a woman more capable than most men. In 802 the iconoclasts revolted, deposed her, and made her treasurer Nicephorus emperor. She yielded quietly and asked of him only a decent and safe retreat. He promised it, but banished her to Lesbos, and left her to earn a scanty living as a seamstress. Nine months later she died, with hardly a penny or a friend. The theologians forgave her crimes because of her piety, and the church canonized her as a saint. 3. Imperial Kaleidoscope, 802-1057 A full perspective of Byzantine civilization would require at this point a record of many emperors and some empresses, not of their intrigues, palace revolutions, and assassinations, but of their policy and legislation, and their age-long effort to protect the diminishing empire from Moslems on the south and Slavs and Bulgars on the north. In some respects it is an heroic picture. Through all the fluent shifts of appearing and disappearing figures, the Greek heritage was in good measure preserved. Economic order and continuity were maintained. Civilization continued, as if by some enduring impetus from the ancient labors of Pericles and Augustus, Diocletian and Constantine. In other aspects it is a sorry spectacle of generals climbing over slain rivals to imperial power to be slain in their turn, of pomp and luxury, eye-gouging and nose-cutting, incense and piety and treachery, of emperor and patriarch unscrupulously struggling to determine whether the empire should be ruled by might or myth, by sword or word. So we pass by Nicephorus I, from 802 to 811, and his wars with Harun al-Rashid, Michael I, 
from 811 to 813, dethroned and tonsured into monkhood because of his defeat by the Bulgars, Leo V, the Armenian, from 813 to 820, who again forbade the worship of images and was assassinated while singing an anthem in church, Michael II, from 820 to 829, the illiterate stammerer who fell in love with a nun and persuaded the Senate to entreat him to marry her, Theophilus, from 829 to 842, a legislative reformer, royal builder, and conscientious administrator who revived the iconoclastic persecution and died of dysentery, his widow Theodora, who as an able regent, from 842 to 856, ended the persecution, Michael III, the drunkard, from 842 to 867, whose amiable incompetence left the government first to his mother and, after her death, to his cultured and capable uncle, Caesar Bardas. Then suddenly a unique and unexpected figure appeared on the scene, overthrew every precedent except violence, and founded the powerful Macedonian dynasty. Basil the Macedonian was born, possibly around 812, near Hadrianople of an Armenian peasant family. As a child he was captured by Bulgars, and lived his youth among them beyond the Danube in what was then called Macedonia. Escaping in his twenty-fifth year, he made his way to Constantinople and was hired as groom by a diplomat who admired his physical strength and massive head. He accompanied his master on a mission to Greece and there attracted the attention and some of the wealth of the widow Danielis. Back in the capital he tamed a spirited horse for Michael III, was taken into the emperor's service, and, though quite illiterate, rose to the position of Lord Chamberlain. Basil was ever convenient and competent. When Michael sought a husband for his mistress, Basil divorced his peasant wife, sent her to Thrace with a comforting dowry, and married Eudocia, who continued her services to the emperor. Michael supplied Basil with a mistress, but the Macedonian thought he deserved the throne as reward. He persuaded Michael that Bardas was plotting to depose him, and then killed Bardas with his own enormous hands in 866. Long accustomed to reign without ruling, Michael made Basil co-emperor and left him all the tasks of government. When Michael threatened to dismiss him, Basil arranged and supervised his assassination and became sole emperor in 867. So even under hereditary monarchy, career was open to talent. With such servility and crime, the letterless son of a peasant established the longest of all Byzantine dynasties and began a nineteen-year reign of excellent administration, legislating wisely, judging justly, replenishing the treasury, and building new churches and palaces for the city that he had captured. No one dared oppose him, and when he died by a hunting accident the throne passed with unwanted quiet to his son. Leo VI, from 886 to 912, was the complement of his father, learned, bookish, sedentary, mild. Gossip concluded that he was Michael's, not Basil's, son, and perhaps Eudocia was not sure. He earned his cognomen of the wise, not by his poetry, nor by his treatises on theology, administration, and war, but by his reorganization of provincial and ecclesiastical government, his new formulations of Byzantine law, and his meticulous regulation of industry. Though an admiring pupil of the scholarly patriarch Phocius, and himself devoted to piety, he shocked the clergy and amused the people by four marriages. His first two wives died without bearing him a son. Leo insisted on a son as the only alternative to a war of succession. The moral theology of the church forbade a third marriage. Leo persisted, and his fourth wife, Zoe, crowned his resolution with a boy. Constantine VII, from 912 to 958, was called Porphyrogenitus, born in the purple, that is, in the porphyry-lined apartment reserved for the use of expecting empresses. He inherited his father's literary tastes, not his administrative capacity. He composed for his son two books on the art of government, one on the themes, or provinces, of the empire, and a book of ceremonies describing the ritual and etiquette required of the emperor. He supervised the compilation of works on agriculture, medicine, veterinary medicine, and zoology, and formed an historian's history of the world by selecting extracts from historians and chroniclers. Under his patronage, Byzantine literature flourished in its polished and anemic way. Perhaps Romanus II, from 958 to 963, was like other children and did not read his father's books. He married a Greek girl, Theophano, she was suspected of poisoning her father-in-law and hastening Romanus's death. And before her twenty-four-year-old husband was dead, she seduced into her arms the ascetic general Nicephorus II Phocus, who with her connivance seized the throne. Nicephorus had already driven the Moslems from Aleppo and Crete in 961. In 965 he drove them from Cyprus, in 968 from Antioch. It was these victories that shattered the Abbasid Caliphate. 
Nicephorus pled with the patriarch to promise all the rewards and honors of martyrdom to soldiers who should fall in battle against the Moslems. The patriarch refused on the ground that all soldiers were temporarily polluted by the blood that they shed. Had he consented, the Crusades might have begun a century earlier. Nicephorus lost ambition and retired into the palace to live like an anchorite. Bored with this monastic existence, Theophano became the mistress of the general John Simisses. With her connivance, he killed Nicephorus in 969 and seized the throne. Remorseful, he repudiated and exiled her and went off to atone for his crimes by transient victories against the Moslems and the Slavs. His successor was one of the most powerful personalities in Byzantine history. Basil II, born to Romanus and Theophano in 958, had served as co-emperor with Nicephorus Phocas and Tsimisces. Now, in 976, he began at the age of 18 an undivided rule that lasted half a century. Troubles encompassed him. His chief minister plotted to displace him. The feudal barons, whom he proposed to tax, financed conspiracies against him. Bardas Sclerus, general of the Eastern Army, rebelled and was suppressed by Bardas Phocas, who then had himself proclaimed emperor by his troops. The Moslems were recovering nearly all that Semises had won from them in Syria. The Bulgars were at their zenith, encroaching upon the empire in east and west. Basil suppressed the revolt, reclaimed Armenia from the Saracens, and in a ruthless Thirty Years' War destroyed the Bulgarian power. After his victory in 1014, he blinded 15,000 prisoners, leaving one eye in every hundredth man to lead the tragic host back to Samuel, the Bulgarian Tsar. Perhaps in terror rather than in admiration, the Greeks called him Bulgaroctinus, killer of Bulgars. Amid these campaigns, he found time to war against those who enriched themselves at the expense of the poor. By his laws of 996, he sought to break up some of the large estates and to encourage the spread of a free peasantry. He was about to lead an armada against the Saracens in Sicily when death surprised him in his 68th year. Not since Heraclius had the empire been so extensive, nor since Justinian so strong. The Byzantine decline was resumed under his aged brother, Constantine VIII, from 1025 to 1028. Having no offspring but three daughters, Constantine persuaded Romanus Argyrus to marry the eldest, Zoe, who was nearing fifty. As regent, and with the help of her sister Theodora, Zoe governed the state through the reigns of Romanus III, from 1028 to 1034, Michael IV, from 1034 to 1042, Michael V, in 1042, and Constantine IX, from 1042 to 1055. And seldom had the empire been better ruled. The imperial sisters attacked corruption in state and church and forced officials to disgorge their embezzled hordes. One who had been chief minister surrendered 5,300 pounds of gold, which he had secreted in a cistern, and when the patriarch Alexis died, a cache of a 100,000 pounds of silver was discovered in his rooms. For a brief interlude, the sale of offices was stopped. Zoe and Theodora sat as judges on the highest tribunal and dispensed stern justice. Nothing could rival Zoe's impartiality. Having at sixty-two married Constantine the Ninth, and knowing that her cosmetic skill had preserved barely the surface of her charms, she allowed her new husband to bring his mistress Sclerina to live in the royal palace. He chose quarters between their apartments, and Zoe never visited him without making sure that he was disengaged. When Zoe died in 1050, Theodora retired to a convent, and Constantine the Ninth ruled for five years with wisdom and taste. He chose men of competence and culture for his aides, re-beautified St. Sophia, built hospitals and refuges for the poor, and supported literature and art. At his death in 1055, the supporters of the Macedonian dynasty led a popular revolt that brought the virgin Theodora out of her conventual retreat and, much against her will, crowned her empress. Despite her seventy-four years, she and her ministers governed efficiently, but in 1056 she died so suddenly that chaos ensued. The palace aristocracy named Michael the Sixth emperor, the army preferred the general, Isaac Comnenus. One battle decided the issue. Michael became a monk, and Comnenus entered the capital in 1057 as emperor. The Macedonian dynasty had come to an end after 190 years of violence, war, adultery, piety, and excellent administration. Isaac Comnenus resigned after two years, named Constantine Ducas, the president of the Senate, as his successor, and entered a monastery. When Constantine died in 1067, his widow Eudocia acted as regent for four years but the demands of war required a sterner leader, and she married and crowned Romanus IV. Romanus was defeated by the Turks at Manzikert in 1071, returned to Constantinople in disgrace, was deposed, imprisoned, and blinded, and was allowed to die of his untended wounds. 
When Alexius Comnenus I, nephew of Isaac Comnenus, came to the throne in 1081, the Byzantine Empire seemed near its fall. The Turks had taken Jerusalem in 1076 and were advancing through Asia Minor. The Patsanak and Cuman tribes were approaching Constantinople from the north. The Normans were attacking the Byzantine outposts in the Adriatic. The government and the army were crippled with treason, incompetence, corruption, and cowardice. Alexius met the situation with subtlety and courage. He sent agents to foment revolution in Norman Italy, gave Venice commercial privileges in return for the aid of its navy against the Normans, confiscated church treasures to rebuild his army, took the field in person, and won victories by strategy rather than by blood. Amid these foreign cares he found time to reorganize the government and its defenses, and gave the tottering empire another century of life. In 1095, in a far-reaching stroke of diplomacy, he appealed to the West to come to the aid of the Christian East. At the Council of Piacenza, he offered a reunion of the Greek with the Latin Church in return for the unity of Europe against Islam. His appeal conspired with other factors to unleash the first of those dramatic crusades that were to save and then destroy Byzantium. 4. Byzantine Life, 566-1095 at the beginning of the 11th century, the Greek Empire, through the arms and statesmanship of the Isaurian and Macedonian dynasties, had reached again the power, wealth, and culture of its zenith under Justinian. Asia Minor, northern Syria, Cyprus, Rhodes, the Cyclades, and Crete had been wrested from the Moslems. Southern Italy was once more Magna Graecia, ruled by Constantinople. The Balkans had been recaptured from Bulgars and Slavs. Byzantine industry and commerce again dominated the Mediterranean. Greek Christianity had triumphed in the Balkans and Russia, and Greek art and literature were enjoying a Macedonian renaissance. The revenue of the state in the 11th century reached the present equivalent of $2,400,000,000. Constantinople was at the crest of its curve, surpassing ancient Rome and Alexandria, contemporary Baghdad and Cordoba, in trade, wealth, luxury, beauty, refinement, and art. Its population of nearly a million was now predominantly Asiatic or Slav, Armenians, Cappadocians, Syrians, Jews, Bulgars, and half-Slav Greeks, with a colorful infusion of merchants and soldiers from Scandinavia, Russia, Italy, and Islam. At the top, a thinning layer of Greek aristocrats. A thousand varieties of homes, gabled, terraced, or domed, with balconies, loges, gardens, or pergolas, full markets reeking with the products of all the world, a thousand narrow, muddy streets of tenements and shops. Splendid thoroughfares bordered with stately mansions and shady porticos, peopled with statuary, spanned with arches of triumph, and leading out to the countryside through guarded gates in the fortress walls. Complex royal palaces, the Triconcus of Theophilus, the New Palace of Basil I, the Bucalion of Nicephorus Phocus, descending by marble stairs to a sculptured colonnaded wharf on the Sea of Marmara. Churches as many as there are days in the year, said a traveler, and several of them architectural jewels. Altars enshrining the most revered and precious relics in Christendom. Monasteries unashamedly magnificent without and turbulent with proud saints within. Saint Sophia, ever newly adorned, glowing with candles and lamps, heavy with incense, solemn with pageantry, sonorous with convincing chants. This was the frame, half gold and half mud, of teeming life in the Byzantine capital. Within the city palaces of the aristocracy and the great merchants, and in the villas of seaside and hinterland, Every luxury available to that age could be found, and decoration uninhibited by Semitic taboos. Marbles of every grain and hue, murals and mosaics, sculptures and fine pottery, curtains sliding on silver rods, tapestries and carpets and silks, doors inlaid with silver or ivory, furniture exquisitely carved, table services of silver or gold. Here moved the world of Byzantine society, men and women of fine face and figure, dressed in colored silks and lace and furs, and rivaling the graces, amours, and intrigues of Bourbon, Paris, and Versailles. Never were ladies better powdered and scented, jeweled and coiffured. In the imperial palaces, fires were kept burning all the year long to brew the perfumes required to deodorize queens and princesses. Never before had life been so ornate and ceremonious, so colorful with processions, receptions, spectacles, and games, so minutely ordained by protocol and etiquette. At the Hippodrome, as well as in the court, the firmly established aristocracy flaunted its finest raiment and ornament. On the highways its stately equipages passed, so reckless as to earn the hatred of the pedestrian poor, 
and so rich as to bring down the anathemas of prelates who served God in vessels and on altars of marble, alabaster, silver, and gold. Constantinople, said Robert of Clary, contained two-thirds of the world's wealth. Even the common Greek inhabitants, reported Benjamin of Tudela, seem all to be the children of kings. If Constantinople, said a twelfth-century writer, surpasses all other cities in wealth, it also surpasses them in vice. All the sins of a great city found room here, impartially in rich and poor. Brutality and piety took turns in the same imperial souls, and among the people intensity of religious need could be adjusted to the corruption or violence of politics and war. The castration of children to serve as eunuchs in harems and administration, the assassination or blinding of present or potential rivals for the throne, continued through diverse dynasties and the monotonous kaleidoscope of changeless change. The populace, disordered and manipulated by divisions of race, class, or creed, was fickle, bloodthirsty, periodically turbulent, bribed by the state with doles of bread, oil, and wine, diverted by horse races, beast baitings, rope dancing, indecent pantomimes in the theatre, and by imperial or ecclesiastical pageantry in the streets. Gambling halls and saloons were everywhere. Houses of prostitution could be found on almost every street, sometimes at the very church doors. The women of Byzantium were famous for their licentiousness and their religious devotion, the men for their quick intelligence and unscrupulous ambition. All classes believed in magic, astrology, divination, sorcery, witchcraft, and miraculous amulets. The Roman virtues had disappeared even before the Latin tongue. Roman and Greek qualities had been overwhelmed by a flood of uprooted Orientals who had lost their own morality and had taken on no other except in words. Yet even in this highly theological and sensual society, the great majority of men and women were decent citizens and parents, who settled down after youthful frolics to the joys and sorrows of family life, and grudgingly performed the work of the world. The same emperors who blinded their rivals poured out charity to hospitals, orphanages, homes for the aged, free hostels for travelers. And in that aristocracy where luxury and ease seemed the order of every day, there were hundreds of men who gave themselves, with a the zeal tempered by venality, to the tasks of administration and statesmanship, and somehow managed, despite all overturns and intrigues, to save the realm from every disaster, and to maintain the most prosperous economy in the medieval Christian world. The bureaucracy that Diocletian and Constantine had established had become in seven centuries an effective engine of administration, reaching every region of the realm. Heraclius had replaced the old division of the empire into provinces, by a division into themes, or military units ruled by a strategus, or military governor. This was one of a hundred ways in which the Islamic threat modified Byzantine institutions. The themes retained considerable self-government and prospered under this centralized rule. They received a continuity of order without bearing the direct force of the struggles and violence that disturbed the capital. Constantinople was ruled by the emperor, the patriarch, and the mob. The themes were governed by Byzantine law. While Islam confused law with theology, and Western Europe floundered through the chaos of a dozen barbarian codes, the Byzantine world cherished and extended the legacy of Justinian. The novels or new laws of Justin II and Heraclius, the Ecloga or selected laws issued by Leo III, the Basilica or royal edicts promulgated by Leo VI, and the novels of the same Leo, adjusted the pandects of Justinian to the changing needs of five centuries. Codes of military, ecclesiastical, maritime, mercantile, and rural law gave order and dependability to legal judgments in army and clergy, in markets and ports, on the farm and the sea. And in the eleventh century, the school of law at Constantinople was the intellectual center of secular Christendom. So the Byzantines preserved Rome's greatest gift, Roman law, through a millennium of peril and change, until its revival at Bologna in the twelfth century revolutionized the civil law of Latin Europe and the canon law of the Roman Church. The Byzantine Maritime Code of Leo III, developed from the nautical regulations of ancient Rhodes, was the first body of commercial law in medieval Christendom. It became in the eleventh century the source of similar codes for the Italian republics of Trani and Amalfi, and by that lineage entered into the legal heritage of the modern world. The rural code was a creditable attempt to check feudalism and establish a free peasantry. Small holdings were given to retired soldiers. Larger tracts belonging to the state were cultivated by soldiers as a form of military service. 
and great areas were colonized by heretical sects transported from Asia into Thrace and Greece. Still vaster regions were settled under governmental compulsion or protection by barbarian groups who were judged less dangerous within the empire than outside. So Goths were received into Thrace and Illyria, Lombards into Pannonia, Slavs into Thrace, Macedonia, and Greece. By the 10th century, the Peloponnesus was predominantly Slav, and Slavs were numerous in Attica and Thessaly. State and church cooperated to diminish slavery. Imperial legislation forbade the sale of slaves or the enslavement of a freeman and automatically emancipated slaves who entered the army or the clergy or married a free person. In Constantinople, slavery was in effect limited to domestic service, but it flourished there. Nevertheless, it is almost a Newtonian law of history that large agricultural holdings, in proportion to their mass and nearness, attract smaller holdings and, by purchase or otherwise, periodically gather the land into great estates. In time, the concentration becomes explosive, the soil is redivided by taxation or revolution, and concentration is resumed. By the 10th century, most of the soil of the Byzantine East was owned in extensive domains by rich landlords, dinatoi, or powerful men, or by churches, monasteries, or hospitals endowed with supporting terrain by pious legacy. Such tracts were worked by serfs or by coloni, legally free but economically chained. The owners, equipped with retinues of clients, guards, and domestic slaves, led lives of refined luxury in their villas or their city palaces. We see the good and bad of these great lords in the story of Basil I's benefactress, the Lady Danielus. When she visited him in Constantinople, three hundred slaves took turns supporting the litter or covered couch in which she traveled from Petrus. She brought to her imperial protege richer presents than any sovereign had ever sent to a Byzantine emperor. Four hundred youths, one hundred eunuchs, and one hundred maidens were but a part of her gift. There were also four hundred pieces of art-woven textiles, one hundred pieces of cambric, each so fine that it could be enclosed in the joint of a reed, and a dinner service in silver and gold. During her lifetime she gave away much of her wealth. At her death she willed the rest to Basil's son. Leo the Sixth found himself suddenly dowered with eighty villas and farms, masses of coin and jewelry and plate, costly furniture, rich stuffs, numberless cattle, thousands of slaves. Such Greek gifts were not altogether pleasing to the emperors. The wealth so gleaned from the flesh and sweat of millions of men gave the owners a power collectively dangerous to any sovereign. Out of self-interest as well as humanity, the emperors sought to halt this process of concentration. The severe winter of 927-28 to ended in famine and plague. Starving peasants sold their holdings to great landowners at desperately low prices, or merely in exchange for subsistence. In 934, the regent Romanus issued a novel that denounced the landlords as having shown themselves more merciless than famine and plague. It required the restoration of properties bought for less than half a fair price and permitted any seller within three years to repurchase the land he had sold and at the price he had received. The edict had only a negligible effect. Concentration continued. Moreover, many free farmers, complaining of high taxes, sold their lands and moved to the towns, if possible, to Constantinople and the Dole. Basil II renewed the struggle of emperors against nobles. His decree of 996 permitted the seller at any time to redeem his land at the price of its sale, voided titles to lands acquired in contravention of the law of 934, and demanded the immediate return of such lands to their former owners without cost. These laws were in large measure evaded, and a modified feudalism was sporadically established by the 11th century in the Byzantine East. But the effort of the emperors was not lost. The surviving free peasantry, under the stimulus of ownership, covered the land with farms, orchards, vineyards, beehives, and ranches. The large proprietors developed scientific agriculture to its medieval zenith. And from the 8th to the 11th century, Byzantine agriculture kept pace with the prosperity of Byzantine industry. The Eastern Empire in this period acquired an urban and semi-industrial character quite different from the ruralism of Latin Europe north of the Alps. Miners and metallurgists actively explored and developed the lead, iron, copper, and gold in the soil. Not only Constantinople, but a hundred other Byzantine cities, Smyrna, Tarsus, Ephesus, Durazzo, Ragusa, Petrus, Corinth, Thebes, Salonica, Hadrianople, Heraclea, Salimbria, throbbed and resounded with tanners, cobblers, saddlers, armorers, goldsmiths, jewelers, 
Metal workers, carpenters, wood carvers, wheelwrights, bakers, dyers, weavers, potters, mosaicists, painters. As cauldrons and caverns of manufacturing and exchange, Constantinople, Baghdad, and Cordova in the ninth century almost rivaled the bustle and bedlam of a modern metropolis. Despite Persian competition, the Greek capital still led the white world in the production of fine tissues and silks. Only second to it in this regard were Argos, Corinth, and Thebes. The textile industry was highly organized and used much slave labor. Most other workers were free artisans. The proletarian population of Constantinople and Salonika were class conscious and staged many unsuccessful revolts. Their employers formed a considerable middle class, acquisitive, charitable, industrious, intelligent, and fiercely conservative. The major industries, including their workers, artists, managers, merchants, lawyers, and financiers, were organized into systemata, or corporation guilds, lineally descended from the ancient collegia and artes, and akin to the large economic units of a modern corporative state. Each corporation had a monopoly in its line, but was strictly regulated by legislation in its purchases, prices, methods of manufacture, and conditions of sale. Governmental examiners kept surveillance over operations and accounts, and at times maximum wages were fixed by law. Minor industries, however, were left to free workers and individual enterprise. The arrangement gave order, prosperity, and continuity to Byzantine industry, but it checked initiative and invention and tended to an oriental fixity of status and life. Commerce was encouraged by state maintenance or supervision of docks and ports, governmentally regulated insurance and loans on bottomry, a vigorous war on piracy, and the most stable currency in Europe. Over all commerce, the Byzantine government exercised a pervasive control, prohibited certain exports, monopolized the trade in corn and silk, charged export and import duties, and taxed sales. It almost invited its early replacement as commercial mistress of the Aegean and Black Seas by allowing foreign merchants, Armenians, Syrians, Egyptians, Amalfians, Pisans, Venetians, Genoese, Jews, Russians, and Catalans, to carry most of its trade and to set up semi-independent factories or agencies in or near the capital. Interest charges were permitted but were limited by law to 12, 10, 8 percent or even less. Bankers were numerous, and perhaps it was the moneylenders of Constantinople rather than those of Italy who developed the Bill of Exchange and organized the most extensive credit system in Christendom before the 13th century. 5. The Byzantine Renaissance from the labor and skill of the people and the superfluities of the rich, there came in the ninth and 10th centuries a remarkable revival of letters and arts. Although the empire to its dying day called itself Roman, nearly all Latin elements had disappeared from it except Roman law. Since Heraclius, Greek had been the language of government, literature, and liturgy, as well as of daily speech in the Byzantine East. Education was now completely Greek. Nearly every free male, many women, even many slaves received some education. The University of Constantinople, which, like letters in general, had been allowed to decay in the crises of the Heraclian age, was restored by Caesar Bardas in 863 and attained high repute for its courses in philology, philosophy, theology, astronomy, mathematics, biology, music, and literature. Even the pagan Libanius and the godless Lucian were read. Tuition was largely free to qualified students, and the teachers were paid by the state. Libraries, public and private, were numerous and still preserved those classic masterpieces which had been forgotten in the disordered West. This ample transmission of the Greek heritage was at once stimulating and restrictive. It sharpened and widened thought and lured it from its old round of homolytical eloquence and theological debate. But its very wealth discouraged originality. It is easier for the ignorant than for the learned to be original. Byzantine literature was intended chiefly for cultured and leisurely ladies and gentlemen, polished and polite, artistic and artificial, Hellenistic but not Hellenic. It played on the surface and spared the heart of human life. Though the churchmen of the period were remarkably tolerant, thought of its own accord, through habits formed in youth, stayed within the circle of orthodoxy, and the iconoclasts were more pious than the priests. It was another Alexandrian age of scholarship. Pundits analyzed language and prosody, wrote epitomes, outlines, and universal histories, compiled dictionaries, encyclopedias, anthologies. Now, in 917, Constantine Cephalus collected the Greek anthology. Now, in 976, Suetus accumulated his encyclopedic lexicon. 
Theophanes, circa 814, and Leo the Deacon, who was born in 950, wrote valuable histories of their own or recent times. Paul of Aegina, who lived from 615 to 690, composed an encyclopedia of medicine that combined Moslem theory and practice with the legacy of Galen and Oribatius. It discussed in almost modern terms operations for cancer of the breast, hemorrhoids, catheterization of the bladder, lithotomy, castration. Eunuchs were manufactured, says Paul, by crushing the testicles of children in a hot bath. The outstanding Byzantine scientist of these centuries was an obscure and impoverished teacher, Leo of Salonica, circa 850, of whose existence Constantinople took no notice until a caliph invited him to Baghdad. One of his pupils, captured in war, became the slave of a Moslem dignitary who soon marveled at the youth's knowledge of geometry. Al-Mamun, learning of it, induced him to join in a discussion of geometrical problems at the royal palace, was impressed by his performance, heard with eager curiosity his account of his teacher, and at once sent Leo an invitation to Baghdad and affluence. Leo consulted a Byzantine official, who consulted the emperor Theophilus, who hastened to secure Leo with a state professorship. Leo was a polymath and taught and wrote on mathematics, astronomy, astrology, medicine, and philosophy. Al-Mamun submitted to him several problems in geometry and astronomy, and was so pleased with the replies that he offered Theophilus eternal peace and two thousand pounds of gold if the emperor would lend him Leo for a while. Theophilus refused, and made Leo archbishop of Salonica to keep him out of Almamun's reach. Leo, Phocius, and Pacellus were the stellar luminaries of this age. Phocius, possibly from 820 to 891, the most learned man of his time, was in six days graduated from layman to patriarch and belongs to religious history. Michael Pacellus, possibly from 1018 to 1080, was a man of the world and the court, an advisor of kings and queens, a genial and orthodox Voltaire who could be brilliant on every subject, but landed on terra firma after every theological argument or palace revolution. He did not let his love of books dull his love of life. He taught philosophy at the University of Constantinople and received the title of Prince of Philosophers. He entered a monastery, found the monastic career too peaceful, returned to the world, served as prime minister from 1071 to 1078, and had time to write on politics, science, medicine, grammar, theology, jurisprudence, music, and history. His chronographia recorded the intrigues and scandals of a century, from 976 to 1078, with candor, verve, and vanity. He describes Constantine IX as hanging on Pacellus's tongue. Here, as a sample, is a paragraph from his description of the revolt that restored Theodora to the throne in 1055. Each soldier in the crowd was armed. One grasped a hatchet, another a battle axe, one a bow, another a lance. Some of the populace carried heavy stones, and all ran in great disorder to the apartments of Theodora. But she, taking refuge in a chapel, remained deaf to all their cries. Abandoning persuasion, the crowd used force upon her. Some, drawing their daggers, threw themselves upon Theodora as if to kill her. Boldly they snatched her from the sanctuary, clothed her in sumptuous robes, seated her on a horse, and circling about her led her to the church of St. Sophia. Now all the population, high-born as well as low, joined in paying her homage, and all proclaimed her queen. The personal letters of Priscellus were almost as charming and revealing as Cicero's. His speeches, verses, and pamphlets were the talk of the day. His malicious humor and lethal wit were an exciting stimulus amid the ponderous erudition of his contemporaries. Compared with him and Phocius and Theophanes, the Alquins, Rabani, and Gerbers of the contemporary West were timid emigrants from barbarism into the country of the mind. The most conspicuous side of this Byzantine Renaissance was its art. This book is continued on Cassette 4, Side 1.